Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Theory Underground. I am your host, David McGarricker, and today we have another epic marathon stream. And what I mean by an epic marathon stream for those who are new to this whole endeavor is that we have back-to-back -back interviews all day long, unless you're in the Pacific time zone, in which case it'll be over by about 3 p.m. But the way that this works is it starts really early for me, and it goes until my evening. So the lineup today is going to be Alenka Zupancic, then Lucas, Vukas and Michal from Poland will be talking about the European tour. Then Brent Atkins, who's a scholar in Deleuzian studies, and we'll be talking about Deleuze and Guattari for Deleuze's birthday, because it is, after all, Deleuze's birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Deleuze. Um, and then I'll be having on, uh, my gosh, who's next? Daniel Garner from OG Rose to give us all a shot of adrenaline and to get things properly based in the sort of humanist framework that I kind of want to approach the next couple of conversations. Then I'll be talking to Ashley Frowley, famous uh, for so many things, but you know she does a lot of work with Sublation Media. She's got a great lecture course going up on her channel. I want to talk to her about what she's doing with all of that, talk to her about the event that we are planning for the European tour. And then uh, Leon Brenner was supposed to be here. He's currently on the thumbnail, but it's looking like that's not going to happen uh, because he just, it, it's some kind of an emergency. And so um, that's a spot that will probably be filled in by someone else, or you'll get an impromptu lecture. Sometimes that happens here as well. Uh, maybe it'll be a call in, who knows? But then, uh, then, drum roll, everybody, the two final big guests of the day, Todd McGowan and Justin Murphy, two very different thinkers from very different walks of life. And Michael Downs is going to be joining me potentially for both of those conversations. And it should be a great way to kind of bring in this whole Deleuze and Guattari versus Jacques Lacan and Slavoj Žižek kind of uh, debate, really. The, it, it ultimately all lays the groundwork for a contradiction that is going on today. And we hope to get to the bottom of it, or at least set it up so that we can get to the bottom of it. But with that, I'm going to roll the PSA, and then I'll be back with Olenka. Take care, everybody, and see you in a moment. Thinking is super uncool, and that's why you should do it. It's just like almost anything that's like cool anymore. Um, yeah, it just sucks. And I think that's like what the underground movement has always been about is just like seeing what's in the mainstream, being like it ain't there and kind of like cobbling something together, you know? And, and yeah, it's a little mismatched, but that's like its beauty. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. We bring primary texts from leading lights of diverse fields to bear on topical issues and works popular in our current world. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run and review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. Seriously. This is a little experiment in what I David McCarricker can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. Usually a good edited collection has good essays, but you only want to read a few. Every essay makes me want to read the other essay because you have a vision. Everyone that you invited, you invited for a reason. You weren't some fake publicist. He's like, hey, someone has a new book, have him on your show. No, 
you only talk to people because you've read shit by them that you right, thought right, about right, that you right. think has value even if you disagree so i think that's what's amazing i believe that i am like so many others pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory however before these tools become accessible they have to be experimented with that's why i built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages five patrons and some small classes of students over the last year of course i also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that i don't get in trouble with the irs or whatever in less than a year theory underground has already put out eight courses two books one my book time energy and the other underground theory which has over 30 contributors including works written by students at theory underground some of my fellow travelers and colleagues in the broader universe of underground theory beyond the books and courses though you will also find interviews reading exegetical reaction sessions and live weekly events for working class autodidacts independent researchers and renegade academics these include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. Support at this stage of the operation is more crucial than ever because my savings were used up over the last year of getting this established. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive. So excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. If you cannot afford it, but want to get involved with some of the stuff behind the paywall, I have made a financial aid scholarship you can sign up for here in the description. Quick side note, some people ask about the profit motive. At this point, I have not actually made a return on any of my investment in terms of the amount of time energy that I put into things, the amount of savings I've actually put into things, the opportunity cost of the work that I'm doing as opposed to the other kinds of things that I could be doing for money. Uh, but more importantly, I don't actually make enough to pay for my cost of living. The goal is to make enough for my cost of living and then once that is achieved, everything over that amount is going to go towards expanding the operation to the point where I can hire Michael Downs, AKA Mikey of The Dangerous Maybe, to be a full-time researcher and part-time teacher at Theory Underground. All right, so with that aside, I just wanna say also, if you are a worker with earbuds, what's up? I see you. I work at Amazon part-time and everything I do is for my past self who used to work there full-time. Most workers with earbuds couldn't care less about theory, but I do believe a working class intellectual revolution could grow out of the underground theory scene. My hope is that what I have built here will contribute to making the scene something more than just a scene, and you into something more than just a scene kid. We're trying to make this into a real intellectual milieu capable of leading a way forward beyond the imminent crises facing humanity. But for that, we need thinking now more than ever. Start thinking. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program. And also make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. Think of it like a gym membership for your mind! <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> I love you too. All right. So let's see here. My my software looks like it froze for a second. Um, as soon as I see that it's working, <laughs> we'll we'll proceed. All right, everybody. If it's working, let me know in the live chat. Um. I've got like the loading sign, you know what I mean? Um, all right, we're good. Welcome, Elenka Zupanchich. How are you doing today? Uh, 
great to be here. I'm very happy to have this opportunity and to yeah be able to do, to discuss things uh, at this platform at this site. So I'm I'm okay. It's like early afternoon here, so I guess for some people it's very very early morning. Um, I appreciate <laughs> whatever the eagerness to listen to this discussion even so early in the morning. Oh yeah, we've got a lot of people who, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that this gives them their sort of morning kick along with their coffee as they get into their, their job or whatever. This is the first yeah, time that we've... Or the kind, sorry, kick or the kind of depression after which everything will look great <laughs> when they come to work. <laughs> Much more interesting and funny. <laughs> Sorry, I'm joking. Well, yeah, it is, it, you know, it is kind of like a form of uh, disassociation to be able to, you know, if you sneak an earbud at work, some people are allowed to have an, <clears throat> an earbud at work, you know, excuse me, but like some people are allowed to have their earbud or their headphones, but uh, a lot of the time you actually have to sneak it. It's a, it's, it's a form of inherent transgression to be able to listen to, uh, to lectures and interviews and books while you're working. And so um, to all of the workers out there who are, uh, who are doing that, you know, uh, rock on. It, 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 but it's, it's like a form of disassociation because, you know, your, your body is at work, your body is growing tired, or, but, but your mind is somewhere else, you know. This is the first time that we've had Alenka since uh, she was published in Underground Theory. Um, her piece in Underground Theory is called A Sex Passé. And so I thought maybe we could start with um, some questions related to that piece. But first, I also kind of want to introduce you uh, to the new listener, to people who might not be super familiar with your work. And I'll just say as a way of introduction, that Alenka Zupancic is part of what is called, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, the Ljubljana School in Slovenia. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes? Correct. Wonderful. Which, you know, obviously, uh, Slavoj Žižek is a part of. He tends to take the spotlight, but as he will freely admit and r routinely says, like, he owes everything to his fellow travelers in the Ljubljana School. And Alenka's work is spanning a wide array of topics. Uh, most recently, you published Let Them Rot, Antigone's Parallax, is that correct? Yes. Yes, and then like, I don't know, I think probably a long and time ago. There, there is just recently, sorry, there is a um, European edition of this book, which just came out in December. Because it was, it seems it was very hard to get in Europe. So there is a European version now with a, a post face. <laughs> so there is, and it's just um, let them rot without the subtitle. Oh no, subtitle. Okay. So let them rot. And I had actually originally, I think, in our email correspondence, had it backwards. I uh, I thought I thought it was Antigone's Parallax. Let them rot. No, it's let them rot. Is the is the main Whatever. title? Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but you know, you've you've written books on dealing with Nietzsche. You've written books dealing on uh, and, and uh, inter uh, interpreting Antigone. Um, but I think that the the work we'll be focusing on is this this work you've done on sex. But I guess I want to allow you to kind of say a few things by way of introduction, and I will just kind of set you up by saying, you know, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you got into um, Lacan. Hegel, theory more broadly, kind of what was your way into this world? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, as it usually happens, uh, this is always a kind of interplay of uh, some things that are there and some coincidences, just like uh, shit happens, good things happen, and uh, uh, I kind of, uh, the fact is that when I was coming of the age of reason, as they say in in, in French. Uh, when I was in high school, the the the, slu the scene here in Ljubljana uh, was just really, really changing a lot. And uh, coming to this kind of a 
life that you know now in these terms of Slovene, whatever, Ljubljana school, uh, theoretical, I mean, um, things were happening, Slavo and a few others, which are a bit older than me, were already on the scene and books were published that were completely out of the ordinary, uh, not only in comparison to whatever uh, the classical, let's say, regime books that were available then, but uh, I think um, out of ordinary, just a moment, there is this uh, surplus sun coming in. <laughs> Surplus sun blasting in, <laughs> blowing. <Surplus> sun, yeah. <laughs> okay. The ghost um, of Bataille. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, so there was this kind of uh, uh, very vibrating scene that was already there. Okay, if one it was interested in it. But so I was in high school and I just came across uh, some books that they published at that point, particularly Slavoj's book, The um, uh, History and the Unconscious, which was the Slovene book then. Uh, and I was completely swept <laughs> off my foot uh, because it was something so interesting and so different from anything that I've read before at, or thought people were reading before even my parents my father was some kind of a intellectual i mean this was so new different and my question was simply okay what did they what did, did these people study what did their line of whatever interest okay philosophy so uh, from that moment on uh, and yeah i said it happened relatively early in high school it was uh decided for me so um and i then soon joined this group uh and was very warmly <laughs> welcomed uh, in their midst. So, uh, but yeah, I happened to read a couple of books that uh, kind of, uh, well, this was my whatever uh, encounter with something that, uh, yeah, then really shifted and changed and orientated my life for, and it still does. So. What were a couple of those books that had the most, you know, this, this impact on you? So I said one was this uh, book by Slavo Zizek, History and the Unconscious, which does not exist under this title in the English translation, but I think the crucial parts and bits of it uh, are in other early books of Slavoj that he published, uh, um, uh, like from Sublime Objects, stuff like this. So, uh, but uh, the Slovene title was, this is just an English translation, History in the Unconscious, and this kind of reading of Marx that was completely different from the Marx that we were officially served in uh, then still uh, ex-Yugoslavia. Uh, and also the introduction of, of Lacan, of this thought which is... Uh, also presented front in a new and uh, very interesting way. Uh, so, and then there were also the first translations of Lacan. Uh, the Seminary 11th actually was, I think, the first one translated in Slovene. Uh, so, I, 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 as I think you can imagine. Then, I mean, I was not a particularly whatever. I mean, I was a normal uh, human being, uh, and this. The stuff was sometimes extremely uh, difficult, but uh, the say so I cannot say that. Okay, I read these books, I understood everything, and I just decided that this would be my path. Not at all. I understood almost nothing, <laughs> but there was something, some some things that I understood and understood just enough to be really driven to do some more research and to, to try to understand more and to figure out what was going on there. I mean, so it's not like something oh, that I would read that say, okay, yes, that's it. I I understand what it, it's just uh, even that some things, what the, the kind of questions you ask, the kind of topics you uh, abhor, which, which is not a classic necessarily academic topic, the kind of twists and further interrogation. So there was something extremely interesting and fascinating that pulled me in, even if I was barely able to follow the, the arguments back then. But I, I feel that is very relatable, not just for myself, but probably for a lot of the listeners. Um, we were talking before going live today about how, uh, you know, I have listeners from all walks of life from all classes, from all uh, 
areas of the world, really. I mean, I really all areas, uh, but there's a lot of people who are joining from Europe or the United States who are, for instance, in, in graduate school, but, or maybe they decided not to go to graduate school and now they're working and now they're tuning in. But I said that's interesting because I always say that my audience, my intentional audience is workers, not some kind of ideal worker, not just some kind of, oh, all workers are the same or, but specifically myself. 12 years ago, like I kind of just imagined myself 12 years ago when I was listening to podcasts, stuff like Joe Rogan, and I was getting into, you know, audiobooks instead of just music because I used to just listen to music at work. And I started switching over to podcasts and then intellectual conversations and then audiobooks. And around that time, uh, I still didn't know what philosophy was, right? And so that's when people tend to go for. Sam Harris or or Richard Dawkins or Neil deGrasse Tyson or uh, Steven Pinker or kind of these, I guess Jordan Peterson also counts now, but these are just kind of these these pop intellectuals, and so uh, I, I try to make my content for people who maybe got into pop intellectuals, but now they want to start reading real books, about more serious philosophy, and the problem with more serious philosophy is really knowing where to start. And so the other day I had someone in the comment section saying that they are new to all of this, but that they're really into it. They just feel overwhelmed and they don't know where to begin. And I think that that's uh, one of the interesting things that you have all kind of pioneered is the idea that there really is no beginning. It's always going to be, you're in the deep end and it's always retroactively. Um, you know, being made sense of. But I am curious what you would uh, tell a person who's wondering about where to begin. They look at uh, your work or, or Slavoj's and they, they think, uh, oh my God, do I have to go learn Hegel now? Do I have to, well, then I have to learn Kant. Well, then I have to learn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way back to the pre-Socratics. Um, what do you say to a student who has... Yeah, uh, no, I think this is a very good question. I'm not sure that I have some kind of a, um, profound wisdom about it. I can uh, talk, uh, okay, not only from my experience, also from the experience of uh, uh, some of my students, because students are often, even if they are just students and not workers, they are often in a very similar position. They start at the point where they don't... Uh, yet know things or start reading stuff which uh, is difficult and so on. So, uh, first of all, I think perhaps just to address the first part of your question, comment, whatever about uh, people first uh, listening to these um, in intellectuals like the, the, the... I mean, one thing that for me was always fascinating about someone like, let's say, Zizek, who is a public intellectual and so, but he's a, of a very different kind than these gurus, you know, these intellectual gurus. Uh, and, but I was always fascinated precisely by this twist into his appear, I mean, appearance, not like physical appearance, but in the way he presented things, in the way he was thinking, which was related to the fact that it was not at no point he appeared as a kind of someone who has the wisdom, you know, wisdom to tell now the followers, the whatever this is, uh, but uh, some, 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 someone who is constantly driven by some interrogation of his really, who is really driven by going further and asking new and different questions uh, every time and kind of undermining uh, with the next sentence the perhaps some of the things that he said before. Uh, this drive, this kind of movement, um, which is far from any kind of um, uh, wisdom, general wisdom, and like now you will get it and then you will, it, your life will get easier or better or whatever. This kind of things which I'm kind of uh, suspicious of, 
uh, was precisely not there. And I think that still now you can really distinguish between uh, some intellectual, public intellectual figures who really believe that they are public intellectual figures and want to, and some who simply are this, and this kind of poster does not enter into the picture. And I, I think like personally, subjectively, I have a very strong inclination for this um, second kind. So, uh, so I think for people, be it uh, students or workers or whatever professionals, uh, to enter this kind of uh, thing, uh, you you need first to have a certain desire, let's say, for theory, for theory in the larger sense, like philosophy, something that because not not all people are particularly, you know, kind of. Um, um, sensible to this in the sense that there is a strong uh, desire to um, to follow some argument, figure something out, and then also reject it or whatever. So there is a certain um, doing theory, doing philosophy is a specific thing. It's not that it's not for everybody because of the class differences or whatever, but it's simply not for everybody because not everybody has this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, desire or enjoyment in 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 that thing. So this is the first, I would say, necessity. Uh, but then now to finally come to your uh, last question, um, you start to read. I mean, this is and this is a very Hegelian thing. You always you don't learn to swim before you jump into the water. So there is no way in which you can say, okay, now I will study this and all this and that, and then I will. Uh, start doing no you jump in you start at some point it's very usually this is a some random point on point that by some kind of accident or coincidence crosses your life path whatever you you start reading something and then uh, this kind of enriches you enough to 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 pursue to for, to read something more and so on. But this idea that uh, then first then it leads you, for instance, for instance, from whatever Lacan or Zizek to to Hegel or to Kant or to Plato. But this does not mean that you need first to read all of their opuses in order to then be able. It doesn't work like this. You just work as you go along, you read as you go along, you read some Hegel, you read some this, and with this um, difficult classical text, it's always good to read them together with their, the, the, the readings of them, like uh, not simply, I mean, it's nice to read Hegel, but it's also nice to read, uh, to see also how different philosophers or different interpreters uh, see different things, and uh, you figure out what is the one approach or the one line that um, speaks to you the most, to the, that kind of your theoretical philosophical machine, uh, that it's your philosophical machine that gets excited about it. Because not all, some readings for me also, they can be more or less academically correct, but they are uh, boring or they don't speak to particular paradoxes or things that uh, I'm interested in. But there is no way, I mean, one just needs to go on reading and uh, thinking about things uh, without this idea that there is some some corpus, some totality that once we read all this, then everything will become clear. No, questions will still be there. And this is why this field exists and expands. Uh, otherwise, it would simply stopped with Hegel, who was the last probably person in the position to more or less read everything that was uh, around, like uh, in philosophy, but also to some extent in science. Uh, at the time in in, uh, in history and when he was uh, living. Now this is physically impossible. I mean, um, GPT could say it, but, this is, but uh, yeah. not... <laughs> Yeah, ChatGPT maybe can uh, be be the next ne next Hegel, but you know uh, that's why it's first yeah, is tragedy, then is farce, right? My uh, main yep. question that I wanted to uh, kind of frame everything that follows here is um, sort of I think potentially the key for unlocking a lot of what you're all doing um and especially your work in what is sex and your piece for underground theory is sex passe and that is the the concept of drive its relation to 
this word sex, which means something very different, I think, in the way that you're using it than how we use it in a standard way in the United States. Um, and then kind of real, something that is potentially related, and that is uh, repression and sublimation. And I kind of want to start start with the latter and then work our way back to, to sex and its relation to drive. You know, are they the same thing? I don't know. Um, and we'll start with, um, so, you know, in, in, a, in the United States, uh, if you go to a psychology class, uh, especially like a psychology 101, uh, they usually give some, at least a little kind of credit to Freud for being like, the founder of the field. Um, and they'll, they'll, you know, you'll learn about penis envy and what a, what a misogynist he was or, or something along those lines, right? It's very, very simplified. But I remember the thing that I found most impactful was the idea of repression and sublimation. And I remember thinking that makes a lot of sense. Like I, I've always, you know, had the experience of, of we'll say prohibition or, or the, the no of the father or the, 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 the legal system t t saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. Um, and so of course you're disciplined in, you know, in the society. And so you, you learn to, to not do certain things. Uh, and because you don't do those things, sometimes you feel like you're going to go crazy. Right. And, uh, th so the idea that we shove all of that down, these impulses, we shove those down. But those continue to live on, and then they, those find other ways of manifesting through sublimation, right? That was very intuitive for me, and I really latched onto that as a young uh, learner. And, and I think that that is kind of the way that people talk about repression and sublimation when they're learning about uh, or, or teaching Freud, whether it's on YouTube podcasts or in an actual you know, class. So with all of that said, I'm curious then, how would you say that Lacan and what y'all do with the Ljubljana school um, takes that and it goes, goes in, say, a different direction? What, what changes in, in, the, in your theory when it comes to these ideas of, of repression and sublimation? Or is it even a change? Yeah, no, I mean, this is a huge question, of course, uh, but perhaps... Uh, a uh, simple way to start uh, answering is to point out exactly what what Lacan, let's say, did in his return to Freud. He simply read Freud. And this, I think, is absolutely crucial because what you mentioned earlier, okay, one uh, hears, hears, hears about Freud more or less dismissively, uh, and then one hears about a couple of uh, whatever doctrines that uh, he's supposed to, uh, theories that he's supposed to advocate, but really this is not Freud. Freud's uh, thought, Freud's investigations, Freud's research, this is something so much alive. I mean, I really, really would strongly encourage people simply to start reading Freud. This is such a vivid, I mean, this was at least my experience. Uh, you, and for, with Freud, you don't need many secondary literature and explanation. I think with Freud, it's actually very good to begin with Freud. And uh, because it is also a theory in making. And it is precisely when you reduce it to some ready-made doctrines or theses, then you lose really the, the most important things in it. Because Freud was constantly, he was also like uh, changing his position or re reconfiguring his concepts and so on, because he actually was eager to, to get it in some way. And so, uh, and he was doing this uh, live with material, with live material, so to say. Uh, so it's really uh, extremely, I don't know, uh, extremely good experience to just try to read Freud and try to read him perhaps precisely without all this um, additional information about this that have is has accumulated through this century uh everybody thinks they know what freud is but just to try to listen a bit as little as prejudice as possible to to read what is going on and it's exciting to read not only the case histories which obviously are uh exciting it's like almost crime novels but also this 
other more uh, conceptual theoretical books, uh, it's really an exciting thing to read, and there is a thought which is alive. And Lacan's gesture was precisely to get rid of this institution, institutionalized Freud, which uh, was also, uh, there were different Freudian orientations, let's say, but different schools, one emphasizing this or the other right of this, but th there was this kind of uh, very, very strong institutionalization of, uh, of Freud, and the call simply said, okay, let's read some Freud. Let's say what uh, what is alive there, what he does, how he reopens certain questions, why people don't see some other things in it. So, uh, and I think this is precisely what um, is the first important thing to, to simply uh, read Freud, uh, and then very quickly you get to see how all these notions, uh, starting with repression and sublimation, uh, which are absolutely crucial, but have a much, not all, not much more complicated, but I would say much more interesting texture than simply this kind of uh, idea that, okay, there is the society and we enter it as some kind of uh, whatever, uh, innocent or guilty substance and it just tells us what to do, how to do it, represses uh, and uh, causes all this repression which then further operates uh, through many different channels. Uh, so, of course, Freud's idea, it was that civilization, part of civilization, was this kind of no, as you put it, this kind of uh, prohibition as a certain uh, way in which uh, society uh, symbolically organizes uh, its functioning. But it was also his discovery that it's not simply that Without this, let's say, if we can think about some uh, ideal state before the law, let's put it, there was some kind of uh, absolute freedom, and then the law, the society came and put an end to this freedom, and now we suffer because of all this repression. Uh, I think what Freud clearly saw is that what you had, I mean, it's not some, if you imagine some kind of primordial state, it's a chaotic state, which is far from freedom in the sense that would kind of really emancipate you. Um, it's uh, something which is uh, rather chaotic and uh, resembling some kind of uh, original state, which is not actually free. So, and but then he also realized, and Lacan emphasized this very strongly, how there is a certain interplay between, let's say, some kind of a impossibility or some kind of impasse, some kind of contradiction that is there in this uh, imaginary state before the law or whatever, and the the law itself. And the, the way, the reason why, let's say, the law and these prohibitions uh, often have such a hold on us and uh, why they kind of have this power to organize the society is precisely because they also give a symbolic form to this impossibility inherent in this chaotic state itself. So it's not simply, or one way of putting it is, is that a kind of impossibility is uh, the, the, some kind of impotence, let's say more like, uh, or frustration, impotence is elevated to the status of symbolic impossibility. So, or to put it where something that you cannot do in any way, physically, let's say, becomes prohibited. Very often symbolic prohibitions are the prohibitions of the impossible. And this is not just stupid, you know, there is something that changes in the nature of what uh, your frustration or your impasse is when it uh, becomes articulated in the law. So I'm not saying that this justifies all the legal whatever prohibitions, but there is something in the structure of the law itself, which is um, also an answer to some, let's say, uh, impasse or difficulty, which is not simply uh, so. The, so this is why these dialectics, uh, why sometimes it is actually um, um, liberating to have a certain kind of no, <laughs> uh, because uh, so and why then to some extent we often hang on to prohibition rather than you know. So the the, the freedom kind of only starts there, and how we then 
uh, tackle with these prohibitions and so on, this kind of symbolic rules. So uh, the this simple idea that, that there is some kind of uh, authentic, uh, whatever, uh, free and pleasurable, uh, whatever, circuit of desires, which is then brutally interrupted by the law and forces us to repress things, is not, that the, there is a complicity, let's say, between the uh, chaotic, of drives and the law. Law is not simply on the other side of drives, but also, as Freud said, it fits on the drives. It's kind of, uh, so there is a certain circularity uh, in the way in which uh, the two are articulated. So, uh, and uh, this is also why uh, it is for Lacan uh, also, but already for Freud, why it is much too simplistic to say that once, if we just get away uh, from all these prohibitions, we will finally breathe um, uh, freely. Uh, and, uh, you know, okay, this is a very no quote from Karamazov Brothers, the Dostoevsky uh, novel that Lacan comments on, and uh, I'm sure you know it, when, when this uh, father says, okay, now God is dead, so God as the source, symbolic, locus of prohibition, let's say, God is dead, everything is permitted, everything is allowed. And Lacan says, you see, this is precisely what Freud discovered, that it is the opposite, that it is true. Once God is dead, in the sense of this, then nothing is allowed anymore. And this is how Lacan reads the very, let's say, emergence of all these neurotic disorders that Freud was uh, uh, started with. But this does not mean, okay, we should reinvent God and some severe prohibitions. This is not what I'm saying. It's just that to point that the dialectics between the two is more complicated, more interesting. And also, uh, if you want to think of freedom in any kind of politically also meaningful way, you need to take both into account. So it's not simply let's get rid of all the laws or let's just uh, have all the laws and forget about anything else. It is precisely their complicity and this kind of uh, thing that is interesting. Sorry, this was a very long, uh, and I'm sure I didn't even address half of the question <laughs> that you uh, asked. No, I think that is... That is so much more and better than, you know, the, what the question asks it actually, you know, you still address it, the, but, uh, you bring up several things I would like to get into, but just to kind of resituate. So the, I guess my clarifying question would be, so you're saying that drive feeds off of law. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, is, is drive prior to law is the baby is the baby prior to its uh coming into the the symbolic and language uh and being tr you know domesticated or trained into society or whatever is the baby already a bunch of drives or or does it already have drive yeah i mean uh this question of uh the chicken and the egg, it's uh, always a tricky one because, I mean, even if you say, okay, obviously babies are, are born with what we observe as certain drives. I mean, something drives them. Uh, but it is true that basically what is at stake here, at least like from what uh, we can see, is that what drives them are some basic needs, which is to say hunger uh, or whatever other um, uh, these pleasures, the things that irritate them, pain, whatever that they, so that the, there are, uh, you could say, to put it very simply, that there are some basic needs that drive the baby. To, to, but at the same time, there is also one thing which is, uh, which comes into play very, very early, which is this relationship to the other, usually the parent, uh, and the way in which uh, what you demand from the other, even when you cry for food, uh, becomes attached to something else in this demand, which is, for instance, uh, the demand for love, which very soon it's not, it, uh, you cry for food, 
the food is given to you, but it is given to you, it could be given to you in many different ways. Ones that you can associate, like if somebody just stuck some whatever thing into your mouth and disappears, it's not the same if somebody, you know, answers your demand for food. So th there, is, uh, there is a point in which this interaction with the other, who is usually also the carrier then of all this prohibitions and whatever limits and uh, uh, things that the law that is uh, being formed, uh, something happens here which is not simply uh, that, uh, that, 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 which also allows for the drives in this more genuinely Freudian Lacanian uh, meaning to appear because drives are not simply needs. Drives are needs who actually already diverge, let's say, from their biological aim. This is the basic definition of a drive. Drive is not just drive to food, this is hunger. Uh, drive is precisely, for instance, this is one of Wright's example, uh, the, the, it could be drive related to, 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 to nurture, to, 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 to eating, could be the drive related to the satisfaction of the mouth, that is a side product of satisfying, appeasing your hunger, you know. So, which is why, for instance, sucking on this thing, how is it called in English, that children get, um, you know, when they are uh, being appeased, they, they get, how is this called? I don't know. I know, you know, I know this, I know, I know this one. It's a binky. Yeah. So, a binky. So, I mean, this is, you know, here you can see something of the drive, which is not, you do this, you don't get any food by it, but still there is a satisfaction there, not just because it resembles food. It, but the, so the drive is always, always already something that drives a little bit away from the need, although it appears with the need and then makes a different kind of circuit and uh, kind of makes circle of a different kind of object. So the object of the drive is never simply the object that satisfies the need. But it is real, nevertheless. So, uh, and so to to answer your question, it is precisely uh, and this drive then are already drives because they become part of also this symbolic network. Uh, I mentioned okay the demand for love, but there are other things where drives can get a, some extension, which goes far beyond, let's say, basic biological needs precisely because there is certain, let's say, symbolic signifying support then that makes this ex uh, extension, this long circuit possible with all this, all at the same time, uh, uh, enabling the satisfaction being produced, another kind, the other, so-called the other satisfaction in this, in this circuit. Uh, so in this sense, Drives uh, and uh, the symbolic are kind of chicken and the egg question. You can start, you know, in some way like Freud did, from the need. You said, okay, drives start by inhibiting the need, but then they kind of develop a life of their own, which is not reducible back to, uh, to just to need to the satisfaction of uh, hunger, thirst, whatever uh, is there including if you want some kind of sexual urge, which is also something else, I don't know, some kind of um, need to to get left or whatever, which is not the same thing as um, sexual drive, which is, uh, again, uh, something that encompasses a much uh, uh, wider, uh, wider sphere. So, yeah, this would be my answer. I hope it clarifies a little bit. But otherwise, you know, this is what I said, that the... the uh, law also fits on the drives. This is particularly true, or this is particularly something that Freud said for the so-called superego law, which is not simply the same thing as some kind of uh, uh, external symbolic prohibition. Uh, but when he came, Freud came um, across this paradox that it was precisely people who led the most saintly life, you know, like almost like saints, who reproached themselves with the uh, the worst scenes and uh, that there is this kind of a uh, uh, strange spiral of guilt. Uh, the, the more you obey the law, the more guilty you are. Uh, and that there is something, the more you give, 
the more you sacrifice to the law, the more it maltreats. It's not that you give it more and then it will uh, be satisfied with say, okay, so you did what you uh, what I asked you to do. No, with the superego, it's the other way around. The more, and this is why it I say it fits on the drives, because the more of the drive you so-called sacrifice to it, the more this internal law enjoys, uh, becomes itself a kind of drive enjoyment that maltreats you. So because it's not that all enjoyment is pleasurable and not all enjoyment is something that you want, <laughs> you know, the superego is part of you and it enjoys, but you suffer because of this. So the superego enjoying is something that you, you feel to a certain extent, but it, it, it's a kind of suffering. I mean, this is, I guess, the phenomenon. For, you can also, you can only feel uh, the enjoyment uh, uh, of the superego precisely in this sadistic form in which you kind of treat yourself. But finally, if you are talking about superego precisely as something which is the kind of internal instance, which is not, uh, and so you can obey the external laws, but this thing in your head still keeps telling you this is not enough, it is never enough, you didn't do, do uh, you know, this kind of internal sensor, who, as Freud puts it, sees also what you can hide uh, from the external authority. You can, you know, uh, lie to your parents, and this is no problem. But the moment you internalize this, as long as they don't know, you are okay. We don't. Uh, but this then precisely uh, makes this kind of cheating, let's say, the symbolic other, the law, impossible because you cannot hide it um, um, from yourself. Uh, and so there is something in yourself that makes you uh, pay for it. Amazing. And then I guess with our remaining time, uh, yeah, we could so kind, of, time. <laughs> kind of bring yeah. it all back together into the idea, the, that question of, of sex and drive. And so this expanded notion of sex, you say it's not just the, the act mm -hmm. of sex. Um, well, what is the relation then of sex and, and drive in this way we're talking about it? I mean, this is precisely uh, why, as you pointed out, uh, the way, not only me, but the way I uh, talk about sex, sex for me is a concept that uh, um, that names, like conceptually names, a certain configuration, let's say, which is configuration of a negativity, of certain deadlock, of certain lack, and a surplus that is organized around it. Because in my theory, in my view, uh, there is uh, the surplus is not simply the, you have something, some level, and then you have the surplus. This kind of surplus of drives, it only appears at the point of a gap, of a lack of some uh, something not being there. Then there is surplus. And also, I mean, this is uh, like... Uh, even in kind of imaginary way, there is a, this can be related to the so-called erogen zones, which are always also zones which are uh, uh, something that surrounds a certain opening, a certain um, soul, so to say. Uh, it be or even eyes, you know. It, there is a certain logic, uh, even bodily logic. But here I'm not talking about this. How drive this surplus of drive, this excess of drive. Uh, is not simply access over some normal limit, but it is access that appears at the place of something which is not there. Basically, this is what I'm trying to argue all through the book. And so, so but in sometimes being accused of why negativity, this is impossibility. No, the point is precisely that you cannot separate the two. If you want to explain the surplus, the positivity, this kind of thing that... Um, you cut it here and it re-emerges there. Uh, you need to include the precisely this negativity as its in, in, inherent point, not something separate that you can separate from this 
positive, let's say, excessive uh, uh, form or appearance of the, of the drives and so on. So, uh, and so sexuality for me is precisely sex in the sense, if you just, it's not simply about sexual act, uh, which obviously exists, but sexuality, the, the concept of sexuality in psychoanalysis is a concept of something which has no uh, substance in the sense that there is this sex you can neatly circumscribe the thing and say okay this is now uh, uh, sex and then the, the rest is something else no the problem is that there is something some some nothing something which then only exists through these all kinds of extensions including of course obviously sexual acts and many other stuff including sublimation that you mentioned before and so on so there is there's a network that is uh, growing out of this thing, which is not a thing precisely. It is a, another kind of country, but it's not that there is some uh, core sexu sexual core and then these things are growing out of it. No, the sexual core is precisely uh, a certain negativity that nevertheless organizes or is the root, let's say, of all these pussy, of all these extensions, which then can just become loose ends and have no particular whatever way of coexisting or can form something more uh, solidified, let's say, in a sense. But so the, the sexuality and the drives are very much uh, connected precisely through this concept of negativity that exists as surplus of something and only as such, not that you can encounter the negativity directly, you know, in this, but precisely uh, when you start to think like ontologically or, or, about uh, this uh, organization, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, this perhaps is, uh, sounds a bit complicated, but I think it also rhymes with our very fundamental experiences of sexuality, which is uh, everywhere and Nowhere in the center, uh, it, everywhere, but it's not that you can just uh, very neatly uh, circumscribe it and say, okay, the, f up to this point, this is sexual, and from this point on, it's not. I mean, this is already involves some kind of repression, not of sexuality, but of thinking of this impasse. Because I think what is really, really crucial and what happened in most of the American, let's say, uh, reception of Freud and in psychology is not that they talk about the repression, but actually they repress the repression itself. It becomes something very different from repression. But anyway, I will, I will stop sharing it. Um, so then it would be a mistake to say that they are the same thing. They're connected through, neg through negativity, but they're not the same thing. No, I mean, to, to some extent, you can say that, that, that there is, um, there is no, let, let me put it like this, uh, according, this is Lacan saying, there is no such thing, I think already Freud, there is no such thing as sexual drive in the sense of, you know, instinct that it's just, uh, but at the same time, sexuality is precisely this kind of compound of drives. Uh, or the, the, the thing that, the thing in drives that refers to uh, what is there in drives uh, more or other than the satisfaction of this or that immediate need. So you can say that sexuality or sex is the name precisely of this space, let's say, that opens between the satisfaction of the need and something else that gets satisfied uh, in through other ways. But this is precisely why then it becomes... Uh, why we can say, like, you know, Lacan says that, okay, I, I'm talking now here or reading this book, but I can be, uh, it could be not a sexual experience in the sense that equivalent of the sexual act, but there is something going on there which is about a certain satisfaction, uh, which is in itself paradoxical, and in this sense, also sexual, that it's not simply because I want to, I read because I want to learn this or that. Uh, I also read it sometimes for some pleasure, but also because something drives me in this in this reading. So the point is not, you know, that everything, all these activities that are not directly sexual are at the bottom 
sexual and does dirty. You know, this is one understanding of that psychoanalysis wants to reduce everything to sex and says, okay, there is sex behind. Uh, you read the book, you just sublimate, sub, uh, sublimate whatever the uh, sexual desire you cannot satisfy in another way. No, the point and uh, it, the revolution of Freud, well, and this is what was the scandal that his theory really produced, was uh, not to abase these intellectual activities to something lower like sex, but actually to, to show how sexuality itself is a highly intellectual activity. <laughs> Uh, that it, it it is already there. I mean, the, it is not simply uh, you know, two bo- the, there are two boys, but the, something happens there, which is precisely which goes beyond this kind of you know whatever you would uh, call it, uh, um, um, biological, anatomical, whatever kind of distraction. So, and I think here uh, Lacan was quite right in pointing this out that the, the real scandal of Freud was. Uh, not that whatever high philosophy is uh, the basis has to do with sex, but that sex has to do with high philosophy, and this is not exactly the same uh, the same claim. Thank you so much. I think we'll have to close it out here because of the time. I would love to get into how that creates serious problems for doing ontology, for doing epistemology, how it brings so much light to uh, ethics. And uh, you even raised things that I would like to get into about um, the, you know, well, you know, you can't just bring God back. There's not just a solution by bringing God back. There's so many questions that I would love to delve into, but, you know, I'm sorry to say we're out of time. So thank you so much for joining. It's been an absolute delight and an honor that you have spent this time with us. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm sure there will be some possibility or chance to continue these discussions with the questions that you mentioned and perhaps some others. So thank you. And thank goodbye you so much. to everybody. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. All right. And then um, Salamoon, Lucas, Nance, you can all get in the chat. We'll, res- we'll begin the next section here right after this PSA. Thinking is super uncool, and that's why you should do it. It's just like almost anything that's like cool anymore. Um, yeah, it just sucks. And I think that's like what the underground movement has always been about is just like seeing what's in the mainstream, being like it ain't there, and kind of like cobbling something together, you know? And, and yeah, it's a little mismatched, but that's like its beauty. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. We bring primary texts from leading lights of diverse fields to bear on topical issues and works popular in our current world. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run and review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. Seriously. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarricker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. Usually a good edited collection has good essays, but you only want to read a few. Every essay makes me want to read the other essays because you have a vision. Everyone that you invited, you invited for a reason. You weren't some fake publicist. He's like, hey, someone has a new book, have them on your show. No, you only talk to people because you've read shit by them that you've thought about that you think has value, even if you disagree. So I think that's what's amazing. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages 
five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground has already put out eight courses, two books, one my book, Time Energy, and the other Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of Underground Theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. Support at this stage of the operation is more crucial than ever because my savings were used up over the last year of getting this established. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive, so excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. If you cannot afford it, but want to get involved with some of the stuff behind the paywall, I have made a financial aid scholarship you can sign up for here in the description. Quick side note, some people ask about the profit motive. At this point, I have not actually made a return on any of my investment in terms of the amount of time energy that I put into things, the amount of savings I've actually put into things, the opportunity cost of the work that I'm doing as opposed to the other kinds of things that I could be doing for money. Uh, but more importantly, I don't actually make enough to pay for my cost of living. The goal is to make enough for my cost of living and then once that is achieved, everything over that amount is going to go towards expanding the operation to the point where I can hire Michael Downs, aka Mikey of The Dangerous Maybe, to be a full-time researcher and part-time teacher at Theory Underground. All right, so with that aside, I just want to say also, if you are a worker with earbuds, what's up? I see you. I work at Amazon part-time and everything I do is for my past self who used to work there full-time. Most workers with earbuds couldn't care less about theory, but I do believe a working class intellectual revolution could grow out of the underground theory scene. My hope is that what I have built here will contribute to making the scene something more than just a scene, and you into something more than just a scene kid. We're trying to make this into a real intellectual milieu capable of leading a way forward beyond the imminent crises facing humanity. But for that, we need thinking now more than ever. Start thinking. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program. And also make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. For your mind. <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> I love you too. We're going to be live in three, two, one, and we're live. Welcome, Mihao and do you say okay? I I understand that it's like Mihao, like the L in Polish is like is like a H sort of in in English. Uh, so that would be like. like Wu Tang, so it'd be like Wukas. Yeah. Would be how I would say. You you said it's okay to say Lucas, but but it would be Wukas, right? It would be Wukas. Okay, wonderful. Uh, great to have you both on stream. Great to be able to sort of introduce you uh, face to face, so to speak, for the first time. Um, I'll say a couple of things to kind of set you both up here, and then we will uh, probably be joined by Nance in any moment. Uh, who, by the way, me Panther in the chat said, Nance without a beard looks weird to me. The beard is badass. 
<laughs> well, yeah. Uh, well, we'll be joined by Nance because this is a really uh, exciting conversation. We're Nance and I are both about to purchase our tickets to come to Europe and to see you guys, as well as a bunch of other people who have collaborated with Theory Underground or who have supported us up until now. Um, so for the audience who might not remember Mihao Rams Wugowski, um, he is in the Underground Theory volume. He's got an amazing piece on critical media theory, the commons, and what he thinks Theory Underground is doing or participating in. And I'll let him say a few words about that in his own introduction. But um, he also has his own channel in Poland. He is a graduate student there in Katowice. He also was a tour guide for uh, Anne and I when we visited. And so uh, he and his partner, Caroline, were wonderful uh, hosts and guides for us. And so we're very excited to return to Katowice and to visit them. Um, and he has been involved with Theory Underground since before it was called Theory Underground. He has been uh, following for a couple of years now, right? Yeah, that's right. And it's been, yeah, it's been a, a journey and it's been a, a wonderful one at that. So then we have uh, Wukas. Great to have you, man. Uh, Wukas has uh, been, I've not met Wukas in person, but he has been a part of the critical media theory research cohort. And so in that sense, uh, we've spent plenty of time to, together virtually. Um, and so I guess in, in that order, then I will have Michal say some more about uh, what you what you're up to in terms of your research and the piece that you published in Underground Theory. And then we'll bring it over to you, Lucas, and we'll get into what, uh, what you're doing over there in Krakow. And while you both talk, I will be right back. I got to go get my coffee. It just finished pouring. Okay. Yeah. Co coffee is a very important thing for some people. So, uh, hi, my name is Michael and uh, I'm a PhD student in communication and media studies. And what I'm currently, at least for my, you know, doctorate, what I'm interested in is um, political economy of anarchist media, mostly in Poland. Uh, and I'm studying them, you know, empirically. Uh, I just want to understand uh, how do they survive uh, within the realm of uh, capitalist um, society? How do they organize, you know, production and exchange of the, the, the cultural symbolic goods they're producing and consuming and so on? Um, and, you know, that's... Um, also connected to what I wrote in my chapter in Underground Theory. I tried to, you know, take the same framework, theoretical framework of autonomous Marxism mostly. And um, I just, you know, tried to analyze the phenomenon of theory underground using it. And uh, we could also discuss that later because uh, you made some uh, points in the introduction to the book, uh, which I would like to, you know, answer. <laughs> Maybe that's a good occasion today. But yeah, that's basically all about me. Called out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll give you an opportunity to, to respond to those here on stream. And then obviously you'll have the opportunity um, at both of the events in Krakow and Katowice, but um, really quick, I just wanted to say, I don't need coffee. I don't. In my defense, <laughs> there's no reason to have to defend it, but I also want you all to know that this operation is not powered by caffeine. It is powered by drive alone, willpower and drive. That's it. The, uh, the coffee is decaffeinated, so. Fucking... You know, sure, <laughs> no, it really is. Um, I, drop, no. I stopped drinking uh, caffeinated coffee last, uh, like May, I think. But um, it was because Anne was like, she thought it was messing me up in some way, health wise, and so I decided I was like, well, I'll just do decaffeinated. I was like, it doesn't make a difference anyway, and she was like, yeah, it does, and then. I was like, no, it doesn't. And then so I've been on decaffeinated ever since. So when I do these 10 hour streams or like these 12 hour streams, 
Sometimes I've done 14 hour streams. I just have to say, yeah, decaffeinated. But uh, Lucas, uh, how's it going, man? Yeah, how would you like to introduce yourself then? Uh, hi, everyone. I cannot say that about myself, that I'm powered on the drive because today I wake, woke up, drink an energy drink, and went to psychoanalysis. <laughs> and now I'm here. I'm a, I'm a student right now. I'm doing my majors this year. And I was very stoked for Alenka's talk because I'm writing actually about Marie Ruti's work on sublimation and I'm connecting the concept of sublimation, or contrasting, contrasting it with transgression and like two kinds of enjoyments you can get from these two. And uh, right now my research, my research started when I went to uni with Marx mainly and like I... Uh, I read a lot about Marxism, but like three years ago, I got into Lacan, uh, like partly because of the course Dave was doing with Mikey. I looked at it, I was like, Lacan, that's dumb. And then I'm, I'm here writing a major. I'm also participating in Krakow Lacanian society, trying to become an analyst. And so, yeah, also I'm organizing two students group, one on psychoanalysis. Right now we are reading this beautiful translation of what is sex yeah it's, it's great it's great yeah it's, it's wonderful and also one on Hegel so that's what I'm doing right now yeah I mean can I ask Lukas a question <laughs> like um are you attending those meetings in the uh Krakow Lacanian circle is is that the thing yeah, the new Lacanian school, Krakow, Krakowska. Yeah, 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 so we have the same background when it comes to Lacan, because I used to attend like for two years those same meetings. Well, I, I didn't want to become a psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst, but yeah, that's some pretty hardcore stuff happening in there. Yeah, yeah I, it's, I expected it to be more of a sect, so I was actually like pleasantly surprised that it's not. It is kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I I mean, the, I guess the like, it's split within. Like, yeah. So I was just. Uh, I had said something, but my microphone it was muted. I was cl asking a clarifying question about that of book. So what is sex? Is that a brand new translation? It's a just came out recently. No, it's not brand new. It's from a. I don't know, from a few years ago, from three years ago. Oh, okay, but... relatively. Like, yeah. Okay. For me, in my brain, it's still brand new. <laughs> yeah, it is because it's still twenty twenty, basically. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the true, the true end of history was twenty twenty, right? Yeah. The uh, so what is sex? I, th I think the reason I had that idea that it was brand new was because I think Michal might have said something along those lines um, in one of our personal conversations. We have a lot of back and forth through voice messaging. Um, but I, I want to I ask you both kind of about the intellectual scene in Poland, about the political scene in Poland, how those two things are related how you two are related to those two things and how your respective cities are related to those two things. I know that's a really, really big set of questions, but I think it kind of eh, sets up us. We can kind of do with it what we like. You can, you can ask me questions. We can all talk about all kinds of things, but I, I, I do feel like, yeah, the, the standard uh, American probably couldn't uh, put point Poland out on a map um and you know if, if they could could they find krakow they definitely wouldn't know where katowice is right and so um you know in that sense we'll start with the one that's most marginalized in this case you could say a few things then maybe me how about katowice and the intellectual and political scene there well <laughs> there's nothing much to say about katowice in that respect um i mean I'm not just saying that, you know, to be overly modest, something like that. It's really uh, a serious problem, one that we're trying to conceptualize in our, you know, 
Marxist or critical theory circles that there are you know plenty of these universities in Poland which have people who are trying to do some interesting stuff but they're like institu- institutionally marginalized and Katowice is one of the, those examples it's you've been there Dave it's a pretty like densely populated place it's a so-called conurbation it's built of you know few different cities who are just tightly connected together and we have pretty you know great people lovely people at our universities in social studies in humanities whatever you want but um still if you want to do something more serious like to have a debate to make a a nice conference or something you usually have to go to either krakow or uh, warsaw or Poznan, whatever else. And it's the same with politics. Like, it, it's it's uh, also a bit complicated to explain my political, political background because I've, like, grew up intellectually both in the Marxist tradition, you know, Frankfurt School, and anarchist tradition, on the other hand. And uh, what really got me, like, like uh, seriously into politics, also like f- almost physically, was uh, our local anarchists in in Katowice or you know wider in the Silesia region organizing something like you know every year in Katowice we have this uh, economical congress, European economical congress, and every year anarchists are, are organizing their anti congress. So in 2015, it got so hardcore that they had like anti-terrorist in there, you know, chasing those anarchists. You know, she was crazy. And it was for the first time I've seen personally, you know, people representing, you know, a relatively small group politically, but they were so into it. They were so like devoted that they could like risk, you know, being jailed or something. And it was the first time when I felt, you know, political theory touching me almost physically. And I've decided I want to follow, you know, that I want to understand that. And that's how I got into politics. And it was the last time in Katowice where shit like that happened. And now it's a pretty dead place, I'd say. I'm not, you know, if you want to ask me about like uh, parliamentary politics, parties and so on. I don't care that much about it, so I'm not the best source. Uh, but when it comes to you know labor unions, anarchism, anarcho syndicalists, uh, or post left anarchism in Poland, maybe I'm your guy here. But yeah, that's how it looks. Did you say post left? Yeah. It's pretty popular in Poland among anarchists, at least. Yeah, I was I was curious about that because I think you've you know well in our, in our personal conversations you've referenced it before, but I think it has a bit of a different meaning there, right? It for I think in the U.S. it's a very it's basically just populism, right? I don't think it's so much anarchism. Oh, you Would you that s- meaning? Okay, I'm not okay. so sure. I'm not so sure. I I feel conflicted about the category because whenever I've tried to research it, I really can't get to the bottom of it. And I feel like if it has a real uh, history in Europe, and then when I look into it in the US, all people can point me to is like a couple of podcasters who are just kind of burnt out Marxists or or Bernie bros, then I I don't, I think we should go with the European, you know? And so really quick then, what is that in Europe? What, what is what how would you characterize uh post leftism in in Poland at least i say it's a kind of a platform a kind of a um mixture that what you said about like burnt out marxists maybe but it's mostly um it's mostly composed of anarchists who well they take a lot of from this you know traditional Marxist leftist um, orientation finance and um, but but you know at the same time they trying to cut themselves off from this traditionally like collectivist or un- anarcho communist traditions of, of uh, anarchism in Poland it, it has its specific flavor because for a lot of time 
the biggest, you know, anarchist like Feder anarchist federation of Poland, and most of the squads and 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 most of the um, anarchist milieu was was you know this. I don't want to offend anyone, but they're like still LARPing, like if it, it, it was 19th century and Bakunin and, and Kropotkin were still around. Um, so now the younger generation, and I mean younger even than, than me, uh, teenagers, they're trying to find something new. So they read things like Bob Black or For Ourselves Collective or, you know, all those publications uh, from ill will or or anything like that that is, is a complete mixture it's like uh anti-work uh, autonomism uh a bit a little bit of nihilism and insurrectionism um yeah it's basically we, we're trying to uh, oh, they're trying to distance themselves from you know focusing mostly on uh, Marxist categories, you know of being a working class, um, exploring a bit, you know going back to Stirner maybe, um, and trying to find some synthesis or some creative tension in between the um, class analysis and collective perspective and the egoistic and and individual perspective. And it gets into very interesting places. It first of all, it's, um, it's it tries to work through the the, the problems uh, and the dead ends of working in collectives and big bigger you know issues. Um, yeah, it's basically that. And, and and it's also I'd say as you know a media scholar that's been a lot of influ it's been influenced a lot by you know the the social media uh, world we're living in because the communication gets more individualized now and you can organize small virtual uh, collaborations and so on. So there's more to, to that that I could describe, you know, like in even in 15 minutes, but it's, it, I, I think it's worth checking out wherever you come from politically. Cool. I just realized that uh, my, my follow-up question to that, I should probably set on the side for now. So we can bring it back to Wukas. But by the way, Nance, welcome to the stream. Hola. You Nance. So yeah, the What's two the of us are... Sorry? Yeah, the political situation, the intellectual situation, Krakow. Yeah. The intellectual one is, I agree with Michael that, you know what happens? You can find a lot of, if you search, you can find a lot of great papers on philosophy. But for example, I have here the book. It's on the Ljubljana school by a guy. Yeah, I wanted to mention it myself. It's great. It's a great one. And the guy actually has lectures in which film school, <laughs> in a film, in a film university. Like and you can find a lot of those great papers from Lublin, from Universitet Śląski in Katowice. I found a lot of great stuff published. And in Krakow there is, but, but it's like, I would say, I don't know if fringe is a good word, but it's not like we have like a Ljubljana school, like a big, like many people working together. You usually find like few people in each city doing great stuff. And for example, on my university and in Krakow and in Warsaw, you have a lot of analytical philosophy. Uh, it's basically mostly analytical philosophy is what is being done. You have continentals who are doing like existentialism, but basically the feeling is that theory is dead in the sense that what they are doing is like revisiting old stuff from 200 years from a hand. And it's like historical, you know, it, it was back then we are only making more and more, more papers about it. And I think that right now like students like me and my friends what we are trying to do is like organize precisely some stuff outside of university for example we have students meetings like people from my uni and we are doing it kind of outside the of like sometimes we invite people to talk professors people from other cities but but it's not like we don't get money like from the university it's not like it's not supported in any way mm. and yeah, so it's that. But uh, and politically, <laughs> I 
I don't know if I should switch right away, but politically the situation in Poland is like, for the last eight years, uh, we had a right, basically uh, the right-wing party, Prawo and Spray, Prawo and Spray, Lee, was like Law and Justice Party, a great name, was ruling Poland, we, and we had a lot of like political regression. Like, for example, what the way I practically got into politics was uh, when abortion laws were restricted in Poland a few years ago, it was a like a loud, 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 like loud events, women's women's protests for a few years, and we organized protests with like local people, like anarchists, but also liberals, and we we're do we we're doing active protests, like, uh, and that's and so I interacted with a lot of people who. Maybe not theoretically, but practically were involved in politics. And what I found out is either you get liberals who are for whom like the end goal of politics is basically returning to 2012 in Poland, which was like not great, not a great time, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, or on the left, you get those precisely like LARPers who think that it's 1923 that we like we should like. The only thing we should do is take the means of production from the state. You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> so it's complicated. Right now, it's a mm, we have a big commotion in the country because actually liberals took over again, and we'll see what happens. But like, yeah, yeah. I would like follow up follow up to all the, what you said, Lukash. First of all, the book that you showed, it's. Uh... It would roughly translate to English as um, "non all," you know that Lacanian uh, term, uh, and it's it, it was written by uh, Kuba Mikurda, a Polish uh, film scholar. So he's not, you know, like straight. I don't know philosopher or psychoanalyst or whatever, but it's like one of the few, like in the global perspective, one of the few monographs about uh, the Ljubljana school. And it's such a shame that it hasn't been translated into English or anything a bit more international because the guy actually went to Ljubljana and he done interviews with Zizek, with Dolar, with Zupancic. And so there is some, you know, historical, biographical background to that. And he also explains how they, how do they, you know, remix Lacan with Hegel and so on. So, uh, so you see, there are some people like hidden gems in Poland who are doing great research, um, but it's kind, it, it's um, hard to export that because of the language barrier. Because you know, people have to make a living. So uh, before you write anything in English, you have to calculate. Like for example, I'm pushed a lot as a PhD student to write in English. But at the same time, every time I think like, so what the hell am I going to read with my students? Like, I cannot assume they all speak English. And it's it's all that, you know, um, kind of a peripher peripheral neo-colonial problems we have in Poland. <laughs> and when it comes to politics, uh, I very often, um, I very often, you know, abbreviated saying that in Poland, you either get conservative liberals or liberal conservatives. And it's all about, you know, um, securing the neoliberal capitalist order after the fall of, you know, uh, socialism and Berlin Wall and everything. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's now we have a, a more liberal government, which promised a lot of, you know, to, to uplift the ban on abortion, to be less harsh with LGBT people, but they're not really doing any of that. And they're, you know, just screwing us economically even more. So uh, it's interesting. It's interesting to live in Poland. Definitely. Nance, you, uh, you were here for the Alenka conversation as we're Mihao and Lukas, and so I want I want to like let everyone uh, maybe say a few things about that, and then we'll kind of get into the the events that we are planning in Krakow and Katowice, as well as say some more general things about the European tour before we close out. We've got about a half hour to do this, 
And, uh, but I wanted to, you know, let's, let's just kind of, so here we are, Nance, you've just, you're, you're, you're officially in, I'm sorry. I didn't send you the link. I thought I did. I sent it to everybody, but you, um, but, uh, yeah. Do, do you have any thoughts on that conversation or anything that's happened here up until now? Really? I kind of want to just give you the floor. Um, no, I think I really like Alenka Jupancic a lot, but she's also, for whatever reason, kind of just in general confusing sometimes for me. Um, I know I like what she's done with Catherine Malibu and Julie Resch, and and that I like that a lot. Um, but the. I don't know the sex stuff. It's it's confusing for me because because I am just kind of like disinterested in all that. Um, but she does find a way to make it interesting. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know. And then like in general, um, talking about Poland, I I think like from my very American point of view. Um, I don't know. It seems like things are like outdated and maybe kind of stuck in a cold war mentality a little bit, but, um, I don't know. I'm definitely interested. And also I, I, I really like the whole post left stuff. I like, I kind of like egoism, right? I kind of like Sterner. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe when we go over there, we'll catch some some interesting vibes. I don't know. Yeah, I really want to read Bob Black now. Um, you reminded me of him. He's I've got I've got some of his stuff downloaded. I just never actually got into it. But Miha just reminded me of it. Me Panther in the chat says sex is confusing for everyone. Nance, <laughs> you know what that did for me. me. What that did for me, that conversation, it I think it really drove home a couple of things. And that is that for Elenka, um that when we talk about drive, we really are talking about something that happens after law, that happens after prohibition, that happens once a creature is domesticated into this thing called humanity. And the 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 you know, it's sort of the 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 precursors for for that is in this sort of bundle of drives the baby has but those are more related to need but then of course the baby still will like drink more milk than it needs right and then it will throw up it's like so there is already something going on there uh but she did make this distinction between like at the most infantile stage it's really just there's something driving that baby but it's not this thing we're referring to as drive and i found that very useful and then also that that the sublimation and repression is not something that she abandons and in fact in, instead of going oh yes well here's the standard account and now i'm going to tell you all about lacan and why it's so important she instead goes actually you know what everyone just needs to read freud you know just just actually read freud um, and that's a really good starting point i found that really clarifying. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it is really confusing to me as well, though. And I think one of the main things, I guess the final thing I want to say about that whole conversation was that um, when Nina Power was on and she was in the public call, and I believe Nick Casalucci of The Vanishing Mediators said that, um, you know, something, something, something about sex from what is sex. And then Nina was like, yes, but that that's a fantastic book, but that's dealing with sexuality. It's not dealing with sexuation. And I was like, oh, damn, because when I read it, I was kind of just thinking it's supposed to be all of those things. But after that conversation and what little I've gone back over in the book, I'm like, I think that's right. I don't think she's dealing with sexuation really at all. And so when she critiques Judith Butler, She's critiquing, she says she takes the sex out of gender, 
she means the sexuality out of gender, not the, say, biological sex or whatever. And so um, I found that fascinating. And, and so um, now I wonder if you guys have anything you want to piggyback off of with all of that, especially since you're both, you have like this crazy, uh, you're almost like brothers in some kind of like fraternity you didn't know. Like, it's obviously not a fraternity, but it's like this, this psychoanalytic group in Krakow like Mihao went for years and now Wukas is doing that. Um, I wonder how anything you all might want to say uh, in relation to the Alenka interview. Mm, listen, like, uh, well, I think that what's so precious about Alenka and this book in, in particular, what is sex, is that she gathers so much material into it that basically like yeah it's great to go and read Freud but and Lacan and other like Zizek and stuff but I think th this book is like so dense and condenses so many concepts like I was reading about drive for the last two months and when I opened what is sex again and read about her take on the death drive I was like Shh, this is not anywhere like it's brand new and it, uh, but somehow it all fits it fits all of those other uh, like texts together and w like even in the course which was done on theory underground and philosophy portal on what is sex what was so interesting to me uh, when Kadel was teaching it with Dave is that there were those points at which it was like yeah I don't know like there is a point at which you have to wonder like there is no answer to this question she poses there is no and i think this is like it's precious that uh, a thinker like alenka can just mm, bring you to a point at which you don't you are not like oh i should read more i should read more that's why i don't have the answer for this question it's like no this question literally does not yet have an answer and i should go and read so maybe I can contribute a little bit to that theory. And also the it's about sex, okay, sexuality. I think it's also a little bit about sexuation. I don't know if I agree with, but like it's about politics also. And that's what's so precious to me that like, uh, I wonder about uh, after the talk Leon Brenner uh, had on the channel, that he said that psychoanalytic concepts are strictly related to the clinic. And should not be applied outside of it okay but like that may be true but also when she talks about sexuation and how Zizek talks about sex in general like connecting it to political topics i just can't help but like think that i i i start seeing it in like when i watch media when i analyze certain situations those concepts which, which are so abstract uh start coming into your analysis of like everyday political situation or like not every day but like and she also does this in the book so yeah but it's a uh, hard it's hard stuff and you will probably it's frustrating <laughs> to read but i think that's because of the nature of the topic and not the way she writes i think that what you just said about the connection between uh, practicing psychoanalysis and theorizing about using psychoanalysis in a you know philosophical milieu is a very important problem I would say even because um, like my serious actually my serious uh, adventure with philosophy started with Zizek because you know I have some my own you know critiques of Zizek and I do not really agree with like hundred percent with him but still he's like hell of an important thinker uh even if you do not respect what he says personally he's just like a crossroad like a guide on the crossroads uh, between Marx Hegel and Lacan and these are they are so dense and important and you know um complex by themselves and there is this guy from Slovenia you know a country that you know like 10 20 years ago we wouldn't even think about if not for Zizek and, and, and the, the, the Ljubljana school and I think we should probably problematize more and I'm so happy that you had this this topic in your stream about um, you know 
um, psychoanalysis terms, you know, working only in the context of, of, of an actual curation and so on. Uh, and that's what I that's what what I called you know this Lacanian circle circle in Krakow being hardcore because you you go there not only to study you know Lacanian seminars together and discuss the text but you have like regular psychoanalysts who are exchanging you know examples from the cases that they're analyzing and you feel almost a bit embarrassed because you're listening about very intimate things. But it's so important. It's so it's so valuable. Um, but when I ask them, like, what are your takes on Zizek, and do you even read that? And mm-hmm. I remember, like, the 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 the, the head of this uh, Lacanian uh, circle in Krakow. She was like, "Oh, you mean those guys from Ljubljana? They're still working on that Lacan stuff. They're alive." <laughs> so you know, it's like, in at least in Poland. Many people got into Lacan because of Zizek. And we have like plenty of Zizek translated. And Zizek even wrote for some, you know, magazines and newspapers in Poland. Uh, and he got people in Poland interested with Lacan. But the OG Lacanians are now like, huh, so now you're interested with Lacan. Like, like what the hell, you know, it's too late. <laughs> We've already gone into different, you know, places than than the Slovenian guys do, and so there is a, what I'm pointing at with 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 uh, what I want to say is just uh, there is a great gap in between the um, Lacanian practice and what is being popularized and tackled by Zizek and his colleagues, and there's a lot of work to be done in between. Because I would still agree that it's hard to actually get what you know Lacan is about without getting a, at least a you know superficial grasp grasp on what is done on on the psychoanalytical coach. You know, you, you know there. I I think that maybe they are split, dude. Like because when I talk with some of them, uh, they are and I they are old. And the Lacanians in Europe, I don't know how the situation is in other countries, but they are old and they will, if they don't take in new people, they will probably end in like 20, 30 years. And yeah, situation... they're boomers. They're boomers, basically. They are boomers, really. Both but... like literally yeah. and ideologically. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. There was a conference uh, last year they organized and they had a section for like... Uh, LGBT questions and it was called like gender. Jesus Christ, that was yeah. But but I asked them about it and you know what's funny? They and actually uh, I received the mail. They are trying to recruit new young people and it's not done in this bad way. Like yeah, come on, young people, we will ideologize you. But actually, I came in and I was like talked with some of them and I was like. They like they cannot do this uh, stuff with Zizek anymore. They cannot dismiss him, and now it's like either they hate him or they are like, no, no, it's he has a wrong interpretation. And I found it in so many Lacanians here, even in professors on uni, they are doing Lacan. And if you mention like Ljubljana stuff, first they will dismiss it like you are under influence of a bad spirit, and then they will accept it slowly, but say that it's a misinterpretation. And it's so funny because. Uh, on the one hand, Lacanians will, t- will tend to like treat philosophy as like, oh no, we know what is philosophy, it's boring, you know, we don't have to do it. But if you mention Zizek, they are like, and you like start uh, mentioning his concepts and how he deals with it, they don't dismiss it like, oh no, it's stupid. They are like, no, no, this is wrong. And it's, I don't know. But I think the situation oh, yeah, is... Yeah, it's like, it's like affirmation through negation. At least they're treating... Um... The the, the 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 Slovene Lacanian school seriously, uh, either as a as a treat uh, as a threat to to you know the status quo or something, but yeah yeah I, I I agree that's that's we can see it's funny that we can see like year after year it evolving because they have to respond to popularity of Zizek because now Zizek is the ambassador of Lacan like worldwide you know Lacan can cannot speak anymore uh, for himself. And like, you know, this uh, 
NLS, New Lacanian School, uh, on, uh, and all, all of that other organizations there, like for regular people who are interested in, in philosophy, like for example, you, Dave, or you, Nance, can you name any uh, French or um, Spanish or uh, Argentinian uh, schools of, of, of Lacan, you know, those OG psychoanalysts who seem to, you know, um, carry the weight of the, the burden of the Lacanian heritage, you know, which was passed on by um, uh, Jacques Alain Miller. No, like it's it's underground for us. Uh, so everybody reads Zizek and Zupancic now, and they have to respond to that in some way. That That is, I think, a gift and a curse, you know, in a lot of ways. And so, you know, it's becoming more and more of a problem, I think, for me. Now, I think the vanishing mediators, you know, Nick and Andrew, they are the half of the young Zizekians that is most... Um, uh, I think on like a weekly basis in dialogue with a lot of Lacanians, bringing them on their channel, reading the seminars page to page all the way through. Uh, I think they're finishing out seminar three right now. And like they just had, uh, you know, Chiesa, Chiesa on their channel recently. You know, he's a big deal nowadays. Um, wrote an amazing book on Lacanian subjectivity has certain disagreements with Zizek. Um, and of course, you know, they've, they've brought on Leon Brenner, who I have had on recently, and I just put up a video of Leon uh, problematizing the uh, application of the technical terms in psychoanalysis outside of the clinic, because he's saying it's not, these are not ontological categories. And then I think the obvious comeback and I will just cite Mikey, who is in the chat. What's up, Mikey? Mikey's in the chat. Um, you know, the for for someone like Mikey or or Todd McAllen, uh, that that doesn't mean that the subject's not split, though. The subject is ontologically split. I don't care if that concept comes out of a practical clinical scenario. Um, the subject's still split. Do, do do we need to somehow get some scientists with some lab coats to prove it? I don't think it needs to be proven, right? Like the subject is split. Um, like that's a good operating assumption when thinking ontologically, right? Yeah, Mihai, yeah, I, yeah, I can see you I have. May, you know, cut in for a second. You know, the split subject is pretty easy, easy to, um, I mean, relatively easy to explain to philosophers, sociologists, whoever else. It's so, you know, self-explanatory. Uh, and there are many, you know, traditions like existentialism or dialectical tradition who can go on with that. But you have more nuanced things, uh, which, in which you know, will, will sound different, will, will, will work different in different contexts. And when you take it, you know, into the wild, into, you know, context of, I don't know, for example, my media studies or um, some, you know, context of, I don't know, class struggle, whatever, uh, without having it being, you know, mediated through the context of original Lacanian therapy, you know, therapy in the wider sense, you may get lost, you may misinterpret it, you know, and that's what I'm afraid of here. And that is why I said this is becoming more of a problem for me is because I think that the that the goal should always be to kind of deconstruct our usages and not to say leave them deconstructed, but to hold open the space of the question of the interpretation of any of these concepts that we're mobilizing, especially when we're doing, say, ontology. Now, uh, we don't have much more time. And I want to give everyone a chance to say something else before we close out. And we still have to say something about the event, which has been deferred at this point. But Mihao, I, for I had forgotten you had said that you wanted to respond to my uh, to what I said in the introduction. So I'll read the piece here in Underground Theory. Uh, it's from the introduction. I say, the thing is, I owe a tremendous debt to all of those who have courageously attempted to do something different. 
In the same way that I see things that I want to correct for, there will be people like Michal Rams Ugalski in this book who will have critiques of how centralized theory underground is. I mean, it's not just in this book, right? This is just a common kind of thing that people might say, uh, which is why I started saying the theory underground is a fiefdom. You know, it's my little fiefdom. That's just the way it is. Uh, it's because I'm just trying to own this fact, right? But I said, I guess this just comes down to a difference in perspective because I don't think small media projects are effective when decentralized. For instance, those who have tried to unionize, collectivize, or democratize current affairs, or TYT, the Young Turks, or even a small business like Mina's World, or a pizza shop in downtown Boise, completely miss the such singular entities built around individual personalities and their networks would exist in any ideal society. The point is not to let them rule the world, of course, but if people don't have the freedom to do what they want on an expanded scale, then it wouldn't be a society worth living in. Yet decentralization is upheld as a supreme value. I just do not think of them as effective or fun. So, so first of all, and I... I guess it's my fault that I, you know, didn't express myself well enough in my text. Uh, but your critique went totally in a different direction that I actually wanted to, to, you know, make the thinking grow. Because what I'm criticizing is not like centralization of power and you being, you know, the the, the king of the theory underground project. It was it was rather a critique of material conditions, you know, working conditions. Uh, and what I was afraid of uh, in this analysis is that, is that you basically can just burn out because of having all that burden uh, on your shoulders only. And that's all. It's about, you know, uh, sharing, you know, the, the, the workforce, sharing responsibilities, just to not, you know, being left alone with everything. That's all. That's like purely uh, organizational um, material issue. Well, I'm glad you got a chance to to respond. I think maybe in, in Katowice, maybe up, or, or maybe in a future volume, one of the ones to come out of the October conference this year, I'll have to do a piece on why you're right. And why my interpretation of your, uh, your critique was 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 wrong. Uh, my critique, my response applies to those people who are saying it in that other way. But no, you're you're a hundred percent right. It is not sustainable in a sort of sense, and that's why I am trying to get things to a point where I would be able to uh, pay a fair uh, amount of money to uh, programmers to actually make the website and the app function you know because right now it's like barely functioning and uh it's kind of just like wow after all of that work i put into it it would it still just demands so much time and energy and then it's not really working for people like it kind of works like people can get the app and they can still use it some people do prefer the app over the mobile site or i mean the the desktop site but at the end of the day it, some degree of specialization and division of labor really is necessary. We have to be realists about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well then, okay. I probably shouldn't talk about that at the event in Katowice because the theme of the event at Katowice, well, there will be a theme. All right. And so I wanted to kind of let you each talk about your vision and sort of ideas you might have for the events in uh, Katowice and Krakow. Uh, and then in, in the closing, you know, Nance and I, we might say a couple things about what we will want to talk about when we're there, if we have time. But right now, I really want to give the floor to you both. And so we'll go uh, Wukas and then Mihao. Um, I'm going to pull up the dates that I have for this. And uh, but if you know it off the top of your head, uh, you can also share that out. But yeah, so Lucas, what do you what do you have in mind for for this so far? Mm, what I yeah, what I I would what I would like to talk about would be like some there is a real deadlock in the left politics in Poland, and I would like to talk about maybe some some way to like 
really, I'm really inspired by Todd McGowan's enjoyment uh, left and right. And I would like to present a piece which would be connected with it, like analyzing the way in which left, which maybe exists, maybe doesn't exist in Poland, works and like to to present a piece about that. But I don't know about the general theme. I, I have to like, I, I have to think about it. Yeah. And I also wondered uh, how we will, uh, like, we'll probably, and I thought about it right now, like, we'll probably be presenting in English, but I don't know if we'll also be presenting in Polish. Because I, po in Poland, people generally, like, 90% 90, 90 of people in the cities at least speak English, but I wouldn't like to assume that. So we'll think about this, I think. That's a really good point. I assume that on our part in Katowice, when I was discussing, you know, uh, technicalities with my, with with my uh, with people at my institute, um, and yeah, there's one thing uh, that may be interesting for our viewers that I was discussing with you, Dave, with you, Lukash, that the uh, Krakow event will be more like unofficial, casual, because it will be organized in a cooperative milieu. They might be some, you know, anarchist, you know, some horizontal um, structures. Uh, so, you know, to make it um, to make an interesting contrast, I wanted to organize uh, the, the the Katowice part uh, on a more official level. So I've asked for help at my institute at University of Silesia in Katowice uh, because I work in the Institute of Journalism and Media Communication. And I've said, you know, we have some critical media theory stuff. Are you interested in that? And yeah, yeah of course you have, but you have to organize everything by yourself. Good, better for us. Um, they're not going to stick their, you know, fingers into <laughs> the theory underground machine. Uh, but, uh, and I said that, um, yeah, it will be mostly like aimed at students. And they were like, so you do not want to like invite us. Why not? We want to take part in a discussion. We want to discover that you know that fresh thing from states. Um, so it might be very interesting. And uh, when it comes to my part, if of course there'll be you know time and space for uh, me talking there, uh, I would just like to present some points from my uh, underground theory uh, chapter. Uh, with some additional thoughts and also empirical data that I have uh, already gathered by all this time. So, yeah. I want, so, it's going to be more critical media theory in Katowice. And it sounds like it could be either a mixture of things in Krakow, or it could be more focused on you're saying you want to present on something having to do with politics. And so, I mean, we could do something just on post leftism. You know, we could. Yeah, I also wanted to. I don't want to. Uh, what Michal said about it being not connected with the uni per se. I want to get all possible help I can and like invite all the theory connected professors or doctors which i know work with students already and are open to the to a discussion and i also wanted to maybe invite some of my friends who are working on like heidegger or precisely on politics uh we have i i know people who are like right when theory underground was doing the course on nick land i there was also a group in krakow who were independently doing uh, Nick Land studies. So that was very interesting. I think politics would be great. And you we'll see there's some that. there's some zeitgeist in the in the air, you know, the spirit of, of the times. People are independently reading same shit, you know, all around the globe. But I want to make a one important correction because we are close to making an overstatement. Uh, when we're talking about post-left being popular in Poland, we're talking about it being popular among, you know, youngsters, I mean, like 20-ish and below. Uh, that's what uh, is, is Zoomers, now... Zoomers, Zoomers. Yeah, that's what's hip with, with the kids right now. Uh, 
uh, it's not like you know on every corner of every Polish street there are like regular working class people reading you know some post left stuff or Stirner and anything like that you know like it's it, in Poland it's the same as everywhere like most of the people are not even interested in politics as a theory because, but but you know in Polish in Poland and Dave was already exposed to that we love nagging we love you know complaining especially about politics. So there is something to start with, but it's still not philosophy per se. <laughs> well, and uh, that would be the goal then for me would be to draw the connection between philosophy per se, political philosophy per se, and um, I would probably read some Bob Black and I would... Uh, look into the podcasters in the U.S. a little bit more, and I would draw this distinction because ultimately, what I want to flesh out is post left versus post politics versus anti politics, and I want to talk about are these all the same thing? Are they different? If they're different, how are they different? And then finally, most importantly, oh, Brent Atkins is here. We're gonna let him in in a second, but we'll we'll still finish out really quick. Um, yeah, what is what are the connections between these things, and then. Are these new identities for people to assume or are they methodological modes of operation? And so that's that's the big question. Actually, we got to we got to close out. I didn't realize we lost lost time here. So, um, guys, thank you so much. I hope that we can resume this um, maybe in a month, maybe on uh, February 22nd. Uh, you'll both be welcome back. We can figure out a time. If this time works for you all, then we could do it then. But if that won't work, we'll figure out something else soon because I would definitely want to bring you both back so we can keep talking about all of these things. Thank you, everybody. Peace. Bye. Yes. Bye. You. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run and review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. Seriously. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarriker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages, five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground has already put out eight courses, two books, one, my book, Time Energy, and the other, Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of Underground Theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive. So excuse the commercial, 
But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program. And also make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. We're back. Welcome, everybody, to the show, I guess, to the Epic Mar Marathon live stream at Theory Underground. I'm David McCarricker, and you, you are all familiar with Nance here. But we're excited to introduce you all, if you're not familiar with his work already, Dr. Brent Atkins. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's really great to have you. Um, you've got a bunch of books that look totally fascinating, um, such as A Guide to Ethics and Moral Philosophy, uh, Rethinking Philosophy and Theology with Deleuze, A New Cartography, True Freedom, Spinoza's Practical Philosophy, and then it looks like the first one that's available, at least on my end of things, is Death and Desire in Hegel, Heidegger, and Deleuze. And that one, which I only found out about this week, really looks fascinating because I'm very interested in all three of these thinkers. But we, I think the reason that we all know about you, several of us here at Theory Underground, is because of your amazing book you, you published in 2015 called Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus, A Critical Introduction and Guide. And so today is Deleuze's birthday. And Yay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> happy, happy birthday to Guy Deleuze. Um, well, welcome to the stream. You're the official real Deleuzean scholar that we've had on the stream, and so this is a very special occasion. Um, I guess as a sort of introduction to you, and also through you, him, um, maybe you could say a few things about uh, your own philosophical journey, getting into philosophy, uh, your discovery of Deleuze, and what brought you to write that book. Yeah, sure. Um, really happy to be here. And the the journey was strange. Uh, so I, I actually started in theology. Um, and uh, numerous versions of this story. Uh, the, the short version is, uh, it just looked to me like theology was bad philosophy. Uh, so I started doing philosophy in graduate school uh, after graduating with my theology degree. And my first love uh, was, was Derrida. Uh, my master's thesis was on Derrida. And like um, most, well, I don't know about most, but like many scholars, there's a tendency towards scholasticism. So, you know, you find somebody you like and you want to know, oh, what are their sources? And so you do these deep dives into all the obscurities and stuff. And so that was the move that I made uh, in my PhD program, which was what are what are Derrida's sources? And I, I zeroed in on Hegel and Heidegger uh, and wrote my dissertation on Hegel and Heidegger. Uh, and so... I was aware of Deleuze uh, in that process, but never really looked at him. I was much more into uh, Derrida and his relation to Hegel and Heidegger. And uh, I came across Deleuze a couple of times. I think I took a seminar on Lacan and his critics uh, where we read a little Deleuze uh, from Antiedipus, uh, but yeah, it just wasn't, wasn't on my radar at all. And so uh, I got my, uh, position here at Rona College, and uh, I thought, well, you know, what does one do well, when one gets one one takes their dissertation and turns it into a book? The problem was I wasn't really crazy about my dissertation. I didn't think it really went anywhere. I just thought it came to an impasse. Uh, you know, it was Hegel and Heidegger on death, and their their position seemed uh, incommensurable with one another, and I didn't really have any 
uh, non-question begging way to prefer one over the other. So it just sort of ended. Um, and so I was sort of searching around and I was becoming more interested in Deleuze and my path into Deleuze was actually through Spinoza. I started teaching Spinoza pretty regularly and was using uh, Deleuze to help me understand Spinoza and Spinoza to help me understand Deleuze. Uh, and so I took the big step of uh, putting Antietipus on a syllabus because I tried several times to do something with it and they all failed. And I thought, well, if I'm gonna figure it out, I'm just gonna have to put it on a syllabus and have to figure it out in real time in front of students or go down in flames. And so that's what I did. And I thought it worked pretty well. And I began to piece together an understanding. And not only that, I thought there might be a path out of the impasse uh, with Hegel and Heidegger through Deleuze. And so that ended up being the Death and Desire uh, book, which is basically my, my dissertation uh, rewritten with Deleuze at the end. Um, and I could say more about sort of the argument there, what I'm pursuing there, but um, you know, the, the entire text is available on my academia page. Um, if anybody wants to take a look as our not full text of all my books, but uh, full text of some books and partial text of other books. Um, and so, yeah, I, I sort of, I don't know, I, I had a conversion. Like I, yeah, Deleuze, Deleuze was the man. I was done with uh, all of this talk about uh, the negative and the nothing. And I was really into uh, desire and production and creativity. Uh, and so I started pursuing uh, Deleuze and hanging out with Deleuzeans and they were super cool uh, in a way that Hegelians and Heideggerians weren't. Um, and so, yeah, I just sort of made my path from there. And um, the I, I developed a good relationship with the editor uh, at Edinburgh who published uh, the first book uh, and asked if they would be interested in a book on a thousand plateaus because it was sort of starting to piece that together. Um, and they said, sure. And so I wrote that and yeah, I've been very pleased with um, the response uh, to the book and it gets me invitations like this. So I'm very happy to have to have taken this path. Yeah, this, this book is an absolute treasure and has been foundational for unlocking uh, a thousand plateaus, probably for, I don't know, I want to say millions, but pr let's be honest, it's probably a few thousand. Um, yeah. But in my mind, it's millions. Yes, and uh, <laughs> there are dozens of us. Dozens. <laughs> yeah, dozens of us. Well, you know, at least a few hundred more than there would have been, I'm sure. Um, and that's because really at the end of the day, unless someone has the time, the energy, the resources, uh, and that's not even enough. You actually, resources, we have to have an institution. We actually have to have some kind of a vehicle for teaching it to learn it. Like that's the thing is, you know, I, I, I see people struggling to just read a book like that, uh, A Thousand Plateaus in isolation. And it's like, not only, you know, you, you, you had been going at, at it for so long, but it was that kind of that leap of faith saying, no, I'm going to teach it. And if I don't, you know, and trial by fire and it forced you yeah, into yeah. knowing it. So yeah, I, I, I mortgaged my students' future uh, for my own benefit there, but uh, yeah. it ended up paying off. Well, it's, um, so A Thousand Plateaus, uh, very difficult book. You wrote this critical introduction and guide to it. Um, and maybe you could say a few more things about the, the structure, um, some of the key concepts uh, that you chose to focus on. You know, obviously you can't take on the whole book, but kind of like, what do you kind of see just as, a, you know, it's Deleuze's birthday. So giving people advice, people who want to dive in the deep end here, um, what are some of, what's some of the advice you would give them and, and kind of what, what do you, what is your sort of key to unlocking this text? Um, my key to unlocking the text is a kind of an offhanded sentence from the first plateau where they called the book a perceptual semiotics. 
And this to me is absolutely crucial because I think it uh, militates against a very common reading of uh, particularly a thousand plateaus, uh, which is, oh, yes, uh, Deleuze is separating the wheat from the chaff. He's separating the uh, sheep from the goats. And uh, the, the terms that he uses are tree and rhizome or state and war machine you know, or, or any of the other dichotomies. Uh, and so the purpose of A Thousand Plateaus on this uh, reading, this common reading, would be to say, okay, well, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? Who are the trees and who are the rhizomes? And let's be more like rhizomes and less like trees. And I think what Deleuze and Batari are arguing uh, is not that at all. I take that to be a moral reading of a thousand plateaus when everything in uh, all of their works suggests that they would um, they're aiming for an ethical reading rather than a moral reading right and by ethical i mean in the straightforwardly spinoza sense that the task of ethics is to figure out uh, which of which combinations are composing and which are decomposing uh, and so for deleuze and guattari the task is not to find the good rhizomes and eliminate the bad trees, the task is to recognize that everything can be seen as a rhizome. Okay, well, what does it mean to see something as a rhizome? Well, it means to see it um, without essence. It means to see it as capable of change. It means to see it as a vector uh, for invention. Uh, and so for Deleuze and Guattari, even the most arborescent structure uh, can be examined and understood in terms of where its uh, edges are, where it's likely to change. And for them, that's interesting. That's where invention occurs. And so what how I read A Thousand Plateaus is not this um, not this metaphysics where they're they're laying everything out. They're saying, uh, look, uh, if you thought of things this way, these are the kinds of things you could invent. Now go invent new things, right? So it's more a series of illustrations or examples about how to create, how to invent, rather than it is a sort of new totalizing metaphysics. And then Deleuze though had a metaphysics, maybe it wasn't this totalizing metaphysics, but you know, the basic sort of uh, the virtual, intensive, extensive, you know, uh, way of thinking of, about how things come into being, which is, you know, developed, at least for me, I mean, I've only really read Difference and Repetition prior to Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus. I haven't read The Logic of Sense or any of his lectures yet. Um, but I, I'm wondering if, uh, maybe you could say a few things about, uh, what, is done what what is what is working with Guattari and, and writing these books ultimately do with his metaphysics and maybe we can use that as a bridge into talking about the body without organs <laughs> because you have to tell us what that is <laughs> which they famously disagree on so okay yeah, we may be in for a rather long conversation there um so of course, I wouldn't deny that uh, Deleuze has a metaphysics. Uh, and I agree that it is a metaphysics, uh, to put this in the most sort of blunt, uh, straightforward terms as possible, it is a metaphysics in which uh, things arise out of chaos, right? So it's not as if order is imposed on chaos from without, right? This is the um, judgment of God, uh, he would call it. Uh, he's trying to account for the way in which uh, chaos itself is uh, self-organizing. Um, and so you can imagine like a sine wave and uh, above above a level you have extensity, right? You have things uh, uh, formed into what we would call objects. And that for the most part has been what philosophy has focused on, on Deleuze's reading. And he's not interested in that at all. What he's interested in is that 
prior intensive process that produces uh, these uh, stable objects. And so that's why he's so interested in what he would call uh, the anomalous or the deterritorializing edge, right? Uh, where are those inflection points where uh, something is likely to change? Uh, that's what defines an object, not some sort of unchanging essence. Um, and so what does, uh, what's Hari bring to the table? Um, I think Watari brings a lot, and I think it's um, it's been underappreciated. It's being more and more appreciated, but um, and you know we we could point to things that Deleuze says. Uh, you know he says that uh, Felix uh, was this sort of unending fount of invention, like he never stopped inventing things and. Uh, Felix was often uh, upset with Gilles because he moved so slowly uh, that by the time he got around to sort of thinking about, you know, this uh, thing that Felix had invented, uh, he, he was on to the next thing uh, and was inventing more and more stuff. Uh, and so you do get this sort of, uh, I don't know, this effervescence I find in both Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus that's not quite there uh, in the other works. But uh, beyond that, you know, beyond sort of a kind of shift in style, uh, you do have a much more straightforward political engagement. Uh, and, uh, you know, of the two, Felix was much more politically engaged uh, than Deleuze. And this goes back to his... Um, work as a practicing clinician at Laborde Clinic. Uh, and the work they were doing there was uh, institutional analysis, right? It wasn't individual analysis. Uh, so all, all therapy was group therapy. There were no distinctions or very minor distinctions between sort of staff and patients at Laborde. Uh, Laborde had you know, no walls, no doors. People came and go as they pleased. Um, and so there's this real concerned with what in other texts Deleuze would call the individual uh, as opposed to the individual, right? That, you know, the, the individual isn't the basic unit of analysis for uh, this kind of analysis and not for uh, Deleuze either. Uh, the basic unit in, of analysis is, you know, uh, what forces are intersecting here, what forces are at play, and what sort of assemblage do they produce, and what are its uh, anomalous edges, uh, where, where can something new be produced? Um, but I could ramble on on that. I, I think I posted a recent article uh, called Anti-Oedipus um, Metaphysics and Method um, that, that talks a lot about Guattari's contribution um, to the project. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm happy to say more, but I can also go on to something else uh, there. So the the body without organs then is right. is uh, that that was the answer? Mm -hmm. No, no, I okay. didn't talk about body without organs at all. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Just making sure that wasn't the answer. Yeah. No, no. Well, uh, that was uh, what does Guattari bring to Deleuze and the writing of Deleuze? Um, right. And then I was pausing to see if you wanted to pursue that or go on to the fraught. Uh, body without organs. Well, I've got uh, two questions uh, from Michael Downs, who's also a huge fan of your work. Uh, I have to say, like a lot of what I initially got for in terms of DNG come through Mikey, um, and uh, so we'll want to get into those for sure. Um, we don't have to get too deep into the body without organs. Maybe you could just problematize the common takes on it and show what this contradiction is kind of between uh, Deleuze and Guattari's positions on it. Yeah, well, I mean, that's not clear. It's It's been obscured by the way the books have been written. Um, but we could just start very um, simply by talking about the difference between the way it's presented in Anti-Oedipus compared to the way it's presented in A Thousand Plateaus. So in Anti-Oedipus, uh, the body without organs uh, 
just for, for lack of a better word, is just really big, right? Uh, capital is the body without organs of capitalism. Uh, you know, the king's body is the body without organs of despotism. Um, the earth is the body without organs of pre-state societies or non-state societies. Um, and so there it has this um, sense of a, um, a surface on which um, desiring production is organized and also uh, prevented, right? It, it has this um, anti-productive kind of, um, I don't know, anti-productive kind of um, feel uh, in, in that. When we get to uh, A Thousand Plateaus, right, the chapter, the plateau that's on that is called How to Make Yourself a Body Without Organs. Uh, and there it feels like a very sort of personal experimental project, right? Um, uh, you know, the opening lines, right? Uh, you have a, you have one or you have several. Uh, and so it looks like they're imagining that um, each person is continually producing and reproducing bodies without organs. And it's done as an experiment and it can be botched as in the case of the, um, the drug addict's uh, body without organs or the masochist body without organs. And so again, the, the question is, how can you um, produce yourself such that uh, as many affects as possible circulate, right? Again, to uh, sort of withdraw into Spinoza's language. So, um, so to summarize, it looks like in Anti-Oedipus, uh, body without organs plays this uh, very large institutional role, something like uh, strata in the geology of morals plateau. Uh, whereas in a thousand plateaus, it looks like it is this um, individual experimental process that one continually undergoes. Um, so, uh, you know, wh which of that is coming from uh, Deleuze and which of it is coming from Guattari? I don't know. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's clear that Deleuze engages with uh, Body Without Organs from Marteau uh, as early as Logic of Sense, so before he meets Felix. Um, so, and it's not clear uh, what Felix took up. I, I don't know uh, his work as well to be able to point to passages uh, where he's talking about this to, to you know, flesh it out more. Um, but uh, it's, it certainly feels to me like um, Anti-Oedipus um, Anti -Oedipus has this more institutional account of the body without organs and Thousand Plateaus has this much more personal. Now, ultimately those are harmonizable, I think, or at least I would move in that direction as a first move and if that failed, that would be fine. Um, and, and say something like, well, even, even given the differences between the two works, the body without organs in both cases functions as a limit. And we could talk about, you know, what that, what that limit is and how that works, but uh, what they're trying to think in both cases is the limit of um, desiring production in the case of anti-Oedipus and the limits of circulation of affect or, um, you know, lines of flight or something like that in A Thousand Plateaus. So I, I was under the impression that the body without organs is also in the virtual or it's mm. that it's, or that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like what, the extensive, like what we would see, you know, empirically or experience phenomenologically is all in a sort of sense downstream from the, you know, the virtual. And then there's the intensive processes between sort of not mediating, but producing what we take as given. Right. And that the body without organs is like the, is it, is it, is it, is it in the virtual and that it's like, that there's different kind of abstract machines that can then produce it into specific sort of uh, ways of being or something? Uh, so 
a couple of things, and I'm not sure I have a good answer to your question, but uh, here here's a first attempt. Um, and, and not that uh, you're saying this, but I just want to be clear about this. Um, the body without organs, as I understand it, uh, is not a ground for Deleuze and Guattari. Uh, it, it appears as a quasi-ground or quasi-cause, they call it, in Antiedipus, but it is not itself a ground. And so what's prior to that? Well, in Antiedipus, it's desiring production. Um, and I think in A Thousand Plateaus, it would be something like intensity. Uh, and so what what's being described in both cases is the ways in which uh, intensities coagulate into extensities, right? And the body without organs is the name of that limit that um, intensities run up against. And as they, uh, you know, sort of bounce back or fold back on themselves, they spread out over this uh, surface. Um, and so I, I think Philosophically, the project is trying to replace this concept of ground with something that is produced by a prior process. Um, secondly, uh, so how, how does the body without organs relate uh, to the virtual and actual? And here I confess, I have real difficulty um, sort of translating the language of difference and repetition to the language of capitalism and schizophrenia. Mm. Um, they, uh, Deleuze and Guattari abandon talk of the virtual and actual um, in A Thousand Plateaus, and it doesn't come back again until what is philosophy. And so two possibilities here, um, either, or there maybe there's more than two, but two occur to me at the moment. Uh, either um, there's there's some kind of one to one translation. Um, you know, the project of difference and repetition is the same as the project of capitalism and schizophrenia, and so there's pretty straightforward conversion that one could go through. Like the virtual is um, the intensive, and the um, actual is the extensive and you know is assemblage or stratum or, or whatever is, or is where they meet or is this process production or something like that uh, maybe that's the case uh, the other possibility uh, and this is my view although this is, is admittedly a minority view i've taken a lot of crap for this and that's okay um, but i i read a thousand plateaus as a critique of um, ideas found in difference and repetition. I think uh, with Guattari, Deleuze is trying to go beyond uh, the way he was thinking in uh, difference and repetition. And so mm. uh, to my mind, uh, you know, and this is uh, to sort of hedge into the, the kind of work I'm doing now, I think difference and repetition remains uh, too transcendental uh, for the Deleuze of a thousand plateaus, and he's trying to uh, think otherwise uh, than the transcendental in a thousand plateaus. But this is super inside baseball. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to go down this path, but anyway, so at the end of the day, I don't have a great answer for how does body without organs relate to the virtual, for example. I'm I'm not sure they're compatible vocabularies, or at least it's not clear to me. Um, I'm, I'm sure uh, somebody like Dan Smith could, you know, wave his hand and, and make it happen uh, just like that. But um, I'm not there yet. Well, uh, I appreciate you for, uh, I don't want to say calling me out, but problematizing my uh, derivative uh impression of what's going on there because that it, i think it is important to problematize and keep these things problems um and so i, I kind of want to get into uh i want to definitely want to get into this this idea of death and and what deleuze brings and and everything but i, I don't know we'll, we'll see if we have time because 
like I said, Mikey asked a couple of questions. I don't know if you're familiar with his blog, but it's called The Dangerous Maybe. And he mm. has referenced your work um, a few times on there. And, you know, what he does is he tries to flesh out his understanding of concepts. He tries to use, you know, key thinkers from continental philosophy, usually philosophy more broadly as well. Um, and so it's a real resource and a treasure to us all. And then, I mean, that's, he's put me onto so many great works such as yours, um, because you were ultimately the key for unlocking how he approaches D and G. Now, his first question is one concept of D and G's that remains blurry for a lot of us is that of the Earth stat. Can you clarify mm -hmm. this concept for us? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. What so, is that? Uh, as far as I know, the first place this arises uh, is in Antiedipus, um, and so. It's interesting. Um, I think the key here is the work of Pierre Clasters, right? Especially Society Against the State, even though that comes out two years after Antiedipus. Um, but uh, maybe Clasters had uh, articles or something that they were also reading. I, I'd have to look at the uh, the notes in Antiedipus. But uh, here's here's how I take it that um, any society, and uh, thinking here particularly of non-state societies, um, thinks itself always in reference to its limits, right? So again, we're back to this question of limits in the body without organs. And so uh, what is the limit of a non-state society? That is, uh, what boundary would it have to cross in order to not be uh, a non-state society anymore? And that boundary would be something like centralization of authority, hierarchy, things like that. Um, and so uh, what lies at the horizon of a non-state society is the state. And so for Deleuze and Guattari, following clusters very explicitly by the time we get to uh, the war machine in a thousand plateaus, is this notion that um, the state and non-state societies are equiprimordial, right? So that there is this formal relation between uh, the state and not the state uh, that exists wherever there is a society. And I think it's that state form, that's the term they use in A Thousand Plateaus, is what they mean by the Erstadt, right? This idea of uh, at what limit does a society become a state? Uh, and what mechanisms does a society use to ward off that kind of centralization and hierarchization um, that becomes the state, right? That's the Erstadt, right? That's the fundamental form. Uh, that gets imposed and ends up overcoating uh, non-state societies. Perfect, thank you. And then the the other one is what makes DNG's theory of desire? And I understand the irony, especially since you you have this background in Derrida. This is a very American way of interviewing, just to be like question after question. But I just wanted to make sure we get these two before we can kind of really dig into. The, sure. the the question that keeps me up at night. Um, so what makes DNG's theory of desire so different from Lacan's theory of desire? Are these two theories totally incompatible or is there a way to square the circle? Yeah, great question. And you can see how carefully um, they're skirting around this issue in um, in Antiedipus. Uh, they're very clear to paint Freud uh, with this uh, brush, uh, but very subtle uh, with references to Lacan. And um, Guattari starts as a Lacanian, right? He's uh, he was a um, client of Lacan's, uh, and the initial task of Laborde was to sort of use Lacan to do institutional therapy. So there's this very uh, tight relation between Lacanians and Guattari and 
Deleuze and Lacan met, I think when Deleuze was in Lyon uh, at one point. Uh, so yeah, like this, the, the Parisian intellectual circle was uh, very small and everybody knew everybody. And so, yeah, there was a lot of that going on. And then there was also sort of shenanigans too when um, in their sessions, Lacan kept plying Guattari for information about the book that he was working on with Deleuze, right? This is all in uh, Das's Intersecting Lives, right? The uh, sort of uh, ur text for anecdotes about Deleuze and Guattari. Um, so anyway, let's talk about the difference first and then talk about whether that circle can be squared or not. Um, so, the straightforward difference is the difference between what um, Deleuze and Guattari call productive desire, that would be their view, and desire predicated on a lack, right? That's the fundamental distinction. And they think desire predicated on a lack runs throughout the entire history of Western thought, right? So the uh, in Plato, right, the, the soul... Uh, seeking uh, the forms, right? Uh, in Augustine, you know, the heart is restless until it finds itself in God, right? So there's there's some kind of something that we're missing. And, you know, again, this is super obvious and it's weird that to even call it into question, like the reason I want something is because I don't have it. I don't want things I already have. So that must be the structure of desire that we're lacking something and we move, right? We're impelled to uh, fill that lack. And so we seek the thing that we don't have. And so uh, Deleuze and Guattari's position is, uh, yes, of course, desire is predicated on a lack sometimes, uh, but this is always a contingent and historical production, right? And so whenever we find desire predicated on a lack, that becomes a problem. That becomes a question to ask, like why that lack and what structures are producing that lack and supporting that lack, right? So it becomes a problem of genealogy uh, rather than a, a transcendental structure uh, that organizes experience. Okay, so in contrast to that, uh, Deleuze and Guattari are arguing that, well, uh, sure, sometimes in certain situations, which we would have to ask about, um, desire can be predicated on a lack, but more fundamental than that is productive desire. And so they have a couple of uh, touchstones here. For me, Spinoza's the most straightforward one, right? Spinoza says desire is the essence of all things. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, the way that Deleuze reads Spinoza, what Spinoza means by that is that um, everything is always either connecting with something or breaking a connection with something. Uh, and you break a connection in order to make a connection with something else. And I spent years thinking about this, like this made no sense. Like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And uh, it was not clear to me until I had kids. And once I saw my kids playing, I suddenly understood productive desire. And I think, you know, we've all had this experience, even if you don't have kids of your own, if you watch a toddler play, you can, you can imagine this in your mind, uh, toddlers running around with a toy in each hand, just toddling around, toy in each hand, like just making the connection. What happens when the child sees a different toy, throws the toys down and picks up the new thing? The child wasn't looking for the toy. The child didn't desire the toy as in it was something that it lacked. It just made a connection. And in order to make a new connection, it had to break the old connection. And the entirety of Antiedipus is thinking about iterations of that very basic process, right? That's just what reality is, the continual making and breaking of connections. And this making and breaking of connections produces limits, which they call the body without organs, uh, and then those connections get channeled and spread out across that body without organs and you have society and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, an entire metaphysics of desire um, based on the idea that desire is just the making and breaking of connections um, 
rather than being fundamentally predicated on a lack. Okay, before I get to the squaring the circle, I'll just pause there and see, are there questions or things you wanna follow up on? Nance, do you have anything? Oh, wait, your, your mic's not working. Oh, you're muted on Zoom, oh, okay. Okay, am I working now? Yeah. Okay, I'm having tons of issues today. Um, that, to me, um, rhymes with drive in a way, the surplus. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that's where I, I start to get confused and my brain starts to shut down because I immediately just want to say, oh, okay, they're, they're just um, using polar language and they're like, they're just, mi you know, miss, missing each other. And I don't think that's right. But I, I also do see how it kind of rhymes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So, I mean, like, uh, yeah, I don't want to be the Deleuze police, right? And say, no, there's no way that Deleuze and Lacan could ever go together. Like, yeah, th there are paths one could take um, to use both of them. And, you know, from Deleuze's perspective, I think that would be the task, right? If you find something that's in Lacan that illuminates Deleuze or vice versa, and that's useful to you, that allows you to create something new, do that, right? Like there, there's no, there's no final judge who's going to say, oh man, well, you got the Lacan wrong, man. I'm sorry. Just no dice, right? So yeah, just like combine and recombine and see what works and see what doesn't work. Um, you know, and I and I, I don't mean that to be like a flip answer. Uh, like, yeah, there there are real textual issues. There would be really hard scholarship to be done uh, to square the circle, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, and for me, and in my work, uh, not that this has to be anybody else else's project. Um, I guess I, I can't uh, I can't quite get beyond. Um, the role of negation or the role of the lack uh, in Lacan to to sort of bring it back to Deleuze and Guattari. And uh, I, I think I can do what I want to do without that. So I'm just going to go do that. Uh, but if you think, no, no, like there, there's, I can make something here. There, there there's a, there's a fuzzy edge where, where they can be meshed. Like do that, do it all. Well, and I think it seems that the part of what D and G want to get away from and getting away from this idea of lack would be the inference. Uh, it's just a lot of the Lacanian inferences that are behind the idea of drive. So, you know, and, 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 you know, and the idea that say OJR is like, um, has to do with like this retroactive, um, uh, for the the, the prohibit you know because of prohibition because of the law there is this lack and then we have like this fantasy and then like it, this is all this, these inferences and they're kind of just like we don't need all of that we can just say everything's productive like we don't need to add this this backstory or I mean I think we could say it this way uh, and and this is the way they say it in Anti Oedipus Freud is right about everything. He's absolutely right. We're all Oedipalized. Oedipus is real. Like this is, uh, you know, unassailable. Like Freud was a genius. And you could read Anti-Oedipus as kind of a recovery of Freud. Except what Freud took, all the structures Freud took to be transcendental, universal, and ahistorical are in fact produced historically and contingently. So yeah, read Freud. He was right, but he was only right about this particular slice of society. And so part of our task is to figure out uh, what are the conditions that led to this, uh, this particular arrangement of desire, this particular lack. Like, why is it that uh, our desire is captured by the family? Well, we'd have to tell a story about how families get privatized under capitalism and about labor and the way uh, labor gets detached from the land, and right? 
and the way the state overcodes, right? And that's the story they want to tell in chapter three of Antiedipus, right? So it's not that uh, Freud was wrong and, you know, maybe we can include Lacan here, maybe we couldn't. As I said, they're very cagey about uh, Lacan and Antiedipus. But for Freud, they, they, they start with the acknowledgement he's right. Uh, just he's not as right as he thought he was, right? And he he didn't discover uh, universal structures of the unconscious. Uh, he discovered a process, uh, and then he assumed that the way in which that process got captured uh, in contemporary society is the way that it fundamentally is. And Phyllis and Guattari are saying, no, uh, what's more fundamental is productive desire, and so what we need to do is give a genealogy, tell a story about how productive desire gets captured in this very specific way. I think that's enough for us on these two questions to think about, and probably, hopefully, we'll want to come back. And I would love for you to have an opportunity to meet Mikey. Sadly, he he would normally be here, but right now he's working, and so he's listening while driving a truck. Um, and so, uh, not like, yeah, drive safe out there. It's probably snowy and, you know, it's been wrecked out here. Where are you located? Uh, Roanoke, Virginia. Roanoke, Virginia. Okay. And what's the weather like out there right now? Uh, it's chilly and we had some snow. Uh, I'm in the mountains of Virginia, so it's, it's very pleasant. Um, nothing, nothing serious. Um, you know. Classes weren't canceled or anything like that. So it's all good. Actually happy to see some snow. We haven't had any here in a couple of years. So that's good. And you said this is the first week of classes for, for you all? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad because on the first week of classes, I'm a discussion leader for two sections as an adjunct. And um, my, both my sections were canceled during the first week. And then this week they were almost canceled. The The morning classes my wife teaches were canceled. Mine were not. So it's, it's dicey out here though, because people are getting stuck everywhere, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, the streets are clear here. Nobody's getting stuck. It's, uh, it's all pretty, pretty anodyne. All right. So now the question about death. Uh, and in fact, I'll use as a bridge, the fact that I was just talking about whether Heidegger would say this is, you know, this is idle. This is idle talk. That's and right. the, you know, yeah. fall, falling is fleeing, right? It's fleeing from that uh, resoluteness, that anticipatory resoluteness, and this kind of like taking seriously the fact that all of our life, insofar as it can be meaningful or deliberate, is um, in reference to the uh, necessary impossibility or of, of any more possibilities, right? Um, I, I don't know so much how to bring that into dialogue with Hegel, much less how Deleuze would factor in, but you've done all this work on it. So I want to give you, I guess, some time to talk about that. Sure. Um, so, yeah, it did seem like, uh, you know, in, in a superficial way that Hegel and Heidegger had opposing conceptions of death. Right. So for Heidegger, you know, uh death is individualizing you know one's own most possibility it happens without meat sign all these you know sort of very um indiv individualizing uh st structures uh, of death for heidegger uh hegel on the other hand uh seemed like and i'm just speaking of the phenomenology though i might be willing to make broader claims here um for Hegel, uh, death is a communal problem, right? That um, death is clearly this natural negation. Uh, and so what needs to happen for a society to progress, become more rational, is to convert that natural negation into a spiritual negation. And so you can read the phenomenology as this uh, process of uh ever more fully uh, spiritual uh, negations of death, right? So master-slave, uh, you don't get very far, but by the time you get to revealed religion, where you have this entire institutional process and the Eucharist, which, you know, 
celebrates this death of God every day, um, that's a fully spiritualized uh, negation as far as Hegel is concerned. Uh, and then this gets taken up into the conceptual language of philosophy, right? That's just uh, picture thinking for Hegel, right? The, the real action happens in philosophy for him. Um, so we sort of have this, you know, in very bare terms, an individualist account of death versus a communal account of death. Um, and so I was thinking, well, maybe this uh, opposition is structured like an antinomy in the Kantian sense, right? So maybe we have uh, two uh, valid arguments for opposed conclusions. Um, it's like, okay, well, wh wh what does one do with an antinomy? And Kant says, well, there are two ways you can solve an antinomy. Um, either the antinomy is dynamical, in which case both sides are true, or the antinomy is dynamical, in which case, or sorry, mathematical, in which case both sides are false. Like, okay, well, uh, maybe we could think about philosophy since Hegel as uh, offering either mathematical or dynamical solutions to this impasse, right? The individual versus the communal uh, on death. Uh, and maybe um, we could think about these two opposed sides as uh, either mourning or melancholia, right? So I'm, I'm using Freud's essay, uh, Mourning and Melancholia here. And I argue that um, Heidegger presents a melancholic uh, account of death and uh, and his melancholy lies precisely in the fact that one is never done with one's own death right it just keeps returning uh, over and over again uh, for Hegel uh, the negative is always sublated only to reappear again uh, and so this seems more like mourning in Freud's sense where uh, you know, there we have a love object and uh, the love object uh, disappears and we withdraw cathexes from the object and we reorient our psychic topography and then reattach to a new love object, right? That's the dialectic uh, for Hegel is this process of attaching to a love object and withdrawing uh, the loss and reattaching, right? So it's this... Uh, never ending process uh, for Hegel. Um, and so then we can begin to think about sort of contemporary accounts of death and whether they're uh, mournful or melancholic or the way in which this antinomy gets solved. I don't spend a lot of time on this, but I propose that, for example, I think someone like Derrida uh, presents a dynamical solution to the antinomy. He thinks both sides are true. Um, and I think this is very clear in um, The Gift of Death, for example. Um, and then uh, my sort of contribution or the insertion of Deleuze here is that Deleuze is the only person who presents a um, mathematical solution to the antinomy. He thinks both sides are false, neither mourning nor melancholia. And he thinks both sides are false because... Both sides are predicated on a, a desire predicated on a lack. So if we replace desire predicated on a lack with productive desire, we get a new account of death that does not fall prey uh, to this antinomy or dissolves the antinomy. Um, so that's sort of, that's the whole book in a nutshell, sort of just working out uh, all of those steps, you know, first with the Heidegger and melancholia and then with Hegel and mourning. And then finally, uh, Deleuze, um, with a new account of desire, we get a new account of death. That was amazing. Thank you so much. That's, yeah, uh, sure. that's, I, you made me want to read the book. I hope to be able to get to it here in the next, uh, couple months and bring you back on, hopefully for a conversation where Mikey can also be here as well. Nance, do you have any closing, uh, thoughts or questions for, uh, Brent? No, I, I, I do think you were actually very clear um, in laying out, 
I guess, kind of the differences between anti-Oedipus and a thousand plateaus with regard to body without organs. And that's not an easy thing to do. So thank you for being able to, to lay that out. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to getting into, uh, your work and reading through it. Cause the last hour was very clear, very concise. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, it's been great and I'm happy to come back on anytime, uh, talk about death and desire or anything else uh, you might be interested in. Wonderful. And, you know, it's been an absolute honor. So thank you so much. Um, everybody will be right back after this for our conversation with Daniel from OG Rose. Brent, thank you so much. Take care. Yep. Thanks. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarricker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages, five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground has already put out eight courses, two books, one, my book, Time Energy, and the other, Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of Underground Theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive, so excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program and also make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. And we're live. Welcome, Daniel of OG Rose. So good to have you. How's it going, man? It is a pleasure. I am doing well, gentlemen. It's good to see you. So I, you know, I understand it's Deleuze's birthday. So I was going through my kids' toys and I found this body without organs. You can squeeze it. It's like a body without organs. I was going to set him on my shoulder as a parrot, but I didn't have a rubber band. I also have Grace's kitten. So I have two bodies without organs in celebration for Deleuze. Very happy about that. 
And um, I've, it's a pleasure to be here, gentlemen. I have to say, again, I, I finished the series, um, caught up last night on the on the value theory, labor theory, Henrik and everything with Mosin, really enjoyed it. And I think it, it actually has inspired me. Um, I've been thinking for a long time on how to think Leibniz and Marx together, where for Leibniz, we can only have intelligibility when we take into consideration geometry and situation. He talks about the analysis of Sittas. And I think basically also that's what you kind of see coming into question. Like we're always, our intelligibility is always situated. We are in a situation of capital or markets, which then we interpret all experience through. But you see, since we naturally understand in terms of algebra, if you will, points, not situations, we don't notice the entire situation because the brain works by translating things into points, which then makes you think that reality is points. So then you lose the entire network of intelligibility that is keeping you from experiencing. And it makes me think, too, like I know you talk about Heidegger and kind of getting to the grounds of intelligibility itself. Well, what's right. happening is socialization works basically by cutting us off from the grounds of intelligibility because it's terrifying. And then what it does is our brain by naturally bringing algebraic makes us then lose sight of that situation. So we don't realize we're cut off from that grounds of intelligibility. So then we're just intelligent. Uh, as we reduce everything to various exchange values or use values or algebraic values that don't require us to take into account the entire situation. Um, so I really, I've been enjoying that very much and it's a pleasure to be here today, gentlemen. <laughs> so good to have you. Yeah, this I so are you saying that you get that thing about points uh from Leibniz? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And you know, so Mr. Leibniz in his great debate with Descartes, which we can see is almost a debate between um geometry and, and algebra. And uh what, what Leibniz is kind of warning is that when I talk about the number two. Uh, I'm always talking about two things. There is no number two in reality. That is a abstract idea that arises from two phenomena that gives me a kind of model by which to understand reality. But I must never forget that it's not actually in reality. If I actually, for some reason, come to think that the number two is reality, then I'm inherently set up for what? A reductionism, a sort of reducing everything. And that's also what Marx is talking about when he talks about kind of the abstract notion of human labor. There's some sort of human labor as value that is behind everything that then you end up reducing everything to that human labor and then marx is kind of like um guys what what is that <laughs> what's this labor thing you're talking about but there's a reductionism and so what leibniz is warning is like hey um we have to remember that all intelligibility is situated i'm never dealing with just a point i am always dealing with an entire plane an entire situation and if you don't realize that then you lose sight of the fact that intelligibility is always um a result of some degree of human involvement so because what do we do with like the number two we go oh two is two regardless if there's a human regardless if there's anyone involved right well, Leibniz comes along and he's like, well, you know, actually, um, the very act of intelligibility always has a human element involved. And what ends up happening is if you lose sight of that, because the human is always in the situation that makes intelligibility possible, then you actually will disown the human involvement, which actually there still is a human involvement. So now you have a pathology. You're going to say, oh, well, you know, the numbers are just there. Oh, it's kind of like you were talking about where you read the Bible and that you don't acknowledge interpretation. Well, when you do that, you end up in trouble because what Leibniz is warning, he's like, by thinking that algebra is more primary or essential than geometry, you are basically saying there's a possibility of escaping interpretation. Well, then there's a whole lot of work that you don't have to do as a human being because you can just have the numbers give it to you. What he wants to say is that algebra, it is not that geometry is built out of algebra. It is that algebra is a reduction or a kind of a reduction of geometry. And likewise, what Marx wants to kind of point out is he says, you know, human, the abstract notion of human labor is a reduction of actual human labor into a notion that's kind of naked, but you are able to imagine it is there. Therefore, it is able to have an authority over you, which then you then disown your involvement in the creation of that authority, which creates pathology, right? So likewise, what we do is we take geometry, reduce it to algebra. Then we say algebra is more essential to geometry, which then we disconnect our involvement involvement in the algebra, then make it have authority over us. And now something reductionist, reductionistic has authority over us, which then, of course, removes the possibility of us coming to terms with the origin or basis of intelligibility, because we're not part of it. So, you know, there is no um, there is no origin of intelligibility. There's just intelligibility. 
crap. Mm. Well, now we're in trouble mm-hmm. then. That's when compression, I was become flattening. So Leibniz, I think, is very important. Um, I think the, the analysis of Sittas is an incredible work. Everything I know about Leibniz, I um, I owe to the great Anthony Morley, who wrote a tremendous book on um, on Leibniz that can be found on Amazon. I highly suggest it. And, um, and he talks about basically is he makes the example where he asks the question of if of what is sameness? Because if you think about it, nothing in reality is the same, right? You know, it always has a little bit of difference, right? But he says sameness is, the, is a way to describe something that you can confuse as something else if it's not in the same situation. So he talks about two temples that are completely identical. And they're identical because you wouldn't know which was which if you were just inside of them. Okay. In order to tell that they're different temples, you have to bring it to what he calls the same situation. Then you can see they're different because they're brought together, right? And it's either in the same mental state or it's the same geometrical space. But then what ends up happening is sameness is unveiled as similarity. But the funny thing about similarity is that it means there's a difference, right? So the weird thing is where is similarity located? Where is this similar that you're talking about, right? It's in the relation that you are identifying between the two different phenomenon. This brings to mind what Marx is saying about equivalence and um, relational. You know, when you suddenly bring to that, you're like, oh, the linen is the same as the coat. And you bring them together into the same situation. Where is this similarity between the linen and the coat that you're talking about? Where would you find this? When they're apart, it's easier to see them as exchangeable. Then you bring them together and you go, oh, these equal one another. Marx is basically asking, where does that equal sign come from? Like, where did the equal yeah. sign come from? This, this, Stanley, yeah, <laughs> this Stanley mug is the same price as this book, this underground theory book, like on Amazon. I'm just guessing, but you know, they're about the same price. What? You know, you hold them up yeah. to each other and it gets weird and disorienting, right? Well, the key is as Leibniz is asking, where does the equal sign come from? So Marx is asking, where does the equal sign come from? Because every equal sign unveils that they're not equal, that they're only similar. The very act of identifying sameness, which is the equal sign, is the act of showing they're not the same, which is really freaking weird. Because, you know, when Alex Ebert also in the Hegel anthology was talking about how in mathematics there's this debate, apparently, I, I'm not an expert in the field, where they're debating that if they should equal. get rid of the equal sign and replace it with equivalence because there really is no equal sign. Well, that's kind of what Marx is getting at. And he's suggesting that in order to create an equal sign that is not there, we have to treat things according to an abstract idea of labor where we say, oh, well, they're equal because of labor. Really? Uh, you know, so two hours of like uh, typing on a computer screen is worth eight hours of working on a car. Where does that judgment come from? Here's the key. Um, to cut ahead, Leibniz wants to say that all intelligibility requires a human judgment. You have to judge a similarity. And ultimately, he's saying that all metaphysics is basically the art of judging similarity. It's saying these are somehow similar. So likewise, in order to create the logic of capital, you have to find a similarity in phenomenon that actually is not there, but that you judge is there so that then they are intelligible to you, right? Well, here's the trick. That means human beings are the grounds of intelligibility in an act of judgment that they forget they have because they come to treat the price as objective beyond them, as not something that they are in. It just has that value. It just has that price. But actually, there's a relationship that it is necessary to be judged. But if that is the case, that means the human being is an active participant in the act of intelligibility, that then they disown their active involvement in treating capital as objective beyond them. Now, Marx points out that the only way abstract ideas have this kind of authority is if they have an objective manifestation in the real world that then can facilitate the idea back and forth, back and forth. All of this creates a what? a situation. That's what Leibniz is saying. All intelligibility is a result of a situation between the abstract and the concrete that are con- completely in a feedback loop with one another, which then, and then I'll pass it back to you, when the human realizes this, now we've opened up the possibility of the grounds of intelligibility. Now we go, wait a minute, I organize myself in the world according to the manner by which I judge it. Why do I judge it this way versus another way? Capital versus, say, time energy, totalitarian versus infinite or different things. Now all of that has been opened up. But 
to uh, to the defense of capital, one of the reasons we do this is because human beings are horrified by the abyssal. Like the moment you say, oh, I have an active role in the very means of intelligibility, then you have to ask yourself the question, why do I judge it X way versus Y way? And that requires all of the sort of anxiety that results of that, which then gets into why it's important to say read books the way you do, because you get used to not knowing, not understanding what's going on, training yourself due to that effort and working through that, which basically suggests that being open to the origin of intelligibility requires practices like reading books or different things like that. So I think it can help. To, um, to look at Marx in terms of Leibniz, the situation, analysts of Sittas, and to bring those kind of things together, because then you can see the entire situation that is an operation. Amazing. OK, so I want to back it up here. I want to say, first of all, that, uh, you know, this sounds like a, an excellent piece that you're working on, maybe multiple pieces. Maybe it'll be a book. Maybe it'll maybe it'll be something you submit to the value form anthology coming together in the October conference, you know, here at Theory Underground. Now, it's definitely welcome if you would want to do that. It sounds amazing. I like the way that you bring it together with Heidegger in terms of intelligibility, the background conditions of intelligibility, because when you're saying that everything's reduced to points. Uh, it's through this compression that is reductive. Um, I'm I'm thinking, of course, fallingness. We're thrown into fallingness, which is to say, taking our being to be present at hand. We're taking uh, what we are at our most base level to be, pretty much be objects. Right? It's a sort of objectification through compartmentalization. Through uh, what he says, uh, he says we we. We, we think that we could get, get an idea of the whole through this sort of piecemeal assembling of facts, right? And these facts are, of course, of ready to hand or non ready to hand situations, a, a non, oh, sorry, present in hand. I said ready to hand. But what I mean is like, a, you know, so when I say non present in hand, it's like, oh, well, that's not there. Therefore, it's not real. You know, maybe it was, but now it's not, uh, as opposed to, oh, that is there, that, therefore, that is real. Right. And so we just take that to be the kind of the law of of realness and value. Uh, and of course, what gets foreclosed is us, our being in the world, our entire the fact that we are responsible for that rendering intelligible and that we are uh, ontologically different and distinct from, say, these other objects that I'm waving around in the room because these objects are not responsible for holding open and maintaining the that responsible mode of comportment towards the world towards others right and and really rendering it intelligible like disclosing so it's like we're always in disclosing we're always rendering intelligible we always have some idea of what's right or wrong or what's better or worse or but we don't take responsibility for that right and of course there's at some point in everyone's life when there might be opportunities to, and you can make choices along that way, along that road. And, and sometimes it's not even a choice. Uh, maturity can be forced on somebody in a sort of sense. Um, but there is always in some, in some sense, an actual taking over interpretation. The book does not read itself to you. You are reading it and you come to it with a whole world of equipment. And if you haven't spent a lot of time surfacing that equipment and then trying to think, oh, is that those presuppositions, are they convenient? Are they self-congratulatory? Do they let me off the hook from actually having to wrestle with this? Is it just a way of simplifying it and putting it back into little boxes so that I can totalize it, as Levinas would say? Well, then, it's not going to really amount to much. It'll feel good in the moment, but what's the long-term payout? probably not good, right? And so this is, last time we had you on, you talked about reading and different ways of reading. And so I want to get into reading a little bit more. I want to talk a little bit about reading. You've been following along with Capital Mondays. You gave me a, a, a comment on that that was so long, I couldn't screenshot it and send it to Nance. And then I was like, oh, I'll just do it from the desktop and then I'll just do it that way. And then I, I never actually got it to him. Nance, did you see it? No. 
Okay, so we'll get to that in a minute, but I wanted to give Nance an opportunity to say some things because you were talking to Nance uh, prior to uh, going live, and he never got his chance to even respond to you. Um, and I don't even know what he was going to say. I don't even know if it re relates without you kind of restating what you had already said, but I kind of wanted to give him an, an opportunity here. No, I, I think, uh, so we were talking about effort and how um, th this contradictory notion of excellence without effort, how that kind of covers up um, conditions of, of possibility of, of, of things and I think with social media, it gets especially bad because things are just presented as like, oh, here's this thing for your consumption. And and it always covers up um, the origin of these things. And it, I think it does go hand in hand, um, definitely with Heidegger and, and with Leibniz. Um, and it's exciting. The last couple of days I've been trying to write um, about chapter three of Being in Time, which we'll be going over this Saturday. Division um, two. Division two, yeah, Div division two, chapter three. Um, and I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, I guess, this idea of co-responsibility um, and how we have to acknowledge our own co-responsibility, but we also have to be aware of, of um, others and their responsibility for what we're seeing. So when we see excellence, but we see that, the concealed effort or the the attempts to conceal the effort. Uh, I think that's a particularly malicious ideological operation that's happening. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. Leibniz. I definitely need to read some Leibniz. I've been wanting to read for a while now. We've, we've been talking about it and we haven't gotten around to it, but now we have even more reason to do so. Well, marvelous. So a, a few things. First off, I like to actually imagine that Raypoint, um, your book Waypoint is reading itself to me on the new audio aud aud audible. So, you know, uh, but I but I love that point that you're you're saying. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, so first off, um I think there's a weird way where perhaps on this idea that we want there's almost a way in which we want things to be algebraic and points, because then we understand them without effort, because our brain just naturally gets it. And there's a way in which, you know, in Christianity, you talk about the virgin birth. It's almost like we want virgin greatness where it's just there it, and the boy ex nihilo. And likewise, we want things to just ex nihilo be fully understood. Now, I think this aligns with, frankly, the pleasure principle. And Cadell at the month of libido at Philosophy Porter was talking about how the brain is always sexed in the sense that it's always seeking pleasure. And one of the reasons we're prone to algebra is because algebra is pleasurable. It's pleasurable to understand. I understand this bookcase. Oh, I understand that there is either greatness or not. Not a complicated process of sacrifice, life, and time that brings an entire situation that's harder to understand, involves risk, and all other factors. No, 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 no. There's just virgin greatness. It's just ex nihilo, baby. So then I understand it. And then I automatically understand my location in the social hierarchy. I'm better, I'm worse, done. Nothing to think about. So the brain is naturally prone to what I what I was talking about as compression, where you compress and you compress things. And that's just basically live. As I understand, I'm no Levinas uh, expert, so I appreciate the work you're doing, Dave, on the notion of totality. So the brain finds totality pleasurable because it's pleasurable to understand. And as we learned from Mr. Peirce uh, in Ethics of Belief, the brain is primarily in the business of getting rid of that horrible itch of not understanding. Well, totality gets rid of that itch. Likewise, saying that greatness is just there or not gets rid of that itch. And everything is gradually turned into algebraic because it is more pleasurable. This means rationality is in service of pleasure in this kind of reductionist way. Now, we're not saying pleasure is bad and work is good, but there's a higher form of joy that is possible through effort. But the brain can't even conceive that if it is stuck in a form of com compression, that then here's the key. What we like, you know, we like compression. And James K.A. Smith has a lovely book where he says, you are what you love. And what he means is that we love tends to form our habits. So when we love something, we tend to form habits around it. And that thus translates into our character. Well, here's the problem. When we compress everything, which we enjoy because it makes it understandable, then we come to create habits around that compression. And then the compression, the inevitable, because like you were saying, Dave, with Levinas, totality, all language, all thought, everything has a tendency toward totality, right? Which also means it's uh, naturally toward cutting us off from Heidegger's origin, as I'll call it, grounds of intelligibility. Everything is naturally toward cutting us off from the origin. Well, here's the problem. It's pleasurable to cut ourselves off from the origin because that creates understanding. Then we create habits around doing that. And then in those habits, compression becomes a permanent flattening 
and we all become cartoon characters, as we were saying last time, and then lose the capacity to know that we have flattened everything into car cartoon characters. And then reality becomes algebraic, objectively, quote unquote, because we lose the capacity to think an alternative. And so this is why it becomes extremely important to resist the natural tendencies of the brain, which requires us to believe in effort, process, geometry, as opposed to just magic. It just is or it is not. Now, um, it's very interesting, too, because there's something about as well that if you entertain the category of, I'll say, effort versus maybe I'll say work, where in capitalism, you can have work, you can have a job, but you can't do effort. OK, well, work then is intelligible, OK, because it's within the system of getting a job and it's paid for it. Effort is not intelligible. Why in the world would you be reading these books so closely if you're not getting paid for it or anything? So effort is not intelligible. It is precisely because it is not intelligible that it is then the road back to the origin. It is then the road outside of the logic of capital, which then creates a kind of game theory dynamic where if everyone does what is rational, they end up in a suboptimal result. It is outside of that. But you see, here's the trick. I think there's a difference. There is this kind of idea today that, oh, we have to get out. We have to get outside of cap. We have to get outside of the system. We have to rebel. You know, there's kind of that emphasis, right? Here's the problem. The real revolution is from algebra to geometry. And the problem is without process and effort, there's no possibility of geometry. You are stuck in algebra. You can be individually expressing yourself all day long. You can be doing your own, you know, your own kind of individualization or your own kind of like pleasure principles. But here's the problem. If it is algebraic, it is not a revolution. It is still in service of the point thought or the totality that has led to the Nash equilibrium. So this means the following. The only way basically to have a real revolution or a real reformation has to be something more geometrical and meaningfully geometrical. That's a process, that's effort, that's time. You're now bringing a temporality into the picture, right? But it's a temporality that is not merely the passing of clock time, but a structuring of the subject, almost in the Lacanian time, that then opens up the horizon of geometry, which then necessitates the revelation that you are an active subject in the interpretation of intelligibility. Ergo, we're back to the origin. Without process, you cannot individuate in a manner that is non-algebraic, thus outside the logic that is capturing people, thus unveiling the origin that we need in order to actually have an intelligible and real transformation of the system into geometry, thus instead of a 2D cartoon character, which is algebraic, a full human being. So pro because it's also processed in a meaningful way. You know, it's not going to do simply to have the passage of time, right? There has to be a building of time. There's a dip, right? Well, the only way that's a building of time is effort, compounding. So building of time, here's the key. When you're building time, you're changing it from something algebraic, one, two, three, four, sequential, you know, spurious infinity. When you're building time, you're giving it what? Dimensions. It's becoming geometrical. So now you have something that can be infinitely building as opposed to sections of totalities. Because here's the irony. Clock time is just one totality following the next. One minute totality, two minute totality, three minute totality, four minute t -t totality. If all you have is the passage of time, it's just the following of a sequence of totalities. In order to get an infinity, you have to be building on time. And that requires effort. And if you do not do that, you cannot have a real revolution to a new grounds of intelligibility in terms of geometry, which will be getting to terms to origin, which will be getting to the possibility of the structuring of a subject in a manner that is able to handle the anxiety of that very origin. And reading is a great way to do that. <laughs> I take it you like math. No, actually, me, Panther, there in the chat said, I'm going to go out on a limb by guessing that Daniel loves Plato and Aristotle. Um, is that true? Do you love Plato and Aristotle? I, 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 I never want, I have a great, great respect for the founding members, you know, to disown the fathers means there's probably some pathology. I do think that Plato is mostly cheaply read. And I, I think uh, Aristotle actually needs to be read in terms of phenomenology. 
and Good. to see Good. all of his books as part mm -hmm. of a progression, not merely separated books that have nothing to do with one another. So I'd like to talk about Aristotle's chain. And I think it's important to understand that Plato's forms are not idealistic versions, but more like the orbits of planets, according to which things formulate. So I think there's a lot to be learned in those thinkers. Yeah, which is really good because I've been thinking a lot about ideals um, and how they're real. And yeah, we I even think there's a way to argue that they are objective um, in their form, in their form, not in their content. And uh, I just did a little impromptu lecture on that yesterday uh, for some, my students because, you know, the, the class, the topic is, is college worth it? And uh, your lovely wife, Michelle Garner, there in the chat actually just interviewed mine uh, and Snellgrove McCarricker and that they both had this conversation that just went up on Spotify last night. And so the interview was yesterday. It went from interview to publish like so fast turnaround. I was like, whoa, my God. And so I listened to most of it actually this morning before getting going with this stream. I was like, it was like at 4.30, 5 a.m. I was listening to it while getting set up, you know. Um, and uh, where am I going with this? I wanted to say, Oh, yeah. So they were talking about this course. Uh, is college worth it? And Anne is, has been a discussion leader for it, an adjunct um, instructor for this course. And you know, it's like 100 students. And then there's the breakout sessions. And the breakout sessions is arguably like the most important part. It's where the, 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 the bigger plenary lecture is sort of digested. But also there is like this, you know, outside of the discussion component, there is, you know, on the adjunct instructor like this responsibility to kind of contextualize things and to kind of like bring it make it more meaningful for for the students in this smaller group capacity and so um you know that gives me a lot of license which is nice because like with my second version of that class i was just kind of i was already i was hungry and i kind of just spent more time in the discuss discussion mode getting them to talk amongst themselves and stuff like that you know whereas in the first I was on fire, man. But I was going off about this idea of uh, the ideal uh, student, right? The, this this is something that gets talked about uh, at Boise State, uh, specifically in this course. Yeah, Anne helped, by the way, put this course together when she was still a student. She was actually there building this course out with uh, the the main professor, um, and so I wanted to give her that credit. But the uh, one of the things that they do from this sort of sociological background is to say that the ideal learner is a social construction and that it is, you know, we, we lose touch with, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, this ideal that we're holding ourselves up against might not really be one based in reality two realistic and three that it might, uh, it might be classed. It might be racialized. It might be uh, all of these different things. So, for instance, if the ideal student is easily able to uproot and go to a different university, this is the language they use. I don't. I mean, literally, the professor uses that language of uprooting, which is funny because I don't realize that they understand the connotations there. But, um, but yes, this this globalizing uprooting. You know, no, that's actually what's going on there, right? It's just, but the ideal model is like the the person who's able to just leave. Uh, leave their family, leave their, their hometown, like whatever, right? So uh, not everyone's able to do that, right? The ideal student also lives on campus. Not everyone's able to do that. Uh, the ideal student gets involved with everything because they don't have to work a job, right? So you go down this this line of things. And so, you know, the takeaway from it, I mean, there's time constraints on the lectures. Who knows how much more nuance we could have gotten into, uh, but where it was left at is it's a social construction. It's made up. It's bullshit. Don't beat yourselves up, kids. You know, and that was kind of the professor's position. And I was like asking them about, you know, the idea of well, the, the question itself is college worth it? You know, um, and one of the things that I was getting from everyone's thinking about this so far is that this is relative and or subjective and that people are using these two terms really to say therefore kind of make it what you want it's unimportant which to me is a huge problem now, you've read time energy so you obviously know there's a section in there where i take on this idea that the subjective is somehow 
less real or, or whatever, or that it's just pure fancy or, or feeling. Um, and so what I was bringing in was like the idea that, yeah, so at the subjective level, there's whim, there's fancy, there's will, there's desire, there's bias, there's standpoint, all of these things. And, you know, students, I was getting the students to kind of answer those things out, right? Um, but then I was like, well, wh what about relative? What's different with relative, the word relative? And the thing is, is all of their answers to the word relative were the same as their answers to the word subjective. And the interesting thing about that is like, well, yeah, when we're talking about something being in reference to the self, in that case, then sure, it's subjective in a sort of sense. But of course, you also have objective needs, and those are in relation to the self. And you could say that your feelings about those are subjective, and you could say that your desires about those are subjective, but that doesn't make them less real, right? In fact, and then so then I use that to kind of like scale out the idea of relativity. Well, what else is this question? Is college worth it relative to? And so we get into things such as community, family, society, uh, goals, standards. And then because of goals and standards, I get into ideals. And then I tie ideals back into uh, the ideal student. And then I say, even if it is a social construction, is it not in it, you know, is, is it not real? So let's just say that the, the content of the ideal student is bullshit. Let's just, let's just say it's completely made up by the, the, the McDonaldization of the university. Does that mean that the form of the ideal student is therefore also just constructed in bullshit? And my answer would be no, because there are objective needs and requirements for having a society, for having a community, for having a culture, for having a family, for having a self, for having any kind of meaningful relations within any of those things, right? That means that the ideal student as a form is objective in some sense because it actually holds together your ability to navigate and maintain or build, because you might not even have, all of those things. And so just this is I, I only went so far into the details of this because, first of all, it relates to the whole conversation about is college worth it? I want everybody to check out that conversation between Michelle and Anne. We will link it in the description and in the live chat in a minute. Um, but also because ideals do relate uh, and they're, they're relative to situations and two certain objectives, and two certain questions such as the good life, or whatever, but that we are creatures for whom ideals matter. And so there is this kind of naive, materialistic approach that just says, oh, anything in language, anything in ideas, anything in philosophy, it's all just idealism, that doesn't matter, viva la revolution, let's go, let's go, material, material, let's change, let's change. And it's like, yeah, but if you don't realize that the human creature is a creature for whom ideals are real and matter and, and in a material way, then we're fucked. And so using that all then to set you up, I want to hear your Neoplatonism a little bit more in reference to, in reference to kind of how I'm talking about it, where you probably go in some other direction. Who knows? I just want to see. Oh, delightful. So a few things come to mind. Um, your ideals must have the possibility of proving you wrong. The issue is that people have ideals that can't prove them wrong. Flannery O'Connor also had a lovely line where he said, she said, the truth will set you free by making you weird. The problem is we have ideals that don't make us weird, as in other, as in different from the logic of the society, which means we're then stuck in service of, say, the Nash equilibrium. So uh, the problem is a lot of times, when you hear people critiquing ideals or different things like that, they're critiquing the algebraic version of it or the form version of it, which then is a version that exists because of the system of algebraic exclusivity that the university system may have come to teach. So then it's identifying a problem with a problem that creates because of the, the modes of thinking that it is created that cuts you off from the origin, right? So there is a problem with an ideal that is a point that puts you outside of relation and that puts you outside of cost to yourself. If my ideal is to have power over everyone else or to have a position that then reifies the system of exclusion or that keeps people poor or whatever or so forth, 
this is the problem. But if my ideal forces me to work against the structure of rationality that is keeping me entrapped and thus makes me weird and thus makes me feel wrong because you're going to feel wrong if you're trying to operate outside of the logic of careerism or whatever, so forth. This is a valuable idea, ideal. So the key is to have ideals that make you strange, ergo non-rational. And you see, basically the point of, in my opinion, the point of the university uh, should be to help people avoid Nash equilibria. Um, in a sense, the university should exist to help the universe from being suboptimal. And what I mean by a Nash equilibrium is the notion that, um, and I spoke with my beloved uh, Lorenzo about this, another term for it is I call it a rational impasse, which is a situation that if everyone is rational, you end up with a suboptimal result. And there's that lovely scene in the movie Beautiful Mind where John Nash is saying, if we all go for the prettiest girl in the bar, we don't get any dates. So the best outcome is actually to go for the not as pretty girl in the bar, right? So it seems, but here's the problem. Game theory is taught as, well, actually, that just means that the most rational thing to do is to go for the other girls, not the most beautiful. This is a terrible, in my opinion, interpretation because you're moving it to the systems layer level away from the individual experience. The individual experience is that you're doing Doing something crazy. You're doing something non-rational. Now, here's the key. What is non-rational at the time feels irrational, but actually it's non-rational because it opens you up to the optimal result. So there's a difference between rational, irrational, and non-rational. OK, and the non-rational is what gets you out of a rational impasse and how you get an optimal result that is beyond the horizon that is given you by the mode of intelligibility that you have absorbed. OK, so the non-rational is always what gets you closer to the origin. I'm using origin in line with Heidegger, the grounds of intelligibility, which without the non-rational, it is inevitable that you are cut off from the origin because rationality ultimately always becomes a structure that reifies itself by its own assumptions of what constitutes the good life. So the function of the university should be to keep people out of rational impasses individually, societally, everything, which means it gives you the ability to identify non-rational decision-making, which requires bravery, courage, discernment, wrestling, effort. The moment you start talking about non-rationality, by definition, it's geometrical. By definition, because there has to be an entire situation that does not give you in its facticity the, rest, the correct course of action, you have to think about it. When you go into that beautiful mind example, the facticity tells you go for this girl. But if you think about it, ergo Leibniz situation, you go, actually, that's not the best result because then nobody's going to get a date this evening. Like the prisoner's dilemma, all these things. You step back as an active unit and condition the situation non-rationally to make possible the best result. This is the function of the university. This is the function of defining the form according to which to formulate in an ideal fashion that does not lead to a rational impasse. And I basically think I'm not an expert on Neoplatonism or anything like that, but I have a notion that basically there is something about the grounds of intelligibility found in the one that is a way to access the one that we're often cut off from because our notions of intelligibility are separated from the one, therefore they're suboptimal as opposed to non-rational. Now, this would require me different th to go into different things, um, but I would also note one of the keys, like you're talking about the subjective versus the objective divide, et cetera, so forth. The word subjective is an algebraic term automatically. So the moment you use that language, you're off because there's a point, the subject, independent of the objective. Well, that's algebraic. So the language is incorrect automatically. And this is the problem. You must pay attention. Uh, so advice for reading, uh, you know, in talking, you must pay attention to the background assumed by the term in order for it to be intelligible. The only way the word subjective is intelligible is as a term that makes you independent of situation. There's no such thing as a world independent of situation. Therefore, this term is a problem. Maybe there's another word we need to look for. I like to talk about conditionalism. And what I mean by that is I have in mind, say, in praise of, let me make an example because I think the Japanese philosophers are good at this. Um, so in praise of shadows, what is a shadow? A shadow, is possible because you have an object blocking light. It's conditioned to create a certain effect. You, in architecture, he talks a lot about in Praise of Shadows of Architecture, you have to design the room in a certain way so that shadows are created. Well, this is very interesting because it's a combination of a human with objects. You are conditioning the environment to create a certain effect. 
Conditionalism is the middle ground, if you will, between subject and objective thinking. And the truth of the matter is that we are perpetually undergoing conditionalism. I like the word condition, too, because that's like going to the gym. When you read a book, you're conditioning yourself to experience the world in a different condition, back and forth, back and forth. Conditionalism is the truth of reality. And it's also like a veil. Like, there's a lot of things like this. Like, think about a work of art. A work of art is like a painting is a giant testament to conditionalism. You have to get all the, the paint in the right spot, in the right location, one false move. One, if, if Van Gogh is doing a paint and he goes, oops, the whole thing is ruined. So it has to be perfectly, skillfully conditioned, which must be a process. There's no way you get conditionalism without a process, ergo effort, that then if you are successful, creates a what? An effect, painting. The subject object divide does not exist in the work of art. There, it, it's, in, it's meaningless to discuss about those differences because the subject conditions the object to be a certain way that then conditions them to be capable of so conditioning reality back and forth and back and forth. It, there is truth to the idea, if by subjective, you mean a algebraic entity separate from situation that just interprets reality, yeah, that's a problem, but there's no such thing as just interpreting reality. There is conditioning reality, but not like a voodoo magic trick. There is conditioning reality through what? Time. Effort is the magic. The only way to have the magic transformation of objective reality is according to the effort of conditioning it, which in turn conditions yourself to be capable of so conditioning reality and experiencing it in accordance with that higher, more earned conditionality. And that's, I think, when we talk about object, you know, when people said um, objective, what they meant is, you know how we talk about my objective today is to eat lunch? It meant a process. There's something to get to. That would be one thing. But you see, what the if, if by objective, we said you need to be objective, if by that we meant you need to make your object getting to the thing itself, which, by the way, you suck at getting at because you're stuck in totality instead of infinity, thus meaning your objective is to get to the infinity of things, that would be one thing. But that's not what we mean. We mean objective, generally, we mean objective as an independent of subjective involvement. But the funny thing about this is that there is no such thing as, as points or objects independent of subjective conditioning. They all exist relative to subjective conditioning. Because the moment you say, even if you take a tree, which exists without human beings, the moment you say tree, you have conditioned it according to the intelligibility of the word tree. So it's so to talk about intelligibility without human involvement, I don't want to say is to talk about nothing, but it is to talk about something instantly within a human intelligibility of which what you're trying to do is say human intelligibility. Now back out, human. Back out quickly. Back out as quickly as you can. Well, guess what? Here's the funny thing about that. The closest we can get to objectivity is through a process called the scientific method. There's only one way we've ever kind of gotten close to something like regular regularity in, in, in result, the scientific method. But that's a process, not an algebraic uh, comprehension. You do a process of saying, every time we drop the ball, it seems to fall. Okay, there's a process that then gives you not certainty, but reason to think that balls tend to fall when you drop them. But do note, if you were on the moon and dropped a ball, it would float. So the law of nature would be a little different, right? So even that is kind of conditioned. But there's something about science giving you a relative reliability, but that reliability is a result of a process, not an instantaneous, not an instantaneous, effortless apprehension of things in their facticity, right? There is no such thing as reliability without process. So here's the thing. If you want to be a reliable human being, it's going to take some effort. If you want to be a reliable human being that's able to reliably comprehend and experience reality according to higher conditionalities, it's going to require effort regularly, which then creates that process of conditioning. So I think basically, and then I guess the last thing I'll say, and then I'll give it back to you, is we just simply don't ever experience thinking in terms of points. Like think about, like it's always geometrical, which would then create, re which would then create reason to think this geometrical conception of human life is more accurate. Because think about when you dream. Has anyone ever dreamed not a world? Like just a thing floating in some sort of vacuum, right? Thinking always worlds. It always seeks a world to contextualize the point so that is intelligible. You can't, and here's the funny thing about a dream. A dream shows you that even when you're not experiencing the world, 
thought naturally seeks a world, right? Because it creates a context in which makes points intelligible. So when you're talking about, oh, you need to be objective, as if it's possible for thought to not world, as if it's possible for intellig intelligibility to create points that are independent of relation, there's no such thought. We don't even see it in dreams. The key is not to leave the subject behind, but to figure out how to condition the worlding of thoughts with the world that thought is making intelligible in a manner that makes it more of an infinity than a totality, but that requires effort and work because the brain is not naturally so conditioned. The, natu the brain is naturally conditioned according to the, the pleasure principle to seek an understanding that turns a compression into a flattening and then you lose the capacity to know it's even been flattened. So I think it, you have to work against those tendencies. That's very well said. Yeah. Conditionalism. I'm a condition. I'm a conditionalist and I didn't even know it. I'm a hundred percent, hundred percent down with that. And honestly, all of the thinkers I think that we like are conditionalists in, in their own ways. You, you could write a great book, I'm sure, called Conditionalism, A History of Continental Philosophy and a Critique of Analytic. You know, I don't know. Maybe analytics are learning conditionalism. I don't know. I've not, I'm not hip with everything right now, but when I was in an analytic department and I was wondering what the hell they were all talking about, when I, whenever I could figure it out, I was like, oh, the reason I'm so confused is because they don't care about condition. They don't care about structure. They don't care about environment. They don't care about context. They don't care about history. They don't care. And I'm like, how the fuck do you guys not care about all this stuff? I, you, I don't know. I, they're doing very important work. I, 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 believe, I believe it. I just don't understand it. I need to. That's part of my longer life you know, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not responsible for having to really square that circle. I am, uh, in my own journey, I have to figure it out because they care about epistemology. Continental philosophers don't. I think that that actually matters. It, what's real doesn't fucking matter if we're not also thinking about how do we know what's real? And also the expanded definition of we. In that case, how do we know gets us into social epistemology? And then, of course, because the conditions for knowing together are so problematic today, that's why we get into critical social epistemology, which is a course that will hopefully be taught here at Theory Underground next year by Samuel Lonkar of Becoming Human. He is the vanishing mediator of this conversation. He was going to be here and that was the original goal was to introduce you to, and I wanted to see what would happen around questions as to the human, post-humanism, transhumanism, you know, wh whether the human is something worth preserving or not, uh, it, like the whole thing. I was really excited for that conversation, but it has been moved, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else, to February 22nd at the exact same time that this session is happening at. So the next big epic marathon stream at theory underground is going to be on february 22nd and we're going to be all things assuming all things go well right uh we'll be doing it with uh with daniel with samuel uh nance and a whole bunch of other people uh by the way i've got you got a bunch of love coming at you from the comment section people are saying that your energy is infectious even nance said dude i fucking love daniel with like i don't know a lot of exclamation points um martin heidegger said who is daniel well, Daniel is this OG Rose guy you see here on the screen. He is one half of OG Rose. Michelle Garner in the chat is the other half. I shared a link to the interview where Michelle is interviewing Anne, my wife. So that it was, it, I think it was called Cute Theory Couples is the name of their, it's, it's called Cute Theory Couples and uh, Critique of Education or something like that. And so uh, definitely check that out. And uh, me, Panthers, said that you are the Goggins of philosophy. Damn, I was going for that title, but you, it's true. You've won. You've won. You get it. Hats off. But um, I want to get into uh, Waypoint. I want to get into the idea of sustained effort and how the condition of sustained effort is time energy. But of course, there's also like this sort of reciprocally determinative relationship there where we could also then say that time that sustained effort is also the condition of time energy itself, um, that this is a kind of time that has to be built, that this is geometric time, as opposed to the point time that we deal with is this algebraic time, uh, and that is the time of the clock, it's the time of the bus, it's the time of labor power, um, but we can't get into that. We don't have time to get into that, and so that's 
me, I just gave you all the cliff notes of a conversation that I hope to have with Daniel. Um, there is an opening later today. Maybe we could bring you back on. I'll send you the, the time. We can see if that would work. But I wanted to give it over here to Nance to say some stuff. I don't know. You guys got like a full on like six minutes here. Nance, I'm hoping that you can kind of just reflect on all of this stuff. Uh, if you want to turn it into a question or not, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to go get some more of my decaffeinated coffee. You think after a conversation with Daniel that I need caffeine? No, no. I said I'm doing this naturally today. So I'll be right back. I'll be listening. So actually, I, I do have a, a quick question before hopefully we can just go a little back and forth. But every time we talk, I want to ask you if you know who Hanu Rajanemi is. No, I do not. I, I I need to, apparently. He's a Finnish, um, <clears throat> Finnish mathematician who does some interesting stuff with game theory. And I he interests me. He he writes math and he also writes fiction. Um, but he's interested. And it it every time I always go there when when you get going. Um oh. but I I love the subject list. Ness. I've a lot of the time I just kind of make recourse to saying things are super subjective. Um, and I kind of use that as a defeater for the binary position of subjective and objective. Um, because everything is conditional, everything is contextual, everything does depend on the structure that supports what it is. Um outside of ideal forms. And actually, another thing I uh I read the Timaeus. A few months ago and i was and i've been trying to convince dave that we need to read the timaeus and i i think you helped do that I, I i do think um i want to engage more seriously with plato um and i think of course i don't know i just it, i love it man i think there's a lot of synergy going on um maybe it's zeitgeist maybe it's great minds think alike i don't know what it is um but effort um conditions of possibility conditions of intelligibility background environment um all of it it's it just kind of screams to me in a way that like of course this is the case but it seems like institutions don't want us to be able to engage with these deep structures um of all the things that are in our world they, they want us to be very superficial they, they want us to interact with appearances with surfaces um, and it's not like they, you know, it, it is just the market logic, like things have to be algebraic points rather than kind of like dense interconnected nodes in a web of, of just interdependent. I don't know. I don't want to get too delusion. We were, <laughs> but, but it is like, everything is flowing. Everything is constantly in flux. Um, nothing is concrete and we shouldn't settle, uh, when we're being told that things are always just kind of concrete objectivities in themselves. Um, and I love it, man. I, I, I really do. Every time we talk it, I just, I get so amped. Um, cause you just have like a, a, a thirst for knowledge that it really is infectious. Like it, 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 it truly is. I, I need to go read. I need to go write. Like I, I'm on fire right now. Thank you so much. Well, oh, goodness, Nance, that means the world. And, uh, you know, a few things. First, thank you for that reference. I always appreciate that. I'll look that up. That's wonderful. Um, second, I, I think one of the, there are people that talk about like relations, you know, a whitehead, you know, Deleuze, um, different things like that. The issue is a reason I like conditionalism because that's relation with effort. You know, condition is like a gem. And one of the things that can happen is if you take seriously that re relations are ontological, but you don't condition yourself to be ready for that reality, you can be overwhelmed by what Lacan says the real. So there's a certain work that has to occur, which makes me think of, I guess, Canto 21 in the Paradiso where Beatrice is with Dante. And Dante's like, why won't you smile? And Beatrice is like, well, at this point, if I smile, it will reduce you to ash. Heaven will suddenly become Lovecraft. Likewise, there's a certain work Dante has to go through to get to the place where he can handle more joy, ergo relation, ergo more that. So we have to think about effort. And I do think that if we're going to emphasize relation, which I do think is 
deepest reality because it's geometrical, then it must be paired with a notion of effort. And that gets into things like reading and work. And indeed, I think there was, you know, Samuel, you know, like his work on the on Kuhn is extraordinary. And that that's exactly what he's putting forth with Kuhn is a kind of relational structure of science, a process. That's what we have to think. This is all process. Process is relation plus effort. And that is what we have to think to condition ourselves ready for it. And um, and the last thing I will say, um, and I also think there's a lot to be talked about with Michelle Planier, with personal knowledge. I think there was an entire movement of philosophy that I call the modern counter enlightenment that was missed with your Fondains, your Blondels, your Planiers, the Japanese philosophers who get into this, but they were overlooked. Because when the um, tyranny of algebra takes over, anyone who's introducing geometry gets ignored from the conversation. And that's a problem. But the last thing I was going to say as before we go, and this has been a treat, and I always really look forward to speaking with you, is um, one of the things on the concept of reading, when I try to write a paper, I read a book, I try to imagine that thinker over my shoulder or giving them the paper. And the reason I do is because we all, when we're talking with people that agree with us, we tend to kind of silo and our thinking gets kind of lame, just like you become a little lazy in conversation. But when you speak with someone different, you become a little more thoughtful. Likewise, I never want to write a paper on Marx that if I hand it to Marx, he would read and look up at me and say, do you really think I'm this stupid? Like, do you really think I'm this dumb and wouldn't have thought of this? Like, and like Leibniz, Hume. And to me, when you think about writing and reading as I'm going to tell the writer what I think their book means, it calls you to a higher standard and it calls you to working uh, a little bit deeper. And what I wanted to say is I think that if Marx was to receive a paper on the work that you've done so far, he'd be like, this is wonderful. So well done to you, because that's not easy to achieve. But Nance, this has been a pleasure. Best of luck with the best of the live stream. I always enjoy it very much, my friend. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, we actually. This Monday, we we had a really interesting uh, occurrence that went down on our Capital Mondays. Um, dude, 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 dude. And- I was like, I was like, you cannot leave before we tell you what happened because you were just saying all of this stuff. So, Nance, you're going right where I was hoping you would go because I was like running upstairs. I was like, I can't miss Daniel saying goodbye. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Damn Keurig. It takes we, so long. We we had a moment where um, I, I, I we were challenged. Um, we were called upon to um, return to the spirit of the task, which we undertook because I... I I had gotten a bit lazy. Uh, I think Dave would tell you that he himself, he felt he had got a bit lazy and we had an interesting opportunity to uh, raise our standards, raise our effort. And I do think it was successful. I think coming out of the back end of it, um, it ultimately ended in an amicable disagreement that um, I think we have buy-in to, to, to stay engaged. Um, but I already feel like the challenge that I bring um to defend my initial position is already stronger because I've spent, you know, I spent a few hours the other day talking about it and I've spent a few days thinking about it at the background. Um, and that just, I guess the form of what we're doing is um, demanding this effort in, in, uh, in the pursuit of excellence. You know, I, I, I don't ever want to um, believe that, that will be achieved. I, I think it will be an ongoing, unending effort. Um, and I'm excited for for that episode to come out because it was it was great. And it was very ser- serendipitous, too. Um, so for people who are into um, coincidence and serendipity, I think it'll be a pleasant surprise as well. Oh, well, that sounds magnificent. And uh, I look forward to it. Well, by putting yourself with the person who disagrees, form becomes formulation. You move from an algebraic thinking with yourself to a geometric situation where form becomes formulation. And without that formulation, then we can't develop to the fullness of the human being. So I I look forward to that. And gentlemen, I enjoyed this immensely. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Nance. It's been it's really been a treat. Thank you so much for being here. It was an honor. Take care. Best to you, gentlemen. All the best. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time-energy theory, 
critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. Seriously. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarricker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages, five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground has already put out eight courses, two books, one, my book, Time Energy, and the other, Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of Underground Theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive. So excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program and also make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. I'm turning the screen back on to just me. All right, everybody, welcome to the stream. How about that, huh? How about that? How was that for everybody? How are you all doing, huh? We're going to fill time for a moment here. I'm going to move some things around. We've got a minute before we're joined by Ashley. I think she should be here any moment, I suspect. I suspect Nance is going to be right back. How's it going, chat? How's it going, everybody? This is not being recorded except in the totality of the live stream, but this is uh, sort of between recordings. All right, here we go. So let me go ahead and bring Ashley on right now and then change the speaker view. She's here, everybody. All right, Ashley, welcome, welcome. We are live. How are you doing? Oh, I'm all right. I'm just trying to make sure my video is all right. There we go. Hello. There we go. <laughs> hey, so good to see you. Hold on one moment. I'm going to start the recording button here. We are live, but I'm also doing a separate recording. And so that'll be its okay. own independent video that will go up later. So three, two, one. Welcome everybody to Theory Underground. I'm your host, David McCarricker. We've got Nance here as the co-host and representative of the student base at Theory Underground. And today we are joined by Ashley Frowley. How are you doing, Ashley? Yeah, not too bad. How are you? Fantastic. Really glad we were able to make it work. So sorry about the confusion. Last time when I said next week and I, and I did not mean to say next week, I meant, yeah, it was this week. <laughs> 
And and I also said next week, and I just I maybe it was just wishful thinking. I was like, yeah, plenty of time. Anyways, <laughs> it's all yeah. good. Is that a, a real bookcase behind you, or is this one of those? Uh... No, my actual books are here next to a very, very messy, <laughs> messy <laughs> mess uh, of an office. So no, this I don't even know what this is. It looks like there's like, it looks like there's what you call it, um, price tags. So I, I think that it <laughs> it's actually a picture of a of a book a bookstore, but it's better than the actual thing, which is a mosquito net and a door behind me. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. And are you, and are you in Athens, Greece right now? I'm in Greece. Yeah. I, I live in Evia. In Evia. Cool. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> um, we wanted to bring you on just as a follow-up from last time last year when I was doing the course site launch and you were able to join, but not for very long. Um, but also as a way of, you know, Hey, everybody, we're going to Europe and Ashley is in Greece. And we're going to be doing an event with her there. Um, we haven't really talked out too many of the details at the moment. There's some kind of a vague idea that we'll be talking about one another's works or presenting on stuff related to our works. Um, but you've got a venue. There's stuff that you've done there before. Is that right? Yeah. So I've worked with the uh, Hellenic American Union in the past and also the Free Thinking Zone. So I've been in touch with them. But um it's been a bit a bit slow, but I'm I'm confident I'll figure something out. We'll figure something out, and it'll it'll happen. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, there's there's uh there's been complications in the trying to make our plans. We were supposed to have the tickets like two weeks ago, but uh, there's several people on different points of the journey who are um they're they're trying to nail things down, but it's it's hard, you know, this far out and. Uh, but also the, the, that's why the tickets are so much cheaper right now. And so um, we're trying to yeah. figure that all out. But what I wanted to start out with is I wanted to talk about the fact that you have started a YouTube channel here. I think over the last couple of years, you've been putting up content on your own. You Because when I was originally becoming acquainted with you, it was through the work that you were doing on Sublation Media and with Doug Lane. And I know you still do a lot of stuff with him. There's a conversation that I... I want to watch uh, where you guys are talking about uh, Russell Brand. Um, haven't gotten to it yet. Maybe we can touch on that a little bit. But I mainly want to just like give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and your work and what you're working on and talk a little bit about your channel and what you've been up to there. Sure. So I'm a sociologist. I'm not a philosopher or <laughs> theorist. Uh, although, you know, when I was doing my PhD, I was always much more interested in theory. And you could see like my books the one, you know, the theory books were all like destroyed, full of notes and the methods books were like pristine, <laughs> um, <clears throat> which is funny because I always knew that that was a weakness of mine. And so I kind of overcompensate and I'm very careful methodologically, at least I, I try to be. Um, anyway, so I'm a sociologist. My main area of interest is social problems and in particular, um, the way that social problems become increasingly therapeutized or psychologized. And um, and sort of set up as problems of subjectivity, as problems of the subject, things that can be that are ultimately down to human behavior, human weakness, something wrong at the level of the human being. Um, and I think there's a kind of hegemonic, um, there's a, a hegemonic outlook that stems from the side disciplines that's very powerful in society and particularly powerful in American society. And that has permeated leftist movements, I think, for the worse, because you don't need a theory of subjectivity or psychology to understand why things go wrong within capitalism. Um, that's really the domain of our modern kind of bourgeois economics that uses human fail fail failures and frailties to understand um, why things go wrong in the economy. And this becomes a sort, a, a sort of insidious justification for the creeping control of behavior. Um, but we don't need that as Marxists, right? I don't need a theory of human greed or human stupidity, or human frailty, um, I can take the same subject that bourgeois economists did in the, well, classical e economists did, and Marx did this, took the same subject, took the same starting point, and you will still come to the same problems. And, that, and people misunderstand me. They think that I'm saying, oh, human beings are perfectly rational. I'm saying even if human beings are perfectly rational, we would still have the same problems within capitalism. Some people might make mistakes, but when you have 
uh, behaviors coalescing around um, trends, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people doing something tells you that there's a logic, there's some kind of push there. And our job is to figure out what that is. So that's a massive part of my my research, my ongoing work is um, pointing out the ways in which this hegemonic kind of understanding of social problems permeates so much of of our everyday life, of the way that we understand why things go wrong. And I think a lot of people on the left don't recognize it as such because um, it's great. One of the biggest um, advances <laughs> in recent years in terms of capitalist ideology is in framing the utter fleecing of the working class in kindly caring terms in psychologized terms, even in quasi-leftist terms. And I actually don't think this is anything new. Um, Marx wrote in the Grundrisse about the um, romantic viewpoint. And he says that capitalism has never moved beyond the romantic viewpoint and it will uh, accompany it as legitimate antithesis up to capitalism's bitter end. So this sort of like romantic anti-capitalism, this um, antithesis or this critique of capitalism on the basis of like, you know, feeling um, a desire for a lost past, a fullness, an imagined fullness that existed in the past, um, this notion that things are just going too fast for humanity to deal with, this kind of thing. Um, so it's framed in that this this kind of um, sustaining ideology of capitalism is framed in a very leftish kind of way, in a very therapeutic way as being on behalf of victims. And I think a lot of people on the left get fooled by that. And that's a lot of what I try to do is point out that no, look, this is a, this is a, a, this is just capitalism in decline being sold to you as socialism or being sold to you as like a leftist progressive thing. To give you an example of that, my first book in 2015 um, was about uh, this idea of happiness as a political project that became powerful in the UK and well all around the world really. Started out in the US and sort of. Uh, diffused from there but this this idea that like oh money doesn't make you happy you know <laughs> and people are like oh yeah that's like a leftist thing isn't it well I don't know about you but I don't usually go out on strike begging my employer to give me less money for my own well-being no um so you know it, 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 at first glance it seems kind of leftish it's more there's more to it than that like if you read my book <laughs> I go into it in terms of like um this turning away from economic growth and I found that to be very interesting. Why would these sort of well-to-do academics, these uh, policymakers, conservative policymakers, uh, be telling us that economic growth doesn't matter? That's a bit weird. Uh, and um, the way that I explained it is that capitalism has a, a both a productive side and a destructive side. It must grow, but it also can't grow. And this is sort of asking us to acquiesce to its destructive side, to its stagnate, to its its in, inbuilt kind of stagnation. Uh, this is something that Marx talks about, even in just the the Communist Manifesto, that um, the that um, capitalism outlives its historical justification be, uh, when it stops being a productive system. It's no longer able to. It's not an absolute system for the production of wealth, but at a certain point comes into co conflict with the um, continuation of wealth. So this is very basic kind of stuff that if you kind of go to Marx, you can see. But it gets sold to us as very leftist, right? And then leftists are like, oh, yeah, we don't want economic growth. <laughs> you see, because it sounds, you know, it sounds like something we should get on board with. So that's kind of what I do when I try to I try to go into things that are sold to us as quite progressive and point out the way that it hides within it um, a destruction of subjectivity, the very thing that we need to understand the world, to take hold of the world, to take control of the world, and thus the future, um, and sells us um, stagnation and even our own loss of freedoms and so on as as a kind of um, as a kind of freedom, as a <laughs> or at least a kind of psychological freedom, a freedom from within. Um, and then my YouTube channel for years, I just um, I just posted TV clips and stuff like that on there. Um, I never. You know, somebody, people asked me back in like 2016, as I'm sure a lot of people uh, went through this, like, oh, you should do a podcast. And I was like, oh, gosh, I, I don't have the time. There's no chance. And then eventually, of course, after the wave went, I was like, all right, I'll do a podcast. <laughs> so that's what I've been doing. And um, I've been having conversations about particular things that I've been trying to think through. So I will talk to people on. So I've been trying to think through really nailing down 
libertarian communism. So that's my next podcast that's coming out with Reed Kane. But of course, I wanted to talk about libertarian communism. We just like went, went all over the place, talked about the dialectic and stuff like that. Um, so I just kind of, my philosophy is I'm interested in something and I want to hear different viewpoints and kind of make up my mind. And, um, you know, the famous phrase, a mark of a great mind is being able to entertain a thought without accepting it. And I always just assume that other people are able to do that. So I, I don't, first of all, I feel bad inviting someone onto my channel and then being like, coming at them really rudely. So even if I'm like, not 100% convinced, I might like kind of prod and ask questions to hear more about it. And then I'll really think and make up my mind in the editing process. And maybe I'll insert little readings and that kind of thing that kind of pre present a contrasting viewpoint without being rude. <laughs> so I, just, I don't like My the God. idea of like inviting someone and tear them apart. No, I, I just want to hear people out and I want the audience to make up their mind and I want to have polite conversations because the last thing I want too is to like, I'll talk to right wingers, talk to left wingers, talk to whatever. I don't care. I, and I don't want to be that caricature of the blue haired leftist that's like frothing at the mouth. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know? I just want to hear people out. And oftentimes you find that you, that people don't live up to the caricatures that people make of them. And there are things that people say that, that who come from a completely different viewpoint that are correct. Um, and it's interesting that you come to the same conclusions from completely different areas and then take them in completely di different directions after that. And that should make you think. You know, and I, I, I definitely think that any kind of politics, uh, or a Marxist politics, shouldn't be moralistic, shouldn't, have, you know, create friend enemy distinctions. We should be fo focused on systems and processes. So I'm not interested in sort of making enemies, and um, uh, pointing out who the, you know, personifying some enemy. We should all direct our hate at. Anyway, so that's me and what I do. It's a very long lecture I just gave. <laughs> no, that's that's amazing. Thank you. That's that's a great introduction to you, and I think it's it's a it's a more uh it gives the audience a lot more than what they might have gotten if they were there for this stream last year when we had had you on um and there's a lot of things here i'd love to get into not sure if we'll have time like for instance i hope that we can have a real conversation about subjectivity it seems like something that we need in the sense that we have to actually have some kind of an understanding of ourselves like because you believe in agency Right. And if our understanding mm -hmm. of ourselves is that we don't really have agency, well, then that's a bad theory of subjectivity that's getting in the way of our agency. Right. Because. Mm -hmm. But and so maybe like, oh, uh, I'd love to get into that. But what I, I, I kind of want to talk about is this idea that you've had on these different. Um, you said left wing, right wing, whatever. Uh, well, somebody in the chat had just suggested uh, or asked, did she interview James Lindsay? And actually, I, I remember I, I reached out to you and I was like, you got James Lindsay on there. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, uh, Swolitariat, uh, someone I think we're both familiar with on Twitter. He likes to call people retards on there. Um, well, he's we, we love Swole. He's a great guy, especially in real life, especially on stream um, on tw and on Twitter. He's pretty much like just calling people idiots and it's cool, whatever. Uh, but he loves to tear into James Lindsay and not take him seriously whatsoever. Whereas you thought, no, I'm going to have a real conversation with this guy. And I would like to hear, and maybe we should say a little about who he is. So maybe you could share like, who's James Lindsay for those who don't know and why you thought it was important to have a conversation with him. So James Lindsay came into the spotlight because of a hoax um, where they uh, tried to well, I think successfully um, exposed what was happening in a lot of the social sciences with sort of grievance studies. So um, they created a bunch of, it was actually really impressive the amount of paper writing that they did. Like they wrote like 20 papers in a year. I was like, shit, like I struggle. I just had a paper come out yesterday. It was like one this year. <laughs> I, and I've got a book chapter and other things coming out. And a book, by the way, my book came out a month ago, my new book. Uh, significant emotion <laughs> but it's uh pretty amazing that they were able to write that many papers of course they weren't actually writing about real research so i suppose that makes it a little bit easier but like the papers are convincing <laughs> anyways um and, 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 and so that uh, people so that people have an adequate understanding of the nature of these these hoax papers um they were calling it so-called 2.0 right so-called kind of exposed yeah. 
the low standards of one of the main theory uh jameson's uh journals at the time social text uh but what what Bogson and uh pluck rose and 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 lindsay did they one of the one of these papers everybody was about dog rape culture it was about dog rape culture in the park and about how and it was basically talking about how problematic it is that dogs will hump one another without consent at the park and it was accepted so that i just want people to have an idea of how bad these pieces were you know yeah um and it's I, I, I really enjoyed that hoax when it came out because there were a few things that were going on in, uh, obviously I'm a sociologist, so there's a lot of rot, but there's a lot of rot in academia just generally. And I, and I think we have to be careful. You don't want to uh, sort of expose the, the silliness and the, the, the flightiness that people get into with like postmodernism and that sort of thing. And then, you know, be a reactionary and sort of drive back to everything that came before that, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to reject a lot of the subjectivism that was going nuts and go straight to objectivism. That's not the point, um, because a lot of stuff will use the language of science. Um, and it's just it's nonsense. There's a lot of junk science out there, a ton of junk science. It's just as bad. And so I think one of the problems with this uh the reception of this hoax is that it's kind of fueled a general attitude where people then start to become even less critical of things that operate under the banner of so-called science um you know you have a, you have problems like economics and psychology for instance like i don't want to dig on all of psychology there's a lot of really good psychology around don't get me wrong um, but a lot of there's a lot of junk <laughs> that across academia and there's a lot of junk science and economics and, and psychology. And the problem there is that they they have never lost their physics envy, sociology, anthropology. We lost our physics envy, at least those papers about humping at the dog park. <laughs> Like, at least they weren't saying, I objectively have discovered that it is morally wrong for dogs to hump each other. Like, it, no, it's like me and my crazy ass brain decided one day that this is problematic. <laughs> and that's like, at least you're not saying, you know, using this kind of scientism that said, like, no, this was handed down to me from God, which is how science tends to be used in a lot of the time now, as though it was handed down to you from God, which is deeply unscientific. Um, so I think that's kind of an issue with that. But I, I mean, generally, the hoax was great because it exposed a lot of the rot, which is which is fine. Um, and, I, you know, one of the things that's really bothered me is the way that the language of whiteness and white privilege and this sort of thing has permeated the social sciences, where that's just a big, big part of some of the journals that I used to really enjoy. You can't get away from it. And I'm on this listserv for indigenous psychology. And there used to, there's some really great authors on that listserv, people that I really admire. But over time, it was just like, white people this, white people that. And I was like, you know, I can go through this email thread and put it in a Word document and hit like control, find, replace, white people and put Jews. And like, this is the this is the level of discourse that we're dealing with here. If it was wrong to scapegoat an ethnic group, then why is it right now? Like, why is your analysis any good? Because we got the wrong group? No. And also, like, I don't even think it. I think that the crossover was pretty huge. Like this, you know, Jews were like the ultimate privileged white group. So it was <laughs> exactly, or, exactly. Like, are, are, tend to be conceived that way. So. I found that to be really, really disturbing. One of the reasons why I wanted to talk to James Lindsay was I found it interesting that one of the papers that they submitted was a rewrite of a chapter of Hitler's Mein Kampf. And I didn't think that that was an accident <laughs> um, because there is a lot of overlap with uh, this junk ideology of privilege and identity um and nazism <laughs> and i'm not saying you know, okay this is the argument ad hitler i'm not saying that these people are like literally nazis but there is no the overlap is is before nazism and that is in the kind of romantic reaction to the enlightenment and identity politics and that sort of thing that was part of the old right that was the right wing. And, that, and if you listen to one of my podcasts, <laughs> I, I go through this whole history of um, 
of what the right was and how identity is wrapped up with that using the work of, of Ken and Malik, who I really, really enjoy. Um, so that, you know, identity politics, that was the right. And Hitler absolutely hated socialism that emphasized class. You know, they were socialists. And, you know, I can, I can say that they were socialists without the, the, the um, uh, scare quotes. And I used to always say, oh, they ape the language of socialism. But now I can say I, I truly believe they were socialists in the sense that there were lots of different kinds of socialism from the 19th century onward that were battling it out. And Marx was engaging with these different kinds of socialism in critique to point out that they were dead ends. And this is one of these forms of socialism that reached historically one of the most horrific dead ends possible. So I'm not saying that people in the in the social sciences today are literally Nazis or fascists or whatever, but they are part of that um, tradition or they, I don't know if they, their reaction to the enlightenment, their reaction to capitalism is not the sublating progressive kind of Marxism, but the negating kind that longs for a, a return to some original wholeness before the fall, before colonization destroyed the, you know, the flourishing of other cultures and all these sorts of things. Um, and, uh, and so it is part of that old right. And I thought it was interesting that, that James Lindsay, you know, that they were, <laughs> that they rewrote a bit of Mein Kampf and that it was accepted and people didn't notice because both of those, that I think identity politics and it's sort of permeation of academia and Nazism both come from that same right wing reaction to the enlightenment. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's, I don't know. I still haven't made up my mind on whether or not I am willing to, to stick, to stick to my old argument of no true Scotsman, that it's not real socialism or not, because anyway, I won't go into it, but yeah. So that was the thing that, that made me interested in, in James Lindsay and kind of talking it out. And also that I knew that he knew that a lot of what he's criticizing is not Marxism. I knew he knew that. And yet on Twitter, he would often talk about Marxism and Marxists do this and that. And I just kind of wanted him to say to me, <laughs> this isn't Marxism. Because if you Google Marx or Marxism, one of the top results, or sorry, if you go on YouTube, one of the top results is James Lindsay describing it in the EU at the EU council or something, I don't know, some big gathering. Uh, and so I wanted to ensure that if someone saw that, and then was interested to see more of James Lindsay, they'd go on YouTube and find our conversation where he admits that it's not Marxism that leads to this nonsense. I don't know that's, if that made sense. Well, I think it probably helps people see that uh, there's at least one Marxist on the internet who is not this sort of, as you say, blue-haired you know, caricature that would just you know, call him all of the names and write him off on that basis. Uh, Nance, I'm curious if you uh, have anything you want to go piggyback off of with that in relation to uh, Lindsay and everything. I know what I want to come back to, but I want to give you a chance well, here. If I could just, sorry, if I could just add while, while you're thinking, if I could just add, that was actually one of the criticisms that I got was like, how dare you give this interview where you just smile and nod along and let and let James Lindsay say all of his nonsense without pushback. And I was like, but I did that on purpose. I don't want to be that caricature that people are expecting where I'm angry and trying to catch him out. I wanted to have a polite conversation like a normal fucking human being. <laughs> That's actually uh, one of my biggest pet peeves with the, the scene uh, when it comes to the political interviewers is, is it's like they all think that Joe Rogan is so popular because he because of some secret agenda or because, you know, it, you know, there's something wrong with his audience or something wrong with the world. And they don't realize, like, no, workers are just starved to see uh, a somewhat amicable, competent human being hold space and have a serious conversation with very different people for three hours. Like people actually mm -hmm. want to see that. And instead they just go, oh, it's this, it's this or it's that. And it's like. They're like, oh, he lets someone on and lets them slide and never calls them to task on anything. And it's like he there's there's whole uh, you can see clip reels where people have put together times that Joe Rogan is is really interrogating and then like arguing with with various guests like Candace Owens or Stephen Crowder or something like that. I'm not saying that he's the be all end all. All I'm saying is that uh, 
what he's doing wouldn't work if he was always that way. It wouldn't work if mm. he was like a combative asshole who was just looking to dunk on them, you know? Yeah, exactly. I was I wasn't sure if you wanted to come in and ask a question, uh, <laughs> Nance. No, I, I I think um, it's it's funny to me that there have or there seem to have been a lot of people who accuse you of being, you know, an undercover right winger, <laughs> um, and I don't know. I'm not really on the internet a whole lot, so I I think that's probably mostly hearsay from my point of view. Like I don't I don't know. Um, but I do know that your body of work seems like spectacularly in touch with the experience of working people. You've talked a lot about like families and how the state comes into like destroy families in the name of um, like the nanny state. Mm. And like I've encountered that in my own personal life. And it's, it's, it's just, it's very powerful that, someone who's talking about real issues that really affect real people um, seems to get brushed off and called like, oh, you know, you're just a crypto fash or something like that. <laughs> well, I think part of the reason why people think I'm a closet right winger is because I wrote a report for MCC Brussels, um, who, which is a think tank that's associated with the Hungarian government. And the reason why I'm associated with that think tank is because my PhD supervisor was Frank Ferreiri, and he's the head of that think tank. And Frank has never, ever censored me, told me what to say, told me what to write. Um, and I am never going to give up an opportunity to speak to a new audience because some jerks on the internet <laughs> want me to be ideologically pure or not even ideologically pure, want me to be like associatively pure. Um, so, which is really funny because like if you ever stood next to some, for the last like decade or so, if you ever stood next to somebody with a shady history, you were tarnished by association. You you, you were on a panel with them. Oh, you, you're in whatever this person was, it rubs off on you, right? Like Like bad people permeate everything by osmosis. There's one person on Twitter who's, absolutely weirdly crazily obsessed with me and is constantly googling my every movement and everyone who's ever stood next to me gets like first of all this person thinks that i'm funded by the Koch brothers i fucking wish i would take that money 100 percent. make no <laughs> same you want to give me money to you want to buy me a shovel to dig your grave i'm not gonna say no so but I've never been funded by the Koch brothers, unfortunately. I wish I was. <laughs> but everybody who has ever stood next to me is also apparently funded by the Koch brothers. It goes like like by, via osmosis, this money. Like anyway, um, so the reason why people often say I'm a crypto right winger is because of that. Um, but <laughs> it, I, the other reason why that annoys me is because, you know, it just shows that people don't actually care about any of the issues they claim to care about. They care about like um, curating a little public persona curating the little, their little profiles, that sort of thing. If you honestly care about things, if you honestly care and you have an opportunity to do something about it and you go, oh, well, not with you, then you don't care, right? Like people who are like, oh, I would never go on GB News. You have an opportunity to talk to tens of thousands of people. Well, I don't know what GB News, Sky News, tens of thousands of people, but GB News, lots of people anyway, particularly a lot of working class people. And you can show them that socialism is not the caricature they make it out to be. Personally, I prefer uh, Marxism to the word socialism for reasons that I've just said, that socialism has a kind of sordid history. Um, and it's difficult to sort of disentangle that. And people don't really know what you're talking about when you say you're a socialist. Sa same problem with kind of communism. But I think if you call yourself a, a Marxist, an orthodox Marxist, people might get a sense of what you mean. Anyway, but you can like, show people that being a Marxist doesn't mean you're like screaming and uh, want to take people's kids away and want, you know, all these psychotic things that people will, uh, you know, want to control you, the way you speak and anti-freedom speech, that sort of thing. You have an opportunity to go on a platform and say that stuff, but you won't do it because, oh no, aren't those the bad guys? Oh, I'm going to look bad, aren't I? You don't care. 
You don't care about people. You don't care about convincing people. You don't care about anything but yourself. That's it. You and your little buddies online, go have fun, okay? <laughs> I'm not about to, you know, give up that opportunity because somebody online has a problem with it. So I have the opportunity through MCC Brussels to speak to a totally different audience than I normally would. And also to stand up against really insidious processes that nobody is talking about. Nobody is talking about. So one of the reports that I'm writing about at the moment, it, uh, that I'm writing at the moment for MCC is about um, the use of mental health as a policy framework in the EU. And it is ultra insidious. First of all, mental health has a very sordid history going back to the mental hygiene movement. And you should know <laughs> mental hygiene then got bound up with, well, mental hygiene was always bound up with eugenics, but uh, was got bound up with Nazi eugenics, right? Uh, one Nazi slogan was healthy body, healthy mind, which by the way, I was invited to give a lecture with that title once. And I was like, you may have misunderstood what I'm all about. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, go Google that phrase. Anyway, so mental hygiene, um, if you go on Google and Graham, you can see as mentions of, men of mental hygiene go down in the literature, just as mentions of mental health go up. And I'm not saying all mental health discourse is necessarily bad. Obviously, there's a certain amount of like residual madness in society, to use you know the sociological term, that you know is just there. Um, whether it's a response to social conditions, whether it's about human variation, that sort of thing. Obviously, there's that, and that's really important to deal with, and and can be quite difficult for a lot of people. What I'm talking about is the tendency to reframe a huge range of discontent as a health issue. And this becomes a Trojan horse for all kinds of behavior management, for very authoritarian policies like clamping down on freedom of speech through hate speech and talking about how hate speech affects mental health and mental health is just as much, just as important as physical health, isn't it? Are you saying it's not as important as physical health, <laughs> right? So now you, if you agree, then you are, you know, we could have a conversation about free speech. That's contentious. We're going to have a, a really deep debate about rights and this sort of thing in, in contemporary society. But we're, if we have a conversation about health, now we're talking about harm and physical health. And therefore, if I simply interpret something as harmful, and it, then it is just as harmful as being physically hurt. Now, if you are saying that people should be free to physically do something, it's just it's exactly the same as physically hurting people. You are a monster. And so this becomes this is becoming a framework for the for um, encroachment on freedom of speech through hate speech laws. And now if you're a leftist and you've lost your fucking bearings, you're going to be like, oh, that sounds leftist because um, aren't we all about being nice to each other? No. That's not what it's about at all. It's not about mutual love and care. That's what the Nazis were about. You would be shocked. A lot of people were uh, attracted to Nazism because of the caring ethos, because of their slogans that were like the we before I, we before greed, community before the individual. That's that's the socialism. I'm not saying like, the, okay, the Nazis obviously took that on, but it was pre-existing the Nazis. It's sort of like, it was utopian socialism and Christian socialism, that sort of thing. It was very moralistic. The proper kind of socialism we want is the freedom of the individual, that the socialization of the means of production, which are, is already happening in capitalism, is important because it frees the individual. You can truly be free to do what you want with your time, whatever, beyond like the sort of basic reproduction of your own existence that's always going to be with us. But that, that could be a very small amount of your time. Anyways... Um, so, but people have lost that, that understanding and they're like, oh, you know, capitalism is individualism, ergo socialism is just a negation of that. It's about community. No, no, it's about the sublation of the partially realized individualism that's, that's barely given to us within capitalism. Um, it is a, it, it's going beyond capitalism to realize the bourgeois rights that it could only dimly perceive but not fully grasp to build a bridge that only some people cross now in capitalism build a strong enough bridge for everyone to cross that's that's what socialism is about realizing the individual um anyway so if you don't have that kind of understanding you're like oh <laughs> 
uh, socialism is just about caring for each other. Hate speech. Oh, that sounds like a socialist thing. No, that's an encroachment on right to free speech. That is extremely authoritarian. And we need to fight against that. And we need to point out, look, this is being sold to you through a language of health, through a language of caring and kindness. But it is not. It is not caring and it is not kind. And it's not about also, it's not even about hate speech. What's underneath that is that they want to control information on the internet. That's what it's actually about. It's just that's the that's the sur the surface level is how it's sold to people. Same thing with like um, uh, child pornography on the internet. Yes, it's a problem, obviously, right? But the it becomes like a thin veneer for clamping down on all sorts of freedom of expression on the internet. And it makes it really hard to argue against, right? Because no one's ever going to fucking argue against like laws against child pornography, obviously, right? But then the laws cover all sorts of expression because that's the first thing. And they're like, we need this act because it's going to clamp down on people's ability to do this and that. We need to, you know, make sure that such and such isn't encrypted, blah, blah, blah. So then they're able to see more. <laughs> they're able to control more things. So it's very, it's very difficult to criticize these things without getting called a right winger yourself. And in fact, a lot of like leftist policymakers, think tanks and so on, they don't touch it. And in fact, they get on board with it. Part of the reason why the only people that will pay you to write reports are the ostensibly right wing or conservative think tanks. And the only people that will often have time for you and to listen to you uh, will be from the so-called right, which, by the way, if you uh, scratch, if you scratch below the surface, often um, someone who's called right wing now is simply a classical liberal or a libertarian. And I agree with a lot of libertarians. I just disagree that capitalism can ultimately deliver the goods. Well said. That issue about the usage of the term whiteness is one that we've become super uh, kind of, I don't, I don't want to say fixated, I guess aware of over the last year. Um, of course, it was already an issue um, back in my, you know, Marxist and Bernie organizing days. I, it was a constant problem because people perceive me as, as a white person. And of course, They'll say that it's not about that. They'll say, oh, you're a white person, right? It's a social category. It's, it comes with some status. It comes with some privilege. But then, of course, then they'll say that, no, but you, you can act white. And then they'll, and so like they'll, they'll turn it back into a spiritual essence. And, and then, of course, whiteness has like this material basis in history. I mean, that's what uh, 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 Theodore Allen's, I think it's Theodore Allen, his book, The, the Invention of the White Race, is all about, was about, you know, as a Marxist. He's arguing that this was a, it was developed as a, a way of dividing people. And so the, you know, the, the white, um, I don't, what, what, what's the word for an indentured servants. Uh, everyone was indentured servants, black, white, uh, mulatto. And then they got after Bacon's rebellion, there were laws put in place saying, well, but if you're white though, then as an indentured servant, you're able to gain your freedom which used to be true of black people, but now black people can never gain their freedom. And then mulattoes, they can gain it, but it will take longer. And so this is like the encoding of this category. And it's as a way of trying to divide and conquer and, and get out ahead of, you know, what might, what, what, what might come after the, after Bacon's rebellion. And so then it's crazy knowing that and trying to organize in spaces where people are like, well, you can't talk because you're white. And it's like, Dude, I'm a fucking worker and you are literally mobilizing the term that was invented to make it so that we can't organize. And sure enough, you're speaking for a bunch of people who aren't in the room, who barely even live in the state. I live in Boise, Idaho. There's barely any black people here. I would love to be in a world where that changes. I would love diversity everywhere. But in the meantime, we're here. And if we're talking about organizing anything now, uh, people, they oh, well, I don't think we can really do anything you see because... We don't have X, Y, and Z kinds of people here. It's like, shut the fuck up. Could we do something anyway? Um, and so, you know, it's been a, a it, it actually gets, it gets me a little, uh, I get a little angry when I think about it. You know, it's not, a, it's not a neutral thing. It is. And it's like, okay, you can't be racist because, you know, racism is, is power plus privilege. I would love to hear your, your thoughts on that as a sociologist, obviously, because this, this is a definition that, is supposedly a scientific category, you know, definition that comes out of sociology, but 
Um, I just wanted to say as a quick side note, you know, I'm teaching this course on being in time. I've been reading being in time by Martin Heidegger for a long time. I used to have this, I would call it now naive interpretation of his work as being for the most part, you know, apolitical, if not <clears throat> in, in function, then, uh, at least in his intent. And I don't, I don't hold to that anymore at all. <clears throat> the guy was, he always was a, a radical, uh, right winger, you know, conservative. And I think he had good reasons to be at the end of the day. I think he had good reasons to be. I don't think there were a lot of positive options on the table that made sense from his standpoint, but I also have tremendous issues with his diagnosis of the problem. And I have huge issues with his solutions of the problem. And of course, that's where Marx comes in. But the, uh, the thing is, is that everyone acts like, like, uh, oh no, his philosophy is one thing. And then it's the fact that in the black notebooks, he talks about jewelry, jewelry, black, you know, uh, this, this idea of like, uh, in the black notebooks, he references the, the global globalizing jewelry as though that's the most damning thing. And, and the part of how I'm teaching being in time is to say, that's not the most damning thing. There are much more damning things than that. But when it comes to this, this mobilization of the term jury, we have to remember it is exactly what people progressives are using today when they say whiteness. It is not different. Yeah. Jews were overrepresented in wealth, but they were not all wealthy. Well, same thing with white people. They're overrepresented in positions of power, but not all white people. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I just 100% want to support that and also clear the air in case anybody watching had this idea that I'm just doing this sort of uh, just scanning Heidegger in this course. It's, it is all about actually showing um, not just like, oh, he got something interesting here. No, also how deep the, these issues with, uh, I wouldn't just call it Nazism, but really with uh, the reaction to working class organizing how deep that actually goes yeah i think um I, I mean i couldn't think of a better way to absolutely destroy any opposition than these kinds of movements i mean if i were in the cia i'd plant somebody in every fucking meeting every union to be like oh, but what about what about the representation of blah, blah, blah. but <laughs> i don't want to sort of uh think about th whether or not there's any sort of like deep conspiracy or something i think we've done it to ourselves but I, I hesitate to say we, because um, this is a this is a movement of people who, for various reasons, want to identify with a leftist label, with a an anti-establishment kind of label, and you know historically socialism, the word socialism went through a similar kind of vogue, where a lot of people wanted to call themselves socialists, and you can and now being called right wing is a slur. Oh, you're a right winger. You're far right. Everybody's far right. <laughs> you know, if you're a bad guy, you're far right. If you're a little mean, rough around the edges, you're far right. If you're kind and nice and try to pre present yourself in that way as caring for the vulnerable, caring for the weak, all this sort of thing, you're left wing. That's it. That's our, our, the stupidity of our political spectrum now. Um, so people want to associate with the left. And so they'll be like, oh, well, you know, I'm this, this and this. If you call that, if you know, call it left wing, whatever, what do words matter? Kind of reminds you of Oswald Spengler, like I'm this and this, th th these sorts of things. Well, if that's socialism, OK, call it socialism. What do words matter? You know, <laughs> that's at that time, socialism was a word that was really in vogue. You know, in the 1920s in Germany, uh, a huge number of the political parties had the words had the word socialism in the name. You had to have the word socialism in the name, or you had to have national in the name. So the Nazis used national socialism. <laughs> these were words that were very much in vogue. So these people that break that come into these meetings and like break them up, um, you know, willingly or not, I don't think that they're on my side. So when I say we, I'm not talking about like we socialists who should know better. I think this is a totally different kind of movement. I'm not saying like, oh, they're on my side, ergo, they're the enemy. I think they're doing a lot of damage, but I think they're not leftists in the traditional, well, in the sense, or well, they're not Marxist, definitely, <laughs> which is a bad thing because Marx, Marxism emerged out of like a critique and a critical engagement with the socialisms and, and, and bourgeois political economy and the movements of his day. And I think, you know, 
for a damn reason, he was really important as a thinker. And we don't need to go back. We don't need to forget everything that we learned from him. So I, I don't see these people as being like on my side, but mistaken. I think I see them as a kind of separate movement, um, a, a trajectory that is, you know, if we want to be kind of definitional about it, belongs on the right. If you want to go back to the French Revolution, there they have a lineage that takes it back to the right, not the left. Anyways, but this whole thing about whiteness dividing people. Um, yeah, I mean, this happens a lot. This happened lots of times. Like if you go back to the American South, um, you had situations in which, you know, you had fusion movements that brought back, brought together black workers and white w workers um, to challenge, you know, as Ken and Malik describes, challenge the established order and even take power. And this was put down by the Democrats, by the way, <laughs> um, uh, by launching a, a white supremacy campaign to rupture this coalition and persuade the white workers that their interests lay with white people and not black people. And I saw something like this happening with the truckers convoy. Initially, in Canada, initially a lot of Native people went to Ottawa. There was a lot of people in orange shirts. Um, and, you know, my brother was there. My Lots of my aunts and uncles were there. Uh, and because it was about self-determination initially, um, and Indigenous people are also sick and tired of being surveilled constantly, of having their children taken away because of whatever mistakes, because of poverty as well, um, and the kinds of mistakes that you make because you live in horrible poverty. Um, and they're just sick and tired of being watched all the time. And a massive, you know, obviously a huge area of our advocacy and our like movements has been for self-determination and instead we're fed all this crap about like oh you know you need your you need help in this way and you need this kind of therapeutic intervention and my dad always used to say uh you can't throw a rock on a reserve without hitting a psychologist you know <laughs> and then like after this period of rehabil rehabilitation then finally you will maybe you'll have your self-determination which is a distal determinant of well-being or whatever the crap they they pull out um and so a lot of indigenous people went there and what I found interesting was that the leaders, the indigenous leaders, were like, no, come back. Do not go there. That is not your struggle. Your struggle is at home in your communities. You should only be worried about indigenous issues. And they explicitly divided. They said, no, you're not part of any kind of working class struggle, Anything, any working class struggle that might have developed. No, you are part of a a group with specific interests. You can't, you are always particular. You can't be general. Um, and this is the same kind of thing that's been going on for a really long time. It's this kind of like, um, no, no, your interests lie with your group, not with your class um, and not with any kind of mass movement. Uh, I think that's a very powerful strategy, willingly or not, knowingly or not, to divide and conquer. Um, and, you know, I said, we've been here before. You see this with like Jim Crow. <clears throat> you see this in, you know, um, recently you see this with the whole white supremacy thing. But also going back to the 19th century in Germany, there was this widespread exhaustion with liberalism, this belief that liberalism was this failed experiment. And um, the you had this sort of romantic reaction and, and German romanticism and so on, this belief that you know universalism had killed the beautiful spirit of the particular um and you know some of this wasn't all bad you know um but you had this idea of like the volk and the volksgeist and all this stuff and then this developed into obviously volksgemeinschaft and all this kind of um stuff that grew out of uh, that grew into you know nazism um but it's interesting if you go into the the nitty gritty of what was happening in the 19th century in Germany, for example. So did you know, that, like, if I had to ask you what two groups were the most vociferous Nazis, like which two sort of classes or groups of people were the most vociferous Nazis? I, I don't know. I'm guessing so it's, were, it's a, I understand it's like some subsection of the working class and some subsection of the bourgeoisie. That's just the, that's yeah. the way people talk so, about it, you know. They had a lot of difficulty making inroads with the working class. 
And there's a lot of debate about exactly how much of the socialism that was espoused and the anti-capitalism anti that was espoused was just deployed to kind of get to speak to the workers. But like, you know, it's, it's very difficult also to say that Nazism had an ideology because it was very slippery. So Hitler would say one thing to, you know, a group of industrialists and then another thing to the workers, another thing to the peasants. And you know, he'd say all, whatever people wanted to hear. Anyway, so that's a bit difficult, but they, they had a lot of trouble making inroads with workers. But yeah, some sections of the petty bourgeoisie, peasants, uh, some big capitalists. But in general, like the groups in society in society that were most convinced were um, doctors and um, and students. And the Nazi student movement was really, really powerful. And in fact, like they in the 1930s, they were annoyed that the Nazi party had taken student student groups were annoyed that the Nazi party had taken credit for the de Jewification of the universities. They were like, we did that. <laughs> so there was but if you go back to the roots of this um, in the oh, and by the way, Germany also was a highly educated society. It was one of the most educated in Europe. And the um, members of the Nazi party were disproportionately educated people. So when people talk about like, oh, you know, you have to, you should get an education to be able to vote because, ooh, democracy is going to lead us to Nazism. Well, <laughs> it's not, uh, it's not exactly what happened. It was educated people that had convinced themselves. And and it wasn't like, we have this idea now of like, it's it's very interesting how we think of World War II. I keep going off on tangents, but it's very interesting how like the dominating understanding is that like Hitler did this dance and the working class was like circles in their eyes and like oh. and why not and like he sort of like beguiled and, and entranced the working class and that's how we got like the holocaust that's not at all what happened um Hitler was simply giving voice to ideas that were already powerful and prevalent within German society not amongst normal people not amongst regular people but amongst the educated <laughs> um that you know the that it um eugenics was considered to be like a a, a very humanitarian um, ethos and outlook, very scientific, very um, forward looking, obviously in some ways. Um, but if you go back to the 19th century, as I said, you know the roots of this is like liberalism starts to um, they have this reaction to the Enlightenment. People start to see liberalism as this failed project. Um, this desire to sort of like you have this romantic longing for the past for Christendom. You know, this this period in which, you know, all of Europe was united under Christianity, blah, blah, blah. Um, but also uh, you had you see my green screen failing there a little bit. Anyway, <laughs> but also you had a um, uh, a situation in which the universities were getting opened up to more and more people in order to attempt to solve some economic problems. But what happened was they were overproducing bureaucrats. So the people who were going into the universities were destined for bureaucratic roles. And um, so you wound up with tons and tons of people destined for a bureaucracy, but there weren't enough bureaucratic positions for them. So you had a lot of disgruntled, highly educated people jostling amongst each other for a dwindling number of positions. Does that sound familiar? They all started denouncing each other. There was a wave of anti-Jewish sentiment in the 19th century, long before the 1930s. Uh, they were denouncing their professors. They were protesting in lecture halls. And I'm giving you a lecture on this, and I see you're trying to shut me up because you have your next no, guest coming on. No, no, no. <laughs> Actually, I, uh, I, I, I can I canceled that person because I just want to have this conversation with you. Uh, as you know, we've got a little bit more time. I, I, I'm kidding. I didn't really cancel the next person, but they, uh, they actually uh, are deathly ill. Um, or something, oh, no. something along those lines. And so something has come up it, that has been moved to February 22nd. So that's oh, the okay. next one of these streams, which you are, of course, also going to be welcome back to because there's so many things that I'd love to get into that we can't get into here today. But OK, with all that said, um, no, this the, the, the reason I was getting excited there was only to interject in that way that I hope kind of catalyzes you more egg, eggs you on. And that is to say that uh, on the whole topic of the professionals and managers of capital um and you know the the people who come out of academia the who run the media who run um the the educational institutions who also uh monopolize skills the ones that are valued by capital um and, and then gatekeep those uh commonly referred to as the pmc that's a problematic thing we could get into it that's not necessarily the the point because i i said professionals and managers of capital not the uh, class i'm not talking about a class okay 
So I kind of want to bracket that question out and just say that when you are having that conversation, or when we've been having it at least, um, w- Barbara Ehrenreich is a very important contributor to that conversation. She wrote the piece on the PMC in the first place, coined the term. Um, and she, you know, was a founding member of the DSA, but she also wrote the this as a critique of the DSA because she was saying this is like a middle class, but college educated middle class, not petty bourgeois, but specifically college educated middle class movement. And it's not representing the the workers. And that's a problem. And then people didn't listen to her. And so she left. I don't understand like the middle steps. I don't I'm not saying that's the exact causal order, but that seems to be a big part of it. Well, she and her ex-husband wrote a piece. It was a follow up. It's the third in the series on this. And she wrote it, I believe, in 2008 or something like that. Elton LK of the Working Class Intelligentsia podcast. Um, he he always references it as a, a sort of like, well, maybe there's hope because what the thesis of that is, is that that uh, with neoliberalization, which is something that the professionals and managers had pretty much taken up. Um, with neoliberalization, this grouping is losing its power and it's becoming more precarious. And then people use that to say, ah, yes, so they'll be proletarianized, which means that they will see their interests in common with the rest of the working class. And I've always, and my position has been, I'm not so optimistic. And I just had a conversation with Benjamin Sudebaker a couple of weeks ago about this, where it's actually, no, what that actually, it makes it more competitive, but not, mm-hmm. not, 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 oh, between one another so that they will then work with the working class. But no, instead, the, the kind of virtue hoarding that uh, Catherine Liu talks about is only amplified. And so when we talk about the goalpost moving, of how we should talk about things and what kind of representation or recognition or piecemeal kind of uh, distributions that don't actually change anything should be prioritized. Um, The reason that these language games are accelerating and the reason that people are becoming increasingly militant on language games that seemingly have no real material effect except to divide people is because of this scarcity of jobs coming out of college i don't know that i don't know if you agree with that but it does sound related to what you were talking about absolutely absolutely um yeah and 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 this should not be surprising because again this is in the very basics in the communist manifesto that the petty bourgeoisie fears getting tossed down into the working class um, and they hate the working class um, because they fear getting tossed down into it And so this leads to an overdrive to show themselves to be the managers and not the managed. I am the type of person that should be the manager. Now, I am not one of those great unwashed. I don't belong there. I belong in this position. And so you have this sort of like temporarily embarrassed bureaucrat or you have someone who's in a bureaucratic position and they're lucky they're lucky enough to be there. And there's somebody there jostling for that position, waiting to catch them out. Um, show them up to be, you know, no, 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 you're the managed, I'm the manager. Um, But I wanted to say that, uh, yeah, basically, it's just people sort of jostling with each other for dwindling positions. And a lot of the areas in which you see this really in overdrive are some of the most competitive areas. So um, academia, for instance, you know, there's ton, there are tons and tons of people with PhDs, but very, very few uh, positions. And it's very interesting, like anytime someone comes after me, the first thing that they do is they question this person is a sociologist and they at the university. And it's like, and, and like I've seen, and sometimes it's really painfully obvious too, where like, I remember this guy coming at me and I, I, at first I thought he was like engaging with me in good faith. And uh, so I looked up, I was like, Oh, he wrote a book in a area that looks to be kind of um, similar to my area. So I, I looked it up and I just looked at the title in the abstract. Um, I was like, well, that, that seems kind of cool. And so I was responding to him in good faith. And then he starts insulting me personally. And he's like, you haven't read a book in your life. I was like, the fuck is this person? Like, you don't know anything about me. And you're saying this. You haven't got a philosophical bone in your body. And I was like, well, maybe not. I'm a fucking sociologist. Like, do you go around a dentist? Like, you haven't got a surgeon's bone. (laughs) I'm not a philosopher. It's not what I do. But I don't. But they knew nothing about me. He's really coming at me. And then I looked at this book. I actually like looked at the preview on Amazon and it's a book of aphorisms. 
which I'm sorry, but if you're not like someone who has like a, a well worked out philosophy already, you should not be writing a book of aphorisms. That's somebody who has the attention span of a tweet, I'm afraid. <laughs> this is like the pot calling the kettle black here. But I found it so interesting because this guy was um, uh, an adjunct somewhere and and obviously struggling. And I was thinking, oh, it's hard for you out there, isn't it? You know, that's and you're mad. You're mad. You're like, I should be there. I should be there. How dare you have a permanent position? I'm so much better than you. Well, knowing nothing about me, obviously never having read any of my work or looked at you know, nothing, just literally sees a tweet sees that the person is has a permanent position at the university and enraged and 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 coming at me personally like that's the kind of just a, a sort of anecdote of the kind of person that that does this sort of thing that will look for something to utterly destroy you because they're mad like I should be there I'm better than that I you know uh, <laughs> uh, I'm like this great mind that is uh, unrecognized by society kind of complex but it's, you know, it's all over the place. And and it's this kind of thing that happens when, you know, you work really hard for something and it just, it doesn't come to fruition. And you see somebody who has that and you're like, you get mad and people get desperate and they start to, uh, you know, jostle for those positions. And and as I said, this happened before, like you look at the late 19th century in Germany. This is the people were like backbiting and so they, they'll do anything, some group, you know you shouldn't be there this group on the whole and that's gonna put out a ton of your contenders and now now you think oh now i've got a chance yeah that one of the things that Sudebaker had said is that in a lot of cases especially if they're kind of going the route where they've got to be authors they are writing for basically other failed professionals you know, like people who, an audience of people who are in the working class, but either went to college or kind of like wish they'd gone to college, who kind of imagine themselves as being more intellectual. Um, and so what we have is like this entire industry of publishing where the books are being written by, you know, the Robin DiAngelo's and the Kimbram X, Imbram X Kendi's. Um, and it's not, you know, obviously written to your regular working class person. No, it's being written to people who are in the working class, but who want or who think of themselves as um, a temporarily embarrassed uh, working class person. They see themselves as ultimately getting a job at some HR department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen this, um, you know, lots of times. And, and it's, again, it's like sometimes the sort of person that this is, is like a. Like someone who schemes. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry, I've been getting over an illness for like a month and it just won't go away. <laughs> um, but also there's a lot of people who just like passively assent to it and it becomes like a marker of like, oh, I am better. You know, I am I am aware. I am one of I know I am I am. Well, I am a, I'm woke, but n not in that conscious way of like calling yourself woke. Um, so I've got, I hate to say this, but I've got an old friend who is not a very deep thinker. In fact, really astonishingly shallow, but a lovely person nonetheless. And we were friends when we were very young and we've been friends since childhood. Um, and so, but I've, I've kept in touch with her. And I noticed on her uh, Instagram, she has her pronoun, pronouns up. You know, it's like, oh, well, she, her. <laughs> and I go, why did you do that? And she's like, well, I just think it's really important that people recognize that gender is a spectrum. And I was like, do you really think that though? <laughs> I guarantee you've never given a thought to this in your fucking life. But it's just a sort of like she's struggled a lot to hold on to jobs, that sort of thing. And I it's her way of being like, I am a climber here. Like, I am not going to get tossed down into the working class. I belong out of it. See, look, I am going to use these words. I'm going to use this language. Don't fucking toss me down again. And you can see it. She's like hadn't thought about it at all. But she knew by using that language, it, it's a sign it's a sign of, it's like a class signal. Yeah, I, I think back to when I was using they, them pronouns. It's a very mean way for me to talk about my friend, I'm sorry. Look, <laughs> look, there's, there's, two, sorry. There's, two, there's two kinds of like non-intellectual friends. There's the ones who think, oh yeah, um, 
none of that matters and I'm smart. And then there's the ones who say, I'm fucking stupid and I love my life and I don't give a shit. Right. And I'm yeah. all my, all I've my working lots class of those friends and they're, they're great. That's good. Yeah, they my are. Cause that way too. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, I think that that gets forgotten. People say, you know what? Well, working class people can read and working class people can do this and that. And it's like, yeah, they can. And even with the time energy and even with the resources and even with the restructuring of society that would be necessary to get them all of those things, they still might choose not to be because it might turn out that most people just don't care about certain nerdy things that we care about. And that would still be okay. And I think of like my friend Suzanne and she's just like, no, she's just like, she's like, I, that's you guys. You guys care about that kind of stuff. I just love people. You know, that's her, that's what she yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like my husband's the same way. He's never read a book in his life. He barely finished high school. I don't know if he actually did. I'm sure he did finish it, but he just barely finished whatever the Greek equivalent of high school is. And like he does, he doesn't, he doesn't know what I do. People ask him like, what does your wife do? He says, I think she's a teacher. <laughs> he has absolutely no idea. And, but, you know, I was out and he's like very, he's working class. He's also, interestingly, he's a communist um, because and my my family, my father in law is a communist. Like my family in Greece is family. You know, my in laws are all communists because they come from like when you're a working class person, you're a communist. That's not because you're blue hair and engage in polyamory or something, but because you're a working class person, you're a com you're a communist. But so he's a communist, and um, but like when I go out with him, you know, and his friends for like a coffee or whatever, I'll like start spouting off on something, and he'll stop me and he's like. You don't need to explain that to anybody here. Everybody already knows that. And and I think that's exactly right. Like if I have to sort of sit there and be like, you know, pull the wool off your eyes and know everything you believe is wrong, I am probably wrong. If I have to try very hard to convince my husband of something, I'm probably wrong. Like I remember I was taking a contrarian position. <laughs> this is bad. I was taking a contrarian position on like um, racism in football. And I was like, honestly, this is like an attack on the working class. And what they're saying is that the working class is a bunch of racists. And I think it's just this elitist thing. And he just thinks about it for a second. He goes, he was a soccer player, by the way, when he was younger, uh, professionally. And he looks at me, not like a rich one. You know, in Greece, you can do that as your job without being rich. Anyway, um, and he goes, I had a teammate who was black. They threw bananas at his face. And I was like, yep, so... I'm going to completely <laughs> throw that position out the window. I'm going to think more deeply about this for a minute. So yeah, if I'm like, like he's he's my bullshit detector. Like if I can't get something past him, I'm wrong. I'm completely wrong. And because he has like a very, he's he is an intelligent guy and he's a thoughtful guy. And when it comes down to it, he kind of, he has a sense of like, what's right and wrong and he cares about our family he cares about people around him he cares about um working people getting what they deserve and he knows because he works his ass off and he wants what he deserves <laughs> you know and he's not gonna and he he worked at amazon for a while when we were living in the uk and he like um told me that they have like uh mindful moments and stuff like that and he was like bullshit <laughs> you know <laughs> moving on you know, he knew, he just knew. I didn't need to explain. He doesn't need to read my books. He knows immediately this is a bullshit ploy to you know, get them off the hook for this horrific exploitation that I'm going through right now. He just knows that. Um, and, you know, they cannot. So, yeah, um, there's that, that kind of person that's just that knows about the world through engaging in it and solving his problems every day. Right. And then there's the kind of person that wants to get above that. And it wants to show themselves as the type of person that can um, make things run more smoothly at a higher level. To be a manager, as I said, instead of being the managed. And that's mm -hmm. the people who engage in that lexicon, who want, who go through education in order to show the world they're wrong. Whereas for me, when I went through an education, I came out the end of it being like, what I knew intuitively when I was like 16 years old living in a fucking dumpster, <laughs> not literally, but uh, it was right. Do you know what I mean? It was like a coming home. Mm -hmm. It was that I understood more deeply something that I could perceive 
not to mix me metaphors, but like that I could sort of dimly perceive at that time. Well, I when I first read Marx in college, you know, no background in anything intellectual at that point, nothing nonfiction at that point, besides maybe some self-help or something like that. I remember, I mean, I felt a tremendous revelation and relief, right, in this structural critique because it took the responsibility, at least in part, off of myself, off of my parents, off of my neighbors, off of my family members, off of everyone I ever knew. And it, it brought into clarity the fact that outside of, obviously, the, 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 that part that is our responsibility, there is a lot more to the, to the picture. And, that, and I didn't have even a premonition of that you know, as a teenager. So if, if you kind of had a, a sense for that at 16, then kudos, because I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me until probably 23, you know, it's very late in my development. Well, no, what I mean by I had a sense for it is that I longed desperately for material comfort because I didn't have it. And everything was so difficult. Um, mm. Oh, I'm going to cry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know why. I just, um, yeah. Uh, and I'm very grateful now that my life is a bit easier. And actually, I was talking to a friend yesterday because I've like been going through not a great time. My dad is sick and um, just had like a loss in our family as well, of like a baby. So it was just, oh just awful gosh. things happening. And I said to my friend, I'm so lucky. And he looked at me like, what the hell are you on about? And I was like, I am. I'm so grateful that like my home is clean and I am not hungry um, because like, like I, I think a lot of people, you don't go hungry anymore. I've starved. <laughs> I actually starved. Like I used to go to bed at night thinking if I had endless money, um, what food I would buy. <laughs> that's like, that's what I wanted. I wanted food. I wanted comfort. I dreamed of a house with carpets. The first thing that I did when I had money, I paid off my student loans is I bought carpets. Like nobody has carpets in their house anymore. It's like the cool, the chic thing is to have hardwood floors. I bought like carpets, like underlay, like that thick. <laughs> and I was like, oh, laying on it doing like doing angels on the floor and I'm so grateful for these sort of material things but at the same time I kind of knew I wasn't supposed to feel that way that this was materialistic and that I should as like a good person reject and disavow that and yet at the same time I wanted it so desperately um a, a security a material like I wanted food I wanted house I wanted like luxury if i could have it <laughs> but i wanted it not i don't know maybe like luxury was just so far out of my world i maybe i couldn't even dream of that and even to this day like if i had money i don't have money but like if i have, i have enough to like i'm okay i'm comfortable not comfortable but like i'm not starving but like to this day even if i had a bunch of money i still wouldn't buy like designer things i just i would like i would buy carpets <laughs> but anyways like like that kind of i had this feeling that that was what was important and that people should have that and that it wasn't really wrong to disavow that. I knew that. I knew I was supposed to disavow it, but I I wanted it. So then I go through my education. I learn all about like I learned the worst version of Marxism that you get in sociology, which is like you get taught Marx as though he's an anti-materialist, as though he's like a fucking Buddhist. Like Marx doesn't isn't rejecting objectification as such. That is like the, you know, turning your subject into an object, your subjectivity into an object, this is instantiation of the subject in an object, that is what makes us human. That is a, a very powerful human thing, that we make an object and that this then becomes our sort of, it acts back on who we are and what we are and changes us fundamentally, right? That's like, I don't want to be, um, to echo Marx too much, but like that's the only reason why human beings exist today. Like we have terrible... Like, we don't have much in the way of teeth. We don't have much in the way of claws. We're naked mole rats. <laughs> we make things and we work on the world. And and this acts in this back and forth on us and what we become, that we have this open subjectivity and so on. Um, uh, but so Marx wasn't rejecting that. He's saying that we should have that. And like, 
for me going through by the end of my education I start to sort of reject everything that I learned in sociology and anthropology not everything so uh, everything I learned about Marx and sociology and anthropology and it was this coming home to you should have that that subject and object should come back together I am a communist because I am greedy because I want it all I don't want to spend my life living for other people I already do that in capitalism you spend your life as a worker working a little bit of the time to replace your wages and then the rest of the time you work for some asshole so he can go on a yacht and enjoy the luxury that you should have you should have that right what is it James Connolly our demands most modest are we only want the earth we demand what they command from birth they already live in communism they already live in the world that is possible how do we know communism is possible it's right here it already exists they've got it <laughs> And it's not wrong to want that. And it's the, that it's that idea. It's just, no, it is wrong to want to have more. It's wrong to want to have more. I already knew when I was a teenager, there was something fishy about that. Somebody was lying to me. How could I possibly reject materialism when I don't even have it? So that's what I meant by that. Perfect. Yeah. And I think that's part of the pushback against this degrowth kind of, uh, movement that we see today right hmm. yes exactly because capitalism destroys it well if you're saying that like we have to degrow you are acquiescing to the destructive side of capitalism it both can't grow and it must grow and people are saying oh well you know they're trying to reconcile an irreconcilable and this is what um john stuart mill tried to do as well um he tried to say he saw the falling rate of profit and he said, oh, well, it's just this sort of harmonious stationary state to which capitalism is naturally tending. And Marx says, no, this is this is um, vulgar political economy that's trying to justify and reconcile a, an extraordinarily destructive tendency within capitalism, a destructive tendency that's going to lead us. He doesn't Marx doesn't say, well, he does say this, but not in this line that I'm quoting, um, that's going to lead us eventually to war. Um, to horrific destruction that is completely fucking unnecessary. It's completely unnecessary. Like, that's the horrific thing about capitalism. It is not an absolute system for the production of wealth, but at a certain point comes into contradiction with the furthering of wealth, the further production of wealth. It must destroy it. It must destroy it. Now, again, going back to the Communist Manifesto, the capitalist is like the sorcerer who's unable to control the powers he's conjured up from the, ne the, the netherworld, right? So he conjures up these enormous enormous means of production who knew that such um such extraordinary powers slumbered in the lap of social labor or whatever is the line right so you conjure up these enormous uh, means of production that can give us the pathway to material security for every single human being on earth we have this possibility we can give every single human being on earth a very secure life and then we can build on that make everybody rich we can do that we have those means of production but capitalism can't do that. Capitalism conjures up these means of production, but it cannot deal with it. It cannot make sufficient profit from what's being produced. And so it has to destroy it. So we see increasingly destructive crises. You know, you, you, can't, you can't get bread because they shut down the fucking bread factory and they're burning all the wheat. That's the world we live in. And everyone's like, oh, I guess it's wrong to want to have more. No, go and take it. That's yours. Go take the factory, you know, and this is and in some places they do. They do go take the factory until the government comes in and says, well, no, no, you're a very sad individual in, in, in individual. What you are suffering from is a kind of depression, that anger that you feel bubbling up, that discontent, <laughs> that sense of um, of uh, indignation. That's called depression. Do you have these symptoms? Here's a bag of flour. That's what they do in China. Here's a bag of flour. Here's your prescription for therapy. I don't have to give a prescription for therapy, but I do have someone who comes over and like gives a sort of therapeutizing of people's discontent. And they're like, and you are an individual and I'll be on my way. Don't you go take it over any factories. No, this, this is what they try to teach you. This is what they try to tell you. Right, right. Like you need anger management. There's no, there's no real reason that your cons your entire, you know, your human aspirations are being frustrated. It's just that you are an aggressive individual or oh it might yeah. even be toxic masculinity that's what's really going on here right um so before i step away i'm going to step away for a brief moment i think we got another 10 
to 12 minutes here, I hope. Uh, and uh, I just, I, I had said the thing about uh, back when I identified as they, them, we didn't get into it. I do want to say something about that because otherwise it's weird to just leave that hanging. Um, and then uh, I wanted Nance to be able to share out some of what he's been thinking in light of everything you've said, maybe ask you a closing question. Um, I'm going to stuff my face with some food while uh, while he does that, because this is an all day stream and I haven't eaten yet. But uh, really quick, I just wanted to say that uh, this was in reference to the idea of the goalposts moving and whiteness and this sort of essentializing spiritual essence of, you know, individuals that were reduced to uh, the identity. Uh, and to say that really it was. You know, at the time, if you had asked me why I was doing it, why I was doing this genderqueer thing, I would have said, well, you know, I've experimented with my identity in a variety of ways. Back when it was MySpace, I was into all kinds of, you know, I was a scene kid, blah, blah, blah. So it's really just me experimenting with something and it's socially acceptable to do it in this space at the university where I might not be able to do it elsewhere. And so, of course, I want to do that. But also then I would have said it's good because it actually destabilizes uh, toxic masculinity. It helps people become more tolerant. And of course, I get to help normalize difference, difference of expression and all of these other things. And I think that there's still something to that. And I think that we could all be sympathetic to the kind of queerification that is for play, that is for coloring outside the lines, that isn't for rigid, this is who I am, you have to believe me, forms of militant activism. Um, that are obviously so individualistic. Um, but I, now that I look back, though, I always have to be honest with myself and say, you know, that was all very convenient. I think that there was probably a level to it, though, where I wanted to be heard. I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be able to exercise my voice. I wanted to be able to think. And I wanted to be able to dialogue with others and even disagree with others. But I found that whenever I opened my mouth, people didn't take me seriously because, oh, it's a white guy. I really think that's what it was. And I, I was tired of not being taken seriously. And I was like, you know, I'm not this deer hunting, jacked up, truck driving, gun toting, wife beaten asshole that you all take me to be. So here, let me wear a dress. And, and the th I don't care. I don't care about any of those signifiers. I don't care about any of these boxes you're trying to put me into. I don't care. I just want to be a human and have a serious conversation and be able to hopefully move towards something better. And that was also the period of, you know, 2019 Bernie activism, right? Um, and of course, my experience with tw the 2016 Bernie activism had been, no one's going to take you seriously if you're just a guy, at least not in a blue city in a red state. A blue city in a red state is different than a blue city in a blue state because it's very, very polarized. The mentality is extremely like, oh, we're the minority and we're oppressed. We're surrounded by these hordes of reactionaries. And so there's a lot of like the militancy sort of has a different kind of flavor. I guess, I mean, Portland's blue in a blue state, but it is also surrounded by a red mass. And so any place you have a blue island surrounded by a red mass, there is kind of this like aggressive, defensive sort of mentality. And then me being from the rural area of Idaho, I actually, you know, I feel defensive to some degree because I know a lot of people who say, I don't know about all that stuff. But the thing about all that stuff is that it doesn't pass the normie litmus test, which is kind of what you're mm -hmm. talking about with your husband. It doesn't pass the normie <laughs> litmus test. And they're saying, well, you have to normalize it because the normies are just wrong. And it's like, well, here's the thing. Even if it is all scientifically concluded that everything works the way that you're saying it is. Uh, science can take a hundred years to figure itself out. You know, the, the, the advances that we're talking about when it comes to gender, sex, identity, these are very recent, you know, a very real, very recent articulations of these things. Um, though of course they're old problems. Um, but it's not new, uh, uh, in that sense, it is new in the sense that every normal person has to be on board with it. Or else they're a fascist. It is new in the sense that you can't just say, hey, do you want to get behind Medicare for all? You first have to say, hey, use my pronouns properly. And that is why I stopped doing it, is because I might still agree with all the things that I would have said at the time. But what I realized was it was a, a barrier 
for talking about universal goals. And now I'm back at the university. I'm a discussion leader, ad adjunct instructor for a couple of courses, and I'm experiencing it again. The students are fine. They're normal people. But mm -hmm. in, the, in the faculty and in the administration, it's the same thing again. It's like I go everywhere in society. I'm able to communicate. I'm treated more or less like a person. But in these spaces, they're going to treat me different. And it is because I'm a white guy. And I guess, you know, it doesn't matter how I identify. They're still going to treat me that way unless I fucking dress up for them. And that's kind of crazy. And I just wanted to say, like, it, it really does. Like, I was angry earlier. Now I'm like, it just makes me emotional. And that now I feel sad. It just makes me feel sad because it's, it's, it's stupid. It's not necessary. We shouldn't have to deal with this. We should be able to move forward on things. And you're right. If, uh, if, if the FBI really wanted to undermine things, it's all, it's all they'd have to do. The sad thing is, is I know so many people I really doubt that they're from the FBI. It's like Tumblr's doing it for them or the, whatever, whatever platform is relevant to this stuff is already doing it for them. But of course, the CIA built those platforms, you know, it built the internet. <laughs> and so big surprise, right? But um, anyway, I just love this conversation. I really appreciate you uh, being here. I'm going to be listening with rapt attention while I grab some food. And so you can still respond to me. But then also I wanted Nance to have a moment here if we still have the time before you go. Sure. Perfect. Um, yeah, right. I, I'll have to put my uh, my kids to bed as well. But uh, Nance, did you want to say something? I uh, first of all, thank you for for spending so much time with us. Um, it has been a great conversation. I think um, overall the themes of like we're we're moving in into a new era of like positivism and essentialism where people are doing this like performative goodness. Um, and it it is uh, maybe an attempt to combat their own precarity. Um, it all is kind of very directional and it and makes a lot of sense. But it is frustrating because having these conversations, I guess, publicly, um, one does get labeled as anti-political or even reactionary or, or blah, 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 because um, I, whatever market there is for whatever this is we're doing, intellectual content, Marxist content, I don't even know. Um, but pe people shy away from it because they're um, afraid of being labeled reactionary. They're, they're afraid of, um, I don't know, stepping on their own dick. I don't know. Um, but like we are fighting this trend of, of being essentialized to, to these appearances of, Oh, I'm a good person or, Oh, you're a bad person. Um, and I think you, you have, demonstrated over years that that you are committed to fighting against that and i'm grateful and i'm sure many other people are grateful for the work that you've done and i'm very grateful for the time you've spent with us today so thank you oh thank you i don't know i don't know if i should if i should uh say thank you and then bow out but i wanted to say um just on what david said um where he's like oh i was trying to just like prove i'm not some gun toting truck driver like minus the wife beating bit, like what's so wrong with being a gun toting truck driver? Like, why is that immediately? You're like, oh, I'm not, you know, you got to prove that you're not a gun toting truck driver. Right. And that's that's really sad. Like you need to be able to talk to people like if you can't convince just regular people or 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 and you're completely against even the prospect of doing so, maybe there's something wrong with your politics. And that, I find that really sad because. Like, again, using the example of the trucker convoy, like, I'm not saying that that was like revolution itself. It obviously wasn't. But I just found it very interesting that it was a movement of people who were for self-determination. And the way that the left reacted was to immediately call them Nazis and want nothing at all to do with it. Whereas um, if I had been there, I would have tried to talk to people and uh, learn from them and hopefully try to, you know, impute some ideas myself. Um, I would have tried to open up a conversation and I would hope, I wish that there was some kind of movement that I could, you know, that, that could be built from things like this and other things that go on around the world. But one of the people that I found very interesting from that trucker convoy was Gord McGill, um, who is like, I, I, you know, I, I found him interesting. I, I 
tried to find his number and I wound up calling him on the phone. We chatted for like two hours and now I consider him a friend. And um, I love that guy. And one of the reasons why I love him is because he is like this in a in a previous era, he would have been that kind of working class autodidact organizing the reading groups in the factory kind of thing. He is he reads, he thinks about things, he's completely open minded, but he was so turned off by the let who just came at him from all directions, calling him a Nazi, this sort of thing, that he wanted nothing to do with them. And uh, he was shocked to find a Marxist um, who was willing to have a conversation with him. He he didn't know that that existed. That's terrifying, for one thing. And I sent him The Soul of Man Under Socialism by Oscar Wilde, and he loved it. <laughs> and we had a conversation about it. And, you know, and I try, and he was like so shocked and excited to learn that all of this bullshit that like shutting down free speech and control of the body and all this stuff had nothing to do with Marxism. That Marx, you know, that he came from a movement that called them that, that they called themselves encyclopedists. Like they were so excited about the Enlightenment. They were so excited about the French Revolution. You know, they named themselves after the great figures of the Enlightenment. Um, and the, you know, like the man loved freedom, loved freedom of speech. And um, anyway, so this is the kind of person that like, you know, you want to make inroads with that could well see him you know, leading a working class movement is a great kind of like intellect of just a regular kind of person. Anyway, we, we, we totally write these people off to create these niche movements that show how good you are and how capable you are with these new linguistic codes. And we forget what it's really about. Like part of the thing that bothers me is that because I think the falling rate of profit is correct, I think we are headed for increasingly destructive crises. And um, I put lectures up on my channel sometimes, but um, I put up the lectures from like 2018, 2019, I think, because in 2018, 2019, as I was explaining to students the falling rate of profit, I said to them, I am concerned <laughs> because we are due for another crisis, but nobody wants to deal with the fallout of a crisis, which is that the working class gets mad and it's a dangerous kind of situation. Uh, and so they're kicking the can down the road. They're doing everything that they can to avoid the, quote unquote, necessary destruction that capitalism requires now. And they don't want to feed the beast, nor should they. But it's, they're going to have to eventually. And I thought, I'm scared we're going to have a war. Something's going to happen. Uh, something's going to happen. We have massive capital destruction. Massive. Uh, and I am really fucking afraid. And I think I was right because <laughs> like like COVID happened. I think I think um, Biggie was correct in saying that this was a kind of controlled demolition. And I'm not saying that COVID wasn't real. It obviously was real. I'm saying opportunistically it became a, 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 an opportunistic way of destroying small capital, that sort of thing, you know, through regu regulatory capture and all that stuff. Um, they were like, oh, thank God. It's like manna from heaven. But it's not enough. It's not enough. I am scared. I am worried for the future. This is why I am worried. I am. I have no time or patience for people who want to sit there and play a game. You know, it always reminds me. You ever read Huckleberry Finn? Do you know the part where Jim is like stuck? He's like locked in a shed or something, and the kids are outside and they're trying to dig him out with a spoon. And there's like shovels around and stuff, but they're digging Jim out with a spoon. And 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 like they're just having a fun time of it. They're like, and you know, bring Jim will be a, a mission that we'll pass on to our children and our children's children. And Jim's like locked in a shed, and he's like, kids, they're gonna fucking come kill me. <laughs> Could you hurry up? But for them, it's just a game. That's how I feel about movements that call themselves left today. They're like digging Jim out with a spoon when there are shovels around, and I'm like. Guys, can you stop fucking around? Because this is serious. I am worried. We need to get real here. Like, we, you, you need to stop all this backbiting and infighting and saying, oh, I don't want to be seen with a gun-toting truck driver. Well, you're going to have to be seen with them at some point, and their guns are probably going to be useful. I shouldn't say that. But, like, you know, if, if you're really, really serious, you know, we want to get out of the impasse that we're in, we got to think seriously about how to get out of the impasse that we're in. And that's going to take more than, you know, um, thinking about your own identity, navel gazing and decide and finding yourself. OK, it's it's about more than that. I think that's a perfect note to end on. So thank you so much for coming. It's been an honor. It's been engaging. There's a lot of stuff I'd love to come back to with you in the future. So thank you for coming.
All right. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Take care. And then we'll be right back uh, in a second here, folks, for the, uh, well, we're going to have Dr. Christine Louis de Soli here to talk about a lot of things, but in particular, the particular versus the universal. Uh, and why she doesn't go for uh, class politics, why she doesn't go for um, saying it's the working class. Um, and so it's interesting because you would think that she would if you know much about her positions. In fact, I recently got it wrong. I recently got it wrong. And so uh, we're going to be allowing her to set the record straight. And then I might hystericize her a little bit on some stuff she said last time she was here. So stick around. It's going to get interesting. And we'll be right back after the uh, PSA here. I'm going to go eat some food really quick. Be right back. Thinking is super uncool, and that's why you should do it. It's just like almost anything that's like cool anymore. Um, yeah, it just sucks. And I think that's like what the underground movement has always been about is just like seeing what's in the mainstream, being like it ain't there and kind of like cobbling something together, you know, and and yeah, it's a little mismatched, but that's like its beauty. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. We bring primary texts from leading lights of diverse fields to bear on topical issues and works popular in our current world. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. and uh, amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best editing collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. Seriously. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarricker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. Usually a good edited collection has good essays, but you only want to read a few. Every essay makes me want to read the other essays because you have a vision. Everyone that you invited, you invited for a reason. You weren't some fake publicist. He's like, hey, someone says a new book, have them on your show. No, you only talk to people because you've read shit by them that you've right, thought right, about, that you right. think has value, even if you disagree. So I think that's what's amazing. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages, five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground has already put out eight courses, two books, one, my book, Time Energy, and the other, Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of underground theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. Support at this stage of the operation is more crucial than ever because my savings were used up over the last year of getting this established. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people 
at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive, so excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. If you cannot afford it, but want to get involved with some of the stuff behind the paywall, I have made a financial aid scholarship you can sign up for here in the description. Quick side note, some people ask about the profit motive. At this point, I have not actually made a return on any of my investment in terms of the amount of time energy that I put into things, the amount of savings I've actually put into things, the opportunity cost of the work that I'm doing as opposed to the other kinds of things that I could be doing for money. Uh, but more importantly, I don't actually make enough to pay for my cost of living. The goal is to make enough for my cost of living. And then once that is achieved, everything over that amount is going to go towards expanding the operation to the point where I can hire Michael Downs, AKA Mikey of The Dangerous Maybe, to be a full-time researcher and part-time teacher at Theory Underground. All right, so with that aside, I just wanna say also, if you are a worker with earbuds, what's up? I see you. I work at Amazon part-time and everything I do is for my past self who used to work there full-time. Most workers with earbuds couldn't care less about theory, but I do believe a working class intellectual revolution could grow out of the underground theory scene. My hope is that what I have built here will contribute to making the scene something more than just a scene and you into something more than just a scene kid. We're trying to make this into a real intellectual milieu capable of leading a way forward beyond the imminent crises facing humanity. But for that, we need thinking now more than ever. Start thinking. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program and also make sure to like, comment, subscribe and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind! <laughs> I love you so much. Yeah, I love you too. All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, before I bring uh, Nance back and now our new guest of the hour, uh, Christine Luigi Soli, I'm going to pull up something I said on Twitter that was wrong. And I'll, we're going to be having uh, Christine here uh, to correct the record, really. I'm going to give her this time to, to really... Uh, I, I don't want to say put me in my place. It's not going to be so extreme, I don't think. But uh, <laughs> but I was wrong. But I was wrong about um, something recently um, in framing her uh, position. And so I just want to pull that up. So if I just type theory underground anti-politics, it doesn't even come up. So don't worry, everybody. It doesn't exist. I was going to read it out. Uh, but... I'll just paraphrase by saying that anti-politics is a position that I actually advocate for. And I, I tagged Daniel Tutt and Christine Louis de Soli as examples of people who take anti-politics to be a bad thing. And I was saying it's actually a good thing. And I was saying that part of the issue is that there is no solution through um, class organizing, working class organizing, class politics. Not, not that I'm against those things. I, I want a working class movement. I want, uh, or at least I want things to be better for the working class. Uh, ultimately, the uh, abolition of uh, this thing altogether uh, so that we can be free, really. But uh, my, my point was simply that the current options on the table that are alternatives to liberalism or this sort of fusionist leftism or this sort of identitarian thing um, can't come through working class organizing alone. It can't come through... Uh, this stuff because that just gets co-opted right back into working class identity politics, right? Uh, and so that's that was kind of what I was saying. And Christine responded on Twitter just saying, yeah, well, that's I, I'm not for that anyway. Uh, 
I'm for universalism. I'm not for a, a class politics per se. And I felt a little foolish. I was like, oh my God, I've been arguing with a boogeyman. And so here she is. I'm going to bring her on right now and, uh, and we'll give her the, the, the stage to correct, correct things. Welcome, Christine. How are you doing today? Uh, uh, fine. Thank you. Um, hello. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm not very natural. Uh, yes. Hello. I found your tweet, actually. Uh, you, you, you found your it. Tweet. You did. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't find yeah. it. Okay. You did. Well, if you if you will uh, send it to me, maybe through uh, Messenger or something like that, I'll share it into the group chat and then people can have a look at it themselves or maybe I'll put How it in the comment section for the video later. How do you do that? I mean, you, yeah. your tweets were uh, some tweets. The top one. And uh, yeah. Yeah. What you, uh, anyway, you said we need anti-politics, actually. And then you said that... Um, uh, you want me to respond to it? No, okay. You said you are. We need anti politics, and you said that uh, class politics is is no good. Yes. Uh, you can. You, yeah. Actually, you are also saying that it can never exist again. Uh, and right. that I I responded by saying that uh, I'm not uh, a class politics lefty, in this in the sense uh, that I I. Uh, I'm more into universalist politics, but also because I understand that a lot of the class politics is identity politics with class as um, an identity. Um, but I also argue that um, the reason is because of the understanding of what class means today. Um, and a lot of the uh, and notions and understanding of class is a, a sociological understanding of class in the sense that it's become an identity. So, and, and in, in a way, when you think about class today, uh, you can see how it becomes uh, even more of an identity than anything else. Um, it's not only a sociological uh, category, but it's an identity. So that's why you have, for example, some at the moment talking, calling themselves um, working class academics. So they're academics, they're working and then, you know, have a professions, uh, but they still themselves as working class, uh, as if they have the culture, uh, of the working class, the background of the working class, and uh, uh, you know the identity. The identity is working class, and if you uh, basically an academic with an identity as a working class, you see that the working class, in the sense of class, in the sense of, the, for me, the Marxist understanding of class is gone. It becomes an identity, and if it becomes an identity, then the politics beyond the working class uh, becomes an identity politics. And uh, the good example, uh, and identity politics with class, um, um, I'm um, agreeing with, um, what's his, I can't remember his name, uh, Thomas. What is his name? His, uh, first name. Mm. But anyway, he's arguing that um, uh, uh, um, in the past, some of the class politics, uh, it didn't, I don't think you're, you're, I can't remember if you call it energy politics, but he was arguing that uh, in the past when people were, for example, fighting for institutions or fighting for uh, actually even things for uh, um, wages or, or working class culture, in a way, um, they were defending identity politics based on class. They were basically um, forgetting that Class politics in, in, on, this, on, the, on the original ideas was as a way of um, fighting in changing society, not as fighting for the interests of class as a class. So the ultimate uh, lefting um, arguments is to be able to uh, um, abolish class. So abolish the working class. You don't, you don't fight for the interests of the working class within capitalism as such, as the aim of politics, but you're using the, you're fighting for the interests of the working class as a way of abolishing class and basically as a way of uh, changing capitalism to an, a new society, uh, classless society, that's, that's, the, that's the things. And then, so when you have um, a lot of people in the past and today uh, are using class as a um, identity, what they are doing is basically uh, fighting for the interests of working class within capitalism and it becomes an end instead of a means. Do you understand the difference? For me, it's a, the way I say it is the way, it's the means. You, you can fight for a working class for better wages, for example, 
uh, and its identity politics in a way. But if you make it only as the end of your uh, political aim, like trade, trade unionists, for example, uh, it becomes a pure identity politics and um, it becomes uh, conservative politics for me. It's a very conservative politics. It, it doesn't, um, well, actually, conservative politics, the, what, what I mean by conservative politics is that it keeps the status quo. It doesn't challenge um, the society that we have today. Do I talk too much? Okay. No, never, never. <clears throat> It's always my goal to get you to talk until you think you've talked too much, you know, but, um, Nance, are you all clear on the arguments here? Does this all make sense to you? Does this kind of, I, uh, I, I want to give you a chance to kind of respond to it before I bring it back to the, the tweet and all of that. It seems, it seems to track. Um, and I, I think I agree. Um, if, if our aim is to, um, maintain the status quo and just make it a little bit more bearable or more um, at least have the appearance, you know, of checking all the right boxes on the checklist of, Oh, this is good. Um, then yeah, uh, I, I'm all for it. When, when the, I don't know, the situation or the circumstance of someone becomes their essential quality that is used as an identity category. Um, and the aim of a politics built around that is to just keep that there and never go beyond it, then ultimately it would just become a workerism or become rainbow capitalism. Um, and we already know we don't want that. So I, I think I'm on board un unless I'm missing a huge part. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, the, uh, to, uh, are you responding, uh, Dave? Sorry. Sorry. You know, I'll, I'll just set you up to go. I was just going to say that <clears throat> I think that I was becoming aware of working class as an identity and the problems that come with that in a world where the only kinds of politics that are allowed to exist are, you know, performed as identity politics or organized along those lines. Um, I was becoming aware of it in a sort of uh, not fully conscious way when I think uh, Christine first pointed it out. So she really gets full credit for being the first person to really make me think about it. Um, and so she's been thinking about it um, expressly for longer than I have. Um, I'll come back to that, though. I, wa I want to set you up to just to go to respond to, to Nance. Uh, no, I, w I was going to say, Yes, in a way, yes, some people call it uh, workerism. So, um, uh, or, you know, you, I'm not, I'm not a kind of, in a way, I'm not against uh, people fighting for their interests. So the same way as uh, identity politics around uh, workers, uh, fighting for the interests of workers, like better wages, live, better living conditions. I'm not against that in, in, in that sense. And I'm not, it's the same as I'm not against uh, uh, black or minorities or women or, you know, different groups or, or uh, in academics fighting for their interests, specific interests. What for me, it's, it depends on what your aim, political and um, political um, aim is. And, 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 and it really it depends of, yeah, the, your political aim. What do you want? What do, do you want to fight for the interests of different identity groups within a society, within capitalism? Or do you have an understanding that uh, uh, a better society will have to be, um, you know, changing capitalism? You know, uh, my political aim is a transformation from uh, the capitalist society to something that is beyond, uh, in a way, classless society where the working class doesn't exist or the the black, uh, you know, the black identity doesn't is not important anymore in politics. And this this so if I want to do that, then I will have to understand that the identity politics cannot be my ultimate 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 uh, aim. And this is what's happening today. This is what what is wrong with left wing politics. A lot of the left wing politics is that they are. Um, using identity, different groups that are fighting for the interest, and it becomes the end of their politics anymore. Even if they were saying, oh, we want to have to fight for social transformation and we want to change society, what they are doing is that they are fighting for the interest of particular identity groups within, and it becomes a conservative politics. And 
And even if you're fighting for the majority, which is the working class, you're still fighting for the interest within the society. And without the understanding that you want to go beyond that society or you want to change it to something different. I, would, I mean, so you're using you're using conservative strictly to mean people whose politics ultimately serve the maintenance of the status quo, but not uh, what we would call like conservative issues or conservative values, because os ostensibly uh, people with progressive values and people with conservative values and then people with, rap, you know, libertine values and people with communal Values all all could collaborate towards some bigger project where they think those values are better served in the future. Would would you agree with that? Yes, I'm talking about conservative with what they call it with a small C. Okay. So not conservative as uh, 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 like conservative party or, or Republicans. I'm talking about conservative in the sense of you keep the status quo. Um, yeah, it's a it's conservative cool. with a small C. Okay. You see what I mean is to basically, uh, I, I am I am trying to challenge all the ideas that um, that prevent us to go further than what we that the static core that it is today. Um, so all the ideas that keep us within what is, instead of challenging what is to go what what could we cut what basically all the ideas that stop our imaginations and our ability to go further than what we have today. So that's what a conservative conservative politics for me is, um, uh, or conservative ideas, or ideas that keep the status quo. And it can be, in, in a way, it's very wide. Um, you can have sure. left-wing uh, conservative politics and right-wing and center conservative politics. It's all the ideas that that challenge, who keeps, actually, we save the status quo, not even challenge, but save the status quo keeps people within what is. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I would just cede your usage of it in the context of this conversation. I just don't tend to use it that way, but I get what you're saying, right? I get what you're saying. And I think that it 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 works for your purposes. Um, but I wanted to raise a series but of it, objections. It's important. I mean, the, 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 for me, the, the definition of conservative, because... I, we are in a business of being, uh, um, I mean, radical. I mean, politically, uh, my understanding, my universalist politics is on the understanding that there is a better society than it is today, yes? A better society for humanity than it is today. Right. So I have to uh, look at all the ideas that prevent us to understand how we can change that. My and so issue it means with... That my issue with your definition, and like I said, I think it works for your purposes, but my only issue with it is I think it turns, uh, well, it does, it's not the way that anyone I know who identifies as conservative uses the term. It's a way that only serves the interests or of, the, of a discourse held between progressives that is used to otherize uh, anyone who's not kind of in that milieu, right? So like, for instance, my parents, they want society to be different. They want it to be different. And they don't want to go back to the 1950s. They don't, there's no period in the past that they want to go back to. But nonetheless, they'll wear the Make America Great Again hat. When they wear that, what they mean by it is, the U.S. used to be great. It can be great again. But when they, what they mean is they want to have better jobs. They don't want their small business being taxed so heavily. You know, these very basic things. They want to be able to send their kids to school and not have their kids potentially uh, sequestered off by some psychiatrists or some counselors or something into a whole industry that, you know, they, they actually lose contact with their kid or something like that. Like they're afraid of real things that just conservatives, of course, are going to be afraid of, but they would they want to live in a different society. I don't think that, uh, and, and so when we say, oh, well, that's conservative, it's it, what, what comes along with it is a connotation of bad or of uh, non-preferable. And it's like, it makes it seem like any future looking agenda has to close out uh, conservatives from being in that future. And I make a big separation between uh, conservative leaders, the representatives, and 
just, you know, kind of salt of the earth, small business owning or working class uh, conservatives who, for them, it really comes down to some basic values. They think the Democrats don't care about family. They think the Democrats don't care about their small business. They think that, or their farm, right? Like there's these very basic things and they feel like, well, not only do liberals not care, but liberals disdain them. Um, and even blame them for all the problems in the society. And so when they're looking for, like, they would want a better society. They don't want to be left out of the future or be forced out of the future. Um, and then they're, they're not just trying to, you know, recreate the past in the way that a progressive, in the progressive discourse, that is kind of just assumed. Oh, yeah, well, conservatives, this is what they want. They want something that's gone that will never come back. And uh, my only. I don't even wholly disagree because I understand that even my, you could give my parents everything they want. It would basically be the society we have. I do agree that in the way that you're using the term, they're conservatives and everyone else I've ever worked with in any workplace I've ever worked at. And at this point, it's like 35 workplaces. They're all conservatives in the sense that none of them have this, you know, realistic uh, vision of something that would get us beyond the deadlocks we're currently in. Right. Uh, but 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 but, 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 th but then we've expanded. But then we've expanded the term so wide, so broadly that it includes but, everybody. But this is different. You're talking about if, if somebody wants a better job, I wouldn't say, "Well, it's conservative politics," because you know you want a better job. It's good things to you know. I would like to have a better job, and I I would like to have a better house, and I would like to have a better life. It's not conservative politics as such. What I'm saying is that is the when I call conservative politics, it's the idea is that. When they are developed, they prevent people to imagine something different. So having a better, wanting a better job is a, for me, it's a wish. You want to have a better job. But if you're saying to have a better job, for example, is to, uh, let's say, I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm very much in discussion of the immigration, to, for example, to, to close America from immigrants and have a certain amount of, um, um, people coming in this country and then we're going to build the, the jobs for uh uh you know the working class america i would say it's conservative politics because then you do not understand the problems in society but the way you explain it you're making it as if like the only things to do is just to target a groups of people the immigrants for example and you don't challenge what is the problem today the, so the social order that is the problem today for me it's always based on how I understand the problems today. I understand the problems as the problems of the social order, capitalist society. So if you're saying that if you want to have a better society, better job is just to challenge and stop the immigration, what you're saying is that the problem is the immigrants, not the social order and the way it's organized. So you basically prevent people to look at something more than just a blame game, because this is how I call it, the blame game. So, uh, Thank you, from, yeah. But at the, the same time, there is also some conservative politics with a big C that, for example, uh, but the problem is with when you're discussing conservative politics with a big C is that conservative politics has a lot of different meaning depending on the country, the, um, different, also depending on the time. Conservative politics has not been fixed. So conservatism, basically, is not uh, uh, fixed. And it's not also the same in different countries. So that is... Well, we'll, I call it conservative politics. And then you can discuss what is in, in America, conservative politics, and what is in, uh, in, in France, or what is in Britain. And there will, you will have different understanding of conservative politics today and in the past. But what I mean oh. by conservative, in my understanding, is, is always understanding of as a radical, as a left. Right. So the stand, this is, this is, if you want to change the world for, for, for good and make it significant change. So that would be the radical left thing then, then, yeah. then conservative would just be anything that maintains the status quo. Um, and so do you, so then I don't think the way that I'm using the term fits into either uppercase C or lowercase C, because I'm trying to dignify the fact that there are um, different human values and that those values have a sort of trans historical necessity to them. Uh, and that the way that politics co-opts those values or needs, um, 
is going to be different in different societies. I call this psychological gerrymandering in my book. I, I never really get into it too much, but the basic idea is that there are conservative values, there are liberal values, there are, and I'm speaking loosely when I say liberal in this case, I am not using the word to signify John Stuart Mill and John Locke and, you know, uh, Alexander Hamilton or something like that. I'm talking about liberal in the sense of openness to new experiences, caring more about the 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 wider society, caring more about empathy and compassion, what, kind of these feminine, it's honestly, we could kind of say feminine qualities in this sort of traditional um, way of saying that word, um, as opposed to conservative is going to be more about security, parochial, like caring about what's immediate, um, uh, probably prioritizing uh, what's closer and it's uh, fostering its health over really concern for what's outside of the sphere of its immediate concern. And it's, so in that case, it's, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't see as far and it definitely doesn't trust as far, right? From the liberal standpoint in this looser sense, the American liberal is about trusting society. It's about trusting the government. It's about trusting social programs um, and and being tolerant of pretty much anybody and everybody in that society as long as they're tolerant, right? Whereas on the conservative side, it's like, look, I don't know everybody. I don't trust everybody. I'm prioritizing what I do know, and that is my family. Uh, and the, if the society or the school cannot respect that, then I'm going to come down on the side of the, the family or the church or, or whatever. Because, you know, pick your, your given community, that, that whether it's a church or something else. Um, and I, I take these to be, I said, I, I made a very strong claim to say trans historical. I'm saying across all societies, there are individuals who have prioritized, uh, this one way over this other way. And then of course we have libertine values, which are neither liberal nor cons or, or conservative. And then we have these other ones. There's all kinds of independent positions. Um, and then, of course, these get codified or articulated or, or contextualized or, or, or co-opted in different ways by different political parties, by different political representatives. And I think, if I remember right, in your book on, uh, will you stand by me? Right, it, it, your book. Will you stand? What's the 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 first part of the book? What's it called? The transcending, transcending racial division. Trans transcending. Trans Transcending Racial Divisions, Will You Stand By Me? In that book, I think I remember you actually critiquing this way of thinking about conservative and liberal in the sort of way that George Lakoff uses it. <clears throat> Is that correct? Or am I just... Am I just... Uh... I cr criticize both the conservative and liberal, but I also, if I remember in the book, or, or maybe it could be also the, on the, my thesis, uh, basically saying that uh, they are both wrong. And actually, I would say that the conservative is based, is, especially today, is based on liberal, on liberalism. No, 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 so no. I, I, I don't mean, I don't mean, the, I mean, I mean the psychologizing of the categories, liberal and uh, conservative. It depends. That... Uh, in that case, uh, I, I can't make a difference between my, um, for me, the conservative is, it's, it's more of a, uh, based on the, the under, understanding of uh, the individual versus society. And this okay. is how I separate the conservative politics. So the conservative politics have an understanding of the individual in society in the sense that uh, the individual works for the uh, 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 in a community and there is a natural hierarchy. And, you know, they have, they have a tendency of understanding that there is a hierarchy, uh, a natural or social hierarchy, and that the individual works within that kind of society. So, uh, so the conservative will have a tendency, for example, the common good, a lot of them are discussing the common good and you're working together and, um, you know, so there is less individual. And when you have the individual uh, in liberal, it's more of the, the liberal look at, at the individual as... Um, what I always criticize as as a, a separate entities. So they will uh, look at the it, actually the, I'm talking about the liberal as today, yeah, um, because liberalism and conservatism has changed over the years. But uh, the liberal understanding of society is based on this idea that you have uh, distinct entities, i.e., the individual, and that uh, they don't see really society. So that uh, society is more of an aggregate 
of a distinct and and individual. So we are you an individual and me an individual, and we all live together as as an aggregate. So they basically never see the social order, the capitalist social order. They don't see the they see some of the structure, but they don't see the total society. Uh, and the way they see the society, it's if they see society, it's only as a kind of individual together. And that's the reason why, for example, let's, let's look at uh, racism. Their solutions as a liberal will be to have education. And it's based on the idea that an individual has the problems with uh, the wrong, having having the wrong ideas. You need education, you need to change, and then you fight against racism. So they have this understanding of society as an individual aggregate. Do you understand what I'm saying? And where the conservatives yes. have uh, more of an understanding of the society and less of the individual. Society uh, with the individual working within society. This is how, uh, I mean... Uh, I, but that 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 is how I would understand like a John Locke versus Edmund Burke kind of, uh, you know, liberal versus conservative. Uh, it would does that track like it, it kind of just the, and especially uh, it sounds a lot more European. It's 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 just that in the United States, conservatives are so liberal, right? Because they're all into the radical responsibility and individualism as well. So that's why it gets a little more complicated, but. But I think even though that might be true, it's like, uh, well, no, I, I guess it's, just, it's, it's, it's complicated. It's what? It's, I mean, it's, this definition, these definitions are, if we want to discuss conservatism and liberalism, these are very simplistic way of, of defining them because there is no strict definitions of liberalism and conservatism. Even the even the people who are calling themselves liberal or conservative will not have this, uh, the same understanding and will not have the same positions in politics. And uh, over the time, it also changed. So uh, it's even, even my definition is a very simplistic uh, understanding of what conservatism and liberalism is. Do you see what I mean? It's just liberal liberal you had liberal for example were anti slavery and liberal were for slavery and they right. were all liberals right. so you, there was no strict definitions of liberalism and conservatism and even people studying it will have you know different definitions and uh, for me uh, i don't i don't spend too much time discussing the conservatism and liberalism, uh, uh, except when um, I try to um, basically, when I discuss liberalism, especially uh, because uh, uh, I think that conservatism is very much based on uh, kind of a liberal notions um, that is wrong. It's only because I want to show that uh, the when you're discussing liberalism and conservatism, you're forgetting what is, for me, is the problem. The social, the totality of the capitalist social order, it's never discussed within all this ideology. And for me, that is the problem. Because if you don't discuss that, then you don't discuss the problems that we need to challenge. I am 100%. not into discussing which individuals is wrong and which individual is right in that sense. I'm discussing how can we go from society A to society B? What is the solution? How can we change that? Can we change that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is also a first discussion is can 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 humanity really change a society, a capitalist society which is in a way unconscious to a, a more conscious society? Is that possible? I think it's possible, but I'm not sure if it's possible if we use <laughs> conservative in this way, since it does have these different meanings. But I also I didn't want to get stuck on this, and I, I had said that, you know, oh, it's something maybe for later. But no, but now it has been this thing that we have kind of gotten deeper into. And so I would almost, I, I think that we should actually give it a, another couple of minutes, especially since Me Panther in the chat said, what is the point of contention here? Am I missing something? Um, well, Me Panther, I think we have like the same goals and different ideas about how to get there. And, uh, 
And and this does actually kind of segue into a bigger question about universalism that I want to get into with you. Uh, but I want to give Nance a moment here to... Uh, well, you can answer me, Panther, by saying what the point of contention here is. Because if you can't even... If you don't know, then I've done a bad job uh, explaining my position. But uh, you're muted there. Um, no, it, 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 it can feel like um, just kind of focusing on the form um, and not really going beyond that. And it seems like, oh, you know, you're just talking about forest and trees. Um, and in a sense, that's, that's true in a setting where you have um, mutually, you know, intelligent individuals with mutual respect and, and you can agree and you can see the usage and in, in this and that. But when you're, when you are talking about broad politics, um, it actually does matter what signifiers you use um, because you're trying to communicate with, with people. And if, if the language you're using to communicate with people is confusing those people, then it kind of is on you as the communicator um, to observe and adapt the language you're using. And that is what, that, that is what's going on. Um, it is in a sense, just an argument about form, not even an argument, a disagreement about form. Um, and yes, here in this setting, we can agree, well, I'm using it this way. Let's agree to use it this way, but it does matter for anyone who's here right now and who wants to leave and go have conversations in real life with other people who don't already agree with you or who aren't willing to be charitable enough to use your usage of the word. That's why it does matter to, to, to hash out the disagreements and the misunderstandings and, and the this and the that. Um, me, Panther, that's the point of tension. Um, so and that, yeah. Yeah. No, if you had something more, go for it. <clears throat> no, I just, to, to say like, I, um, I think I, I tend to disagree with you, Dave, on, on this. Like, I, I think we probably had quite a bit of back and forth about it. Um, and I don't think there is a, an easy solution. So I think if anyone is trying to convince you that there, there is an easy solution, they've either not, you know, dwelled with it or tarried with it long enough. Um, or they're, they're missing something. Um, cause in a sense, the way, the way it's being used, the way Christine is using it is intuitive in a sense. Um, but it, is that just because I tend to already agree with her on, on what, you know, the, the bulk of her argument, I don't know. It could be, uh, or it could be, she has tapped into some trans historical trends and, and this and that. I don't know. Um, but don't get frustrated. It's not an argument. It, it is still an important point. Um, Cause that's what we're talking about. The universal and the particular, like if, if you're trying to have something that, that truly has a universal message, you do have to take particular filters into account because everybody has these filters and some people can, uh, overcome them and some people can't. So if you are concerned with a universal message, um, it is worth pairing with these things that might seem like silly backs and forths. Yeah, I guess that would be, that's a good setup. So if you had uh, five minutes to speak to every human on the planet, Christine, and you wanted to lay out what you believe to be some sort of a universal message, would you say, I want X, Y, and Z things, not something conservative? Like, would the word conservative even enter your discourse if you were speaking to everybody? I don't think this is universalism in the sense that I understand it. I mean, m m when I call universalist politics, it's it's based on my political aim, in the sense that my aim is a social transformation for uh, a society that will have a uh, better human development. So, I my understanding for me is. I'm not anti-capitalist just because, you know, it's just because it's fashionable. Um, um, my understanding is that the society that we have today prevents uh, uh, humans to develop 
uh, more than what the, he has developed already. Uh, and uh, I mean, for me, you cannot ha have humanity or, or understanding of humanity and understanding of ourselves cannot be outside the society that we live today. So we have developed in a certain way because of the society that we lived. But I think that the society that we have today, capitalism, has given us some um, um, ideas that we can go further. But unfortunately, the way that we organize, it prevents us to develop in that direction. And for me, that is the reason, one of the reasons I want to change it. So my aim is social transformation in the sense of going from one society to another society. And that the reason I want a social transformation is for humanity's freedom. And but the, the understand my understanding of freedom will depend of in a way of the 21st century uh, uh, understanding of freedom. I, I cannot tell you how humanity's freedom would be in the if we achieve it. What I'm my understanding is that we can do more that we have today, but the way that we most of us is organized in a sense of um what, what I'm talking about, in a sense of we are workers, we are prevented from uh, developing ourselves individually as individuals. Most of the workers cannot develop themselves individually, but we cannot develop them ourselves also as, as a humanity. Even though capitalism has a tendency to, de to develop, I mean, capitalism is not all bad, in a sense that it gives us some pitches to develop ourselves, but at the same time, the way it's organized, it also prevent us from developing. So it's we are we are we have the ability to go further, and then it kind of prevent us to go further, and it always goes like that. So, and I'm saying that I think that humanity today has the um, ability to go further than what we have today. That's this is based on my belief that. Humanity has the capacity today to go further than what we have uh, as a society. So to further than an unconscious society, because for me, I call it an unconscious society in the sense that we are regulated by capital, basically. Uh, cap uh, conflict between capital and, and labor, and we, we, we are, we are regu regulated by capital and the market. And I don't think, I think that humanity can do more than that today. Um, On this, I think we are in complete agreement. Um, I guess the, the, the issue that I raise with you, but it's not just you. I want everyone to know this is an issue that I raise with any leftist who says that they are uh, a universalist or a working classist or a, uh, whatever you want to say, uh, but uh, I think that the universal position that, you know, to say I'm, I'm, I'm for a universal uh, politics that brings social transformation and gets us out of point A, the status quo, into point B, being freedom, that we have the capacities to have a better society at our disposal. We just aren't organizing in the right way. Um, I would say I agree with all of that. Um, and then for me, the, the, the sticking point really is that um you know i'm not so interested in the in the the ideal future you know i'm not I, of course i know that you're not i'm not calling you a utopian uh i don't think any of us are utopians i think we're all realists in some sense but the position for me is like i don't look to some distant you know classless society or fully automated luxury gay space communism or whatever i don't know for me it's um my ideal that i moved to, that i want to kind of orient my thinking towards um also maintains a sort of pessimism and that is that it's more likely that we're going to end up in mad max world and that everybody with money gets off planet and leaves us behind uh, or goes into bunkers and then like exterminates the rest of us. Like that's more likely. Um, and the kinds of legitimation narratives for that kind of violence, um, the kind of mass uh, genocidal projects of future wars um, that might just be right around the corner, are likely to be old ones that we're all very familiar with, such as religion. 
uh, you know, oh, well, you know, they're Palestinians or Gentiles and, you know, we're the, we're God's elect or, you know, you get, you get these kinds of religious narratives, even though that might not be the real reason that the war is going on. Uh, but you also get, oh, well, they're reactionaries. Oh, well, they're communists. You know, you get these old ideas that get rolled out. But I think that uh, the newer uh, ideas that are going to be brought in are uh, uh, these that are uh, kind of kind of like this idea of like hyper racism, which is to say uh, the cyborg humanist or post humanist future versus the people who are against. Um, you know, and you, they might call themselves naturals. In my work, I in unpublished work, I refer to them as naturals. Uh, uh, Daguerreus refers to them as Terrans. Terrans versus cosmists. The cosmists will be the people who want singularity. You know, they are already being led by the Kurzweils of the world. Yeah, Nance. I I almost exclusively refer to them as primitivists when when i write about them because i th i think they're necessarily missing the point so anyway continue well i i i'm going with the terms that the people would probably either refer to themselves as kind of i'm going with their self-conception as opposed to what they are i do agree that they are primitivists or or paleo conservatives you know we would probably call them that um but that this split between you know uh hippies and granola people and paleo conservatives and uh, anarcho primitivists and and the uh trans uh humanist projects and i'm not saying that in a oh we're also just talking about trans activism or no 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 this is separate we're talking about post humanism transhumanism uh cyborg people people who are excited to leave their bodies behind people who are in a rush to get out of their bodies or to be able to change their natural quote unquote natural realities and if not explore the heavens you know go out explore the universe star trek style um then they you know they 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 want to live in computers and, and stuff like that and so we have this this big split between the people who are you know spending their lives on screens and the the virtuals versus the the people who are doing co you know concrete forms of labor or whatever and it's it's all of this can be just oversimplified into the split between naturals and 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 uh, cyborgs. Okay, and I'm I am oversimplifying, but I do think that this is going to be a, a serious driver of disagreements as we move forward. I do think that people who don't want to rush into uh, bioengineering futures will be labeled reactionary. I b believe that they will be labeled. Um, you know, oh, you, you're, you're nostalgic for some bygone era. You want some kind of a natural state of things that will never existed in the first place. You're just a reactionary reacting to progress because now we have the technological means at our disposal to become something more. Right. And this was not a split that Marx saw coming. It wasn't even on the horizon. Like, uh, it, this, the bioengineering wasn't what it is. And so I guess that's, for me, my big issue is I see the old left was there for the working class. I saw that the new left was there for civil rights and anti-war. And of course, both still exist in their farcical forms for the most part. There's some great people working to reform both. And then there's obviously great people working to fuse those two past movements together. And my position has been, well, what's next? What's the next left? And then it would probably be on the side of not the cyborgs versus the naturals or the naturals versus the cyborgs, but ultimately saying we're, even if we're, some of us are modifying and other ones aren't modifying, we're all human in some universal way. And we still need to keep that in mind and not let uh, a civil war occur within the actual species itself. Like this is my, my kind of problematic. I come to this conversation uh, from, and so when I'm thinking of universal, um, I'm thinking of, well, no universal projects going to work without particularisms. And I want to kind of then bring that back to the idea of conservatives. They might realize they live in a modern society, but they're trying to do something like Amish people are a good example. Even if you're the most progressive Amish person in the United States, 
you're still pretty freaking conservative because you don't use almost any forms of you know modern technology um only in like limited senses and for specific ends and so uh does that make them the enemy of humanity and does that mean that they're a necessary stumbling block to any kind of progress or is there a way that a universalism can keep dignify respect or at least tolerate amish people or 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 some other kind of conservatism or some kind of particularism i think we are very far from each other <laughs> because for me the all your discussion was um on cyborg or nature or, or amish people it's not about society it's about um actually individuals how they want to live their life so i have against no again nothing against people who wanted to become robots or whatever i mean like i'm talking about metal body and if you if one day science can uh have uh a brain uh, or whatever or, or, or soul or whatever humanity becomes more mechanical i have no issue less mechanical no issue uh, what we are making ourselves is not the issue when i talk about changing society and uh, changing uh, one society to another i very much agree with um what well, least the way i understand marx is that you can understand society by looking at the means of productions and who and who owns the means of production so for me what you talk about is the social in the sense of um culture when i talk about changing society capitalism to another society i'm saying that the means of productions so a society a human society has to be produced from one one year to the next year to the next year and the, the way that is being produced is with the means of production so the uh to make food to make uh equipment to make uh also to reproduce as well to make uh, new workers this is how society can move from one to the next we are in a society where the means of productions is not in the end of the majority and what i mean is that if the factories the the things that that are that we are making in life it's not in the end of the people who are making it it's in the end of the people who are the capitalists basically and for me that's what i want to change whether somebody wants to become uh, a mechanical person or, or, or an animal, I, I really don't care. Uh, but what I'm saying is that the problems today is that because the means of production is in the end of the a minority, there are, uh, are basically the, the work that uh, workers, the way that we produce ourselves, the way that the work, the way that the workers understand themselves and society is problematic what i'm saying is that we are working you're working and you're getting an, a wage what you get the wage is not what you're doing you're working to produce society but you only get a little bit you just get a little bit of a wage a wage to survive basically and, and to live but everything that what we do in society, the most of the things that the workers do, does not benefit from. They don't benefit from what they are doing, and that's what I want to change. We have we have a class society where we have the workers, and then you have the capitalists. This is still how I understand it. This is I'm not into class politics in the sense of uh, identity politics, but I still understand society as a class society where you have the workers who are working doing things. But the means of production is owned by the capitalists, and they are taking the many benefits from this means of production, from this work. Sorry, not this means of production, from the work of the workers. I want to change that, so that the workers can benefit from the what they are producing and can develop themselves and doing other stuff. An example: Why do we work eight hours a day? Do we need to work eight hours a day? And in, in to produce a society, I don't think we need to work eight hours a day. This is very simplistic, but I don't think in in the way that we produce society today, with the industry that we have, the the technology that we have, we do not need to work eight hours a day. 
but we still work most of us work eight hours a day or even more uh, uh, more uh, for a certain wage and that is based on the way that the means is is the means of production i mean what i mean by the means of production is what allow us to produce society I don't know I, if, uh, I I agree. I'm clear. I, I, I no, you don't, you're 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 very clear, and I agree. I agree it's with the labor. I agree with all of that. I just when you say that you don't care if humanity or we become metal or mechanical. Um, what you care about is that the means of production is um, making society every day be what it is, and it's only owned by a handful of people who are interested in it only creating society the way that it currently is where the overwhelming majority of us only have uh, a pittance or a share of that um really nothing you know uh nothing that uh, beyond our necessity is able to really free us right uh, outside of some basic consumer goods or subscriptions in this case uh i agree with all of that and of course i think what is needed is a serious transformation that would free up uh, those resources and the time and the energy everyone needs to be able to have, you know, real relationships and to be able to develop themselves um, in the ways that they think they need to, you know. Um, and so I'm I'm right there with all of that. But the issue is that when we're talking about the the means of production make the workers anew on this like regular basis, um, because obviously like there's a cycle of of training and and death and birth and 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 new people entering the workforce and old people leaving the workforce um and so there, this is social reproduction the issue is that i think the future we're moving into is not that humanity or we is going to become mechanical or metal i think some of us are going to and others are not going to and that that is a split we're already seeing rumblings of and we're not even allowed to talk about it really like i think that the trans activist debates today versus the turfs like this is just the beginnings of something that's only going to compound for the rest of our lives and our children's lives and their grandchildren's lives because people are already experimenting with what are, what's is it called a crisper right like there's already you can already go into your garage with a crisper and genetically modify yourself. Um, and so right now people are getting sex changes. Well, how long until they're doing other kinds of changes? I know a person. But what? But, what, but you, you're talking about uh, people's um, people defining themselves. I mean, there no, is no, 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 I'm not. Hold on, hold I mean, on. What it means to be human beings, uh, if somebody wants to be changed with sex, is, 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 it's a different thing. What it means to be us, what it means to be human beings, and what it means to be a woman will change. Okay. It, I, I am not. Uh, but there are people who are not a... going to. But there are people who are not going to agree. They're going to say that you're becoming something other than human. And there are people who want to become something other than human who will say, "I've moved on from humanity." And I'm not. And I don't think that this is cultural. I think that it is um, a part and parcel to the reproduction of capital. I don't think this is some mere cultural category. It's, you know, the movie Sorry to Bother You, when the workforce that works at the basic, like, Amazon or whatever, they get genetically modified to be, like, these, these super strong, you know, stamina and endurance machines that are basically horse people uh, so that they can work harder and longer. This is what we already see with super soldiers. A lot of the stuff that's being done to modify people today and the experiments that are being done on working class people uh, in the name of, oh, well, how you identify, ultimately serve these, and, and I'm not saying that this is bad or something, I'm just saying that this is part of the reality we're moving into, is that people are becoming, um, some are going to become like these hyper worker things that can't be competed with, whereas others are going to be luxury, leisure, enjoying um, artists, you know, who are, uh, experimenting with various things. So like, but, but then there will always be the people who don't. Um, but at the point that we're not just talking about, you know, uh, steroids, we're not just talking about, uh, uh, drugs. We're actually talking about real biological 
changes to where human beings become obviously an actual part of those means of production, where people take out lifelong loans to modify themselves so that they can be in certain kinds of workspaces. Like this is a different kind of world that we're moving into. And that the, this, this cultural divide between uh, those who want to maintain their biological naturalness, which I agree is problematic. Humans do change. I agree, I agree with you. And Nance agrees with you. Uh, we do change. That's kind of like in our essence. In fact, homo faber, right? Like the idea that we are those beings for whom modification and tools is kind of arguably like what we're all about. Um, I agree with all of that. I'm just saying that how do how does a universalism like for me it's a problem. I want I, I just want you to to see it as a problem and and as a universalist address it like how to deal with it because we can't just say you, well we're all in this together without no you what for me the way you talk about it you're talking about the changes in workers the use of workers by the capitalist and this has always been done do uh, uh, when you when for example when you look at our educations the education education of workers different education has been done to change workers to be able to use some and not others i mean so you will have uh, if you if you using a uh, genetically modified workers to make it better workers so that you can uh, get rid of other workers it's a use of labor in a, within capitalist society but for me, the for me, it's an expression of the society. It's not. It's not the cause of the problem. It's just uh, the the capitalists will be uh, for the the capital. We use labor uh, in di different ways. So you have the social conflicts within workers. It, actually, it's not only even uh, between the biological and the uh, mechanical. It will be the, the 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 same conflicts we have between the black and the white and the women's and the and the trans and the, this is a social conflicts that is created within a society where the means of production is used is owned by a minority. So if we don't have a black and white uh, divisions, we may have a division between the biological engineered and workers and the non biological engineer workers, but it's still a reflection of the own expressions of the, the conflict that is created within the capitalist society. You see, you see what I mean is that it's, it's for me, it's as if you are kind of looking at different expression of the society that we are living in and you're making it as if it was, we have to concentrate on this particular expression. What I'm saying is that these expressions are only the expression of what is the society itself, how it's organized, it will always create more and more uh, uh, basically social conflict within different groups of people. There is no natural division between black and white, but within society, we have a division between black and white, a social division between black and white that is now being seen as a natural division between black and white, but it's a social division between, between different workers and that you know you, some of them have more rights and some of them have less rights or women or men this is a, a social division that is created within the society that it is today so if we want if we understand it that way then we have to change the society itself but not the fact that some people are black some people are white some people are bio, bio engineers some people are not bio engineer i don't know I, just, I, I don't i don't see it. it's i see it as uh you know you have the structure the the base I, I i don't call it base and superstructure because I, I i i i don't agree with these things and also don't understand it completely i think it's just crap uh but i see it as we have a, a certain structure in society and then we have the relationship that that structures organize the relationship between human beings and so the relationship between human beings is also the social relationship between be human beings so the what you're describing is the social relationships that is the reflections or an expression or the consequences of the structure that we are organized and the structure that i'm talking about is how we are how the society it's how the human society it's produced from one year to the next how is it produced how is it surviving how do humanity survive from year thousand to year two thousand to year to three thousand 
And for me, to understand the society, to understand the basic of a society, I agree with Max, you have to look at, at the how we are producing the society, I, how the, who owns the means of production, how it is produced. Uh, how, and how, it is, how the society is produced means it will also change our social relationship between different human beings. I always go back to how the productions of the society or how the society is produced and reproduced. I, I, I don't explain it very well, but for me, you, you cannot only look at this, the relationship between individuals. You have to look at how, which society, how it is, how can you characterize a specific society, a feudal society, a capitalist society, a future society, uh, Egyptian society in, you know, in Jesus Christ, how is how the society was produced, how it survived, basically, how the so human society carry on surviving. It's not God who gave us food. How do we produce our society? This, this is all fundamentally where I agree with you, but I come back to, but how do you organize people who have fundamentally different particularities that they prioritize above these universals? That is, I think that kind of, is ultimately what it's getting at. Are you saying that those particularities have to be um, liquidated or something? Like, how do we get people who all see themselves primarily as black, primarily as white, primarily as you go down the category list of different niche uh, culture, subcultural categories that people develop on the internet, um, Christian, Jew, Muslim, whatever, um, so what I, I, for me, it comes, I was bringing up, there's this new contradiction that is on the horizon and we're starting to see the rumbles of it. Uh, but even bracketing that out, the, I get your goal. The question is, is how do you, you said the reason we're not that getting, you know, the reason we don't have a free society, the reason we don't, we haven't moved into this better, uh, way of organizing things is because people aren't organizing right. I think you said that at the beginning of this. And so then the question is, is, well, then how do you, as a universalist, still um, include particularity? I only include particularity if, um, for, example, for example, with the war in Iraq, uh, so not Iraq, uh, in Israel and Palestine, I um, show solidarity with the Palestinians. So you could say that uh, I am um, um, I'm using a particularity part particularism today, but I'm only using particularism today in the sense of, for me, is what are the barriers? I don't know about organizing uh, people, but for me, is what are the barrier to to have a society where the divisions, the main divisions. The main division that created a lot of problems is for me is workers and capitalists. So how do I uh, um, kind of show to people and how do I challenge this division? It's by looking at some of the particularities. So for me, the Palestinians are uh, basically actually when you look at the Israel Palestine, the, the work the Palestinians are usually the worker the working class. If you want to look at the working class in that sense. But how do I challenge it? It's because I, th I think that the, the Palestinians are being oppressed and exploited. And they are being exploited, exploited by Israel. So if I want, especially oppressed, uh, so if I want to show that their humanity, uh, in the sense of their, yeah, the new humanity is being, uh, um, basically they are not treated as equal. So when I'm, I'm using the particularism to be able to go back to the universalist uh, uh, politics. So I don't, I don't, I don't support uh, uh, Palestinians just for the sake of Palestinians, because I think the Palestinians are better or nicer people. I'm not uh, Muslims. I'm not a Palestinians. I'm not Middle East. You know, it's not about identity for me. It's about how do I challenge or how do I use. Um, in, in a way it's using, but how do I challenge the intellectual and social barrier that prevent us from changing society from one to the next to have a human freedom? And if you have a society where you have 
if you have a a a, a, a war where human equality is not uh, accepted, then I will use I will support the people who are not considered as equal. Um, it's 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 a bit like saying that I'm against identity politics, but not in the sense of you can use identity politics, so the particularism, but only as a means to the end. And my end is always the, to change, because my understanding of what is wrong is not a, a group of people who is wrong. It's not the capitalists are wrong or whatever. It's my aim is always to change the organization of the way that humanity is organized. I mean, the organization of society. So the way humanity is organized. So if my aim is to do that, what is preventing me, or what is preventing humanity to put together, to work together, to challenge that? And I agree with Marx on the level that the interest of the workers, which don't own the means of production, is to be together to change that. But it's not only, it's, so there is different groups of people who are going to be, well, we have to show that their interest is to, 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 to be together, but also to go and change society itself. So Palestinians are exploited and oppressed by a minority. And we want to show that their uh, uh, unf unfreedom is similar, it's, it's important for us to support them because they are an example of how we can challenge what is society today. I, I'm not very clear. Um, it's, um, it's basically try, you're using particularism to express universalism. <laughs> no, I, I think that's, that's I right. think, no, I think that's, no, I think that's really good. Uh, I think I just kind of balked at the the time. I, I sort of lost track of it because I was pulled into your, awesome. your, your, and, and the thing is, is I know you're working on this in your own writing. You've been working on it for years. You're, you're going over everything you've believed and you're kind of reworking it and you've got uh, so much going on. I writing than talking. And no, you're a really good talker. I think you underestimate yourself. I think you did a fantastic job and it's been a total honor to have you here. And we've really appreciated this. And I, I really look forward to uh, other opportunities to follow up on this throughout the year. And I really look forward to what you might be working on for the conference and the anthology uh, we already talked about. And it's all related to this stuff. And so people, if you're interested in Christine's work, you can check out her piece in Underground Theory. And then uh, stay tuned for a lot more exciting stuff from here in the near future. But actually, we got to switch gears here. So thank you so much for being here, for uh, for your patience with me. And okay. uh, we will uh, follow up soon. Thank you for inviting me. And um, yes, talk to you later soon, All right. hopefully. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run and review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarricker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages 
five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground has already put out eight courses, two books, one, my book, Time Energy, and the other, Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of underground theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive, so excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program and also make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. We're back. back. Oh. We're back. Are we? We're back, motherfucker. What's up, everybody? Hey. <laughs> we're not recording right no. now. We're just, uh, we're, we're going to get ready to record. Uh, we've got an hour um, for a special section of this. Uh, and so, yeah, what do we want to say uh, about, uh, before we get recording? Just as, as far as, well, is there, yeah, anything related to any of the calls that we've already done is stuff that we can get into with this next section. But uh, is there anything for the good of the order or anything I that just, we want to... Um, if anyone's watching and if anyone is curious about timing, where, where are certain people, when are they going to get here, la, 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 this and that. I have seen a few questions in chat asking about where x person is um trying to coordinate multiple people from all across the planet is um difficult and there are things that pop up sometimes time zones get confused sometimes people get the weeks wrong sometimes emergencies happen um and it's like people haven't been bugging but i have seen a couple of questions and uh but yeah. is that just to say that they're wondering, like, it, these are questions that would have been answered if they could have just seen the times on the lineup? Because um, it's all, it's all, it's all in the email. I think, I think earlier someone was asking Justin Murphy. Oh, he'll be the last person on. He's on at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Yeah. Which is, uh, I believe, 11 or 2300 uh central european time which but, is like 10 um, p.m london yeah. be be patient on youtube you can always go back to the beginning and listen at 2x if that's what you want to do um or check your email yeah check the fucking email guys or just <laughs> like sit down and strap in and let it come as it comes <laughs> Don't worry, it's all under control. I have had yeah. three scare. I've had three scares today. Uh, first one was when I found out Leon, Leon Brenner was dropping. Uh, I haven't fixed the thumbnail. I should have just crossed his face out, but I I, I didn't 
Yeah, but 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 I would have had to go into Photoshop and and upload and all I did was take his name off the actual title. It's probably still in the description, but yeah, Leon's not going to be able to join today. Hopefully we'll get to him very soon. We got to plug his freaking course, guys. We got to get some signups for Dude, his so sick. He's teaching a five course or a five yeah, for five course meal. It's a five oh, week course. five week course on uh the uh, the autistic subject and the clinical structures this is a fantastic opportunity for people to get well acquainted with uh lacanian um analysis from an actual lacanian analyst um he's as far as i know the main guy on the internet doing this like bruce fink never really left the world of books in the clinic to 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 kind of make the rounds on podcasts and youtube Whereas Leon Brenner, thank goodness, has. And, you know, he's come down with some kind of either illness or emergency. It's, 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 I'm not going to get too personal, but it's something that he's got to deal with. And it, hopefully he'll be all right and, it, you know, back in good shape in no time. But uh, for the time being, he is down for the count. He'll definitely be back for the, epic marathon on april on february 22nd but by that time the course will have already begun won't it have so if you look above my head while i'm talking for people who have eyes on chat i just put the uh the course up there above me and uh that's him beautiful looking man right well he's got this course the four clinical structures of psychoanalysis it's going to be Wednesdays at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time in the United States. That's L.A. time. And then 12.30 p.m. New York City time. That's Eastern time, which is 6.30 or 18.30 in Berlin time, which is Central Eastern European time. This course is going to be awesome. And as much as it might be problematic for us to be able to take clinical terms and then use them in our everyday life, Nothing's going to stop us anyway. Nothing's ever going to stop humans from doing that. And as thinkers who are going to inevitably do that, we need to clarify our concepts and think about their actual aims, the actual methodological uh, aims that these have been uh, developed for, towards, whatever, right? So when we think about the neurotic, the obsessive neurotic or the hysteric neurotic uh when we think about the pervert or the uh the uh the psychotic or these sort of borderline personality schizophrenic kind of spin-offs of the psychotic or of you know the some of the spin-offs of the pervert today might be the masochist or the uh i don't know i don't know i don't know i don't know if you have any other off the top of your head there but there's other things that currently are in the DSM-5 that kind of have traditionally been lumped up underneath the pervert. But traditionally, the, the autistic category was always made sense of uh, as, it, as the psychotic. And Leon Brenner's whole thing is that thinking about it that way has led to a great deal of, I don't know if he would say harm, but problems. And so... You know, we've got a lot of different competing understandings and interpretations of autistic, right? Well, his is very unique. It's very specific. And it's a lot better than some short page you might have read from the internet or some little thing that you heard online. Like that's that's for me like yeah. so or so important is like we're not going to be able to stop thinking about autism in our lifetimes. It's never going to go away. It's only going to become more of a concern as more and more people think, "Oh, well, I must be autistic." And it's like, "Well, maybe you are, maybe you're not, but why do you think that?" And to even think that, we want to clarify the term. And to clarify the term, we shouldn't just go off of a Wikipedia page because we want to go with somebody who's done this whole history of it and then gone back to Freud, gone back to Lacan, and then ultimately argued with both to, but also taking, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and, and still having the respect of his peers, establishing this term on its own two feet, so to speak. Yeah. And what were you going to say about that? I was going to say like there, I mean, there's people's favorite streamers are now going to take like Buzzfeed style quizzes and they're like, Oh, that's it. I'm autistic now. Guess what chat? We're all autistic. And in a sense, 
you know what? Fuck it. Like, sure, the 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 machines have infected us, uh, generally, and colloquially, sure, we can say, yeah, we're all autistic, because I do think it. I mean, obviously, it's it's a spectrum thing, right? Blah blah blah. blah, blah. But, well, um, actually, but um, but the, there's a tendency to use diagnoses as uh as like zodiacs and and um especially with young people me being a parent um we have a lot of conversations about just like that in general like don't essentialize don't don't seek out some category don't seek out a label and use it to uh frame your entire worldview and interpret your relation to yourself and and frame your like your understanding of what you should do and what you should be and what you should aspire to. But that's so fucking popular with the medium of social media, the way that it operates. It's, it's just, everything is, everything is, is its appearance. Everything is, it is this and it is nothing but this, and it is only ever this, and it will persist as this until the end of time. Um, And that's very, if we want to, you know, do a, a callback, that's very algebraic logic. Um, and the cool thing about being human is that we're soft and we're squishy and we can necessarily contort ourselves mentally, emotionally, and even physically into spaces where um, objects that lack agency can't. So to give that up and to just say, oh, well, I took a, I took a 15 minute quiz on the internet and it says I have this diagnosis. And now I understand the world through this diagnosis exclusively. And the world must relate to me through this diagnosis. And if they don't, they're doing violence to me. And it get like, I empathize, man. I get it. The world is a violent fucking place. I get it. Everything sucks. We're the transcendental miserableists. We are miserable, sad, sorry bastards. However, we want to do something about that. So be sad on your own time. If you want to get together and you want to get busy, suck it up, buttercup. And, and we should all do our best to create spaces where we can commiserate and we can comfort each other. Um, but also, that's not, that's not the point here. We're not trying to, as Catherine um, would say, be conservative and just kind of maintain things as they are and spruce it up Christine. a little bit. We are, Christine, Jesus, I was thinking Catherine Lou. She just... Uh, now I'm thrown off. But I'm sorry. I'm trying. sorry. <laughs> I'm just yeah. Uh, no, you're you're saying we're not trying to be conservative in the sense that Christine would use that term. Yeah, yeah. We're we're not trying to to maintain um the order of the day, the status quo, the 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 structures and systems that do determine our daily lives and slap a new coat of paint on them. We are going for a radical reimagining of our relationship to the world and our relationship to ourselves and our relationship to the others in the world that are here with us. And so we, we always do want to be compassionate and empathetic. Um, but we don't want to overdo it with that. We also don't want to essentialize and say, Oh, you're a diagnosis. Every single person with a diagnosis, you're a person first. So if like, let's, let's stop dealing with these categories and let's, get back to dealing with people. Um, and it, it is, it's a very charged subject on the internet um, and in real life too, but even more so on the internet with young people specifically, but even people our age do it. I mean, you, you see so many books about like, oh, why are you a, a, a housewife in her thirties who's sad all the time? I have the ultimate prescription to tell you exactly what's wrong with your life. And here's the roadmap to figure it out. And if you can't do it, there's something wrong with you. It's not the system. It's you. So it's this weird, like, guilt, shame, fuck you all at once. But it's packaged up in, like, a bouquet of flowers. Um, so yeah, this, I, is, this, is where Ashley comes in. this is where Ashley comes in with saying that we, we, take, we take these, these, uh, these structural situations and then we... We, yeah, it's a bouquet of flowers because we're saying, oh, we're going to recognize you as this. We're going to treat you different as this. We're going to give you representation as this. It doesn't change the structural reality. It actually puts all responsibility back on you as this or on if society has any responsibility, it's for not recognizing you as this, right? Absolutely.
Nice so I'm looking of forward. I'm very much, very much looking forward to Dr. Brenner's course. Yeah, that's a an excellent way of, of bringing it all back together here. And so, uh, folks, you can get into it by being in tier three or four subscri subscription levels at Theory Underground. That's what the PSA I roll between each of the guests is all about. Uh, I'll be rolling it at the end of this as well. Um, well, actually, well, the next segment I do here with Nance, once I start recording, I'll roll it at the end of that before we bring on Todd McGowan. Then I'll roll it at the end of that before I bring on Justin Murphy. Mikey's going to be here with us for McGowan and Murphy. It's going to be awesome. That contrast between a Zizikian and a Landian, between a Lacanian and a Delusian, between, I mean, really, it's just like there's so many things going on here that we get to see today. Um, but is in sort of for closing out the thread on Brenner's course, um, yeah, tier three or four, you get access to it. Tier three or four, you can cancel any month you want. But if you stay in that tier, then you will also get special access to all kinds of other stuff, uh, including other short courses like the introduction to Yvonne Illich or Todd McGowan's course on the uh, 7R11 Jacques Lacan or the Chris Catrone's course on introduction to Marxism or the course I'm teaching on being in time or the course that I'll be teaching on totality and infinity or the class that I'll eventually be teaching on capital. All of these courses, including the one that Mikey's going to be teaching on Zizek this fall, are available to tiers three and four. And then, of course, if you're at tier one or two, you can always get access to those after the fact. Tier one gets one new course every month from the past that they are able to unlock, as well as they get to be a part of one of the two ongoing uh, seminars. There's the Critical Media Theory Seminar which Nance just presented at with Philip, and that was fantastic. And then coming up on the fourth Sunday of this month, and the fourth Sunday of every month, is cr Critical Doxology and Time Energy. So if you find all the talk of Time Energy interesting, um, or if you're interested in the way that we critique self-help and business success uh, without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, which is to say dialectically, then you're going to want to get in on that. And so, uh, you know, Tiers, uh, tier one, you can always get access to one course per month. It's really assuming a person who's super busy and strapped for cash. Whereas the level two, the person's got a bit more time, still pretty strapped for cash, but has, uh, but just wants access to the backlog of courses so they can go through it at their own pace. Um, but tier three or four are for people who are super invested, uh, who have the money, who have the time, who have the energy. Um, not everyone does, and that's okay. We still put out a shit ton of stuff. You guys, hey. Nobody can keep up with the amount of stuff that we do, even on the free side. I guarantee you that. No one can keep up, even on the free side. But if you're if you're nut, if you're nutcase like Nance here, and you're just like, nah, man, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go hard. Uh, and you wanna be you wanna access to all the past stuff and the ongoing stuff and the upcoming things, then you'll wanna get into tiers three or four. Um, for real. Get into that. And of course, we also do have a scholarship for people who have the time and energy, but they don't have the money. Um, and so recently that was made possible for someone who is in Hong Kong and he is at tier three now, uh, or at least he's about to be at tier three, um, thanks to the scholarship. And so, yeah, that's, that's that. If you don't want to do the subscription model, but you are super interested in this Brenner course, then you can always just pay for the course as a standalone. Um, the money does not all just go to me. In fact, I only take a portion of it for the means of production themselves, which is to say uh, the subscriptions. I pay for a lot of plugins, a lot of subscriptions just to run this website, just to run the, the app, just to have my editing software, just to have everything legal and above board. It costs money. And uh, everything else goes to the professors themselves. If enough people sign up, then I think the professors will probably want to keep doing it. And if there's not, then we'll see. And so for me, this is all an experiment. And right now, you know, any experiment that's a serious leap of faith that kind of has your reputation attached to it is kind of anxiety inducing. I'm a little freaked out by uh, just like I haven't gotten anybody signing up for this course yet except for one person. And that person is really excited for it, signed up at a higher tier for it. Um, Nance is there for it. Uh, so I guess that's two people so far. And there's a bit more time before we actually get to it. Like I said, it starts on, what is it? It says it right there, February 18th. Is that right? 
28th. Oh shit, we've got a little bit more time than I thought. Okay, it starts February 28th. I've got more time than I thought. 10 more days than I thought. But be thinking about it. Get serious about it. I'm, 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 I couldn't be more excited, but like I said, I'm a little like, are we going to get more signups? We better get some more signups because otherwise it's embarrassing. Um, we're going to have fun no matter what, even if it's just three people. It's like the being in time course. We had like, what, five, six people? Same with the idea of the university course. We had like five people. Best courses. Some of the best courses are really small. And it's honestly something that uh, people don't get to uh, get a lot of benefit from in standard education, right? Class sizes keep getting bigger and bigger, but every study that's ever been conducted shows that people benefit from smaller classroom sizes. And so when people on tour were like, oh my God, there's not a lot of people in the audience. I'm not going to take this seriously. They were thinking like worldview salesmen people who just want to get a message out to the masses. They were not thinking like academics because for academics, a small classroom is still a good thing. And so, yeah, I'm talking myself back into it's okay. It's ultimately going to be fine either way. Well, and, and it, it is always the case that um, once the courses are over with, the forms persist, the, the VOD is available, this and that. Um, so, I, I think there were there were some people who came to being in time after it. The first uh, cohort was in recess, but they were able to go back through and finish Division One, um, and now Division Two is back on. So it is the case that the, it it will be out there. Um, I think it might just be one of those things that that people find out about later. Because it's not big and flashy like the Zizek course, the land course. Um, they have big name, and so a lot of people want to come to them, which is cool because um, the more people show up, the more opportunities there are to be good backs and forths and and good discourse and this and that. Uh, but for the smaller courses, it has been like, no, we're just here to do this. We're here to study this. We're here to talk about this. There, there hasn't been a bunch of like extraneous chirping um so that's also been cool michelle's in the chat and she said such an important point dave it's about quality not quantity michelle indeed so so cool that you're here right now it's awesome i can't wait to actually have a conversation with you i was jealous of ann honestly i was just like i want to have a conversation with michelle <laughs> um We'll have to make a double date of it one of these times, but I also just want a one-on-one. -on -one. Like I want to have, I just, I, I, I want more. And so for people who don't know, Michelle just had this fantastic conversation with Ann um, on their podcast. I shared the link up above in the live chat, but yeah, wrapping this up, I think it's going to be really good. Like you said, even if we didn't get a lot of signups, it's going to have like that sort of residual value. Um, and it'll become a thing as long as autism is something people keep talking about on the internet. It's going to become a thing where people go, you need to stop talking about that until you go take this fucking course, all right? If it's if you're going to let it change everything about your life and how you think about yourself and other people or whatever, or if you're going to keep running around calling everything and everybody autistic all the time, maybe you should look into it a little bit more rigorously. Like uh, Brenner spends even just the first chapter of his book, the, the introduction, I think, is like so valuable on its own because he's really just doing this history of autism thing. Um, and it's, it's a history people need to know about, but, um, yeah, it'll have that staying power. I have no doubt about that. It'll definitely become something that people go back to. Um, that land course is crazy, man. I get like a couple of new signups for it. Like every few days, like it has not stopped. Dude, it just keeps saying, growing. Man, we are living in interesting times. We definitely are. Which is kind of weird. There are some moments where it does feel a bit uncanny um, when there, there are resonances across all the, you know, we have a conversation um, between all this stuff, between CMT and, and political economy and uh, doxology. Like, like there is a, a framework, a meta conversation that's going on. Um, and it's interesting when other people come in and they're the resonances. It's like, yeah, I'm I'm interested in this 
and I'm going to talk about this, like with Ashley Frowley, like a lot of her work that I've consumed has been about um, like the cultural stuff, like a, a lot of her, her work with her indigenous advocacy, which is actually fucking amazing um, and her stuff about the family. But then there's, there's these weird resonances that kind of plug right into what we're doing with CMT. Um, and it is, sometimes it gets a bit uncanny, but it is the zeitgeist. It, it, it is like, oh, um, we're, we're riding a wave. We're surfing on a wave. Um, and there's other people surfing too. And let's, let's all kind of, yeah, let's come together and let's all like hang 10 on our surfboards on the wave because, uh, I don't know, there's like a big thing in the way and like we're trying to warn each other to move or something i don't know i've never surfed it's, so it's that it's that fucking elephant that people are holding on to different pieces of it's in the water and everyone's yeah. gonna crash into it and they're all like well you can dodge the tail and we're like no there's a whole elephant there look out <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> not to mix but metaphors nice. or anything yeah 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 but, All right. Well, no, okay. It, that it, it that relates nice. to what I want to set up here. I'm going to start the recording. We've got a half hour to talk and we'll talk about the the tour. We're going to talk about the call for proposals. We're going to talk about the publishing opportunities. If you are a writer, stay tuned. All right. Three, two, one. And welcome to Theory Underground, everybody. I'm your host, David McCarricker. Today, we're joined by Nance. What's up, man? Chilling, man. What's up? Not a lot. So we just got to get a little PSA out on the stuff that's coming up this year. We've got a tour in May. We're going to be blowing up the spot everywhere, all over Europe, running everywhere, just running, running everywhere. We're not even taking buses. We're not even flying. We're literally just going to run our butts off you know, to save on fossil fuels, but primarily to get in the, in shape for this, uh, this relay race. But, um, you know, we're going to be talking about different things at different points of the journey. You know, we were talking about that with Mihao and Wukas, like recently talking about like the stuff we'll be getting into in Poland at the Krakow and Katowice events. But there's also a lot coming up that I wanted to touch on. And I want to kind of have at this point, as much as we currently have all in one spot. And so we'll get into the different tour dates with the different actual fixed dates and the variable dates and the things that are for sure and the things that we're thinking about that might might happen. Um, but we'll, we're also going to talk about the October conference and the call for proposals. There are different subject matters in this call for proposals. Um, and people who have been kind of with Theory Underground for a while, uh, but in varying capacities are going to discover that there are different ways of being involved with that. And so what I mean is like in underground theory, there's different kinds of essays. There are professional academic essays. And then there are these ones that are sort of exploring how to write outside of the academy from a more, you know, experiential standpoint. Michael Downs does this in his piece, Wage Labor and Jouissance. Nance does this in the piece, The Walls That Separate Us From Them. And Anne does this in her piece, The Idea of the Neoliberal University. I did it a little bit in the introduction, not so much in my main entry. Now, there's four, I think, main sections of this volume, Underground Theory. And so people were, when they, when I would say, hey, you know, I appreciate your work. You know, we've had good conversations on the channel uh, or whatever. Um, I would love to have you in this volume. Actually, almost everybody I reached out to took me up on the offer, which made it so that the book was way fatter than I planned, right? I cast the net large and wide. And then everyone was like, yeah, sure. And I was like, oh, uh, uh, that's always too many. Like, we have to make the font size a little smaller now. It's going to hurt people's eyes just to fit it all in the book. But, um, you know, that's a compliment and that's a good problem. I'm happy about that. But those four different sections, people would ask me, well, what kind of stuff are you taking, you know, writing on? And of course, with someone like Samuel Longcar, I expected him to write 
on stuff that I'd already seen him talking about, but he went a completely different direction and he decided, oh, you're doing stuff on critical media theory. I've got a piece using McLuhan already on critical media theory. Little did he know that he was going to end up with his piece right beside an actual original posthumously published work by the man, Marshall McLuhan, right? The man of the field of media studies. And so, uh, well, critical media theory, ideology critique, the left and its critique, and uh, the other section was underground theory and alternative education. Now, technically, underground theory is its own category. Alternative education is a related category, but also separate. But I kind of lumped those two things together. Um, the left and its critique yeah, is kind of its own section. And then there was a right at the end, just a couple, three underneath historical interpretation and the history of philosophy. Once again, two separate things, but related enough that they got their own special category. Well, instead of publishing a big fat book like this again, I'm going to be publishing a bunch of anthologies. Some will be this small, very small. They'll be like three to five essays, and we'll have to be very selective about what goes in there. And having to be selective is one of my least favorite jobs in the world. I'll probably try to bring other people in on the decision-making process so that I don't feel um, too much of a, of a weight of responsibility. I'd like other people to kind of weed out uh, ones that I don't I, it's like I don't want to have to to just be like solely responsible for giving the no. But you know, at the end of the day, it's going to have to happen because we're, we're going to be putting out a bunch of slim, sexy volumes on a variety of topics. And right before we started recording, Nance was talking about how we've been having this meta conversation for the last year of all of the, what were you saying? How are you saying it? You're between and beneath or whatever, all of these different threads, right? And so you were saying that, you know, in these epic marathon streams, when we bring people on, there's these resonances, these synergies, these various ways in which it's like, oh, that's uncanny. Oh, maybe we're onto something because people in some other, completely other vein, like are coming to similar things. Like, so there, there's some of that coming out of this, but you know, on the one side that makes me feel like it's a problem to separate these all, to, to put them in their little tiny, uh, volumes. I, I like people having this kind of spectrum of approaches, fields, and disciplines all in one place. But also I like people being able to have little tiny books. And I, and I think that if they all kind of clearly go together, the system of objects effect will kick in and people will want to have them all anyway. Uh, people will understand that you can't read them in isolation. And there will be some kind of a preface to all of them that says something along those lines, right? Like it says like these go together, like they're separate, but they go together. And that's just because ultimately we have to do things one at a time. Um, and so, I don't know, I want, I want to hear what you have to say about any of that. Uh, we've got another like 22 minutes here. Uh, and, you know, specifically like, are, are there some of these volumes that you're especially excited about? I think, uh, I think I am most, I think I'm anticipating writing for human futures the most. Um, I think, like, I just tend to, to think about the future. Um, I guess I'm, I'm geared toward um, making it all make sense through uh the idea of uh ultimate contribution uh or ultimate outcome or something like that and also like just looking around in my sh relatively short life or relatively long life i guess depending on your perspective um it does seem to be the case that things have got worse overall um, and I understand that that's probably a common feeling, um, to many people at many different, you know, epochs, 
But also, I do think it is undeniable that we are approaching some radical shift. Um, and I would like something human to survive the future. Um, so yeah, I, I think I am most excited for the human futures volume, but I also, I think of everything else through that lens. So anything that I would write, I would think, oh, I'm, I'm writing about human futures, but it could be the case that I'm writing about critical media theory. It could be the case that I'm writing about doxology. It could be the case that I'm continuing, you know, the critique of political economy. I could be doing all of that and it would fit into one of those volumes. Um, but I would be thinking, oh yeah, I'm, I'm writing about the future. Cause I, I think I'm always thinking about the future and that, and that, that is what I think kind of ties it all together. The, the fact that when we're talking to everybody, um, they seem to be aware of the current moment um, and, and trends and, you know, some things are accelerating. Maybe some things are slowing down or dying away completely. Everyone has a different point of view on that too. Um, but I do think that's what ties it all together. And I do think it makes sense to, to keep um, some type of barrier because I, from my perspective, I do anticipate the human futures volume to be a little more experimental. Whereas like a, a strict political economy volume, I would expect that to be a little more um, systematic maybe. So it, I think it does make sense to keep things apart. And I don't know, maybe one day there'll be an omnibus or maybe someone else will be interested to download PDFs and create their own omnibus. Who knows? Uh, no, that this that's the thing, man. That's I... I, I should have just already gotten permission from everybody with the first volume to be able to publish it into smaller volumes because now I have to go back and ask everybody because several of the pieces that are in this big old volume need to be in smaller volumes. So for instance, the critical media theory volume, I sure hope it has McLuhan in it. I sure mm -hmm. hope it has Samuel Longcar's piece in it. I sure hope it has, uh, well, I know it will have my piece, the algorithmic stage. I know it will have uh, this other piece, um, the, uh, Mikey's McLuhan and Levinas on the phone. Um, we'll, we'll let, we'll let him in here in a minute. Um, unless you already did it. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll, Mikey's probably watching this right now. Mike, we'll bring you on, uh, once the segment's over, cause we're still like going through it. So I just wanted to read off the list here. So we've got critical media theory, which I was just talking about. We've got human futures, which you were just talking about. Um, and that's really like, uh, I really think that that has to be taken seriously. I think that that is what I was just trying to get at in the conversation with Christine Luigi Soli. I think that any kind of universalism that doesn't have like a thoroughgoing idea of the particular, not just at the level of a culture or the level of an individual identity group or whatever, uh, but a, a more robust kind of, uh, particularism, you're not gonna be able to have what you were saying. It's like uh, a serious pluralism. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And so it's like people will throw words like universalism or pluralism around, but it has to be fleshed out because otherwise these are just black boxes, right? So there's like, there's black boxes and there's rigid designators and we can use them one way or the other, or we can be all lazy about it and act like we're doing one when we're doing the other. We have to get specific we have to unpack those black boxes and then use rigid designation as flawed humans who have specific aims and actually get to the what we're trying to talk about right and so uh yeah we'll have a volume on human futures and critical media theory uh which means that we'll have panels on these things at the october conference in boise the last weekend in boise uh or in october in boise <laughs> <laughs> it's getting blown off the map. It's the it's the last ever weekend in Boise. After a Sunday night at midnight, it's getting blown up. Enjoy it while you can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the last uh weekend of October in Boise, be there, be square. We're gonna have these panels. Gonna be at least 10 different panels, right? 
And uh, some of these will be things people have already been working on as early as conversations we're having today, conversations that we had in the Europe tour, conversations we had in the September 2023 tour going across the United States. Perhaps Daniel Tutt will want to work on something that he presented in D.C. Catron might want to work on something he presented in Chicago, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. McGowan already presented on the thing that he uh, submitted to Underground Theory when we were on tour. Um, but there's, there's a lot of people working on new ideas or, you know, recapitulations or articulations of things that they've been working on for decades or longer. And so, uh, the, the, the tour, like when I think of like Mihao or Mukas, like presenting, what I'm thinking is like, they're working on things that they've been thinking about for a while. And this is all stuff that might fit into one of these volumes, right? Well, in the exact same way. You and I are both working on things that are going to end up in these volumes. And so my goal is to kind of write a call for proposals or sort of grounding, orienting, kind of hystericizing, uh, introductory sort of uh, piece for each of these volumes. Because my goal is to get people to think seriously about the issue in question, the subject matter that we have before us. And so with critical media theory, what is the question? It is, one way of saying it is, well, what's the good life in the digital age? Another way of saying it might be, why can't we organize in the digital age? Another way of, you know, what does it mean to say that the medium is the message and then to go beyond that into the medium is the mass age? Right, what does that mean to go from McLuhan to Baudrillard in that way. And then we have the human futures piece. Will there even be a human in the future? If there is a human in the future, will it be a human or will there be humans? What is humanity? What is humanism? I hope that OG Rose, I hope that Samuel Loncar, I hope that Michael Downs will all have contributions for this volume. I think it's going to be very important. But that's going to be a mixture of dense, serious, theoretical pieces and creative writing. There will be straight up sci-fi fiction or sci-fi fiction. No, uh, sci-fi theory, theory fiction in this, uh, in this work. Um, the Critical Doxology and Time Energy volume is an opportunity for people who've been thinking about time energy in their own ways to, you, to publish that. Um, it might be that there's a time a notes towards time energy theory volume and that that is separate from the cdt volume the cdt volume might just be focused on the new dark age and the council of nicaea events the new dark age is something that i'm talking about with owen cox and cadell last at philosophy portal um it's something that we'll have panels on it's something other people will be invited to contribute to and it's all leading up to the council of nicaea event where we kind of just like play this scenario, like what would it be like to do a Council of Nicaea today? Now, of course, we don't have an emperor. Constantine saying like, hey, we're going to take all of these disparate uh, gospels and take the ones that we think are authoritative and put them all into one book and then stamp it with the approval of the church and blah, blah, blah. No, this is, this is a bunch of underground theorists essentially saying, look, nobody wants to take responsibility for the real ideology of today. But if they did, if they were to all get in a room, if we were to take the world leaders uh, and the PMC and put them all in a room and say, okay, guys, what's it going to be? Roll out the book of books. What would be the books inside of that book of books? And of course, how to win friends and influence people would be in there. 12 rules uh, for life would be in there. You would have all of these uh, seven habits of highly effective people, the subtle art of not giving a fuck. I claim that that's the kinds of books we would have in there. But we're probably going to have people writing pieces, arguing, no, actually, this is the kind of book that would be in there. Or yes, that, but also this. And we need to take this seriously as a fundamental kind of ideology. Like someone uh, in the comment section had gotten excited about this idea of critical doxology and said, oh, what about metal? Yes, you're right about metal. And I mean, we could talk about hyper niche identity categories. Uh, and boutique consumer phenomena as as a kind of ideology today, absolutely. But the, the difference between metal, which is a hyper niche 
consumer activity. And uh, something like self-help and business success is uh, one is for normies to feel a little edgy sometimes or for people who are just super into that thing to make their whole identity into it. Whereas the other is something that people do not associate with identity, which is why it functions so well as ideology. When people turn to self-help or business success books, it's because they're trying to get serious about their lives. It's because they're in recovery. It's because they're in prison. It's because they lost a loved one. Man's Search for Meaning. It's one of those books on Oprah's and Joe Rogan's lists, I think. And so those kinds of books for how to suffer with trauma or how to deal with suffering or trauma, how to uh, how to get your life together after it's, after it's fallen apart. These are the books that we need to dignify. It's, that's the, one of the crucial pieces here. All pieces submitted to it that are scorning um, uh, or have a condescending attitude towards these things will be denied. If, I mean, I'll, if I if I if I pick up on that in the first page, I'm not going to read the rest of it. I don't have time for academics and their scorn for regular people shit. I think that we actually have to dignify, uphold, but then also be critical. You know, and there's there's got to be some kind of balance there not this hipster scorn bullshit. So, uh yeah, I'm really excited for the new the the new dark age and council of Nicaea uh all going into this this CDT volume and then potentially a whole separate volume just for expansions or notes towards or interventions in time energy theory. Potentially two books there. And then we've got the value form book. I just currently have it written value form what the fuck or WTF. Of course, we talked about it being called anti-value, but we can't call it that because that's Davey, David Harvey's term. It's a technical term. I don't want to get into that territory. Um, but, you know, the, the value form debates in Marxism are very confusing. I thought I understood them a week ago. Now I don't think I understand them anymore. I'm just really fucking confused. I hope Sahil will submit something Dude, to I, this. Yeah, I. that's going to be good. I, I, uh, I have a new resolve. I'm, I'm it, in my stance, um, after that conversation and after really kind of like basically asking myself, am I full of shit and how much shit am I okay with being full of? Cause of course I'm full of shit. Um, but I'm, I'm not entirely full of shit. And I think, I think I'm less full of shit than I could be. And I am more resolved in my position. Um, which I wouldn't have had without that conversation. So I'm super grateful for that conversation. And I am super excited to have that conversation continue because I do think that's an integral part of understanding um, the structure itself, capital itself and time energy and where to like, where to, where to position that. Um, I guess I am more interested in the idea of value than I, I was before. Um, before Sahil's intervention. Yeah. Which okay, and at here this in a point few we're days, everyone on YouTube will be able to see it. Exactly. Right now, everybody, you're just like, what are you even talking about? I'm sorry to be talking over your heads, folks. But basically, we've been reading Capital. Uh, we've been reading Mihal Heinrich. We've been reading Fred Mosley. Uh, we've been getting into this value form debate. We've been taking the side of Heinrich. We've been uh, using this for our own theories. His uh garbage theory of, t uh, of value, my time energy theory of value. We're, we're working on these things uh, behind the scenes and, you know, doing the Capital Mondays events um, and then publishing them every Sunday. And I listen to them while I'm at work, while they're, while they're premiering. And then I'll go into the bathroom and say hello to people in the live chat of the premiere. Um, and of course, you're all welcome to join this coming Sunday evening if you want to watch Nansen, uh, myself, uh, get called to task by somebody who thinks that maybe we weren't being entirely fair. But the thing is, is like, he's, Sahil is a gem of a human being. He's definitely not like out there just to shame us or to make us look stupid. He's the most, uh, I would, I would prefer if anybody's ever going to tell me I'm wrong again, I'd prefer it comes from Sahil. I, I hope people will yeah. model themselves on, on him when they are calling me to task. But with that being said, um, that's a value form piece, whatever that will be on. People who want to write about that, I'd love to have it. Uh, I know Chris Catrone has written on it in the past. I hope that he'll be in it. Um, we'll be having him on soon to talk about these debates himself, because obviously he's seen them for a long time at Platypus. But then we also have a volume on underground theory. I know 
That's the name of this book, right? Well, the, no, no, no. The name of this book is Underground Theory Coming to a City Near You. That's sort of like the secret subtitle because it's not even in the subtitle on the on Amazon KDP and that probably needs to be fixed. But the basic point of that is is to say this was like us planting a stake in the ground and saying we're here motherfuckers. We're here. We're not going away and we aim to have a sustained conversation on all of these lines of thought. We aim to develop ourselves as nobodies who are not supposed to be a part of this conversation ever. We aim to make them accessible for other people so that these aren't rarefied um, esoteric debates held in, you know, ivory towers, which are fine. Those are fine. Those are great. I have mad respect for those. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying we want to be able to have these conversations and the people who submitted to the, to the, the, the anthology, they care about that. And so that's good. Um, but no, we're going to have a piece called underground theory, a discourse in search of a method. And it's a piece on the possibility of epistemology being brought to social ontology. It's a piece on how to read. It's a piece on how to study. It's a piece on the craft of thinking, writing, speaking. So that's that. Then there's another piece, underground theory, from scene to milieu, in search of conditions of possibility. So what are the conditions of possibility for a scene to go into a milieu? Well, first we even have to understand like what is a scene and then how is the scene as an analogy going to fail, but also in what ways is it correct? And then we have to talk about the intellectual milieu idea. Is it really a precursor to any real kind of movement? Gramsci thought so. I think so. I think that this much is correct, right? These, this idea that there's spontaneous revolution and that it leads to anything positive coming out of a vacuum or just out of the conditions without a hundred years of building is insane. And it doesn't prove out. There's no proof of it. You can't find me an example of it. You will never find an example of it because all of the examples come from prior conditions where there were people in societies freely associating, arguing, developing their ideas. And so people who want to act like it's just a circle jerk and it has no influence on history have history to argue with, not me. I don't make the rules. I just enforce them in this volume, motherfucker. <laughs> then finally, uh, the last two volumes for now uh, are the Zizekian Ljubljana School uh, Critique of Libidinal Economy Tradition. CLE, Critique of Libidinal Economy. And this will be an opportunity for some of the pieces in here related to uh, the Ljubljana School. Um, as well as a whole bunch of others to kind of find a nice little home um, in people's hands. But the last volume is called Professional Managerial Critique. Professional Managerial Critique, PMC. And then it, the subtitle will be Critique Relating to the Professionals and Managers of Capital. So there you see, I've used PMC in two different ways that sidestep the issue of it being a class. Even though I do think it's a class, I'm always down to bracket it out and keep going because the phenomenon that we're dealing with is more important than the uh, sort of arguments people like to get bogged down in. And so, oh, there's so many amazing pieces that I'm looking forward to putting together into that one. There's several pieces already being written for that one. And so, yeah, we're going to have like fucking 10 books for you all next year. I, I know, I know. I, I, I was already wondering, how could this year get any crazier than last year? Well, we found a way. So, if you're interested in being in any of those volumes, then try to get on the tour and try to present on those ideas on the tour. Or uh, try to present in one of these epic marathon streams. Uh, or come to the event in October and try to present then. Currently, there's no form for you to fill out for travel and everything like that. I have to get some landing page up on the website as soon as possible so that universities can give funding to people who are able to get that kind of funding. I really want to make it so that people are able to exploit or at least put to use the institutional resources that are available to them for traveling. Of course, a lot of you aren't in academia. A lot of you are working full time. Mikey's not going to be able to attend except by Zoom. And that's really sad. And I hate that. But 
He just has to do what he's got to do. And he'll probably talk about that in a minute when we bring him on. But with that, Mike, uh, Nance, I'm going to let you kind of have the closing thought here. Yeah, it's it's, it's going to be dope. Um, anyone who has watched any of these conversations, um, you obviously stuck around for a reason. You saw something. Um, and the volumes are are going to be expressions of that. The tour is going to be an expression of that. Um, the courses and the forums on, on Theory Underground are both expressions of whatever that is and also places where whatever that is gets kind of forged into, um, into being. So if, I mean, those of you who are watching, uh, come on, come on over. It's, uh, it's pretty cool over here. We're doing the thing. Um, and yeah, keep it real. We'll see you on the flip side. Thanks everybody. All right. I'm gonna roll the credits. Dance. Appreciate it, man. All right, let's go. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run and review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. Seriously. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarricker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages, five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground has already put out eight courses, two books, one, my book, Time Energy, and the other, Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of Underground Theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive, so excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program and also make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. Two, one, and we're live. Welcome everybody to the show. This is Theory Underground. I'm David McCarricker. 
the co-host is Nance. And I I mean, Mikey's kind of like a co co-host. I don't know. Like, but but also it's just kind of like the two of us wanted to talk to you two, but the three of us wanted to talk to you, Todd. And so we're joined today by Todd McGowan. So great to have you back, man. How are you doing? Great to see you, David. Uh so I don't know if you know too much about uh what's been going on today uh with the the stream here. No? You've not been No. I mean I kinda you gave me a vague idea, but I'm not exactly sure what you're doing. So Okay. Well <clears throat> you I told me a I lot of the people that were gonna come on, but Yeah, yeah. Well I woke up at like five thirty, you know, or you know, four thirty AM and uh and just started preparing and I've just been going going, going, going. And now we're kind of getting into grand finale territory here. And so uh, okay. we're, we're kind of coming off of all of that. Uh, Mikey, were you able to catch any of that live? Yeah, I watch, I would say 90% of the stream. That's awesome. I had a route, That's awesome. I had a route today, so I was able to watch Yeah, the, the majority of it. Alenka, cool. Brent Atkins, uh, Ashley, uh christine who am i am i missing somebody else daniel garner and I, I, daniel's the one i saw half of his but then i was at a stop and i was supposed to pick up some batteries and exchange they ordered d or c batteries we brought them d blah blah, blah. It took them 35 minutes to find the batteries in the warehouse and so i couldn't watch during those 35 minutes uh so that was a big chunk of daniel but that's uh, a really good no, chunk I mean, too it, yeah, but but uh, another great stream so far. Um, I really wish I had a chance uh, to talk to Brent Atkins, because um, again, like I mean, though I'm this, I'm on the Lacanian Zizekian side. Brent it, it wrote one of the best, if not the best, intros to D and G that I've read so far. Um, I'm not going to be, you know, quiet when it comes to the fact that a lot of the secondary material on DNG doesn't help very much. A lot of times it actually confuses the situation more. Um, I, I don't think I've said it to you before. Uh, Brent's done an incredible job of, of opening up the world of DNG in a way, because, you know, we, we use our examples. Hubert Dreyfus did for Heidegger you know, this, this great service of, even if we, we disagree with Hu, uh, Hubert on certain interpretations, he opened up the world um, of Heidegger force. Todd did that with Lacan and Zizek for all of us. Um, so there's, there's been people who come along and they have the ability to so clearly and systematically explain um, th these, these matrices of concepts, right? Um Brent Brent's taken this huge step forward in making DNG a lot more accessible. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was really great. Um, I actually have a question for Todd um, based Same. on something Brent said. Um, Same. And so, you know, I mean, part of it, Todd, is like we're at this point where we want to bring in more Deleuzians. We want to have these discussions about, Lacan versus Deleuze on desire and all of these, you know, things are, are they compatible? I mean, I, I think I've heard you say, well, no, you kind of have to choose between D, D and G and Lacan and Zizek. And then Brent says, no, he, he kind of does the Deleuzean thing. If you can find a creative way of connecting D and G to Lacan, then do that. I don't, I mean, it, I, I framed it like, can we square this circle and look and the, at the most, fundamental level of systematic ontology i don't think we can square the circle um are there interesting ways to you know could could we find ways to connect obja to a body without a work oh, yeah sure um but the question is like are are the metaphysics as a whole uh reconcilable i i know how you feel about that but mm -hmm. the point is we want to have these these discussions to better understand both sides of this equation and to better understand desire i mean Brent today, you know, Deluzo De Guattarians are going to use this example, especially with kids where little, little young children, um, th they have a kind of spontaneous, sporadic joy in testing out things, right? Making connections to the world. It's not because they're filled with lack and they're trying to fill 
the unfillable void. It's a kind of spontaneous enjoyment in just connecting to the world, testing things out. And so they'll say, well, see, that's desiring production. This is this pure positivity of desire. It's not rooted in lack. Um, but then at the same time, we have Freud's grandson yeah. with Fort Daw. And so, uh, which of course is it, this this whole thing of trying to cope with lack and master lack or understand lack in a, in a way, right? And so to what I would say to Brent is like, okay, what you I understand what you guys are doing when you appeal to these activities kids do. They do. They're they're real curious and just want to try things out, right? But they're also fundamentally concerned with the absence of the mother, uh, the absence of the father. And it's not just social coding. Their very well-being depends on these people at a fundamental level. They cannot survive on their own. And so the smallest of children are concerned with the absence of the primary caregiver. And if D&G think they're going to get, they're going to neutralize desire as lack, simply because they, you can point to these examples where kids are real affirmative in a kind of Nietzschean way, life affirmative. To, oh, let me try this. Let me do Yeah, but there's other issues with desire at that same stage of desire that j those examples don't undermine. And you just to, to privilege it and go, see, this is primary. Lack is derivative. I just think that's an arbitrary selection of what you want to privilege. But okay, I'll shut up now. Uh, okay. Should, you want me to respond to that? So, okay. Uh, I didn't, I didn't know if there was a question there or not. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So let me just, I'll, 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 I'll just, just say, I, I didn't even ask my question. So there, okay, there right. so, we'll, we'll circle back. Just, I, 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 I also, I yeah, also have, yeah. I also have uh, a question that I'll want to ask in relation to Brent Adkins, but before we we get to our questions you will of course say your thing here but i also just wanted to say really quick that it is the birthday of deleuze today so it's deleuze's birthday so you know hats off to deleuze that's why we thought we, if we're ever going to bring on brent adkins it'd be really cool to do it on the day that you know it's his birthday and so so happy birthday to the ghost of deleuze um now let's go ahead and tear into him how old would he be david uh, 46. Would it be, would it be a, how much? <laughs> I, said, I said 46. I was, I was just, I'm joking. No, but would he be, is he, I mean, could he conceivably be alive? I think he could. I think he'd be a hundred or so, right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, he, he could, I mean, he, he wasn't so much older than Badu, was he? Uh, he was only 70 or so when he died. He died in what, 93 something? Uh, so yeah, he could. He, he, was, he was born in 1925. So he'd be 90. You know, Levi-Strauss, he lived to be 102 or three or something. So it is possible. Um, yeah, so I don't want to pick on Deleuze on his birthday. That seems terrible. But let me just give this whole spontaneous uh, vitality of the child, right? So let me just give a counterexample. So, and, and I'm going to give an example of an animal since... The is thinks we should all try to become animal. Uh, so our cat, maybe I know David, you have a cat too. Our cat's favorite thing to do is take these little, you know, like a twisty that you twist around. It's like a thing that keeps a wrapper closed, but you twist it around your finger and then you throw it and the cat likes to go chase it and then bring it back to you. But even more than bring it back, the cat likes to play with it and push it under the couch. And it probably has like 25 twisties under our couch and so my question is why does the spontaneous vitality involve i get your point mikey about there's this back symbolic background of the spontaneous vitality and i think that's very important obviously but why does the spontaneous vitality involve i think kids do the same thing that's what the cat is it's just uh uh incidental uh why why is the spontaneous vitality involved putting the thing out of sight right like like the freud example of the like why put the thing away why put why say da right like i think that that to me that's or why make it da uh to me that's like the whole the whole or for it i guess is what it's called uh i i i guess to me that's the whole question of the of the of the spontaneous vitality right like why what role does 
regardless of lack or whatever, like but what role does absence play in that vitality? And I think it plays, I think just as such a crucial role because if the world was full, I just don't think there would be a vital response to it. Like I think part of what we see in that vitality is a, a way to create something to desire, right? And if you, if you have everything present, then I think there's it, it's suffocating for desire. So I, I think that to me is like a would be my first response to that image of the child being having this kind of imminent vitality. Like I just don't think that I think that that vitality requires something missing, and if it doesn't have something missing, it's going to forge something missing. And I think that's the to me that I don't. I, I've never, I, I'll just to be empirical, like I've never seen an example of that not being true. Like even like the child is concerned with what doesn't seem to work, right? What, what Like what like doesn't make sense within its symbolic universe. And that's what it has. Uh, yeah, okay. It has a lot of seemingly spontaneous interest in that, but it's not, it, it's not in what's just working out perfectly fine. I, I it seems to me. Fantastic. So, uh, Mikey, do you, do you want to ask your question then? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I have two questions for Todd. I want to get to, um, the, since we're, we're kind of pivoting off of the discussion with Brent Atkins earlier, um, Todd, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to read his book, but there's a book that he, he wrote that's been on my radar for a long time. I always wanted to get around to it. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say I haven't, but it's um what's it called death and desire um heidegger hegel heidegger hegel and deleuze it's basically heidegger hegel and deleuze on desire and death sign me up i'm there for that um <laughs> what what brent ultimately argues uh he starts off with this antinomy as he puts it uh between Heidegger and Hegel on death. He says that Heidegger, for, for Heidegger, death is this radically individualizing thing. Being towards death is my own most possibility because it's the possibility of me losing all of the, my possibilities, which are rooted in my singular facticity, right, et cetera. Okay, so death is individualizing for Heidegger. He says for Hegel, death is a fundamentally communal event. Um, part of me wanted to just ask you what you think of that. Um and then what he, he, because this was originally his dissertation, he only had Hegel and Heidegger in it. He wasn't really happy with it. When he discovered Deleuze, he found a way of, of getting outside of both Hegel and Heidegger because Deleuze is the philosopher of positivity. He thinks that ultimately for Heidegger and Hegel, death is fundamentally related to lack. And so you can do something else with death if you're a positivist in the Deleuzean sense. Mm -hmm. And... So he found something out, but I, I mean, primarily I'm just interested if you think that there is a kind of contradiction or antagonism between Heidegger and Hegel on death. And if you think it is right to say that for Hegel, death is fundamentally of communal relevance instead of it being some individualizing thing. Yeah, I, I've, I actually have read that. Our, our, our little theory group at UVM did that book. So um but it's, I, I don't, yeah, I don't agree with that. So I think that, I mean, I, I think that Heidegger and Hegel have have different views on death for sure. But, but it's interesting because when I first read the, I read the two of them together over a summer for the first time. And I thought, well, they just have the same, their position's exactly the same about our relation to death. And I think that's wrong, but I did, that was my first reaction. Um, but I don't think that I don't think that death for Hegel is collective. Like I think it's I think there's something uh, it's individual in a way that it's that it's different for Heidegger because for for Hegel I think death is what you know he calls death the absolute master, right? Like, and I think as the as the absolute master, it's what do, it's what interrupts the collectivity for him. And I think I mean. That's what Heidegger likes about death, 
right? Like death, in, in anticipation towards death individualizes Dasein down to itself, right? Like it, that, that, that for Heidegger, that's really, at least the Heidegger of Zion and Sight, that's the really the key, that's what makes it philosophically valuable, is that it's it's not, like... It brings you, know, you out of the right? Dasein, right? Right, right, like, 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 right. In the public, one dies, but death is always this individualizing experience for 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 Dasein, right? And and, and that's what Dasein tries to, to tranquilize us about. But I mean that 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 I think is not Hegel's position. But I think he does see that, like that that um, death is what we have to confront to to do anything right like i think that that's i mean i think in a way that's one of the main takeaways of the i think people make too much of the master servant dialectic i think that gets way way overblown just because i think it's just a contingent fact that it's some of hegel's it's his best little story it's his best little you know writing and so people they glom onto it and then of course kojab's influences incredible in that in that light but i i think it gets but i think one of the good takeaways of that is that this confrontation with death which the only the servant has i think that often gets misread too like people often say oh hegel's point is you can't really be a person unless you have this unless you you brave death like the master does and this but no his point is the master is actually wrong because the master thinks I'm going to brave death. And because there's something about me that will survive my death, like whatever the, my recognition of my identity as, as someone, a figure of mastery, but Hegel's point when he calls death, the absolute master, his point is that's not true. Like there's a real, I think existentialist flavor to what Hegel's saying. That is once you die, that's it. And then he thinks that the servant has a, understanding of that because the servant's like look i'm in this struggle for struggle for life and i'm gonna or struggle for recognition to the death i give up before i die because i understand that death is that that's it it's the absolute end and recognition is meaningless if you're dead and the master doesn't think that and so for hey i think that and so i think that's the in a way that insight is the ground of everything that comes after. So that's a way early in self-consciousness, right? So everything that comes after in the phenomenology, and I think all of Hegel's philosophy has its basis in that real insight about that our infinitude has to come out of this real grasp of our confrontation with death, right? Like he, like I think Hegel gets wrongly thought of as a philosopher of the infinite who disdains death. But that is, I think that is absolutely wrong. I think it's through this recognition of the of death as absolute master that the one then comes to our infinitude. So I don't, I don't, yeah. So I, I think that I, I wouldn't call that collective, right? Like that's the only thing I would, but I think oh, it's so, right. To, yeah, oh, no, so. let me ask you this, because we all know, if you want to know what Heidegger thinks about death or being towards death, you go to chapter one of division two of being in time. Correct. Hegel, I mean, I guess this is weird, right? I guess I don't think of Hegel having like a, a big original theory of death because if if we're talk if we're just talking about what he says about death in the master slave dialectic portion of the phenomenology, I mean, okay, I, I guess we could say that, but it's almost like what you're doing, you're almost extrapolating a theory of death. I mean, is that what we're working with? Is the master slave dialectic or well, is also the preface? The preface. And the preface, okay. Right, the preface. Because but there, there's no other treatment of death in philosophy of right, and I mean, I know it's no. not in logic or... No, no. But okay, so that's you're, you're right. It's not a major part of his... I mean, I would say it is the major part, but it doesn't get a philosophical elaboration in the way that you're absolutely right. Heidegger, more than any other thinker, I mean, if you said to someone just off the street, who's the philosopher of death, they would say it's Martin Heidegger, right? Because he has this real... Uh, 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 concrete passage where he's just dealing, even though later he, he kind of doesn't the discussion of death later on when he's talking about the forgetting of being they're pretty, they're not I, I can't even think of one off the top of my head right, so it's really to it's confined in a certain part of his thought, but 
it is there. I mean, the only thing I would say, another thing I would say about the difference is in the case of Hegel, it, it seems to me, even though we've named these two little places where it is, it seems to be informing everything that he thinks. Whereas I'm not sure that you could say that about the later Heidegger. Like maybe you could, and maybe people would want to say that. Um, well, I, mean, I, I think about like it, it, when he when he goes over to the fourfold, he starts referring to us as mortals, and so yeah, maybe yeah. in the background of the fourfold, you, you've got yeah, 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 yeah. And I think there's for original. There's even Mikey. There's I mean, David probably knows this better than anybody, but there's even a reading of the carré, the turn that sees it like he's already like it's rooted in the later philosophy is rooted in being in time. It's not actually a turn away from that. I mean, I don't know if that's I know that's a reading. I don't know if that's the one that's the, the doxa today, but I think you could say that. But anyway, uh, that, that that I would I would I would without being super stu- see that's the whole the question of the turn could be its own course, you know. But I for sure. I my operating assumption while reading this has been that that is the case, and that I think one of the big motivations between saying that the turn is an abandonment of say being in time is because people like to think of being in time as this uh, radical existentialist individualist project as opposed to we all know in 1933 he's very big on the collectivity uh in in, in the worst way possible right and then that just right. spir- you know and that 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 goes for another 10 years for him and then he has his mental break while he, he's he's like going through the denazification process. He has his mental break. He's in a, a a psych ward for something like three months. And then he comes out and he publishes the letter on humanism. This is all seen as like this big uh, change. I I don't I don't I definitely don't think that there's a change here because I I don't yeah, think that okay. being in t- I don't think that being in time uh, is an, a radical individualist existentialist text. And right, I, think I, know. That, I, know, you know. I think that chapters yeah. one, th- I think chapters one through three are his summary of the radical existentialist individualist position that he is imminently critiquing. And he, you, you get that imminent critique in the last three chapters of division two. And so we're actually getting to chapter three, uh, this Saturday, uh, in the course. And so, but that's a whole other thing. And honestly, for now, let's just bracket out my reading and just go with sure. what we're saying, which is just that. For him, death is this uh, this individualizing thing, right? Because it obviously individualizes you from the they. Uh, I would then say yes, but for your own most potentiality for being in the world, which there's this cultural aspect to it, blah, blah, blah. But I wanted to bring it back to you saying that that individualizing sense, this more existentialist way of taking it, is related to uh, the way he- uh, Hegel's doing it. So this antinomy, that Brent Adkins is talking about between the individualizing and the communal uh, kinds of negation uh, through death. Uh, you're how are how are they? Yeah, going I just don't see again? where I, I I would just ask where in Hegel is death communal? I just don't. I mean, I just he, don't see that. He said it was through religion. I don't. Does anyone remember better than me what Adkins actually said when he said that it had to do with religion? Sorry, I didn't see it, Dave. So I can't. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, he was. It, I, I mean, yeah, and that's the thing, right? Like, that's why I'm. I was curious. Like, okay, I don't know if Brent is relying on um, master-slave dialectic for it, where it, the question of how religion processes death. I, Hegel. I mean, death is significant in Christianity for Hegel. But it's not in it's not the individuals, it's the death of God. Hey, like that seems like a different thing. Yeah. I mean, that seems like like it's the death of the God of the beyond. I mean, that is absolutely central to Hegel's thinking, but I don't think it's some kind of like synecdoche for everyone's death that Christ I mean, Christ does stand in for everyone for Hegel, but not the death is is not everyone's death. It's the death of it's the death of the God of the beyond, right? Like through Christ's death, God comes down to earth and is now in the community of believers. I mean, that is, that's, it seems like to me that's ABC of Hegel, right? Like that, and that's why, that's the, the why religion, especially Christianity is so integral to his thinking, right? Like that, that 
what Spinoza thinks is just sort of a natural condition that God is in everything. Like Hegel thinks, no, God is God is this transcendent beyond that has to, through this act of 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 Christ's death, comes to inhabit the, the what he calls the community of that's just his term, the community of believers, or what we might call like the symbolic structure. Uh, so I yeah I don't think that it's I don't think that that's that in religion for Hegel that that is some kind of like collective death. I just don't. I mean, except in the sense that it's like it's how we're pro- like religion is for him how we process what we don't can't make sense of, right? Like this absence within the within our existence. This what's what what doesn't fit, right? That's Hegel, that's what Hegel. Well, that's that's less what, Hegel and just more religion. In ge- the right, I mean, right. I don't think that's a, right. That's no great Hegelian insight. That is just what religion talks about. Right, right, right. All right. Well, follow was that your or... follow? Was that your follow up there, Mikey, or do do? Yeah, is it my, is is it my turn? Question, but... Well, I guess uh, my mine is uh, potentially related, it, Mikey. If you think it's going to take us too far afield, you can always. Uh, say, hold on, no, let's get this one in there first. And mine is about the idea, and I, Brent had touched on this, that the Lacanian theory, and also, I mean, I guess D&G, they're talking about Freud in anti Oedipus. they're not talking so much about Lacan in every case. Um, they say it's true, it's true, it's, it is the situation. Everything is that it applies, this is true. But then their move is to say it's not this trans-historical, universalized, all-time truth and that it is a product of a specific historical context, and um, that that it therefore can be overcome, or that there might be other ways of going about things. Um, and so that's, that's for me, I guess the big question is, and I, I have a follow-up to it maybe for later if we get to it, if we have time, but that the main question is just to kind of address this idea that um, Freud trans-historicized, yeah. Well, I just want to say, because I, I, I want to let Todd riff on that, but I just want to say this idea that, hey, Oedipus is not trans-historical, it's culturally and historically determined. Lacan says that in the Acree. Like, Lacan knew that. And so, I'm just saying, like, Lacan was already there before they said that. Yeah, I think, I just would just underline what Mikey just said. I mean, I think Lacan's like and Deleuze and Guattari was a he was at the seminar right so I mean it's not like he was just coming at Lacan externally eventually he distanced himself from Lacan but I don't think that in anti-Oedipus at least in the first volume that they are even Deleuze I don't think they're thinking they're making an anti-Lacanian point I th- and I'm not even sure. I mean, it's anti Freudian to some extent, but it's much more, I think, targeting the practice of psychoanalysis, right? And I think there are a lot of people who, I mean, Aaron Schuster, for one, you know, this book, The Trouble with Pleasure, he would be an interesting person to have on here for this very discussion because he thinks that they're utter, he comes from the Lacan side, but he thinks they're utterly reconcilable, those and and Lacan. So, so uh, there you go. Mikey has it. So, so the, I, I think that it's, there is, there is a position that, that thinks this. And I think that the, that one of the things that Lacan does well to Freud is that he, uh, Mikey was saying this, dethrones the Oedipus complex to, I think, highlight the castration complex and he thinks of castration in a he would say freud was already thinking this but i don't think that is true he makes castration into symbolic castration and then like if that's the background at which in any kind of like oedipal relation comes about then well then oh the oedipal relation is just it's just a contingent this is what mike was just saying like a contingent historical manifestation of the way in which people deal with symbolic castration, right, and the way it gets, uh, you know, manifested in the in the nuclear family, but it doesn't like there's no attachment to that, 
right? There's no way, there's no belief that that's somehow like this matrix that has to be always operative, right? So I think that's a, yeah, go ahead. No, so, okay, two things. One is, I I think the most anti-Lacan point they make, and, and maybe there's others, and I'm this is just the one that always stuck with me. They have this image in Anti-Oedipus uh, where they're saying, look, if, if you blow up a bridge and the bridge just falls back into place, what have you really done? I mean, that's, I'm paraphrasing, but their point is, okay, it's a, it's a jab at Lacan because if you, if you blow up the content of Oedipus, oh, it's not actually the biological mother. It's not actually the biological, but if, if Oedipus, you blow all that up and then the frame, the structure falls back and performs the exact same function, you haven't done anything for them. And yeah, so really I good. think yeah. your critique is like, who gives a shit if you debiologize Oedipus if ultimately the exact same functions play themselves out? Nothing's changed. And right, but yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just gonna say agreed. I don't even disagree with that. Like I think, but I think that I mean it, part of it is I think you have to really think of the difference between Lacan's thought early on in the before the seminars and in the early seminars and then in the middle seminars and then late because I think once he develops the objet on and phallus kind of loses its importance so uh meaning of the signification of meaning of the phallus is 1960 right like after that time the phallus kind of like drops out and so it doesn't matter it's not so much even if it's symbolic phallus or or real or like actual father right like i think it just that's just not important for him because what's important for him is this object ah, that's driving our desire that can't fit that is this piece that doesn't fit within the symbolic structure and i think his response to what Deleuze and Guattari say would be well how are you accounting for what doesn't fit within the symbolic structure right like i think that's the real that seems to me where the rubber hits the road for at least the lacan of this middle period and and not, but I think the, it seems to me like their critique is perfectly valid for Lacan up to seminar seven, up to up to nineteen sixty, and then after that, I think it doesn't do that. It doesn't just bring, bring the bridge back. It's actually like completely re formulated. So, and so, I guess my second point, and this is where this is almost the point where it's like this is why I'm a Lacanian, Zizekian, Magawian, and not a Deluzo Guattarian. It, it's right at this point, which is this. Okay, so if the problem is that there is this spontaneous, life-affirmative type of desire called desiring production, which is all about parts of the body connecting to other parts of bodies, other aspects of the world, and it's this kind of playful experimentation, and that's the fundamental structure of desire. And, and I mean, this I, I, I elaborate on this, this mega post that I've been working on forever. It is going to come out relatively soon. And I... This is, I finally kind of just analyze this point that I've always made about DNG. I think Deluzo Guattarians, when I say this, some of them will go, that's a straw man argument, but I don't think it is. So here's my thought, which is, okay, if you want the, the free flow, free flow of desiring production, just pure experimentation, no social mediation by the law, by prohibition, nothing, then the new earth that they talk about is going to be a society where somebody just walks up and jams their fingers in your mouth because their fingers spontaneously want to connect to your mouth. This does not make social cohesion possible. There has to be certain protocols in place for us to not be pure aliens i know we always have this excess of the real in each other and i don't know your unconscious and i you don't know mine and i don't know mine and you don't yes yeah. but it's just this generic fabric of dosmon or the big other that makes us able to relate at all and right. it is rooted in prohibitions and whether they like it or not those prohibitions facilitate social cohesion and this this fantasy of just completely non-mediated 
connections of bodies connecting to other bodies. I'm sorry, the, the very idea of consent has prohibition at the heart of it, which is to say there are certain things I do not want to happen to me. And if the idea is, oh, you know, it's a it's a fallacy of desire to act like desire has to take whole people into account. It's just part oriented. You and I know that some of this is true because of partial objects and all that. Right. But nevertheless, we don't want to. You, you don't have a society where you don't have people relating to each other as whole persons who have whole networks of what they would or would not want to happen to them. And the point is, if you're going to be part of this social fabric. You are not allowed to do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. That has to be barred. And that is symbolic castration in the purest sense. So you don't have, if by the new earth you mean some sort of society where desire can flow, you don't get a society. Like they're, they're mutually contradictory, where you don't get a society where there's no prohibitions placed on your desiring production. If you want a meaningful social order to exist in any way, shape, or form, I don't care how anarchistic or uh, uh, anarchist you want it to be or how libertarian you want, there are still certain protocols in place that are enforced for us to navigate our interactions with other people. And if you don't have that, you don't have society. And so, I, you know, I think all of it just breaks down and that if you want any type of social order whatsoever, Prohibition is always going to be at the heart of it. Totally agree. I think that, I, I mean, I, I, you know, this, you know, this, uh, this example Lacan gives in seminar 11, where he says, I'm in, you're in a Chinese restaurant, you know, and the menu's in Chinese. And you say to the waiter, you don't say, how do you translate the menu? You say, what is it I should want here? Right. And I think, isn't that, that seems to me to be exactly what you're getting at that you don't, not only would you not be able to get along with the other to the extent that we do get along with the other, uh, but you couldn't even know what you wouldn't even have a way to desire, right? Like that's like, like the, the, and I think this comes down to, I think the one of the real keys of, of the way of thinking about this opposition between Deleuze and Hegel or Lacan is that is around the idea of representation, right? Like, like that, 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 and I think that's what you're talking about, right? Because the law is always intimately linked to representation. And that can you, can you, like, I think the idea for them is, can you find a way to, to can we imagine a social order without this burden of representation, right? And I think for, you've just shown all, or described all the ways that you couldn't do that. But I think that that even would be, like the burden is even on our desire itself, right? Like you could, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even be able to ask that question. What is it I should want here? And, and okay, you can think your desire is going to emerge spontaneously, but even this is what I would say. Like, do, do you know this movie by Francois Truffaut called uh, L'Enfant Sauvage? It's about, about a real, it's, it's called The Wild Child and in, in, it's translated. Uh, but it's about a real, this, the real kid guy that existed outside of it didn't speak existed in nature feral so child like age, yeah the feral child right uh and and he never really could make the adjustment right he couldn't really then they say if you don't learn to speak by the time i don't know what it is like eight years old but you never really you never really can can get it and he could never really speak uh and but the point is he didn't even know he didn't have any like all this spontaneous he didn't have any of them, right? He was just like, just trying to eat and survive. So my- it, it, The feral child is a completely, utterly traumatic image of, it, that's what you get if you have somebody who's not entered the realm of prohibition, big other, all, and of symbolic, all the baggage right, that right, comes with it. Right, right, exactly. And I think the point is that, that there's no spontaneous vitality to that feral child, right? Like there's none, there's none. And and it's only in like, even though the kids seem to be doing it on their own, they're always saying like, look here, look what I'm doing. Like I remember my kids, they always did that. They're climbing up in a snow fort. They're like, look at the snow fort, it's amazing. Okay, it's spontaneous, blah, blah, blah. It's about the snow and this love of the natural world. But why are they turning around 
and saying, look at what we did. That's what I just said. That's to me, my, that's my, just my, and I think that's what you're said that today. I was thinking that exact point, which is Brent, you, you, you're observing your kids. They spontaneously play, but don't they look over their shoulder at you? Like, look, I'm happy. I'm enjoying for you. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Like they're trying to show us what spontaneous vitality is. So it's not spontaneous vitality. Right. It's, it's like, it's like, like that, to that me, strawberry cake me, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The strawberry cake, exactly. Uh, can you want to, maybe after I'm going to say a little thing and then describe that because it's worth talking about. So little story. So uh, the best biography I've ever read of a philosopher is Ray Monk's biography of Wittgenstein. It's, a, it's just amazing. It's like a really good analysis of Wittgenstein's work. And too many of these philosophical biographies are about the cultural history. And like, no one, you don't give a shit about that. You want to know about the philosopher her himself and he does that but one of the things he says is Wittgenstein was watching so he had two brothers that were piano prodigies Hans who died pretty when Wittgenstein was really young and then Paul his brother Paul who uh Ravel wrote the one-handed left-handed piano concerto for his for Wittgenstein's brother so it's a kind of amazing story uh he lost his uh, he lost his right-handed uh World War One. But anyway, he saw his brother Hans, the older one, who committed suicide, uh, playing the piano and was just was so absorbed in his the genius of his piano playing that nothing else mattered for him. And Wittgenstein said, you know, I want to have something where I'm like that, where I'm totally absorbed in a thing just spontaneously and I can't. And then he became a philosopher like that. And then people would watch him walking around Oxford and they'd be like, you know, He's just so spontaneously involved in his own thought. He can't think of anything else. He doesn't care about the other. But then, of course, they were wrong because he's modeled it on what he saw his brother doing. So, like, it's all about the other from the beginning, right? And so I think that's the, like, you could look at that and say, oh, Wittgenstein, that's what is the model of subject. And he was kind of autistic. So there, I think there's a certain parallel to this. Uh disconnection with the other but uh uh you can look at that and say oh my god like that's the model for subjectivity or we wouldn't even call it subjectivity for like uh whatever the body without organs even right like uh but you would miss the way in which it is a subject it is someone who's referenced to the other anyway bring up the strawberry thing because i think that's really well important. yeah so uh, the original example comes from freud himself if i'm not mistaken right who misreads it that's say right that. yeah Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so, okay. There's a little girl, and she, she it's reports... Anna Freud. It's his son, it's a daughter. It's daughter. Who is it? It's Anna Freud. It's Freud's daughter. It's Freud. Okay, daughter. so Anna Freud has this little dream when she's a kid, and it's a dream of her eating strawberry cake, right? Yeah. And so the easiest way to go with this interpretation is, oh, well, see, it's wish fulfillment. She, she desires to have strawberry cake. She's eating strawberry cake. And that's what Freud says. He says yes. children's wishes are are completely unambiguous. Like they just they they see a thing they want and they they or their dreams are unambiguous. They see a thing they want, they have that wish, and then they dream. Exactly. And then here's the problem. Of, it's kind of on this D and G side almost. Like it's yeah. okay, it's a representation, but it's a representation of pure spontaneous desire, right. which is non other mediated desire. Right. right. Well, of course. Uh, now is it. Did G, did Slavoj get it from Lacan, or is this Slavoj in Plague? No, no, of it's Slavoj's own, own idea. It's Slavoj. It's, play, uh, it's Slavoj. Okay, so in Plague of Fantasies, Slavoj goes to work analyzing this dream, and the whole point that when you get into it is that she doesn't spontaneously desire strawberry cake for herself. It's how she it's how she interprets the other's desire. Oh, to make mommy and daddy happy, I have to be the little girl who enjoys eating strawberry cake that they give me. Right. So her being happy. And, and it's prohibited. Right. Like it's a per, it's not like she can't just have it for dinner. Right. That's the other part. of it, Right. Exactly. Right. So basically, Slavoj does this Lacanian reading of the dream that fleshes out the uns, the, uh, the background or the unspoken dimension of it. And the point is, it's completely other oriented. Right. Now, here, here's the thing. Now, the Luzo Guitarians won't like this, but here's how I figure it. I think DNG, because of the whole philosophy, the Spinoza thing, because we are fundamentally lacking beings, 
if we are at our core lacking, then the egg, which that's D- Deleuze's way of talking about reality as one imminent whole, right? The Spinoza's substance, right? If we're lacking and we're part of it, then the, the egg is lacking. There's a gap in the egg. Now, it's a whole other thing to say, well, is the egg itself lacking? That's the real Zizekian move. But let's just say that, okay, all objects are pure substances, right? They're not lacking, but humans are. Okay, desiring production then is a way of filling in the void, the lack, in the other, which is the egg. They have to fill in us with pure positivity in order to keep negativity out of the imminent egg, the imminent one, the the pure substance, right? And so ultimately, I think this move is is almost rooted more in fantasy than philosophy. They're going to not like that at all, but that's where I'm at with it. Like there is a stubborn insistence with D and G on this pure positive, no negativity, no negativity. And you, I can't help, but kick into psychoanalytic mode. Why, even if what you're saying is right, you're sure being pathological about negativity here. What's your deal? Why, why is it such a, Oh my God, no, not negativity. There's a weird reaction. And I'm sorry, like I love Brent's work, but he even, you saw him do that today with negation or negativity. It's like a, a, a like an immediate visceral, no, not to that, right? Um, well, so that's, there's something ironic about that, isn't there, Mikey? Like, you can't say, like, you can't say no to negation because you are, that is an act of negation, right? Like, it's just, I mean, it's, I mean, that, which I think, doesn't it come to the whole issue, which is. Is that a return of the repressed? In a... Right, I think so, right? I think so. But, but isn't the whole issue, like, why did, the, why did we ever get off kilter in the first place? And I think that's the question to Spinoza. Like, why did we ever misrecognize this oneness in the first place? Right? And he, and I don't think he has a good answer for that, right? Like, because I don't think he can. Like, I think to answer it is already to introduce the negative. The problem is, of course, that, that, that the way that Hegel and Lacan think about signification is that it, and Sartre too, by the way, who's also in the background of who Deleuze is fighting against, I think, um, that to speak is already to negate, right? Like to speak is to negate. So you're bringing negation in once you articulate a system in any way at all. I mean, this is, Kochev makes this incredible point about Spinoza. He says, the Spinoza system is perfectly correct, except no one could ever articulate it. And so then you're like, well, okay, that kind of like, it, it sort of undermines the whole thing because you like, I, I remember this. Uh, so I was at a, I, I probably told this story to you guys even before, but I was at a conference one time, a psychoanalysis conference and a, a, a guy who was a quasi friend of mine, gave a talk in which he said he denounced every conference presentation as perverse, a perverse acting out. <clears throat> and so I just, you know, I'm in the audience. I'm just feeling, I guess, prickish. I just raised my hand. I'm like, well, where did you give this talk from? I said, were you out in the courtyard? Or did, were you actually in the thing? And so you yourself are, you see what I'm saying? Like, I think that that's a problem for the critique of negation. Like, where where are you giving that critique from? And I think that's the yeah. I was gonna say also that it's interesting because you know with Hegel, it's you know you have determinate negation. Well, that's that's positive. That's the, to me, like that's a positive kind of thing. And same with uh, the null basis of the nullity in Heidegger. You know, like the, what what is the null basis of the nullity? How does the nothing not? Not or whatever, you know, well, it's because when you don't do something, when you, when you choose something positive, you have also then chosen all against doing all of those other things that you're not doing. It's like, and, and really it's like coming to terms with the fact that you've been thrown into a life where you were never really actively choosing your life. And at some point you have to take over your life. And, and, and when you take over your life, part of it is coming to terms with the fact that it's like, well, it's my life, but I didn't really choose it. How does that work? I don't know. But from now on, I have to choose. And choosing is always negating. And so it's like, right. I just I just don't understand how we could talk about the human and not talk about that. 
And I wish I totally I wish agree. I, but, totally but, agree. But this is I wish I, I wish I I wish I could have asked Brent that. I don't want to act like this is some kind of a gotcha on Brent. I want to send this to Brent so that he can watch this conversation so that we can hopefully resume and have a follow up conversation once uh, but, but I will have definitely it, it even, looked at like, his book to soon. Be fair, is it even possible? Like, I think Mikey was kind of getting at this. Like, I think, aren't there certain, and again, Aaron Schuster would not like what I'm about to say, but he's a friend of mine. But I think, like, isn't it impossible for certain positions to even have a dialogue, right? Because, like, if you don't think, like, if you, like, I think, wouldn't he have to say that what you're saying about uh, life, right? Like life choices. He's like, I think he would have to say, well, you're misrepresenting what's really going on. You're not negating other possibilities. You're just carving out your own positive path, right? Like, I think, I think in, like, like for Deleuze, like, uh, let me just get, like, let's come back to death because it's kind of interesting, right? So Hegel thinks, Mikey, this is another, I forgot about this. This is another place where he talks about death. He's talking about the organism. He says that every organism contains its own death within it, right? It's kind of, it's nice, I think. Completely anti Deleuzean, right? Like for Deleuze, death is only, ex it's a, I think he says this in the Practical Philosophy book, like death is only a, is the result of a bad encounter, right? So it's a no, no, or no entity dies of its own, on its own, by, on, on, by itself, right? It's always just, you get it like I'm going along. I encounter pancreatic cancer. I'm dead, right? Like, but but there's not a. It's not like within me, I contain the seeds of my own destruction, right? Like that is not. But that is that to me. So my question is: Is there a way? Like I almost think you can't have a conversation. Like you can't. I, like I I say this to Mikey all the time. Like you just have to make a choice. Like like. Either you, you know, think you know, you're being right here, you're being very, and it's a guy we don't talk about much. You're being very La Ruellian, which is there's a fundamental decision a philosopher has to make about how they fundamentally bifurcate the world, because every philosophy involves some fundamental distinction or or gap. And La Ruelle would just say that's the core of a philosophy is a fundamental decision. And if if Deleuze makes the fundamental decision that there is no negativity at the basic metaphysical level that it's some epiphenomenal thing and we say negativity is at the very core of being i mean i i mean we could i guess we could maybe try to argue it but if that's the core fundamental decision then everything that we do ethics epistemology uh aesthetics they're all going to take on a different meaning if we're rooting being in the negative or whatever so right no it's absolutely I'll, correct and i think like don't you think that like I think Hegel believes that he's proving for for the reason that David was saying that the negative exists, right? Like that 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 there is that, that there's uh, that that contradiction is actual, and he thinks he proves it by the fact that we're talking right now. Like that's his that's all his proof is. It's like he's a very he's very Kantian in that way. Like Kant's like, how do we know what has to be? Well, let's look at what we're doing. And what makes it possible to do what we're doing, and then we know what has to be true. And I think that's how Hegel. That's how his proofs operate. It's not logical proofs. It's just proofs like what what is ha what has to be true for us to be able to do what we're doing right now. Would there be any philosophical discussion if we were all in the realm of the forms? We wouldn't discuss anything. No, it's because no. we don't live in a world of pure positive identity that we're having to discuss and debate things because things aren't immediately identical to themselves and knowledge is not immediately identical to being there's right. these knots knowledge and being are fundamentally related, but they're not identical. Well then why, how do they relate? Um, and the very, like, so I don't know. I feel like the only way to have pure positivity would be uh it would be a world without thought in a sense right right or or the belief that the negative is a massive fantasy right that it's just this massive myth but then of course that just begs the question of how the fantasy or the misstep emerges which is i think the entire point about i mean that's in a way hegel's entire philosophy is like how did the even if it's a misstep how does this how does what uh 
Spinoza is trying to correct, how does that even emerge as a problem, right? Like, how does this, how does this world of appearances even emerge, right? And that's the, but I think you're right. Like, the, 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 to even have that positivity, you need the, you need the, I, I think it's very hard to argue against that. But, well, I, I hate to cut this off right here. I really do, because I want to ask like six other questions. So Todd, I hope that we'll be able to have you back uh, for the next round. I don't know, next month David, or something anytime, like that. Anytime, man. It's always my pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Mikey, what a, great what a, seeing you, Nance. What a pleasure. Excellent. Great to see you. And uh, just, I, I guess my, my final note on this would be, even if there can't, even if there are going to be irreconcilable, irreducible um, positions that uh, between, for instance, Deleuze and Lacan, um, and, and then the question is, well, can we really have a dialogue? I would say pedagogically we can, at least, at the bare minimum. Totally agree. So for-, totally for, agree. for I, 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 Can I just yeah. say one thing about this? Yes. I think you, one you, of the We'll best- give you the last word. Yeah. Okay, so I don't want the last word. It's <laughs> really, big. but one of the best little exchange. And I don't know if it helped other people, but it helped me quite a bit. Was I had this little exchange? It was like it wasn't little. It lasted for like over two hours with Graham Harmon, and it really forced me. And I think this is where, what you're getting at. Like it forced me to really articulate what my position was in a way that was made it clearer to me than it had been just when I'm writing along on my own. So I think I think. I think you're right that in that sense, there's a, a real pedagogical, pedagogical, sorry, benefit to the the impossible dialogue, right? Can I just uh, so here's the thing: when I was young, studying this stuff on my own, I was drawing from all these secondary sources, and so for Heidegger, William Blattner, Hubert Dreyfus, Richard Capa Bianco, Thomas Sheen, right, with Lacan and Zizek, Todd, Bruce Fink. So right, so on down the line with DNG, Brent Atkins, Henry Somers Hall. Like, there's a whole. This is what's so special about what you're doing, Dave. To have Todd McGowan and Brent Atkins on the same stream, I think it, it's just an invaluable resource. And, th- and that's the thing, Todd. Like, and last week he had William Large on. He's the guy who taught us Levinas. He wrote an incredible commentary on totality and infinity. The thing with academia, and you you guys all know this so well, if you become a Lacanian Zizekian, you're over here. If you become a Deleuzian, mm-hmm. you're over here. If you're a Heideggerian, you're over here. But for us who aren't in academia, we've drawn from all of you guys. All right. of you are, are teachers in some indirect way. And right. so that's what is so cool. Like, that's why we want to facilitate these kind of conversations and everything, because just today having him on and then having you i feel like i've learned something new or something that has been really clarified right um and that's what's so important about this is we want the best minds working in these areas of philosophy to dialogue with us and to dialogue with each other because my god look how much clarity is brought to the fundamental issues where if you're just reading a book by dng and you're just reading a book by lacan you're not going to get there that's why right. you guys exist. We need great teachers. And when you take teachers who, who are the best at what they do in their area and you put them on a stream together and you got one of the best Levinasians, one of the best Lacanians, one of the best Deleuzians, it, it's something that I've never seen exist in the world. And so that's yeah. why I'm so like part of me, not even as somebody who knows Dave or what, like just as an outside uh, outside observer. So as somebody who loves philosophy and theory, I'd be so excited to find theory underground just for what's been happening today here. Yeah, totally agree. Totally. Yeah. Agree. Thanks for having right. me on, Dave. Thanks, Thanks guys. Talk. See you guys. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. 
Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best editing collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. Seriously. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarricker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground has already put out eight courses, two books, one, my book, Time Energy, and the other, Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of Underground Theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive. So excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program and also make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. And we're back. We, uh, Woo. yeah, that was abrupt. And, uh, it's cause I had to run away and eat food and I'm still working on it. And it looks like, uh, the man of the hour is not here yet. So what I'm going to do is step away and let you two run the show and you guys can talk about what you were just talking about, or you can talk about anything else. Um, kind of up to you guys, but, uh, I'm going to finish eating this food really quick. Okay, cool. Nance, just, I mean, okay, what you didn't see was Nance and I talking, uh, carrying on the conversation from where we left off with Todd, and we were talking about the, the whole idea of the feral child and how whenever this has occurred or, or in some way come close to occurring, what you don't find is that little person um, – even really being a person, but again, that's, I don't, when I, when I, don't, when I hesitate to call them a person, it's not out of disrespect to them. It's, it's a tragic thing. Like they don't get to be a person because they didn't get baptized into language, into norms, into social order, symbolic order, et cetera. Um, and so that's where I'm coming from with it. But the point is Nance, we were talking about like chimpanzees or whatever. There's a book. Have you ever, heard of this one chimpanzee politics brands the wall i think i might have downloaded that at some point but i this book really made an impact my uh teacher at community college doug washer it was one of his favorite books the point is oh you better believe there are prohibitions within little groups or colonies of chimpanzees if they find like one chimpanzee is taking too much food they'll kill that motherfucker in horrible ways and they don't play around so even with chimpanzees, you find this fundamental sense of 
hey, you're going to be part of this group. You're not going to do X, Y, and Z. And if you do, we're going to fuck you up. Like, so, yes, it's far more elaborate, this whole thing with prohibition with us. But you still see it working in uh, even with animals on some level. Because it it, it, it 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 seems to be a consequence of of reality. It, it seems to be uh, a structure that emerges from circumstance. Now, that's not to say that it's this absolute, indefinite, objective, always, forever, ultimately cosmic thing. But it is to say um, you... I mean, one plus one here does kind of equal two. I'm just not, you know, going so far as to say it's a cosmic truth for the, for the end of all time. Yeah, but um, you're getting at, the point is it's a kind of logic. Like that's what the power of Freud's myth of the primal father. It's it, it's not because it's history. It's getting at a logical structure at play in human social organizations, which is to say, if all of us are just desiring or willing or urging beings right and that means we don't fundamentally take each other's desire or fundamental where others urges or wills into account if all that matters is me and my urges then somebody who has the most power the most who's the most violent etc the most cruel is going to assert their will and they're going to rule over everybody and they're going to use them however they want law as far as like a, an official public socially instituted law comes out of the death of that figure, which is to say that if you read it metaphorically, it's the death of that type of being social cohesion in any meaningful sense does not work. If you have these isolatable monads of pure will and desire, you have to compromise that if you're going to be part of a social group and every type of social organization is based around that and it, to say oh no the, you know we're violent or we're repressive etc because of law if we got rid of law everything would just work out perfectly i think that's complete naive naive utopian fantasizing about desire yeah and it's not to say be, i think before we came back on um i expressed dismay like I want to be able to, in this conversation, um, trying to square the circle, I want to be able to say, no, let's just posit lack prior to this desire and production, and then we're all happy. It is the it, it is the position of the people who want to stand for this desire and pr production that there's nothing prior to it. And so it is this totalizing and that thing. Lack, anything that institutes lack is oppressive. It's bad. Yeah. It's basically, it, and I'm sorry, but that's kind of, whether they want to moralize about it or not, a, a different question, but yeah. they do make lack and all of the things that bring lack into being like D and G aren't going to be into fantasy. They're not into the signifier. They're not into law. They're not into prohibition. And all of those are fundamental in constituting this type of constitutive lack in us. And they want to get rid of that. That's what the new earth would be. A bunch of human beings who aren't subjects of the signifier, subjects of law, subjects of fantasy, subjects of uh, black. And, and so, I mean, that's, that's what they're hoping to achieve. I just don't think, I, I mean, this is the whole thing with the Lacanian lesson concerning fantasy. The only thing worse than not getting what you want is getting what you want. Because when you actually get what you think you want, it's not what you want. And I, I think if they got the new earth, they'd be really bummed out about it yeah and it does it does sound kind of silly like when you do take it there um and say oh this would be a world where people can walk up and put their finger in my mouth um it does sound silly but it again it it is like a necessary thing that emerges out of their metaphysical position well, yeah, I mean, that's when they talk about the the flows of desire, right? And and the the you know the kind of freedom of spontaneity or whatever when desiring production, that's what they're talking about. They, I mean, it's a paralogism for them for us to relate to at least on the level of desire to relate to other people as whole persons. 
They think at the fundamental level, desiring production is part oriented. This part wants part of that. This part wants part of that. Well, I'm sorry, like organs, organs aren't violated. Subjects are violated. And th that's the thing. If you want to bracket out the whole person or the subject and say that's not relevant, the, the free flows of desire should just be able to spontaneously connect without any type of prohibitions mediating the connection. This is what it gets you. So that's why I say I don't think I'm straw manning them. Yeah. Guys, uh, where's Justin? Where so I get, is I got he? my card deck. Can we summon him? Yeah, summon that <laughs> lemur. Look here. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna show you guys the screen. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something here. Let's uh let's put you onto the screen so you can see what everyone else is able to see right now. So we're talking over the screen. Everyone can see the screen. They can't see us. And I just, I want to do this. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this um, over the noise canceling, but this is just what I think of. I think of this scene I'm gonna do this. from Anchorman. I'll need my news team at my side. There you go. That's 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 how I feel right now, and I feel like we should just do that for for Justin. Can you email him or? I I sent him one uh, after like it was four minutes past the time. Um, I emailed him earlier today. I'm getting better about emailing people ahead of time to confirm, you know, things and make sure that they're coming. And I. Uh, I messaged him at, uh, let's see, at 11.41 my time, which would have been uh, 12.41 his time. And he said, yeah, 4 p.m. Central, which is what it is. And that's your time, right, Mikey? You're Central. And he said uh, that he only has one hour, sadly. And uh, I said, yes, and that works. And then I gave him the link. And then I said, just, I don't know, like, Eight minutes ago, I was like, we're here. So hopefully something terrible has not come up. Hopefully he didn't uh, see you guys dunking on Deleuze and go, fuck you guys. I'm not doing that. Um, I don't I don't think so. I think it's probably something came up. But yeah. can I just say, like, I love Deleuze. Like every I know it sounds weird, like. I love that motherfucker. I think he's one of the greatest philosophers in history. I just disagree. But like I I don't I don't respect Deleuze any less than I respect like Zizek or Lacan. Like he's on that same level of respect. Difference in repetition is one of the greatest works of metaphysics ever written. Period. And so and why do you think I want you, I've told you for a long time, like, get Brent Atkins on here, Henry Somers Hall, Daniel Sp Like, I want as many Deleuzean scholars to talk to as we can because I respect d &G so much. Um, I'm just not going to pretend that I can just integrate d gs philosophy into what I'm doing with Lacan. It, it, there is a fundamental antagonism between them. I, I'm not doing the... Like the way the way Christian fundamentalists just cherry pick verses to suit like I'm going to cherry pick this from D and G, cherry pick this from Lacan and G. That works if you're trying to impress somebody who's new to theory. They go, "Wow, look how they spin all this stuff together." But and, and I, again, I'm with Brent. There's ways we can take something like the War Machine and connect it to Super Ego or something. Like I don't think it, it's wrong to do. Like that's great, but it's Far better to do that against the background of understanding the fundamental antagonism between the two, the groups and understanding what's at stake in making these connections instead of just willy-nilly, oh, war machine, super e You have to go deeper with these philosophies um, and understand the contradiction between them if you're going to make meaningful connections between them. Yeah, so let's just... 
fucking roll with that and say, uh, we're going to assume he's not coming now. If he comes and then we're still able to talk, that'll be great. But let's just assume it's not going to happen. There's a couple of things that we can still do. But one thing that I would like to do is people are here for kind of, we were going to talk to a Landian. We were going to talk about Deleuze. We were going to talk about, I mean, I wanted to get into specifics. I wanted to ask Justin Murphy what the fuck he means by uh, accelerationist Catholicism. Like, okay, what is that for you, dude? I want to know. Um, but outside of like those kinds of things, and I know you had a bunch of your own questions related to, uh, you know, philosophy and stuff like that. I'm thinking, let's just kind of, you know, here we are at the end of this stream. Anybody who queued it up from the beginning and watched it from beginning to end or listened to it while they were working is likely to have a lot of ideas firing around in their head. There's a lot of different lines of thought, a lot of different threads. And we can kind of weave those together into a nice big bow. Now, if Justin pops in, we'll just kind of like abort mission, switch gears right into having a conversation with him. But assuming that he doesn't, we'll talk for an hour and then close it out. And in the talking for an hour, I think we should start with basically what you were just talking about. You were just talking about you think Deleuze is one of the most important philosophers, even though you disagree with them. In the same way that you think that Deleuze is one or Land is one of the most relevant thinkers today. Um, and so, of course, we've been advocating for this land versus uh, Zizek debate. And there's news about that, everybody, but we'll save that for a little bit from now. You know, so just to whet your appetite, we'll drop some exciting news on you all in a sec. But uh, I want to set it up so that Mikey can answer a question. Uh, and that is, you know, he, okay, first of all, you heard the whole conversation with Brent Atkins, yes? Okay. What the hell? Does it mean I'm, to talk about the body without I'm, organs in terms of limits? Limit, limits. Limit. I, I don't know. All right. You don't so even you know. want to know what I, body without organs is? I'll tell you. I think it's completely related to the virtual. I know he was very hesitant to make that connection. But yeah. the way I understand it, and again, like D&G do talk about it in different ways. And he made a really great point in talking about how they link the body without organs to the earth, to the despot, and to capital in anti-Oedipus. Then in a thousand plateaus, they have the plateau, how to make yourself a body without organs. And that's a move in the individualistic direction. I think, and I totally agree with Brent. There's, this isn't a contradiction, right? It's a, it's a matter of focus. What they're concerned with there in anti-Oedipus is, okay, so it's weird body without organs, but everyone that I just, so the body without organs of the tribal society is the earth the the territory the actual earth right we're being literal here um in the despotic society it's the body of the despot the ruler the overlord etc um or the king the king's body um and in capitalism it's capital but they also refer to each one of these as the socius now the socius is essentially the organizing principle or anchoring point of a society it's that around which the society is fundamentally constituted as the type of society it is so on the one hand you can go well why is why is the earth both the socius and the body without organs for tribal society because the possibilities that society has are opened up to it by the earth being the focal point of it Right. By making that the focal point, just like making the, the despot the focal point, the organizing principle, or by making capital the organizing principle or fo focal point, each one of them open up radically different arrays of possibilities for a world. And so, you know, having a top down despotic ruler, king figure, if that's what it's fundamentally going to anchor society, you're going to have a totally different uh range of possibilities right um if capital usurps the king and gets hold of being the the center point of society the organizing principle then capital is going to unleash and this is why they think capital is the socius the the focal point of society out of the three that truly unleashes or taps into the body without organs in a way that the other two couldn't even imagine. What does that mean when you de-jargon it? It means 
that capitalism facilitates the emergence of new things, uh, of new possibilities, right? It's constantly introducing the new, right? Because it's not about preserving a, 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 and securing a, a, a traditional way of life. Tribal societies, if they, as long as they exist, they don't have revolutions in their social orders. They don't have reformation. Like they have a way of life that's sedimented. It's absolutely fixed. And you can't imagine that type of society without this rigidly coded. And there's the word it, we're talking about codes versus axiomatics when we're talking about this whole, okay, so tribal societies have rigid codes. The symbolic orders aren't, they don't sit around and think about all, now maybe on some gut level they know this, but as it operates, tribal, members of tribal societies don't sit around and go, you know, the way we do things is completely contingent and it's bullshit and we could reorganize it. Like, they don't view their social order the way that we do, right? Um, and so, okay, you have like, that is what codes do for dng codes establish fixed identities at the symbolic level that are more or less essences they're not true ontological essences but within the world you are the son of x y and z you married the daughter of x y and z your role in society is x y and z and this is it it's not open for discussion you're not there to flourish as an individual and experiment with alternate versions of your like it doesn't work like that in that world okay but what this means is that desire is completely locked into place you don't have this freedom to explore all your desiring connect your desiring productions all of the ways that you could change or become etc this world Though the earth and the territory and the, the way of life that emerges around that particular territory, all of that is cemented into place at the symbolic level. And your the spontaneousness of your desire is, goes out the window. You're part of the tribe. You are the position the tribe gives you. And that's that. Well, with the onset of these more feudal societies, ancient societies, uh, monarchies, um, you know, uh, overlord, you know, all this kind of stuff. What you have now is you have somebody who doesn't just have a territory because the tribes are territorialized. They have a territory. That's the earth. What you end up with, with the overlord or the imperial conqueror, he's not satisfied with his lands. He wants to extend his kingdom. This is Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan. We want to conquer, right? Well, the, the thing is with these guys is it's almost like Xerxes in 300. You get a, you know, a kind of cartoonish example of he's sitting there going, you can have your fucking way of life. I'm not trying to break your world apart. You just have to bend the knee to me and submit to my overcode. You have a code, you have a way of life. Accept my overcode, meet my demands and the basic symbolic mandates I give you, and I'll leave your local code alone. I don't need you to conform to my values. I don't need you to live like somebody else. Have your way of life. Just modify it by accepting me as this overcode upon you, right? But of course, overcoding modifies your whole society because now you're not just taking care of yourself. You also have to produce enough for the overlord. You have to be taxed, blah, 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 blah. You go into debt to the overlord. It brings in all these new dynamics. But ultimately, tribal society and despotic society are code-based societies. Yes, you have the pure uh, territorial code in, in tribal societies. You get the introduction of the imperial code or imperial overcode. But ultimately, capitalism comes and blows all of that apart. I think Justin's here. Uh, no, but, I, uh, I, 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 brought, I, brought, I brought in, when I said uh, news team assemble, when I played that earlier, oh, it hey. accidentally, it actually brought in... Here, here. Oh, oh, look at it's Cadell instead. What? What up? What? But we did. Who knew that when I had the little, it would bring in Cadell instead of Justin. Welcome, Cadell. How's it going, Hello, man? Cadell. Can you hear us? We can't hear you. There hey, am I coming through? Now you. There are. we go. Good. All right. Yeah. Great to be here. How's the stream? Uh, it was fantastic. I, and I want to, in a second, uh, 
you know, do a thing where we kind of fill you in on some of this cool stuff that happened. And right now I said, we're taking a bunch of the, the threads, the C steamy. Oh yeah. We good. I think I'm messing up my sound. Just a sec. Okay. Well, we can hear you. Yeah, but we take a, we're taking a bunch of seemingly disparate threads, wrapping them up into a nice big bow for people. Um, and, uh, so Mikey was just, uh, saying what the body without organs is for him, uh, because, uh, it was very different hearing, uh, Brent Adkins go into what it is. Um, and so Mikey, is it, does that pretty much conclude where you're at or let me finish up just with a couple trains of thought here and we'll move on. Okay. So the point though, is capitalism is unique because it introduces axiomatics into the equation and replaces codes. Okay, so again, codes are these qualitative systems of fixed identities. I whether it's the the tribal setting where you have a fixed identity within your territorialized tribe or whether it's the type of debtor, overlord, uh king's ro- loyal subject type of identities. Code systems are qualitative because they set up qualitative identities usually hierarchical ones between human beings, which gives them a kind of fixed essence. It's not really an essence, but it's a symbolic essence. And um, it locks all of your possibilities into place because you now, in a sense, have been allotted a position in society. And that position, given your identity, opens up certain possibilities, but it usually limits more possibility like right so you're not free to just explore yourself within these coded systems this is a repression of desiring production because what desiring production seeks is creative experimentation which means you're always undergoing becomings you're always changing you don't have a fixed essence and dng they are they do critique identity they do desire to not have to conform or get locked into identities it's all about this differential experimentation with your potentialities and that's the body without organs the body without organs as i understand it is the virtual reservoir of potentials within ourselves within our bodies and we can we have the abilities to do all kinds of things this is what brings us to time energy if you have time energy you can start to experiment with uh uh you know, learning a a new instrument, learning a new language, your body can learn to do something new. It can tap into potentialities that had hitherto been untapped into. And that's what the body without organs essentially is, is your body. I mean, this goes back to Spinoza. Spinoza famously said, we still don't know what a body can do, right? So your body has an actual side to it. You are an actual body you you t- you're made of mass. You have mass. You take up space. You you have actual uh, d- uh, characteristically <laughs> defining features that make you a human body, etc. But just like everything, right? Lamps, uh, windows, etc. There's also potentials you have that, given the right intensive fields, right? Again, the example I'll use it until I die, probably. But uh, popcorn kernels. Popcorn kernels have potentialities locked inside of them if you want actual popcorn you take the popcorn kernels you put them in a microwave that microwave is a field of intensities and that field of intensity pulls out virtual potentialities right in the popcorn kernel and changes them they undergo a becoming via the particular intensive field they were placed in same goes for us um the different types of intensive situations we're in can unlock different potentialities. So for example, if you want to change your body and, you know, get it, get in really great shape, like be a bodybuilder, you're going to have to put your body under extreme intensities through the pressure of the weights you're lifting, et cetera. Like you are ripping your body apart via intensities in order to modify it, to bring out potentials in your body that aren't currently actualized. And so that's what the body without organs is. And and when we talk about making yourself a body without organs, right? So on the one hand, if you have different anchoring points in society or sociuses, those are going to enable certain potentials within us and within society to come out, right? Um, And that's at the social level. But with, with ourselves, we ourselves can 
experiment with becoming bodies without organs. And so one way to think about it is if you go to the gym, the gym as a whole, you know, configuration of intensities, weight machine, uh, uh, dumbbells, et cetera, right? You're creating a body without organs for yourself, which is to say you you're creating the situation in which you can unlock potentials within your body, right? So you're making yourself a body without organs. Um, you know, they, one of their examples is like sadomasochism. So if you engage in BDSM, you can open up yourself to all kinds of sexual enjoyment you've never had before. It changes your sexuality, uh, changes you, the type of sexual person you are. So, and that's through, you know, if you, you if you're bound, right, you, you, there's sensations that can be unleashed in your body that otherwise you, you wouldn't experience. So whether it's BDSM or going to the gym or going to a swimming pool and learning to swim or getting a bike, all of these are ways to make yourself a body without organs because all of them enable you to tap into potentials in your body that you haven't yet actualized. And so on that thing, like as far yeah, the, the, the social order is a body without organs in the sense that the way our particular symbolic orders open up certain possibilities for us. Um, we ourselves as individuals can become body without organs in the ways I've just described. And as far as it, I, when he kept saying the body without organs is a limit, I've seen it talked about like that, but I don't know exactly what that means. And so th again, that, th this is why I would love to have a conversation with Brent. I mean, that w when I was sitting there, I was saying, Dave, ask him what that means. Like they say the body without organs, but I know you had other stuff to get to, but um, time. Time. Anyway, that's the way I understand. It. And and yeah. all I'll just say is axiomatics, real quick, just axiomatics. The reason that that's different than codes, right? Capitalism introduces, like, the fundamental core of the capitalist symbolic order is axiomatics. It's not about fixed a absolute identities. Part of what it is, I mean, from Baudrillard, you're always playing with your identity with sign values and commodities, right? D and G aren't so much interested in that, but it's relevant for them what axiomatics is is what do you get when you have a symbolic order that's not primarily organized around imposing fixed qualitative identities on people and instead one fixed on economic quantitative calculation right how do i get more right when the fundamental schema through which you're trying to organize society shifts to quali uh, quantitative valuation or over qualitative valuations, you get a whole different organization of society because now oh, we don't care about the quality of your ritual or whatever relation it has to your God. What matters is markets being efficient and we need 24 hour a day uh, access to commodities because that increases accumul. You get a whole different world emerge when the, the fundamental organizing principle is increases in quantitative value as opposed to the endurance of qualitative values. And so that's what capital does is it bring in, in axiomatics, which is essentially just economic calculation. Okay. Stan, the thing is, is when you explain the body without organs, it makes sense and it feels useful. And when other people explain it as a limit, I'm not sure what to do with it. And I did wish I could have asked about that. Um, but, you know, ideally, maybe you can write a blog post someday about not just, oh, what is the body without organs, but say, is the body without organs a limit or is it? You know, and then you could literally just work through and just say, look, I can already I, tell you what I'm going to do, I, what I'm going to do. And I mean, I don't. I mean this respectfully. He's getting at something important when he calls it a limit. He just didn't elaborate on it. I'll probably know what he's getting at once he explains it. And I'll just integrate it into the way I understand. I'll just say that I cannot not read a thousand plateaus and anti Oedipus um, outside of difference and repetition. They are to me, at least extensions. And I just, from my reading, they all gel so well. Um, and again, maybe he, he mentioned Daniel Smith. Uh, maybe my reading of D and G is, you know, uh, more inspired by him than I even realized until today. But I just see that that whole thing of virtuality, intensity, and actuality, that threefold structure of becoming, right? Or the egg. Um, 
I see that at work through the, their whole thing. And I think the body without organs, I mean, they wouldn't like it like this, but I think when they're talking about how to make yourself a body without organs, that is D and G's materialist existentialism, even though they wouldn't obviously call it that, but it's how to experiment with yourself. And, um, what it does is, and in part, I guess the, maybe they'd hesitate because they'd say, oh, well, existentialism posits like some authentic self identity that you're pursuing, which, but for them, the authenticity would be in how you're experimenting in your, your trajectory of becoming. And it's not about arising, uh, arriving at a specific identity. It's about how it's, it goes back to the, the how and the what that Kierkegaard talked about. It's how you're becoming right. That that's important for them. And if you are always teasing out different potentialities in your body, um, always open to some new form of stratification, um, which is again, because they're not, I'm with, I'm with him wholeheartedly on, they're not anti strata. They're, they're anti strata. If you reduce yourself to it again, it's a kind of bad faith. Right. If you reduce yourself to your fixed uh, some identity that's given to you or some social status that you find yourself in, it's bad faith to think that's just what you are, because you always have this potential in your desire to unlock other potentials. Right. Um, but again, so that's why I say I think we kind of can talk about a materialist existentialism with them. We just have to qualify it. All right, I've talked way too long. You guys take. Um, I kind of want to just take it. So let's, I want to set the, set the stage here for Cadell to be able to talk about some of the cool organizing work he's been doing. I don't know how much of it you're able to talk about, how much of it you're not, whatever you are able to talk about, I want you to be able to talk about it in a minute. But first I kind of want to get to a couple yeah. of these sort of like the threads of the, the stream throughout the day. Uh, but no, what did you have something you wanted to interject though? Go for it. Yeah. I did kind of want to ask a question to Mikey. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay, so I'm interested, like, I'm so I'm genuinely interested about your approach to what I'm seeing in your work between Deleuze and Land and Lacan and Zizek. And I love the way you stay with this tension, and I love the way you you approach really going into philosophers that you don't necessarily agree with but you respect deeply um and the way you approach it from the fundamental antagonism as such say between Deleuze and Land and Lacan and Zizek if I can frame it that way is that what do you think the stakes of your activity here are is it to find some position that transcends both is it to sort of demonstrate the the limits of one and sort of like the fundamental necessity of following the other um or yeah what what what's your thought here cuz um i don't know i could give a, an example of sort of how i've approached it in a different way but i i just sort of want to get where your mind is with this difference okay yeah um for me it would be both one i think it's just important to explore this contradiction because i think with with this line from Spinoza up to D&G. Like, look, I mean, they put Bergson in this. They put Nietzsche in this. I don't know if, like, I don't know if every Nietzschean on the planet would agree that, yes, uh, Nietzsche belongs in this tradition that doesn't leave any room for negativity whatsoever. I mean, with Spinoza, it's, it, I think, okay, the way I would do it, I think Deleuze is more Spinozist, Spinozist than he is a Nietzschean or Bergsonian, even though those other two were big influences. Um, and I think that's why there's this fundamental contradiction between D and G and Lacan or, or D and G and Zizek, especially and Lacan, but because Lacan and Zizek in their own ways are Hegelians, just Lacan is a Kojevian type of Hegelian. Um, Zizek is a Zizekian Hegelian, but, uh, point is it goes back to this this tension between spinoza and hegel and i do think that there's these two lines of philosophy that you know it, it, there's a fork there that happens with spinoza and hegel it goes back to them and so 
the thing is, like on the one hand, I side with the tradition that thinks negativity is actually part of the ontological fab- fabric of reality. Um, because I am just I maybe it's because I I just feel too overwhelmed with what I would consider to be good evidence that negativity is constitutive. It goes back to Hegel, but it, uh, Heidegger, I can't, I mean, the null basis of the nullity, all of that, um, up through Lacan, up through Sartre, up to Zizek, McGowan, all of them, that I'm just, it boils down to, am I more convinced of Hegel up to Zizek, or am I more convinced of Spinoza up to d and I'm more convinced of Hegel up to Zizek. Um, so you wouldn't say Spinoza up to up to land. You'd say Spinoza up to D and G. No, well, you're you're right. No, it would go to land. Now, here's the thing, though. I think part of this because Dave and I we have I want to frame of- your debate because I know the debate. <laughs> no, no. So the thing is, I actually, I, I I my appreciation for land is sincere. I think land is getting at this incre- whether or not capitalism turns itself into the singular okay there's an empirical question will it ha- i don't know what i take seriously is the virtual potential of capital to do this and this idea that capitalism is artificial intelligence i don't think this is some crazy assertion i think it makes a lot of fucking sense And that puts me at odds with a lot of people because so many people want to write land off. I'm not doing that. Um, On the one hand, um, for the very reason, this whole thing that Todd and we we were all discussing, chapter three of Anti-Oedipus, I think it gets at a lot of fucking truth. Like it does shape how I actually think about capitalism. Um, I think the way that they talk about this relationship between older forms of society, and then what capitalism does, I think they're right. I don't agree on desiring production being the fundamental form of desire, but the relationship between capital slash axiomatics to codes and overcodes, I agree with. I think capitalism rips apart old forms of society. Um, The Baudrillardrian supplement is to say, yeah, and then it simulates their return, but it does so in a way that neutralizes whatever potential radical dangerous otherness was there in those societies. And so it's Christianity and it's uh, Christian fundamentalist form as actually revolutionary and potentially threatening to capital as the first apostles would. I don't I don't think. I see the radical revolutionary fervor of the the apostles and that first generation of Christians in the typical soccer mom who goes to church on Sunday. I'm sorry, but what it does is it simulates some sort of extreme religious devotion. But if you look at Fox's books of, of Fox's book of martyrs, those are motherfuckers who believe in what they're preaching. If you're willing to go to this, be burned at the stake because you're not going to recant Jesus. I'm sorry, you believe in a way that the average American Christian fundamentalist doesn't believe. But what our type of religiosity we have in this country does is simulate religious devotion. It simulates community, right? And the point is, though, capitalism does. Capitalism is going to privilege market exchange. It's going to privilege capital accumulation and whatever coded identities, which is to say, qualitative ways of life that stand in the way of capital accumulation, those have to be fucking destroyed. And it does this in a remarkably efficient way. I'm sorry, we have a kind of globalized culture now because it ripped apart traditional societies. It beamed consumer culture all over the globe and it won this battle in a way. And that's why when I see anybody like, I understand people wanting to defend certain traditions because they give more meaning to their lives than empty consumerism. Totally get that, right? And people will turn to Buddhism, they'll turn to Islam, they'll turn to Christianity. I get it. But as far as who's really in control here, it's capital. And 
a, it'll let you have your your little makeshift codes or whatever remnants of code you want, but you're going to be a fucking consumer first and foremost, and you better believe it. And you're going to have a job and you're going to be in wage labor. You're not going to escape that. And so it, it found a way to neutralize the, the power of old symbolic orders. And I'm not even defending them on some point. This is where I'm a Deluso Guattari and Landian. I would rather live in capitalism than the, those old forms of society. As far as I'm concerned, rip the codes apart. I don't want these kind of essentialist fixed ideas. I, I, I'm just, I, I'm going to side with the, the kind of nihilistic axiomatics. I am because there is a liberatory dimension to it. It sets people free to not have to be stuck like glue to whatever identity their society has imposed on them since birth. Fuck that shit. If you, you know, this idea that you have some intrinsic duty to your family. Look, I want people to have as good a family lives as possible, but if somebody is in a shitty family or whatever, I don't want them to feel like they're obligated their whole life to stick around just because that's their essence as what I like the freedom and, 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 uh, what this whole capital capitalistic axiomatics opens up, right? Um, destroy the identities, like f which is to say, destroy these essence essences imposed on you since birth. Okay, Dave. I, I, I my interjection is not anything more than uh, a quick little point of order, and that is to say that Justin will be joining us in thirteen minutes. So. Uh, and then we can the, ask about Catholic accelerationism. Yeah, exactly. And, that's and my that's, and that's my point against the, the, the destruction of identities. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look, I mean, like, here's the spoiler, right? Like, this is why I'm so interested to talk to Justin because, as somebody who's thought as much about land and Deleuze as he has, it seems to me that Catholic accelerationism is oxymoronic. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm giving him more credit. I don't. He, I'm sure he has some way to talk about it right? right or he's figured it out or something right i'm just saying that catholicism is arguably the most coded of all codes throughout history right um and you would think capital and catholicism are completely at odds with like you have to choose and so i'm interested to talk to him to see we'll 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 get to say you and i will both get to kind of restate this stuff i want uh in a maybe in about eight minutes, maybe six, six minutes to, uh, to roll the PSA, the three minute one, and then we'll come back and it will only show the three of us, uh, Justin, Mikey, myself, uh, Nance and Cadell. If you are able to hang out for the whole thing, all you got to do is turn your camera off and then hang out. You can be there for the whole thing. You can be there in the chat as well. That'd be helpful. Um, but then, uh, you'll be able to be there for the Q and a part towards the end, right? Like, uh, so it'll be kind of a proper interview that opens up to a and a at that point. So I guess I want uh, both of you starting with Cadell and then Nance in these last 67 well, minutes sorry, here. No, 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 hold on just one second. Just hold on. Cause I didn't no, answer no, what I was going to say. Okay. Uh, real quick. Hold on. Cadell. So here's the point. I think when it comes to capitalism, D and G and land have fundamental insights into it that we're not going to get from Zizek or Baudrillard or, Lacan or even Marx, right? And I accept those insights. I think they are of fundamental importance. I think they can tell us something about how capitalism works that the other guys can't. And so my engagement with land is again, it's sincere because I think DNG and land's reading of DNG um can really tell us something about capitalism. And so that's I'm trying to take that and work that into what I'm doing with. Baudrillard and Zizek and the Marks and the other guys. Sweet Cadell, how about, I mean, then you can kind of lead off and then Nance, and I want you both to uh, respond to the day, the stream, this conversation, Mikey now, but also maybe say some stuff about what you hope to see come from this interview. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I haven't had a chance to, to catch much of the stream. I'm going to have to do some catch up. Um, but um, I appreciate I appreciate Mikey's Mikey's perspective and work here at, at the at the edge of um, DNG and land and 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 Lacan and Zizek and I'm who you know who knows what's going to come from it. Um, 
in terms of in terms of the interview coming up with Justin Murphy, I think it would be. I, I know he's done a lot of work on both Deleuze and Land, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so this is a huge opportunity here to investigate some interesting contradictions from the point of view of his also his interest in Christianity, um, especially in the context of what Mikey's just been talking about. Um, you know, what, what's, you know, how can you maintain a traditionalist identity within sort of an accelerationist paradigm in relationship to philosophers that seem fundamentally anti-humanist? Um, or, you know, these are some of the first thoughts that come through my head. So, I mean, I'm totally, um, I, I totally love the work that Justin Murphy's doing at, um, at Other Life. I was, I, I even participated in Other Life back during coronavirus. So, I'd just be interested to, to hear. I'm just going to be an interested uh, spectator. And uh, as always, uh, loving the the whole uh, community vibe you bring together here on the live streams, Dave. I'm not sure if there's anything else uh, I, I, I could say, or, or if there's a question, I can answer a question. You, you I'm, I'm, ask I'm debating whether or not my... I'm, de I'm debating or not whether I should go to bed maximizing the intensity of popcorn kernels or whether i should go to bed maximizing the intensity of of weightlifting you know it's it's always a tension you know do i do i you know do i want to go to go to bed with a burner do i want to go to bed with some popcorn these are my uh, body without uh, organ without or what is it <laughs> body without organ questions <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step away to do a couple of preparatory things, but I'm listening with rapt attention. Nance and Cadell, you guys can have a back and forth and everything for these next uh, five minutes. But Nance, yeah, overall, I want to give you the floor here for a minute. All right, be right back. Uh, I think once again, um, we had another all-day stream where we brought on seemingly disparate um, People or people who are involved in seemingly disparate, you know, fields of study and and discourse, and there has been kind of a through line through it all, um, and it and it seems to be centered around um, the current moment. Uh, I think it is actually interesting that we will be ending today um, with a conversation that will probably orbit accelerationism, um, and. Yeah, I guess just to, just to reiterate, um, bringing together people and, and concepts that might seem opposed to one another, I think is is how we defeat the tendency of the internet, which is to just sit back and have uh, circle jerks in closed rooms. Um, and I'm happy that the the people that come here and are involved do seem dedicated to really understanding what's going on and not just having um you know demographic circle jerks uh yeah i don't know how do we prevent being in constant masturbatory loops right this is a, a auto erotic asphyxiation it's like how do how do you know how how do we how do we how do we, what is it, how do we refuse jouissance in order to attain jouissance on the inverse scale of the ladder of desire? This is the, this is the message for the end of the live stream. <laughs> Excellent, guys. I just, went, I, just, I just went graph of desire. There needed to be a little graph of desire at the end of, at the end of this. No, that was perfect. Man, I, you know what? I would like to do a whole stream with just Cadell and Mikey. We just dive into the graphic desire. I want you guys to break that shit down for me. Uh, but for now, uh, we're going to close it out on this segment. And so, folks, we're going to roll this PSA. It's about the uh, subscription tiers. It's about the underground and what it's doing. It's about kind of who we are, what it's about what my project ultimately boils down to. It's all there. Wow, there's like an airplane flying right through the window, apparently. Can you all hear that shit? Jeez. Wow. Is that all silenced out for you guys? Oh, okay. So it's okay. I can't hear anything. Well, it's loud on my side. But uh, anyway, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to say really quick is that I do have a Patreon. I started that uh, this week for Theory Underground. Uh, I also put 
uh, pay tiers, paywall tiers on the Substack. The idea is, is that there's a specific kind of content I've not been good about putting out, and that's my writing. I do it all the time, but I don't put it out, and I want to have some kind of accountability, and I know that if some people are expressing that they really want to see it, then that will force my hand to kind of stay on schedule and, and actually put it out instead of getting all neurotically constipated like I do. I produce it, and then I go, oh, I don't know, I don't know, and then I just sit on it. Um, and now I've got like a backlog that goes back like, you know, years. Uh, and then on the other side with Patreon, I don't put out these individual segments from these giant streams in a quick enough manner. So tomorrow, my conversation with Cadell from the one year anniversary is going to premiere, uh, you know, and, and then next week, there's a couple that will premiere. Um, but it's like, my God, I, I need to be doing clipping and putting out, you know, 12 minute important clips. I need to be doing uh more of this, putting the, this stuff out. I need to be putting stuff up on the, the podcast. And, and, and that's just work. It is just work. And it's not the creative kind of stuff I have fun with unless I do video essays and that is creative, but it's a time sink. And so ultimately I want the Patreon to motivate me to do all of those things. And, uh, I have a million things I'm juggling and you would think that adding the, the, the Patreon and Substack like more seriously would actually be a hindrance on my creative abilities, but I think it will be the opposite. I think it will give me the structure that I need. And uh, yeah, so uh, get on it, support it. If you like this, if you want to see more of it, there's plenty more of it coming this year. This year is going to be one for the history books, but it's only setting up for things to come. Uh, but you know, you want to be here when it's forming, you want to be here as it's going down. And so there's lots of really cool shit that I'm going to be doing with Cadell in Europe. There's lots of really cool shit we're going to be doing here in Boise in October. There's lots of really great anthologies coming out. There's lots of amazing writing that is already there or in the works. And I'm not, you know, I'm not going to toot my own horn too much, but like there's stuff that I'm really excited to share is what I'm ultimately saying. If you care about this kind of stuff, I think you might like it. And so look up Theory Underground on Substack, look up Theory Underground on Patreon, get on that shit. That is for the people who don't want to pay for courses, who are like, I'm too busy for courses. I just want to see you succeed, Dave. Okay, so get on that, support that. That was, I was supposed to be making plugs for that all throughout the day. I fucked up and I didn't actually do it. Uh, to the person who called me a self entitled chill, you're right. Absolutely. Of course. How dare me want to get any kind of compensation for my labor? How dare me? I bet you don't tip people either. You know, it's fine. But, you know, what you should do is run a business. And where you have all the people that you like to watch and you could just not pay them. That would be a great way to do things. Um, but also, if you find a way to overcome neo-feudalism, um, sign me up. Until then, fucking sign up. All right, thanks. And then we'll be right back after this PSA that was made with no labor whatsoever and doesn't require any kind of compensation because that would be insane. Peace. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run and review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarriker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages, five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground 
has already put out eight courses, two books, one, my book, Time Energy, and the other, Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of underground theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive, so excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program and also make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. Crad and accelerationism go back. We're back. I don't know if he's. We're back. We're back. Welcome back, everybody. Yeah. Sorry. When the PSA is out, I'm like, it's back. It's back. But you want to? You want to? You want to say what you were saying there? Sorry to cut you off like that, Cadell. Well, I think I've, 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 like, I've been hanging around. I don't want to drop names, but like, I have been around like a lot of people who are trying to combine like a traditional religious orientation with a radically accelerationist technological vision like and it's just sort of like disorienting for me because you know i, I you know i've 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 always seen sort of the singularitarians as kind of the exact opposite of anything you would think of as a traditional lifestyle but like um you know i'm seeing i'm seeing it more and more so you know that that's where i would be interested to hear justin murphy's point of view because i'm i'm genuinely sort of interested to see how these two fit together or where the connecting point is because i struggle to find it except perhaps maybe under some eschatological framework like that's that's what i always thought of as the technological singularity as kind of sneaking in some sort of christian eschatology and and maybe there's some link there which I'm I'm you know I'm, they're seeing which I'm not immediately connecting. Yeah. All right. Well, he said I, coming. I, he just said coming right now because there was this part of me that's like, well, it's four oh three. He was supposed to be here three minutes ago, so maybe he's not coming. But he's coming, so he'll be here any second. Nance, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say I, I think there's definitely people who who maybe naively take that view of uh, forcing a breakdown. And that breakdown being a good thing, and then we can have you know return to monkey, um, which is why uh, it it is difficult. Maybe it it's just aesthetic. I I don't know, but I think there there have to be people who are genuinely engaged in this like traditionalism who are also um, embracing acceleration. So it is a weird contradiction that doesn't make sense to me. So having a an actual answer would be would be kind of cool. Otherwise, like I'm, I'm forced to think of, I'm not forced to, but I, I always just think, oh, they're just memeing. They're just memeing. It's a, a, all right, here we go. We got him now. All right. All right. You guys can turn your cameras off. Hey, what's going on guys? So sorry. So sorry. <laughs> Welcome, man. How's it going? Good, good. Can't complain. Is this a video thing? I forgot. Yeah, we're live. It's a video thing. The people who turned their uh, cameras off are the, uh, well, they're just going to be there for Q&A, potentially. Uh, let me let me get the three speaker view on here. Oh, it's Boom. live? I didn't realize that. Shit, you didn't realize that? Okay, yeah. Really? I don't mind. Oh, okay. Uh, Is live on well, live on YouTube or live with you doing yeah. like in your community or what? Yeah, just YouTube, yeah. And so cool. this is a, right. this is like, 
This, well, let me let me ground you out really quick, and then I'll introduce you to the folks who are here. So, uh, basically, I do these epic marathon streams. I, I I need to get like some kind of a copy pasta going where I explain it to every speaker because sometimes I explain it, sometimes I forget to. Um, in your case, I must have dropped the ball. But basically, I've been up since four thirty this morning, um, live streaming, and uh, so I've had on a whole series of guests throughout the day including people like Alenka Zupancic. And uh, because it's to lose his birthday, we had on Brent Adkins, the author of Introduction to Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. And then, you know, we had Todd McGowan on later. Uh, we had Ashley Frowley and Christine Louis Soli. And so there's been a variety of like these political conversations, but also these uh, conversations kind of between uh, or I, I mean, really Lacan or Deleuze or between the two of them. And so when we talked to McGowan, we talked, Mikey was here with me and we talked about uh, Brent Adkins and that whole conversation because he had said some things about Deleuze and, and, uh, and about Lacan and everything like that. He had said some stuff about Hegel because he used to be into Heidegger and Hegel, uh, people we're really interested in as well. And so um, anyway, all of that's to say that that's kind well, of, you're, you're like this uh, icing on the 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 cake i guess you're you're like the quilting point here but that's really exciting because we've been having this conversation about zizek and land and deleuze and lacan for a while now and you're like you're like the guy when it comes to deleuze when it comes to land and 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 mikey especially has been really advocating to to have this conversation with you he's got he's got a lot of questions i've got questions so i guess what i'll tell the audience though before i turn it over to mikey and let him say some things is just that uh Justin Murphy is somebody who at some point left academia, started doing things his own way, and has his own community on the internet and has had conversations with all kinds of edgy characters on the internet, including Amy Therese and uh, Mencius Moldbug, aka Curtis Yarvin and uh, Nick Land. But also you have all kinds of interesting artistic people who might not be into politics whatsoever on. And one of the things that I've appreciated the most about your work is even just the stuff where you're just explaining how to do things. Just very basic, kind of like the professor office hours, like here, here's how you do this thing. And I've gotten a lot of value uh, out of that over the years. And so thank you. Um, and you also wrote Base Deleuze. Uh, is there anything else you'd want to say in terms of introduction? No, that's more than enough. Thank you for the kind words. I'm really glad okay. to hang out with you. Cool. Mikey, want to take it away? Justin, I just want to say it's good to meet you. I've uh, been watching your videos for a long time, and so it's cool to have a conversation. Um, I guess I don't know how much you, you have heard about what Dave and I are trying to make happen or whatever. Um, we really would love to see Zizek and Land have a discussion. And yes, for fun meme fodder you know we talk about it as a debate but awesome. when we, we talked to Slavoj about it's not even a debate it's more of a discussion and for us the reason why we would want it to happen is without any doubt right these are the two most famous philosopher slash memes uh in the world that and this is something unique that these two have in common where something about them resonates with people beyond just theory or philosophy um they they turn into memes uh in and of themselves and so i uh i asked slavoy when we interviewed him the first time if he was familiar with nick's work and he goes no i was like but you've talked about accelerationism before and i've heard you say a couple things and he's like yeah so i gave him a basic rundown of lance Flot, which is hard to do without turning it into a caricature because you just human extinction ai singularity like and the subtleties of how nick got to his position it's hard to convey them in a short summary but what i was trying to do with slavo is just give him some sort of basic orientation with where land is coming from as a deluso guitarian and um what i think is interesting there's more overlap with gjack and land than meets the eye so on the one hand both of them are anti-democracy for different reasons but um, like Slavoj considers the big stain on his early masterpiece sublime object is that he has a pro-democracy position, which he quickly moved away from. And so there's the anti-democracy thing. They both are interested in the singularity. Obviously land has been interested in that much longer than Slavoj, but Slavoj wrote his book 
Hegel and the Wired Brain. They both hate political correctness, right? And that aspect of the left. And so I actually think there's a lot of overlap for them to actually riff off of. And that's why we're trying to make it happen. Savoy's totally up for it. Land, who knows if he will be. Um, he obviously is hard to predict. Um, but I is guess... He not, I'm, is, he, is he not answering emails or what? Well, he responded. He, he, did, he responded. Yeah. yeah, so actually that was... I had said earlier to the audience that we had some like details that we were going to release a little bit later. And that's the news, everybody. <laughs> First, like we, yeah, no, we want to have a conversation with him just to just talk wanna, about yeah. his work, you know, and to establish. I guess that's the thing. Look, online, Dave and I are known as two members of the Young Zizekians. And so it's easy to just go, oh, you guys are trolling land. And I, I said it earlier, like I have a fundamental respect for land, a fundamental respect for Deleuze and Guattari, even if I disagree on the nature of desire or metaphysics or the status of negativity or all that. Um you know, accelerationism, you know, that whole tradition, all of it, everything with the CCRU has fundamentally influenced me. And so Land is one of these guys who who has influenced me. And look, I mean, I, I'm not sure how I would want to classify myself politically. Would Land probably call me a leftist and a transcendental miserableist? Maybe a little bit. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't change the fact that, you know, he's so, you know, because he's like, blacklisted in the world of philosophy um and everybody just wants oh is chaos uh you know speed poetry no it's fucking not and this is one of the things i really appreciate about a, a series of videos you were doing your line by line analysis of meltdown and i really i, I hope you finish it because it's, it's i will so, i'm committed i will stuff. i will for sure yeah and so what i loved about what you were doing there is like no 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 this ain't adderall infused poetry this is concentrated theory and and like you say you could devote a whole essay or a whole lecture just to one sentence in that text and so i fundamentally agree with you i think it's one of the most important philosophical writings of the 90s um i might even go as far as to say of the whole fucking century um i think meltdown was incredibly inspired and so i think this whole thing oh land misreads dng because he doesn't think in terms of re-territorialization therefore he's right. like these little you know, and I, I, okay, if Fisher wants to make that point. That's cool. I mean, I get that there's, you know, he doesn't talk about the new earth and all that kind of, it's not his, his thing, but, uh, I just, you can't get out of reckoning with land just by going, he doesn't factor in re-territorialization enough. So long story short, I'll shut up. I just want to say that, um, where we're coming from. Yes. Slavoj has had an immense influence on all of us and we love them, but it's not, some oh we're just trolling land or land no like i taught a four-week course on land at theory underground because i think it's it, there's no getting around how much influence he's had and this whole thing oh well i'm just not gonna listen to him or pay him anything then you then that's bullshit um you have to reckon with the philosophy and like his fundamental thesis i think everybody who's concerned about capitalism has to take serious that that fundamental thesis of capitalism is artificial intelligence and if you get it understanding how he arrived at that and where he's coming from it changes how you view capitalism entirely so the the discussion between land and Zizek is going to happen is that the news well no guarantee we haven't land hasn't agreed no, to it. like i said he, we're, we're trying he, to just, no, go ahead he and uh, Anna Greenspan are both uh, planning to talk with us like one on one or, in, you know, whatever, just like in his those are separate. But both of them are on vacation right now. And so both of them have basically said, yes, we will get to this. Uh, but the debate thing, I did tell him about it. He didn't respond to that part. He just said, <laughs> we'll we'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah, it's a fascinating idea. I love that you guys have made it this sort of thing that you're trying to push as a, almost like a, a movement uh, and a meme. I think that's really cool and funny. And yeah, I mean, I would love to see it happen. I, I, I'm i not convinced it would be an amazing uh, debate or discussion just because they're so different and their speaking styles are so different. But even if it was even if it was a train wreck, it would be so funny to see. And like, you know, she's like talks fast and he's like all over the place and then landed speaks really slow and uh he has that kind of like british politeness but zizek has that kind of like brash um you know kind of energy it would be so 
weird and unpredictable to, uh, trying to imagine what it would sound like those two trying to have a dialogue so i, well, I love the idea dave and i have learned and slavo is cool with it i'm like no i will cut you the fuck off like we will interrupt you you just we know what you do and so if we if it did work out I'm going to go out of my way. Like Slavo, you've talked for 15 minutes. Nick gets 15 minutes. Like this is going to be, you know, even in that. And, um, okay. you know, and, and, and that's yeah. the thing. Would it be disappointing? Yeah, probably in, in one sense. Right. I think because it would, it's not going to be combative. I think the second they actually just start talking about the singularity or they start talking about capitalism or democracy, it's actually going to get very calm and intellectual. Okay, and then and then after that, when that's a huge success, then you have Nick Land in conversation with Jordan Peterson. <laughs> I, the I, just, uh, I, I I love to see Peterson deal with the lemurs. I unironically yeah. <laughs> want to see Alexander Dugan in conversation with Nick Land because it's like in a sort of sense they're opposites. In a sort of sense they're opposites, right? And so. There's something really interesting that could happen there as well. But the, the, the thing is, we're working with what's closest to us. And, it, and though I think I understand where Dugan's coming from a lot further than most Heideggerians, and I've got this huge background in Heidegger and Marx, I, I don't think uh, it, it, that would be further out. This is more pressing because Mikey already has taught Zizek and Lacan uh, for, prior to Theory Underground, then he, but, but through my channel. And then he just taught this course on Nick Land. It was a banger. It's been blowing up. Uh, and now he's teaching Zizek another short course on Zizek uh, this fall. And so it's just like, if that's where his, if that's where Mikey's head is at, like, and this is where everybody's like currently at, like, this is just, we got to do it, you know? Um, but well, we, I mean, hold, at some point, hold on, hold I really want to teach Greenspan. But, or, go oh, ahead, yeah. sorry. Oh, yeah. Well, this, 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 this little book is, is absolutely something that we need to teach. And it's, uh, you know, capitalism's, Transcendental time machine. Absolutely. But I want to, I want to turn it over to, to spotlight on you. This is about you. This isn't about land. Mikey led with that because he's excited, but, uh, we want to, we want to ask you a variety of questions related to where you're coming from and what you've been up to. Um, your background, I don't know too much about it. I saw something on the daily mail when I was looking for pictures of you and I was like, and it was basically like you said, you said some tweets and then you're you were suspended for it. And then you're uh, and then when they were like, why, what, when they were like, you said these things, you're like, yeah, those are good tweets. And we thought that was really funny. Um, and, and, and it's interesting. And, and it seems like I don't know. I, I kind of want you to elaborate on your trajectory a little bit on your own. But like, is that when you decided, fuck it, man, I'm just going to do my own thing? Yeah, sure. I'll give you the real quick story. Um, I'll try to keep it fast. So I was trained as a political scientist and I was a working professional political scientist for about five years in academia. Uh, I was quite successful, published in top journals. And then I got the British version of tenure. This was in England. And so like I was made permanent, like I had this, you know, job for life as a professor in England. Um, and so, you know, what they teach you when you're younger is like, oh, yeah, if you just get tenure, then you have freedom. Right. So pay your dues, climb the ladder do everything right. And then once you have tenure, then you can finally be free. Well, I always took that very literally. I took that way too literally, <laughs> like naively so, uh, because as soon as I got the British version of tenure, which is not quite the same thing, but for all intents and purposes, uh, you know, I was made permanent. I immediately was like, okay, now I'm going to like go back to being my crazy self just as I am and as I want to be for fun. And it was very quickly clear that like you're not supposed to do that and, and it wasn't going to work out well. So basically, I mean, I'll, I'll keep it short. I had, a, I, I mean, I, the, the story you're talking about that you might've read about in the news, that was sort of just the, the straw that broke the camel's back. I had a rap sheet a mile long. It was, it was many other things that had accumulated. Um, so that basically at a certain point, um, yeah, I like occasionally use the word retard on Twitter and one of the undergrads at the university I was at didn't like that. So she like reported it to my Dean and then my dean called me in and they're like, okay, we're going to, we have to suspend you. We need to investigate. And I was just sort of like laughing at it. And I was basically like to my, in my own mind, I was just like, okay, I did not get a PhD. I did not put all of that work in and, and to prove myself as, as, you know, a kind of uh, highly educated, independent, professional uh, scholar. I did not put all of that effort in for me to now 
be reprimanded by like an 18 year old girl uh, making an alliance with this like 60 year old woman who's like a washed up academic. And these two women are going to like tell me what words I can use on a public platform in my own life. I was just like, no, I was like, my foot goes down here. This is if this is what this job involves. Guess what? I have other options. Uh, there's this thing called the Internet and all that stuff is going well and it's a rising tide. And this academia thing feels like a sinking ship anyway. So I was just sort of like, no, this is not going to work like that. And I just chose to walk away from, from my career. Uh, I saw an opportunity. I, I believed that there was a way to carve out a new kind of independent professorship, essentially, where I could do everything that I set out to do. You know, as a professional, I could do I find a way to, to port it over to the Internet and uh, create an independent and uh, successful you know, uh, lifestyle as, as a reader, a writer, a thinker uh and a scholar in a way a teacher and I, I could build a profile doing it i could change the way people think independently online and i could make money doing so uh to a comfortable degree and that's what i set out to do about five years ago and that's what i've been doing and that's what i do full time dope awesome so i, I guess i want to just start off with your you know your profilicity your your identity that is stated on your twitter i think it just says that you are a catholic accelerationist is that it, it maybe am I saying it in the correct order, Catherine? Yeah, I don't take any of that too seriously. That's just like what I felt like putting this month. You know, it's just being kind of uh, creative with how you describe things. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. That that's an absolutely fair way to describe my, some of my you know viewpoint, viewpoints. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and so that's obviously a very interesting position, uh, it, and it sounds like they don't go together. And and also, by the way, just side note, I appreciate that you treat your profile that way, because that is kind of what the word <laughs> profilicity should mean, right, on the internet, mm. is that it's not that serious. Um, but could you maybe go into how that does uh, say something for you? Well, like I said, it's not nothing too fancy or uh, preconceived. It's I am a Catholic by fact of the matter, and uh, I am an accelerationist as well. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying there's some sort of grand unified theory of which I am the uh, architect or something like that. Although, you know, we could have a fun conversation and uh, kind of produce that uh, unified theory uh, if you'd like to. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, I guess I'll gesture to that and say that, you know, I take the Landian acceleration viewpoint to be uh, sort of pretty, pretty accurate. And in my view, the most kind of compelling social theoretical framework for thinking about technology and society today and politics and culture. You know, I, I do think that the, the kind of Landian viewpoint on technology and, and society is the, is the sort of highest leverage, most parsimonious and kind of ruthlessly rigorous and an accurate way to, to think about a lot of the, the biggest questions. So in that sense, I'm an accelerationist. Now, a lot of people associate that, though, with a kind of nihil a kind of virulent nihilism and this sort of cold, atheistic uh, kind of uh, submission to uh, kind of the, the evolutionary material uh, realities of the world, allowing for no kind of um, spiritual layer or, or, or these other kind of uh, memes or themes associated with with a religious viewpoint, uh, certainly land is, uh, you know, well known as, as an atheist. And as I said, a kind of, uh, a kind of nihilist, uh, in a, in a, you know, proud sense, but <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm not convinced that those two, uh, that, that, that all of those themes in the Landian perspective need to be so correlated. Um, I personally find quite a lot of resonance between accelerationism and, and Catholicism, uh, or at least Christianity, because, you know, I, I I mean, I take the kind of apocalyptic uh, perspective and the Christian eschatology to quite seriously. It feels like a good fit, in fact, for for how sort of human affairs seem to be unfolding over time. It does seem like, for instance, the 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 singularity in the the accelerationist uh, register is quite similar to the Christian eschatology and the in the, the Christian and the Catholic uh, register. So. You know that's one that's one sort of superficial correlation there, um, but yeah, you know I think I think that that there are others. I just think that that Catholicism sort of uh, or or Christian viewpoint here sort of points a lot of the ethical and spiritual kind of implications of the accelerationist model in in a different direction than than Land goes in. Um, you know I think Land's nihilistic kind of uh, atheistic 
per perspective, which, by the way, is I think now maybe even coming into question he, a lot. A couple of his most recent essays have been strangely, uniquely kind of interested in religion uh, and Christianity in particular from a favorable perspective. So someone still has to kind of tell that story. I think I'm guessing that he's still kind of figuring it out. But that's that's a very interesting, you know, uh, parenthetical right there, uh, by the way, for for the Christian accelerationists out there, people interested in this, you know, way of thinking. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, yeah, we, I, I could say much more, but um, th those might be some initial remarks. Cadell was like, I called it because he was thinking that it would be through eschatology. Um, so, uh, okay, Mikey, you've got some questions. We probably have what a half hour. Let's 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 go. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the, the first question nicely piggybacks off of what you just said, Justin. Um, I totally see the correlation on uh, when it comes to eschatology. My question for you is, as a Catholic accelerationist. How do you deal with this kind of tension that DNG and land see between codes and axiomatics where it seems like Catholicism would be, I mean, depending on what type we're talking about, but I mean, you think about like uh, the great Catholic philosopher Aquinas with this systematic um, codification of being in a sense. I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever been as rigorous in, in this type of philosophy as Aquinas. And I see Catholicism almost as the, the, the purest embodiment of a religious code, right? Uh, religious system. Um, seems like that is at odds with this axiomatic deterritorializing de and decoding aspect of capital. And so I guess the question of codes versus axiomatics is what I'm curious about or when it comes to how you're, uh, how you're thinking through Catholicism and accelerationism. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I, I'm not sure that I really think about it in those terms. So I, I, I might have to reflect on on that particular set of premises more to to give you an interesting answer on there. But I guess what's at stake in your question is is tell tell me if this is it. It's like you're asking, you know, in the in the Landian model and in the Deleuzian model, that capitalism is this kind of. Uh, highly fluid, unbounded uh, kind of creative apparatus, whereas uh, you have an impression of the kind of Catholic uh, catechism as this kind of uh, firmly defined set of unmoving kind of kind of ethics. Is that kind of what you're, is that the Yeah, that's, that, I mean, that's fair. I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, Catholicism seems to be the most rigorous um, systemization of identities all the way up from God to inanimate objects. Um, right. I mean, to me, when I think of tradition, I think of Catholicism. And so I guess that's where I, I, I don't. Right. It right. seems like capitalism is fundamentally against tradition, which gotcha, is gotcha. Yeah. And axiomatics are against codes. Right. Got it. Gotcha. Okay. Right. So yes, Christianity lays these kinds of rules and foundations for society. And then capitalism comes and tears them apart, essentially, you know, like Mark says, all that is, all that is solid. Uh, you know, uh, melts into air or whatever he says. And uh, yes, so obviously there's a conflict and that's why this uh, notion of Christian accelerationism uh, sounds sounds strange to people. So good question, right. I mean, what I think is that um, Christianity also, as Gerard says, is, is one of the only re religions that foresees its own failure, sort of encodes its own impossibility. Uh, you know, Christ himself, sort of knew that his closest followers would pretty much all abandon him. And uh, there's this kind of, and, and in the Christian eschatology, in Revelation and and, and, and texts such as this, there is in, in, in the core doctrine of Christianity an, an expectation that in the end, most of humanity is going to uh, reject it, basically. Like it's not, it's both universal and will win. And also, everything we know about humans and their society and their tendencies is going to uh, hate it and bristle against it and resist it. Right. And so in a way um, I think it's quite, you know, to me with my viewpoint as a Catholic and a Christian, it's just not at all surprising that, that capitalism, you know, got out of its box and that intelligence is now 
kind of uh, multiplying itself without any constraint whatsoever. And, and that we now have these sort of escaped autonomous intelligences uh, in a way, capitalism itself is one that sort of operates now over and above our heads, sort of telling us what to do. And and um, it's it, it's this kind of uh, system that that has uh, has exploded its box and it is sinister um, at, at, at its core in a way. It, it's sinister, um, but it operates through this kind of extraordinary creation of wealth and and opportunity and, and freedom as well. This is, of course, the the, the Delizian and got guitari and kind of uh you know whole model and, and they're sensitive to this and so yeah i think basically as a christian and as an accelerationist what you say is like yeah look we know human nature we know that all of this stuff was going to eventually escape um uh that we are fallen and and that this is just fallen man uh kind of intensifying and and, and making all these bargains with the devil until they kind of completely get out of control. And now, now it is completely out of control. It's literally can't be put back in the box. The Christian accelerationist just simply says, now that evil has been completely let out of its box and it is autonomous, it's, it's ridiculous to say, oh, we need to try to control it and put it back in the box. The Christian accelerationist just says, okay, boys, play it, play it forward. Let's get to the end. And, and and we know what happens in the end, and, right? And so that that's that's kind of what, how I would characterize the Christian accelerationist viewpoint is. Uh, I think we have a set of ethical uh, uh, ethical sensitivities and ethical registers that are different than what someone like Nick Land has, um, but we're willing we're we're courageously willing to confront the the same empirical reality that that someone like Nick Land has astutely described. We just say. Okay, let it all accelerate, and what that and what that really is going to look like from the Christian viewpoint is a kind of divergence between what Augustine calls the city of God and the city of man, and that's what I'm seeing right now. Very clear. That's how. That's very much how I kind of. Uh, that's the lens I see society in right now, and you see it. I, I think you see it. Uh, you see that people who are oriented correctly according to human nature um, are thriving and they will continue to thrive through the acceleration and people who are disobedient to the nature of, 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 of humanity as it is essentially, you know, encoded and what, what, what you might call the natural law tradition, which is for people listening, it's sort of the, that that's essentially the kind of philosophical canon that is associated with or linked to uh, or correlated with uh, kind of Christian, uh, you know, philosophy, if you will. Um, what I'm seeing is a world where people who obey sort of the natural law are going to thrive and anyone who disobeys it are going, are going to get wrecked. And, and that this divergence between those two camps is going to accelerate empirically. Like you're going to see it more and more and it's going to have more and more predictive value actually as a lens for understanding why some groups are thriving and why some groups are failing. Um, and this is kind of like the key to understanding, you know, the next you know, the next hundred years through the singularity, it's like, uh, I think August, Augustine saw it pretty clearly and, and, and gave us a kind of, uh, model for, for, for what to expect. And so the Christian just says, accelerate because there's no putting that cat back in the bag, but you better get you and your friends and your family on, on, on the right side, which is for the Christian, you know, a kind of submission to, to, um, the, the, the Christian ethical system. That was really clarifying. See, and part of it is when when somebody uses the term accelerationist, especially in a, a Landian context, you go, well, well, in what sense? Because with him, especially in the '90s, you know, it's this kind of wild punk rock, destroy the human, trans, you know, let yeah. the thing. And so that's where I guess I'm like, all right, to me, Catholicism would be the the, the most robust, systematic tradition of preserving the human and so when you say you're i'm like but it's just in saying no fuck the human destroy the human in this landian sense but i see what you're doing now where you're like no it's just this objective state of affairs that is capitalism is happening we're not getting rid of that and so you're taking a different response in how to deal with that than just you know that nothing human makes it out of the near future rock and roll uh you're saying no we need to we need to be careful about this and uh preserve what what we would define as a human 
Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, though. We should pause on that, this question of human and humanism and anti-humanism in Christianity. It's, it's, it's a great question, because I don't think it's as obvious as people think. You know, the, you're, you're, the way you laid it out is very sensible, and, and how many people would think about it very reasonably. Um, but I don't think Christianity is uh, sort of wedded to a, a naive humanism. And, and I think this is kind of worth, worth thinking about. In other words, it looks to me like the singularity really does place real stresses on on what we traditionally think of as 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 the human uh or humanism and it is not at all obvious to me that a, a traditional humanism is going to make it through this bottleneck and that you know the 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 community of of believers the community of faith whatever you want to call it just uh christians uh christian accelerationists let's say um to make it through the bottleneck i think and i think we do want to survive i think we do want to not just survive but thrive um through all the material challenges of, of, of that we face on earth to do so we are going to probably become something other than human and i don't think that that's intrinsically sinful or intrinsically unholy or something like that or satanic it's like um you might say that to survive the singularity, um, we will we will actually become uh, le- more like God, not in a kind of uh, not in the sense of usurping God, but in the sense in the Christian sense of imitating Christ. Like I think the singularity will force Christians who are technologically and philosophically sophisticated to to really become more like Christ to such a degree. That it's almost anti-human. It's almost unhuman or inhuman, um, you know. And so, 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 you know, morphing from the the traditional human into something other than human uh, through the the challenge and the pressures of of, of acceleration uh, does not have to be uh, a bad thing. Like you're you're morphing into, you know, the you know the uh, transsexual HIV positive slime ball of like meltdown. You know, it's like. Uh, no, I mean, I, what you said just brought to mind. It's like, I mean, what is Paul's words, right? Uh, new creation in Christ Jesus. All things become new, right? You could argue like that. The whole point of Christianity is to transcend the human. Yes, perfectly put. Yes, that's right. And that that element is not widely understood by people. And 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 I think that that's that's a great point. You know, I think like. I you can read a text like Nick Land's Meltdown, and although it's it's kind of purposely, you know, it has a kind of dystopian kind of uh, kind of style to it or 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 imagery to it. It's also and this is what's so cool about his work is that it's it's also kind of exciting and thrilling and and liberating in a way. And and I think that I think that that's you know there's a way of reading that in a very Christian way, like uh, you know the text talks about humanity kind of being ground down into this sort of like techno scientific um you know kind of kind of matter um but it's also kind of exhilarating and interesting and creative and so maybe that's also kind of what it's what it's like for humans to to really um become more like god um you know uh i don't know well i would love i would love i would love to hear you in a conversation with Samuel Loncar of the Becoming Human Project, who I've had on the channel a couple of times at this point. He he has a very small channel called the Becoming Human Project. I, I he teaches somewhere on the East Coast, and you know he he studies religion and uh, philosophy in a sort of psycho uh, therapeutic way. You know, kind of sees them both as you know the individual versus collective versions of like a basically a way of coping with with the trauma of existence. Blah blah blah. He's He's very averse to land, um, and his piece in the Underground Theory anthology that we put out last year um, kind of concludes on that. And 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 he you know thinks that the human must be preserved against these forces of you know destruction. Essentially, um, you you see that there could be a way that these things go together in a way that I don't think he's really considered. And so there's something really interesting there. Well, you know, if you're interested in this or listeners uh, interested in this, you, who you should really read is um, that guy, uh, Pierre uh, Teilhard, uh, Pierre Chardin Teilhard. Uh, that, this is what this is the uh, Catholic Jesuit uh, priest and, and, and philosopher who uh, was 
one of the main influences on uh, Marshall McLuhan. Uh, but he's a traditional Roman Catholic thinker, but thought very astutely about uh, oh, Cadell, what's up? Yeah, exactly. Um, thought very astutely about technology and really kind of saw where a lot of this is going uh, way before other people. I'm not I'm not an expert on him by any means. I've, I've hardly read uh, much of his work, but I, but I, I know only the bits and pieces here that, that I'm speaking to right now. Um, you'll find a lot of stuff on this here because he's Catholic and he, he pretty much sees the whole kind of accelerationist uh, future coming and, and, he, and he describes it. Um, you know, not in an altogether negative way from a Catholic perspective. And so, yeah, what I'm saying is not completely idios- idiosyncratic to me. There is this kind, there is a certain kind of, you know, uh, Catholic tradition that I think has grappled with him. You know, what you said, Justin, it, it, yeah, sparked a thought, which is simply that, as, if I understand you correctly, the position, the, the Catholic accelerationist position would be something like this, which is, yes, the human is on the way out. You have two options for your transhumanism. You can go in this direction of Christ, or you can go in this direction of the cyborg. But ultimately, the choice is between these two figures of the of transhumanism. Yeah, maybe. I think the transhumanism also that's kind of like a uh, yeah, a bit of a, a bit of a red herring a little bit, or or it gives people the wrong idea. Uh, most people, when they think of transhumanism, they think of this sort of uh, you know, like uh, again, like kind of you know, lesbian, anti-family kind of uh, uh, cyber hacker with, you know, like machine parts in, in, in their body and stuff like this, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that the Christian uh, orientation will point people in in a different direction, but it, but I do, I do see a future, a, a Christian future that is highly cybernetic. It's high, it's highly digital. It's highly computerized. It's tightly integrated with things like blockchains um, and like ruthlessly efficient kind of uh, market phenomena and and computerized systems to the point that is, you know, from some from a certain perspective, perhaps it can be seen as oppressive or or anti-human. Um, but from a slightly different perspective, it's like it is just the kind of universalist integration of 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 all people um into ever increasing levels of uh intelligence and essentially you know uh, kind of convergence with god so that's that would be more i would think less along the lines and themes associated with transhumanism and more uh along the lines that i just described but you could absolutely describe what i described just now as a kind of christian transhumanism if you wanted to yeah okay dave i i one more like theory question for Justin and then I'll hand it over to you. Um, okay, Justin, first off, I've never gotten to talk to a Landian before. Somebody is it, it, interested in land as you are. And, um, mm. but as a Catholic, I think this makes this question even more interesting. Okay. I mean, I, I, I guess I could guess, but I just, what are your thoughts on the CCRU's the whole thing with the occult, the demon lemurs, all of that. And how do you, what do you understand a, a lemur to be for them? Uh, <laughs> all of my theories of how it all fits together, but I'm really curious to know what you think of the occult and the. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, um, and by the way, folks, to be clear, I mean, I'm, I'm like, I, I think of myself as, you know, I, I'm interested in philosophy and, and social science and understanding the truth first and foremost before I'm a Christian, frankly. I mean, I, I came to, I came around to Christianity as part of you know my own just adult mature search for what what really is true to be clear so you know i i have no problem kind of you know discussing my christian viewpoints or how i how i think that through or whatever but um just for people who are maybe listening to me talk for the first time i'm you know i'm not speaking from primarily from the perspective of of a christian i'm speaking i always do all my writing and all my thinking in my entire life uh, from the perspective of just someone trying to kind of figure out the radical truth to the best of my ability um and it just so happens that only really quite recently in the past you know 10 years um ha- has that kind of led me to become increasingly convinced of, of of kind of the christian philosophy that's just a bit of a a, a preface there just uh, and, and and so um having said that though what i would say is that um uh sorry i just lost the thought say it one more time just jog my memory just your thoughts on their their how they utilize the occult uh, the occult they call yeah yeah that's right that's right that's right so uh, so frankly that element of the ccru just 
never really excited me personally. I never, I mean, I, I, I understand some of it, a, a lot of it, I think. Um, I do think that it's kind of um, what you see with a lot of secular or atheist kind of philosophies is that at a certain level of intensity, they always need to sneak some kind of religion in the back door. This is, and to me, this is kind of a kind of vindication of, I, th I think you see this across the board. I mean, it's, it's very hard to find a, a kind of secular, a truly atheistic or secular thinker who um, hits a certain level of genuine intensity and then uh, does not, you know, kind of verge onto something that sure as heck looks a lot like uh, kind of religion. Kind of and the that, point, God is not dead. God is unconscious. Mm, there you go. It's uh, a good line. And so I think that's, in my opinion, that's, I think what you're seeing with the CCRU there. Um, I think that it look, this looks to me like, you know, radical kind of atheistic uh, philosophers who get on a really good thing. They go really far and figure some things out and they kind of, hit this sort of line of flight um, very admirably and very excitingly. I, I, I love the work of the CCRU. Um, and then before you know it, they, they, they just, without even trying, uh, become, they start trafficking in sort of spiritual elements. Uh, and in my view, when you, when you notice that all of that always happens with secular or atheistic philosophies, I think, I think what it asks you to do is it asks you to take a step back and think like, oh, well, um, yeah, okay, maybe we could like invent our own like incredibly new idiosyncratic kind of like religious, you know, uh, theoretical technologies like, you know, the the numogram and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, maybe or maybe the, you know, perennial tendency for all secular philosophies beyond a level of intensity to, to converge on some sort of religious framework. Maybe that actually just vindicates and, and kind of testifies to um kind of the the ultimate kind of religious structure uh, at the bottom of things um and if you think that if you think that if you do think that there is a kind of religious structure at the bottom of things as the ccru does um because you know for people listening that's they have this kind of idea that um there are these kind of mystical numerical structures there's this kind of fundamental creativity that can be accessed like a, a kind of creativity over the world in a way over social reality that can be accessed through a kind of certain uh, uh esoteric manipulation of numbers and 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 things like this um you know uh i personally would rather bet on you know the longest standing and most kind of philosophically justified and sophisticated version of that basically you know um and so i'd rather put my money on you know uh augustine and aquinas and Christ than, you know, some professors uh, on amphetamines in the 1990s, as cool as they were, and as smart and interesting as they were, and as much as I like them, I'm not going to bet on their kind of religious inventions. Okay, <laughs> that, um, that, that's kind of that's kind of how, how I see it. Um, yeah. I guess my, it's it's funny because I, I I get asked this a lot. And I in the course, I the last lecture was on how I interpret all the occult stuff. But I get asked, well, what's the basically what's the metaphysical status of the lemurs? Are do they think there's actual demons out there in the outside, and somehow you can channel them, or is it all hyperstition? Where in fact the forty five lemurs, and this is kind of it, it. They hint at this where they talk about yeah, but the forty five lemurs make up one entity, and you're like, are, are they AI programs in the singularity from the future? Um, somehow okay, right. the, the aspects of the singularity and that's kind of when you piece it together you start going no i think they're because i mean uh, kurtz Weil and all those guys they talk about how once ai hits it'll just keep generating other ais and it's almost like a multitude of codes or personas within the singularity itself would be k tax and all <laughs> the other ones but right, i don't know so Good question. Good question. And I, 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 I'll try to answer this as head on as possible. I mean, in my take, uh, in my, my reading of it all, I, I do see, um, I don't see the lemurs as these kind of um, like transcendental, like um, demons or characters kind of in like the structure of things, but more on your, your second choice there, the, that, that it is essentially all hyperstitional um, you know, I think the lemurs are cool. I like, I'm on the team, I'm on team lemur. Okay. You know, and there, so for people listening, the whole, the whole kind of, uh, uh, CCRU, uh, imaginarium roughly, you know, kind of breaks the world into camps of, you know, kind of, um, you know, liberating creative, 
uh, forces that are kind of generally on one side fighting, you know, systems of control and oppressive, you know, uh, institutions and chronologies and and so on. And so the lemurs are in this camp of of, of entities and themes and images that 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 are associated with uh, kind of rebellion uh, against, you know, the uh, the 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 dominant uh, architectonic. Of, of time and all of that. And so, yeah, I'm definitely team lemur and I think they're cool, but I do think that they're essentially hyperstitional. I think with the CCRU, it's all, you know, it's pretty, I think it's just bio, like biographically and, and, and psychographically, it's clear what they're doing. Like they're highly creative people. They have this kind of theoretical uh, gloss on the world, which is very compelling. Uh, and they realize that, oh, you know, fiction and art um, and symbols can be sort of conceived uh, more or less ex nihilo and, and 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 wrapped around them can can be entirely new worlds and stories that then can get social currency and then can create the things that you know they they allude to right and so th- this is this is probably their key kind of defining sort of like creative uh realization or insight and that they're that they're milking right and so they realize like oh cool so we can just like make things up and have fun and create this world um, which is not completely made up. It's it's tracking certain, you know, themes in the in the in the collective unconscious or what have you. Um, but yeah, the lemurs are just a funny, really fun. Oh, and it's it's drawn from um, uh, Burroughs, I believe, if I recall correctly. That's the, that's the real source text for for that. Um, uh, yeah, and so I see them. I see them as a fun, interesting, cool thing. But it's a um, it's all it's, yeah. I think for the CCRU, it, it's all cybernetic. It's all autopoietic. Um, I don't think they want to kind of uh, grant any other deeper reality to any of it. I don't think. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that... I, I'm, I'm, I, I got the impression that, I mean, cause they, they liken the singularity to a Lovecraftian deity. It's we can joke about Mecca Cthulhu or something. And so it's the same thing with these, you know, Oh, well the, the CCRU's Necronomicon is uh, the true Necronomicon. Yeah. And so ultimately you start going, no, I, th- I still think that the, the lemurs are more of, some way connected to the singularity um as opposed to actual ancient demons from like what the key of solomon is solomon or whatever so uh so can i say one more thing which i yeah, think is important can i throw something else on yeah so yeah, yeah. just want to throw add this that um on some level i would grant kind of like this religious um, you know, kind of mechanism that the CCRU sees with the, with the all the occult stuff and the numogram and all that. Like on some level, I think they're kind of right empirically. Like they are they are right. Like you, a, a small group of people aligned on certain ideas and themes and aesthetics, reading the same novels and writing to each other. Like a small group of people can actually bootstrap their own kind of um, religious machinery. I, I do think that that's available to human beings. So, and, and, and I think that, that's what they're sensing. That's what they're discovering with all the hyperstition and all of this. And so they start realizing like, oh, we can create these number systems with, a, we can create a new number system. And through that, we can generate all these interesting kind of social dynamics. Like on some level, I'm willing to grant all of that as, as empirically accurate um, uh, stories about like the human mind and human societies and how we function re- religiously and, and, and how that can structure, you know, future realities. Um, I would grant all of that empirically. What's, uh, at, but I think I, what I, when I think about all of that from a large, I take a step back and evaluate that philosophically, my mind just says, well, okay, sure. It's probably possible you can spin up a numogram and do all this weird kooky stuff, but do you want to? Is that really the best way to use these powers and and these and these capabilities that we have as humans? I don't think so. Um, I would rather find the universal uh, kind of codex. The, I would I would rather find the universal um, you know substrate that is most likely to align the largest number of people um, to the highest kind of philosophical and aesthetic uh, level. And, and take as much of the entire global population as possible um, into, yeah, you know, into an ever improving uh, quality of life and, and salvation. Uh, and so that's what I see. So basically, I would kind of grant all their occult stuff. But I would say, if that is, in fact, available to all human beings, I would, it's much better for us to all just agree to use those powers on the one, you know, truly most beautiful um unifying universalist version of that 
I, I would say that's philosophically and politically and theoretically uh, a superior option. Base. So I have a couple questions. I will actually, I think we're, how much more time do you think you have here? Um, I have a little bit, if you, if, if you don't mind my son kind of being in the background a little bit, I could go a little bit no, longer, not at all. but not uh, at all. yeah, I have to, I have to go relieve my wife in uh, five minutes, but, uh, we can drag it on a little bit longer if you want. Oh, for Try. sure. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, I'm the pronatalist here, so I'll say that's fine. Gotcha. Um, the, uh, I guess I have a question about hyperstition and I, these are both fair. Actually, you know what? You answered the first, you, you answered the question about hyperstition. I don't have to ask it. Uh, we ha uh, I know that uh, Mikey had a question about Bitcoin he wanted to get into. Uh, but first, I just wanted to say, do you believe in that the singularity uh, is in the future, uh, retroactively working things toward it? And do you believe that that techno capitalist singularity is? the god of catholicism or is it something different yeah i don't have again i don't have some sort of like really worked out model of it but that is my intuition that's something like that is my intuition that's right yeah yeah because you know it's like uh you know the, the christian idea is that god gave us freedom and god gave us free will um for us for us to figure these things out on our own and but also god is you know god god relates to us like like we relate to to children uh to our own children and so it's like you know with your child you want to give you want to give them freedom because you want them to rise and fall on their own uh they need that you want that it's it's the right thing to do it's the right th th that's what's fit to human nature uh but you're also watching your kids and you know if if they're if the kids if the kids really fuck up real bad for a really long time you know, you're going to intervene and you're going to pull them back. You, you know, you're going to pull them back because you love them. You know, uh, I do think it's it's pretty much precisely that with, you know, uh, our our relationship to God, I think. Um, who knows what it's really like? But that uh, to me, that's the best bet. That, that's a good bet. Uh, the best bet I know I know of. And I think what you're seeing is precisely that. Like w our job was to keep this capitalism thing in its box. Uh, we messed up the job. It got out of its box and now it's going to kind of, you know, we're, we're all as a species going to rush headlong to um, ever increasing wealth and power and knowledge and also ever increasing brutality and destruction and, and, and coldness. And both of those things are, are going to be increasingly true uh, until, um, you know, all of the sinners are completely destroyed and all of the faithful are um left standing at which point um we will you know um ev everything will be rectified um and in a way yes i i do think on some level um the god that created us um is also the god that is um pulling us uh back towards him uh through through some kind of uh chronology that uh is not at all our kind of quotidian uh chronology yeah i i think something like that is true at this point like i'm freaked out mikey's got me thinking you know what if what if the singularity because it can work outside of or go back in time like yahweh is actually the singularity just doing its thing it's just like i don't know there's all kinds of crazy stuff but uh i want to say yep. we bracket the mikey's questions about bitcoin and mega cities i say we bracket those i want nance and cadell to each get a chance to uh, ask you a question here so this is kind of like q a for the last five minutes cadell and uh nance you guys can turn your cameras on I want to ask mikey, one I can question. they don't care if he's wrong yeah hey what's up so you can go upstairs what do you say yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to ask one question. It's not a big theory question. Uh, Justin, so I got a copy of the new edition of Xeno Systems Fragments. Okay. And it says, and gift from the lemurs. I don't find a text in here called a gift from the lemurs. Am I being duped here? What do you mean? I don't, well, I don't, I don't. The, the title, it acts like the original title of the book was Xeno Systems Xeno Systems Fragments. The new edition is titled Xeno Systems Fragments and A Gift from the Lemurs. So I was expecting a new text to be included. 
in this new edition, but there's no text called the gift from the lemurs. Oh, so, maybe there's some kind of maybe there's some kind of Easter egg in there that you don't understand. That's that's what I was hoping you'd say. So I I have no insight into that though. Okay. Okay. Welcome, Cadell. Welcome, Nance. Hey, right. how's it going? Um, so I know time is limited. I do have a quick yep. question. Hey, yep. hey so, what's up, man? Hey, Justin. Yeah, long time no talk. Um, yeah, I loved. Uh, I loved listening in on this. This was fantastic. There are so many ideas flying through my head, but the the most important one is that I'm probably going to be teaching on a uh, Teilhard de Chardin this year, and I was I was interested in your perspective on specifically coming at transhumanism and accelerationism from a Catholic perspective. Are there any thinkers you know of that come from a Protestant or an Eastern Orthodox perspective that have approached accelerationism and potentially transhumanism in a way that might be interesting to compare and contrast with Teilhard de Chardin? Hmm. It's a good question. I'm I'm searching my mind at the moment, but no, no, no one comes to mind, but there absolutely could be. Um, I mean, Luther, maybe <laughs> I would look into Luther. I'd see what he, I would see what he had to say. Um, but yeah, I'm drawing a blank at the moment. All right. If, if if something does come to mind, I'd be interested. But anyway, I'm super, super, uh, um, super interested in the way you're playing with these ideas. It's extremely counterintuitive and uh, I think quite helpful. So well, great thank to you listen. I appreciate it. It's encouraging me to yeah go deeper, maybe. N Nance, what you got, man? I, I think uh, similarly it's been super interesting uh and there's so much um it's kind of difficult to to find one question but so from your perspective it, it would be the case that capital and all the silly things we've done humans uh is a consequence of our <clears throat> iniquity right like our failures to to reach the ideal or however god's god's plan for us um so would you know, the breakdown with the singularity, would that be, I mean, here on earth, or would that be some type of phase transition to a paradise or, or on, on the back end of the coming calamity, um, would we be still here or, or would we be in some, some type of paradise? Yeah, it's a obviously tricky question of theology that I don't pretend to have super strong opinions on. I mean, I think the whole question of the afterlife, in my in my opinion, is you know I think a little bit more difficult than than people, especially Christian people, want to talk about. I don't, you know, I I, I I'm not completely certain that to be a Christian absolutely commits one to a strong, you know, statement about about the afterlife or what that even means or involves. Um, so my, you know, there could be some afterlife, but I mean, frankly, I mean, I, I consider myself a, a real Christian, but I don't, I don't really feel um, too convicted about anything related to what happens after we die. I just don't know. And I think when you look at the, when you look, I mean, I, I know the teachings and I know, I know the, the ideas that a Christian, uh, you know, is committed to kind of pertaining to the afterlife. But when you actually start looking at the word afterlife and the history of this idea of the afterlife, you start to realize like what is meant by that is, is very, is very unclear. So we take it for granted now today, today, uh, people who, you know, Christians or just people who talk about Christianity People talk as if it's obvious that, oh, yeah, of course, the Christian thinks that when you die, you go to heaven. Heaven is this place where you're like reunited with all the other people who died, who went to heaven. And it's like maybe it's in the clouds or maybe it's like, you know, it's like uh, you have everything you ever wanted. All these different like themes that, that people kind of take for granted about what heaven even means. But if, when you look at like the, if you look at the history of like Christian theology, it's a, it's actually a pretty late invention. I don't, I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, for 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 centuries there was no real um, like shared discussion or shared understanding of 
of this like theme or this this type this understanding of the afterlife it it, it only gets introduced um at a certain point uh and so there's nothing particularly sort of given about it and and you start looking at the words you start looking at like the greek and the this and the that and like what's actually meant by all this stuff it's incredible it starts it starts dissolving in your hands basically so this is not a very helpful answer but but my point is to say that i don't think you know um a sophisticated christian today has to have any particularly compelling an- like like clear committed answer on 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 any of that I, I see it as a mystery i think the, the christian faith is very um uh interesting and and admirable in that it has these these mysteries but but it's honest enough to call them mysteries you know a lot of a lot of these things are supposed to be understood as mysteries they're not supposed to um you know require you to say some positive statement about what it is and then you sound stupid to all your like you know scientifically trained friends like i'm not i you know, I refuse to take that bait on on questions where it's like just very not that you're giving me bait. I just mean I, I think it's wise for the for the sophisticated, reflective Christian to um, just not overcommit to to anything that that doesn't really make sense actually, and and that and that is unclear. So um, I'm I'm a little agnostic on that specific thing. I, I just don't understand. But I'll say one other quick thing. Um, and by the way, my I I I can I can talk. I'm not in a rush. So uh, it's that. I've always I've always tended to see the Christian concept of the afterlife as essentially a kind of uh, equivalent to what we today would call in the scientific in the the scientific parlance, sort of just like equal like long run equilibrium. Okay, like the long run the concept of a long run equilibrium, the idea that a system with certain parameters or, or certain variables set to certain values will over time tend to reach a certain state. That idea was obviously not available to anyone before whatever the 1700s or something like that. So I've always kind of had this inkling myself that heaven, hell, the idea of all of the ideas of the afterlife and the Christian faith are really just like a super, super smart early uh, encoding of this idea that systems can have these abstract tendencies. They can have these abstract endpoints, which are not materially real in any way but they are just where a system will go after a certain amount of time passes if nothing else changes. To me, heaven and hell and the idea of the afterlife is like a really powerful way of, of maybe just saying that. Uh, and so, so it's kind of saying like, if you're living in sin, you're, go- you're going to hell in the long run because people who live in sin are going to have really bad things happen to them over and over again the more time passes. So that if you just extrapolate that out into its abstraction, the, the abstraction is hell when you play that out to the maximum, like on a long enough timeline. I've always kind of had an inkling that that's what the afterlife means in the Christian faith. As just like, and it's like super, super compelling and intelligent in that regard. So I'll cut myself off there. I hope that you know is illuminating or helpful in some way. Uh, that I like that a lot, <clears throat> and I've had a lot of thoughts about religion, kind of along those kinds of lines, as in like there's there's something, and we know that there's something there. And so we we come up with some kind of a language for it. And I think that you were getting at something really important when you were talking about the uh, there is equipment available to humans working in groups. And, you know, this was something that they were discovering at CCRU. And it's something that people working in groups are able to figure out, you know, but there are also tried and true uh, systems. And that, you know, thinking about religions this way, I think it just makes it really opens up the the history of of world religions but with that said i um, mikey now you get to ask uh, one of those two questions bitcoin or mega cities because i mean we, he said he has a time let's do it are you there sorry yeah i've lost my question here i'm grabbing it let me see We can't just say Bitcoin go. Oh yeah. Okay. So Justin, I mean, we could have a whole another discussion at some point talking about blockchain. I'd love to pick your brain on that. Um, I guess I've had, I recently had a discussion with a friend of mine. Uh, He's far more pessimistic in his view on Bitcoin and blockchain as a technology. And he got me to watch this video. Uh, Basically I'm still pretty new to blockchain. Um, so he sent me down a YouTube rabbit hole. I watched the line goes up video. Um, I'm just curious about where you're at with it. Um, what do you think of these type, uh, you know, especially a video like line goes up that says, no, this technology is intrinsically flawed. It's not going to 
do what it does. Like what, what basically what's your response to people who have that type of criticism? I mean, I think it's fine to have uh, reasonable uh, differences of opinion about particular blockchains uh, or, you know, what's most interesting or what's going to be most valuable for society over the long run. I think those they're, they're, they're very reasonable, you know, differences of opinion you can have there. I know incredibly smart people who think Bitcoin is, you know, the the most important thing and it will be for the long time, for, you know, for a very long time. And I know very, very smart people who think it's going to go to zero. So I think it's just, I mean, frankly, the very fact that there's such polarization among the smartest people to me is just interesting and compelling like like that whatever happens that that that's a proof enough to me that this space is very significant in one way or another um uh even if the, you know the jury's still out on how exactly um because if it was if it was it's just very rare that the smartest people have such strong disagreements about about something that's new that's one observation but the other is um you know i think it I think you can have differences of, of viewpoint on whether a particular blockchain is going to matter or be valuable in the long run. But I don't think I, I really don't think you can make much of a case that the underlying technology, the fundamental innovation of, of these sort of self-enforcing distributed ledgers. I don't I just don't think you can make the argument that that's not going to be profoundly impactful on society and, and the economy uh, just because it fits so perfectly within a, a obvious kind of historical gradient of um you know the as we've been talking about with the history of capitalism essentially that it, it the history of capitalism is about the increasing autonomy of of markets and of intelligence itself and and so it, it's just the, the 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 distributed ledgers fits so tightly and cleanly on this gradient as the next level of of the becoming autonomous of capital uh that I think, frankly, especially if you're schooled in all this stuff that we're talking about, and you're, you know, you're reading Nick Land, and you're and you and and you're well read up on on your marks and all of this, it's like, uh, I I think it's it's it's, I just don't see how you could not believe that something here is world historical and will have uh, a, a, some kind of disruptive impact um, on the economy and society, it's akin to let's say the joint stock corporation or akin to let's say the internet itself um you know these the, these are each kind of waypoints on the history of capital that had clear un value unlocks um that that changed the fabric of things um i i i'm personally you know I, I consider myself strongly convinced that that the blockchain as as is an example of that and 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 i just i find it very hard to believe that that someone uh you know could really reject that 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 form of the of the argument you know and it, it's funny i recently just before i taught the land course i hadn't really dived into cryptocurrent and now that i am uh that's one of the best things he's ever written and it's incredibly underrated yes it is and i'm still working out the de so i know this is a big question so if you want to go okay another time maybe but i am curious to know how you so land gives bitcoin this incredible like ontological status of how it affects time and that it makes absolute succession possible. How do you understand that? What, what is his claim there? Yeah. This idea of absolute succession, it's very strange. Um, I'll try to give you, you know, how I would think about that. Uh, and I should say guys, this, this will be my last one. If that's all right. I, I appreciate it. I've really enjoyed this. Um, so he has this idea that, that yeah, blockchains are, are artificial time. It's a, it's the first kind of artificial time machine, not in the sense of time travel, but in the sense of uh, sort of the production of time. And it, it, it's it's an interesting sort of, it's a really interesting statement uh, because it sort of reminds you that, you know, time is not this obvious. It's not an obvious thing at all. It's not, we, it's not really clear what, what time is necessarily philosophically. There's many different ways you can kind of try to make sense out of that. Um, but time as we know it as humans and generally, like you look at the history of time, like the history of technologies for timekeeping and this sort of thing. It's a history where, Time is always being pinned down to something else. It's all it's always being sort of fixed for our convenience by correlating it to something else. You know, so it's like we think about like the sun going up and the sun going down, right? Um, uh, many, you know, or or whatever the the movements of of the bodies, uh, the planets, or what have you. And so, um, but there's also this time with this problem with time where it's always like there's always slippage, right? So we have things like. 
uh, you know, uh, daylight savings, right? And we have things like um, leap years, right? We have all these weird little things where, A, we're trying to fix time to, to things that are not time. And B, there's always these weird slippages where we have to do this like ad hoc correction to, to keep things, you know, uh, consistent. And, and basically what he's saying with blockchains is because what a blockchain, all the blockchain really does is it ver- it validates a succession of, of stamps, like time stamps, basically at, the, at on some level, that's way, a simple way to, to understand what, what the, what a distributed ledger is. It's all it's really saying is that here's the ordering, here's the sequence of blocks in this order that, ha- that, that were added over time. Here's the one true correct one that all of the other people holding Bitcoin acknowledge to be the one true correct succession of, of blocks that that's really all it can do. But that gives you digital money, self-enforcing digital money, because it solves the double spend problem. It means like you can't move a token from one account into another, you know, into another account and also say that it's in another account. Like you can't lie about who has what money. Um, and you can get that property simply from the a truly correct ordering of time. Um, but basically, yeah, so the, the, the blockchain is this sort of, timekeeping system that does not refer to anything else it doesn't it doesn't have to pin itself to the movement of the sun or or what have you um is it a failed it's, it's, plot, it, basically? It, it's a completely self-enforcing system of timekeeping uh, and that's i think what he means by by absolute succession um yeah it's fascinating so basically like a fail-proof clock in a way but but also one that's like completely self-enforcing um which is which is strange, but anyway, that book is really underrated. I highly recommend it. It's fascinating and fun read. Um, it basically just tries to kind of pull out all of the philosophical kind of um, implications of of what this what this blockchain is. Um, Bitcoin is primarily what he writes about, but that's kind of you know just a, a function of, of of where it was in time. And it's not clear if it it you know only applies to Bitcoin or not. Uh, but hey, guys, this was really fun. And by the way, I, once again, I'm sorry that I was late. It was incredibly disrespectful. I just totally messed up. And uh, please forgive me. But um, this was really fun and I appreciate your thoughtful questions. And uh, when the time is right, some other time, I would love to learn more about what you all are doing. Like I want to learn more about, you know, this, this just seems like a cool little organization and little, little culture you have. Um, Cadell and I know each other a little bit from some of the stuff that I've organized, but I'm always super curious to know about other people's systems and what kinds of, what, what, what you're doing as a community and how you run it and uh, your practices and, and where you're going with it all. I find that stuff super interesting. It seems like you all have a really cool thing going on here. So some other time I'd love to talk more about you know, what, what, what everyone's up to. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you, man. Appreciate mm-hmm. all the good questions. Take it easy, everyone. Take care. All right. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes, uh, for a post game. Then I'm going to go see a movie with my sweetheart, you know, the whole thing. So, uh, I'm really excited for this new movie. It's called, uh, uh, is it? ISS. It's called ISS for International Space Station. Do you guys, you all know about this movie? Oh my God. It's right in line with uh, Leave the World Behind. It's right in line with that Civil War movie. And basically there's a bunch of Russians and Americans. They're in the International Space Station. And, you know, the, the, the trailer opens by saying that this was always a collaboration between the U.S. and Russia. And uh, so they're up there and they're just goofing around having fun. And then they, the, one of the gals, she's like looking down at earth and she sees this light and then light and then light. And so they're watching war break out while they're up there. And pretty much the whole earth just gets wrecked while they're up at the international space station. And then of course it turns out that certain people aboard have a mission to actually take over um, from up there. And, and then there's, of course, people up there who want to work together. And of course, you don't know who's who. So there's kind of that among us kind of component. And so I'm just really excited about this movie because like Leave the World Behind was like, it's pretty cool. Like it was, it was, it was, it was kind of sensationalized, blah, 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 blah. But no, I'm, I'm the, the, the Leave This World Behind and, uh, Civil War and, uh, ISS, all three of these are about the same thing and which is basically uh everybody wants to kill each other or at least they've been kind of duped into thinking maybe that's necessary and i'm freaked out by it i want to write an essay about it and uh so that's why i want to go see this
What are you going to say there, Nance? I, I know you got something. <laughs> I, uh, I ate some gummies and started watching For All Mankind, I think is what it's, it's the, the retell, like the reimagining of the Cold War space race. And I'm like six episodes in, uh, it was, I was enthralled with this show. I couldn't go to bed. Um, but I, I, I think it, yeah, it is kind of weird that there, there's a lot of media coming out right now that, uh, is overly fascinated with this idea of like, uh. A, a new civil war or uh, a reignition of the cold war or whatever. But yeah, that movie sounds cool. And it reminded me of the for, for all mankind show that it's really cool. So I want to, I want to close out with two things. One is I want you guys to talk about the things you wish you could have talked to Justin about like other questions that came up. I know Cadell, you've got something so we can kind of bring up those kind of like, cause the idea is that the saying always overflows is said. So let's put some stuff out to kind of get it simmering so that we can kind of come back to it later and do, do more on this. And that'll be towards our closing thoughts. And then I also want to quilt everything with the response to the idea that I'm a, I'm a self-entitled shill. I think we should close on that comment because uh, I, I know that we shouldn't give the trolls the, 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 the bait, but I actually think that the contradiction here is illuminating and that it, it brings the focus back to what this is ultimately about, which is that I am a shill. So let's, let's, uh, but first of all, uh, let's, uh, what, what do you wish you had asked, uh, Justin, uh, Cadell? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, I was thinking about what Mikey said about the body without organs as a virtual reservoir of potentials within our bodies. And, when I was thinking about that in the context of what Justin Murphy was saying about what it seemed to me to be the virtual potential of our future body is like, is our, is the option between Christ and a transsexual slime ball? Cause that seemed to be like the way he was uh, depicting it. It's like this either with the virtual potential of Christ or the virtual potential of a transsexual slime ball. And uh, let me get the quote that's it's, it's from meltdown. Hold on. And I wanted to quickly link this to Alenka is actually going to be coming to Philosophy Portal this Monday. And I was reading her, well, rereading her article, Is Sex Passe in, in Underground Theory? And she makes a really interesting point in that article that there's a type of weird historical circle between repression and sexual excess. And she frames it as the cultural repression of libido versus the anti-cultural libido. And that there's some sort of weird circle between these two processes. And it seems to me like Christ and the transsexual slime ball would be good models for this system. So I was just like seeing if there's any connection there ultimately between the these lines of thought. All right, so here's the quote. It's from Meltdown. It's in Fang Numina, page 456. <clears throat> Meltdown has a place for you as a schizophrenic, HIV-positive, transsexual, Chinese-Latino, STEM-addicted L.A. hooker <clears throat> with implanted mirror shades and a bad attitude, blitzed on a polydrug mix of K-Nova, synthetic serotonin and female orgasm analogs you have just iced three turing cops with a highly cinematic nine millimeter automatic the residue of animal twang in your nerves transmits imminent quake catastrophe zero is coming in and you're on the run i i think that's going to be the catholics too i don't know I... <laughs> <laughs> that character just described was probably Catholic. Let's be honest. It's probably Justin Murphy's friend. I don't know. But um, uh, I'm glad you elaborated with the quote, actually, because I wasn't sure. I didn't remember. I was just like, I was like, hmm, interesting. So, uh, yeah, any other kind of closing thoughts or questions you guys had on this, this whole line of thought? This, uh, Land, Murphy, accelerationism, Catholicism. I, I mean, I, I mean, I could 
dig up some other questions, but I really got my core questions for Justin asked. So I was happy about that. I want to say, like, Zizek's been talking a lot about apocalypse and, like, the difference between apocalypse with and without kingdom. And I, I think, like, this is also coming up as well in, in, in this distinction between Christian accelerationism. Is, like, apocalypse with kingdom or apocalypse without kingdom? Yeah, it's interesting that Zizek is doing this Christian atheism thing that is totally materialist. And over here we have Justin Murphy doing uh, Christian Landianism. It's, a, it's, it's, it, it's fascinating. I don't know. I don't really know. I feel like today, no, I uh, today this is the year of people trying to theology pill me. It really is. Uh, I know that there are like 15 conversations lined up for me this year of various people from various theological uh proclivities backgrounds uh who are who have this vested interest in talking to me about it uh the one of the ones i'm most excited about is samuel Loncar, become a human project he wants to talk to me about the course he wants to teach a theory underground i offered this by the way it wasn't like he was like hey i want to teach this i was like you should teach a course on this which is uh theology for atheists which is like well you 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 know, if you come from a strict uh, sect or a, 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 you know one of these traditions that's that has a particular reading of things and has told you a bunch of definitions for things, but you haven't done theology and you're being an atheist, well, then you know here's a class on how to be an atheist because he's an atheist of a sort. Um, but it's kind of like he doesn't think that most atheists are atheists and uh, thinks that you know some education is necessary. And so I'm interested in that. I'm interested in a few other things along those lines. I know that we've got Mark Murphy. Uh, he will be here eventually. We've been talking. Um, and uh, there's, there's a few others as well. Uh, but with that said, okay, yeah, Mikey, go for it. No, I was just going to say, I would, I would really like to see a conversation between Justin Murphy and Mark Murphy, right? I mean, you get Landian Catholic and the Lacanian Catholic. I mean, that would be a, a fun discussion right there. Mm, for sure. And and they're both called Murphy's. So you could, I mean, there's something there. There's probably some meme value. I don't know if anybody saw the meme that I already made for the conversation. Um, but you know, you got to check out the meme. It's it's the most recent one on my Instagram. It's also on the YouTube community page. It's very inappropriate. I, after putting the meme up, I realized it's kind of awkward because my uh well, Anne's mother actually follows me on instagram and it's awkward because it's like one of these you know like a sort of porn uh meme it's i'm gonna hold it up to the to the screen here it's not it's not bad or anything but it's like it's showing the guy who's like laying on his back and then she's doing reverse uh cowgirl and and, and he's got the laptop up in front of her back and he's watching us having our conversation with justin you know <laughs> this this meme is just blowing up right now so of course but um well okay everybody so a lot of you don't know too much about theory underground uh i'll roll the psa at the end here it should give you all a little bit more of a chance to to know a bit more about it um cadell is doing education online through philosophy portal i'm doing education online through theory underground theory underground has been around for a whopping year but of course there were decades well, at least a decade of work that went into what what it eventually became. We could say that a lot of those prior projects were sublated into what it became. And uh, this includes uh, the U.S. tour that we did already in September of last year, uh, the anthology Underground Theory with over 31 contributors here, uh, as well as my book, Time Energy, Why You Have No Time or Energy. It's uh, existential phenomenological, structural uh, analysis of the conditions for one, the good life, and two, what what ruins the good life. That is our reduction as human beings into this commodity form called labor power. Um, and my, pre my previous book was called Waypoint, uh, Time, Energy, Critical Media Theory, and Culture War. Justin Murphy actually almost wrote a preface to it, but he was super busy at the time. And uh, I... It, I Elton LK ended up writing the preface. It was just, he was, he was itching to do it. And so I went for that option. 
because Justin was pretty busy and I didn't know if that was going to, how long it would take. Um, but the reason I'm waving Waypoint around, I don't normally talk about this book, right? This is, it's still under my old name, Theory Pleep, right? I used that name when I was more of a lefty influencer or whatever. Well, Waypoint uh, is a collection of my thoughts leading up to the Time Energy book. It includes a piece of my, my master's thesis. Um, where I developed the concept of time energy, which is essentially, in, in very simplistic terms, um, large energy infused repeatable blocks of time that are reliably available week to week throughout your whole, your whole life. Right? The, that, that is the precondition for being able to learn multiple languages and play multiple instruments and go and dance and do jujitsu and ride your bicycle and play with friends and fight and you know, be in bands. I mean, really all of the cool things while still being a philosopher, like the, the condition of possibility for that kind of a lifestyle would be time energy. It's not, it's what we all lack. Uh, and so it's what we all ultimately come together around here, but underground theory is a much broader thing than, than theory underground. Cadell is a part of underground theory. Justin Murphy is a part of underground theory. Everybody is a part of underground theory. If they're here, <laughs> Right. The, the, the underground theory is just the fact that it's outside of academia. It's on the Internet. It's in back alleys, whatever. I don't know. But uh, theory underground is this trying is the to seem to mill you. Exactly. That's what I was just going to say. Seen, so seen, the, seen to mill you. theory underground is trying to take the scene, the underground theory scene into an intellectual milieu, not not trying to totalize the field and then capture it and take it all into its own thing. No, trying to foster the conditions for an intellectual milieu to to come out of this the most anti-intellectual point in human history right and so uh I, I i think that a lot of us here are a part of that process i think that uh the piece that i just wrote on scenes versus milieus uh that is going to go into cadell's anthology is something i look forward to talking about with you all here and as well as on his channel hopefully soon i mean the very you know presentation on that came out of a conference i did at philosophy portal um but this may and october are two very exciting times for theory underground and for the larger underground theory scene that, that gives a shit and that is to say that we're going on tour in europe we're going to be meeting up with cadell doing events in three locations if you are in paris brussels or <clears throat> Brussels. I guess three the three events we're doing are in those two places. Um, if and you're maybe London. Well, we're definitely doing stuff in London, but the question is, is will we be doing the stuff that you're talking about? So there's different things happening in London. There will be definitely a public event in London at Alfie's Pub that you can all come to. That's Alfie Bone of Sublation Media and Everyday Analysis. Um, but the yeah, no, there will be like these smaller uh, meetups in Paris and Brussels. Uh, you basically have to reach out to me direct or to Cadell direct and talk to us for a bit to even be a part of those because they're not just open to the public. But the, most of the events are just open to the wider uh, public, including the one that will be at Katowice and the one that will be in Krakow. Those are Polish uh, cities. And we had uh, representatives of both of those places who are bringing us there uh, on as the second guests on today's all day live stream. Okay. So with that said, May is when the European tour is going down. I think we have a spot in Evora, Portugal for a sort of conference before the conference. And there's a lot of really cool stuff going into that, but it's also kind of up in the air because there's complications now. Um, so stay tuned for kind of locking down the dates. We know for sure that we will be collaborating with Ashley Frowley in Greece. We know for sure about the London stuff, the Brussels stuff, the Paris stuff, the Polish stuff. But at the end of the day, I'm not too desperate. If people don't roll the red uh, carpet out for me and make it really easy. I don't care uh, because I only want to work with people who are eager and uh, pe not too eager. I don't, I don't want to work with people who are too eager, but I do want to work with people who are welcoming and making it easy as opposed to people who want it. They wish for it, but also things are too complicated. Hey, maybe next time. Okay. Well, what's coming out of the tour? What's the fucking point of a tour? Part of the point of a tour is to break outside of this medium and into people's IRL spaces, but to incorporate those IRL spaces into the actual institution of Theory Underground, which is that we were experimenting with the hybrid model all tour. We did events uh, all across the US, coast to coast, 
We did stuff with Mikey in Kansas City at this epic bookstore, Prospero's bookstore. Uh, but we also did stuff in Washington, D.C. at that famous pizza shop, the Comet Ping Pong. We did uh, stuff in uh, a, a super bougie art school in Chicago. Uh, we did stuff at the McLuhan Institute in Ontario. We did stuff uh, at the bougiest uh, college you could ever go to called Pomona. It has like a $3 billion uh, endowment um, thanks to the some amazing faculty there. Uh, and so, you know, it's inside the university, it's outside the university. We're happy to use university resources if people can get those for us, if we can hack the system, of course, because otherwise we're just doing it on our own money, right? It's all very expensive to have to do this kind of thing. And so, you know, uh, but we think it's important. And the conversations that we're having, the presentations that we're doing, the papers that are being written are all ultimately going towards, what? how many was it, Nance? We were talking about the different volumes. At this point, there are... Uh, eight different calls for proposals in development for eight different anthologies, all of which will be small little anthologies as opposed to this fat boy right here. Um, and that would be one on critical media theory, one on professionals and managers of capital, PMC, one on Zizek and the Ljubljana School, one on underground theory from scene to milieu, one on underground theory, a discourse in search of a method, one on value for Marxism versus the labor theory of value and one on critical doxology and time energy, though that might break into two, one would be, which would be focused on kind of this imminent but uh, sort of dignifying uh, critique of the doxa of our day, which is mostly uh, self-help and business uh, success kinds of books and gurus. Uh, as a, And then the other one being the time energy book, uh, Notes Towards Time Energy, Mikey, uh, and several other people have done their own writing on the on the idea, and so it would be a collection of different people's ideas on time energy because the idea at this point is already bigger than me. And the final one would be the Human Futures volume. All the Nick Land stuff is absolutely essential for the Human Futures volume, and so I hope that you each, in your closing statements, might say something about any one of those volumes that you are especially excited about. Uh, and then, of course, the final presentations for a lot of the stuff that's going into those volumes will be in Boise, Idaho, of all places, in the, during the last month or uh, week of October 2024. Cool. Um, so that's pretty much the things. Uh, I started a Patreon and a Substack recently. So somebody in the comment section said that I'm a self-entitled shill. And I did want you guys to kind of, I know you guys don't think I should dignify it. You guys don't think I should take it seriously. But it is like a thought that comes to people's minds, especially people who've never had to do anything or leave their house, uh, especially people who are on their parents' allowances, who don't actually produce things and who've never really, uh, I don't know, experienced the difference between a cost and, uh, and, uh, and a price. Like, because the price that I put on things never actually exceeds the actual cost of what I put into those things. And, you know, that's bad business, but here I am. So, with that all said, everybody, Anthologies you're excited about and say something about me as a shill. All right. Thanks. I think, uh, I'm, I think I'm most excited about the human, human futures, uh, volume. I'm also really excited about the, the volume on value. Um, we've been going through doing a very careful reading of Marx, uh, the last couple of months and it will continue. Uh, and I'm just really excited about it. And, again they're all interconnected they all relate to one another but they they will be um i don't know volumes uh in themselves uh but it's all really exciting um and as far as the the shilling thing goes uh we really need to put out something on on money realism like something substantial because it does boil down to the fact that when you are living in real life in the real world and, and you're engaged in something real, real projects, whatever it is, um, you like come into a relationship with money where you're just like, yeah, this is something that has to be spent on things like food and shelter, um, and base psychological needs and blah, 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 blah. Uh, and it's fun to live in, in the ideal world where, we're all radical leftists and you're, you're just a shill cause you're asking for money and blah, blah, blah. Um, 
but also keep that shit to yourself, dude. That really just demonstrates your lack of maturity at the end of the day. Um, and we don't need to be wasting time doing little bullshit internet putt putt games. Like we really are trying to do serious shit. Um, everyone here, everyone that's involved here, all the guests, all the people that have written, all the people that have done work in the background that never gets noticed. Um, so keep that shit to yourself, dude. Well said, man. I mean, I'll just say very quickly, the human future sounds great. I'd love to participate in that. I'm also excited about the logic for the Global Brain Anthology that we're going to publish at Philosophy Portal. Dave, you'll have an article in it. Um, and that sort of brings together like sort of, you know, my interest in Hegel and, you know, my PhD thesis on the global brain in an interesting way. So for me, that's sort of a special release. Um, and then I guess on the human, on the, on the Dave as a shill thing, I mean, it's just so beyond absurd, but I, I do sort of think that leftist politics needs to go sex negative precisely so that they can start to see civilizational construction as positive. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's just a fundamental problem with leftist politics. So yeah. what does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean to say uh, this thing about? Well, I, I, I actually take this, this is the point I take from Alenka's article in, in the underground theory anthology, which is that first there, she calls it sexo leftism. And sexo leftism has basically the first approach in the 1960s to be um, against the regulation of sex. Uh, and now there's a form of leftism which sort of sees um, a new a new type of regulation of sex in gender identity as a positive meaning. And both of those things for Alenka are sort of obfuscations of the fact that sex is fundamentally a disorienting negativity. And consequently, I just I just think that if if we think leftist politics from this point of view, we have a different perspective on civilizational construction. I'm not sure if that, that totally makes sense. But. Right, and I can see some confusion in the Twitch uh, chat, but Adam, I would just say that uh, it... Sex is being used in a very interesting way here, so you just have to watch the uh, the first conversation from the day that one I had with Alenka to really get into what she means by that, because it's a very specific thing. It, it's not the, well, arguably it is what builds the civilization, but it also it's, we're not talking about being uh, anti-sex or something, like that. that's, that's not what that means, but uh, we're very obviously pro, pro-sex here. This is, that's why I made this meme, you know. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Mikey, you kind of get the closing, you know, spot here. And then I got to run to this movie. Yeah, I'm uh, excited about the Human Futures volume. Uh, I know that all three of you in particular could write something really cool. Samuel Longcar can write something. I hope you can get Justin Murphy to give you something. I think he would have something really cool to add to that volume. Um, the value form thing is, that seems overly intellectual probably to a lot of people but i think it's a fundamental importance so that one's great um you know i'm all i'm excited for the libidinal economy zizek we'd be honest school thing so lots of cool ones to uh be thinking about um people want to you know get their ideas spinning you know for uh for papers or submissions um as far as the shill thing goes i mean how dare you want to fight for a meaningful life? How dare you want to have access to food? How dare you want clothes and shelter? Fuck you. Head to the bridge, bud. That's what I'm going to go do, actually. You know, I was going to go see this movie with Anne, but I think actually... I mean, I'm that's really the message, right? It's just, the message is I mean, head to the bridge. Like, you know, fuck you, dude. Thinking is super uncool, and that's why you should do it. It's just like you muted, you muted. anything that's like. Sorry, I, I started rolling the PSA by accident. I clicked the wrong button. Uh, okay, sorry. What were you saying? Go to the bridge. No, okay. I'm just, you know, fucking around. The point is, 
Now fuck that motherfucker. Yeah. So yeah. so what because what you like theory you're supposed to not want to be able to make a living doing what you like. I thought that's isn't that the whole idea at least the the, the abstract idea behind capitalism is that you can figure out a way to do something you want to do and make a living. And now we know about the realities of it, but um, I don't know where somebody can be coming from to, yeah. that's no, why man, I say it, don't fucking worry about it because it's so stupid that no, ev- necessitated ev- response. Everything should be free. Oh, okay. So that means that we who are already, who have already traded more than our 20,000 hours due to society to you know the 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 system to make it run we actually just need to to keep working for the rest of our lives and just do this on the side that this is you always go back to it's impossible that we get free from wage labor if we ever actually get free from wage labor without the phd then we've done something that was supposed to be impossible now of course i got sixty thousand dollars of debt and a master's degree uh unlike you but if we do we still do the act capital a we perform we make the the impossible possible Right. And that's what it really boils down to. They don't want to see us escape. Yeah, that's the point. You have, well, not the majority of people would root for us, but you will have a couple people who would rather us die than be able to get free from wage labor. Whatever. Um, okay. I mean, but I mean, the, the comments so dumb. I mean, uh, just, just say what you want, which is, if you know, I don't like you head to the bridge. That's the real meaning. So if that's the case and I, whatever, <laughs> keep it moving. Okay, maybe later. Um, uh, and uh, to the person in the chat asking if the calls uh, for papers have been made public yet. Um, honestly, I've got too many submissions already for some of these. I kind of have to figure out which ones will be made public. The best way to do this is to reach out to me direct. I'm not a university. I don't have to do this any sort of, oh, it's open to everybody kind of way. But it's for fellow travelers. It's specifically for people who are taking courses at Theory Underground. Um, if you're doing all the Capital Monday stuff with me and Nance, then I'd want to get you in on the value form stuff as long as you can write a banger ass paper that really contributes something. Um, if you've done the Critical Media Theory cohorts one and are getting geared up to do uh, the second one, we got at least a couple of people binging the past one, then uh, yeah. Then yeah, we would definitely take a. Uh, we're, we're we're open to people who are part of the cohort, um, putting forward pieces. Um, but we're not just taking pieces from from people who are interested. Oh, here's my opinion. I'm really smart. Here's my opinion. We do get a lot of offers like that. I know there's a lot of really great people working in isolation. They're very alienated. But the point of going from a scene to a milieu is to say no. Get a basis in the course. There's a reason I use courses instead of just YouTube videos or Twitch streams. Um, And that's because we have to get a shared grounding. We have to figure out what we're talking about. Um, And so a lot of these courses, especially the Professionals and Managers of Capital one, the Professional Managerial Critique, there's a whole course on that. It's free. It's on the, oh shit, you fucked up my everything. Oh my God. Okay. Who just left? Tell. You got to warn me before you do this shit. Hold on. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> I'm about to close out. Yeah, it's just that I have like a, a OBS setup here. But okay, all I'm saying is that uh, get involved with the courses. Or reach out to me direct. Ask which course for the specific anthology you want to be in. We can work from there. Um, uh, obviously, there's there's exceptions to the general rule, but that's what the general rule is. All right, everybody, I've got to roll out of here. Really, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, Cadell, especially you. I know it's like the middle of the night for you. So everybody, have a wonderful rest of your day. This has been a wonderful, what, how many hours is it? 11 hours and 53 minutes, which means it'll probably get cut off before the end anyway. So everyone, uh, take care. Peace. Much love. Take care. Bye-bye. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time-energy theory, 
critical media theory CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run and review books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best editing collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. Seriously. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarricker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages, five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting.